The Story of Civilization, Volume 5, The Renaissance, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 9, Side 1. It was Montaigne's last great painting. His final years were saddened by ill health, bad temper, and mounting debts. He resented Isabella's presumption to lay down the precise details of the pictures she asked of him. He retired into angry solitude, sold most of his art collection, finally sold his house. In 1505, Isabella described him as tearful, agitated, and with so sunken a face that he seemed to me more dead than alive. A year later he died, aged seventy-five. Over his tomb in Sant'Andrea, a bronze bust, perhaps by Montaigne himself, portrayed with angry realism the bitterness and exhaustion of a genius who had used himself up in his art for half a century. Those who desire immortality must pay for it with their lives. 3. The First Lady of the World La Prima Donna del Mondo, so the poet Niccolò da Correggio called Isabella d'Este. The novelist Bandello considered her supreme among women and Ariosto did not know which to praise most highly in the liberal and magnanimous Isabella, her gracious beauty, her modesty, her wisdom, or her fostering of letters and arts. She possessed most of the accomplishments and charms that made the educated woman of the Renaissance one of the masterpieces of history. She had a wide and varied culture without being an intellectual or ceasing to be an attractive woman. She was not extraordinarily beautiful. What men admired in her was her vitality, her high spirits, the keenness of her appreciation, the perfection of her taste. She could ride all day and then dance all night and remain every moment a queen. She could rule Mantua with a tact and good sense alien to her husband, and in the debility of his later years she held his little state together despite his blunders, his wanderings, and his syphilis. She corresponded on equal terms with the most eminent personalities of her time. Popes and dukes sought her friendship, and rulers came to her court. She subpoenaed nearly every artist to work for her. She inspired poets to sing of her. Bembo, Ariosto, and Bernardo Tasso dedicated works to her, though they knew that her purse was small. She collected books and art with the judgment of a scholar and the discrimination of a connoisseur. Wherever she went, she remained the cultural focus and sartorial exemplar of Italy. She was one of the Estenzi, the brilliant family that gave dukes to Ferrara, cardinals to the church, and a duchess to Milan. Isabella, born in 1474, was a year older than her sister Beatrice. Their father was Ercole I of Ferrara. Their mother was Eleonora of Aragon, daughter of King Ferrante I of Naples. They were well equipped with lineage. While Beatrice was sent to Naples to learn vivacity at the court of her grandfather, Isabella was brought up amid the scholars, poets, dramatists, musicians, and artists that were making Ferrara for a time the most brilliant of Italian capitals. At six, she was an intellectual prodigy who made diplomats gape. Though I had heard much of her singular intelligence, wrote Beltramino Cusatro to Marquis Federigo of Mantua in 1480, I could never have imagined such a thing to be possible. Federigo thought she would be a good catch for his son Francesco, and so proposed to her father. Ercole, needing the support of Mantua against Venice, agreed, and Isabella, aged six, found herself engaged to a boy of fourteen. She remained for ten years more at Ferrara, learning how to sew and sing, to write Italian poetry and Latin prose, to play the clavichord and the lute, and to dance with a sprightly grace that seemed to attest invisible wings. Her complexion was clear and fair, her black eyes sparkled, her hair was a mesh of gold. So at sixteen she left the haunts of her happy childhood and became, proudly and seriously, the Marchioness of Mantua. Don Francesco was swarthy, bushy-haired, fond of hunting, impetuous in war and love. In those early years he attended zealously to government and faithfully maintained Mantegna and several scholars at his court. He fought with more courage than wisdom at Fornovo, and chivalrously or prudently sent to Charles the Eighth most of the spoils that he had captured in the tent of the fleeing king. He used the soldier's privilege of promiscuity and began his infidelities with the first confinement of his wife. Seven years after his marriage, 
he allowed his mistress Theodora to appear in almost regal raiment at a tournament in Brescia, where he rode in the lists. Isabella may have been partly to blame. She became a bit plump, and went on long visits to Ferrara, Urbino, and Milan. But doubtless the Marquis was not inclined to monogamy in any case. Isabella bore with his adventures patiently, took no public notice of them, remained a good wife, gave her husband excellent advice in politics, and supported his interests by her diplomacy and her charm. But in 1506 she wrote to him, then leading papal troops, a few words warm with the hurt she felt. No interpreter is needed to make me aware that Your Excellency has loved me little for some time past. Since this, however, is a disagreeable subject, I will say no more. Her devotion to art, letters, and friendship was in part an attempt to forget the bitter emptiness of her married life. There is nothing more pleasant in all the rich diversity of the Renaissance than the tender relations that bound together Isabella, Beatrice, and Isabella's sister-in-law, Elisabetta Gonzaga. And few passages finer in Renaissance literature than the affectionate letters they exchanged. Elisabetta was grave and weak and often ill. Isabella was merry, witty, brilliant, more interested in literature and art than either Elisabetta or Beatrice. But these differences of character were made complementary by good sense. Elisabetta loved to come to Mantua, and Isabella worried more about her sister-in-law's health than about her own, and took every measure to make her well. Yet there was a selfishness in Isabella quite absent from Elizabeth. Isabella could ask Caesar Borgia to give her Michelangelo's Cupid, which Borgia had stolen after seizing Elisabetta's Urbino. After the fall of Lodovico il Moro, the brother-in-law who had lavished every courtesy upon her, she went to Milan and danced at a ball given by Lodovico's conqueror, Louis XII. Perhaps, however, it was her feminine way of saving Mantua from the resentment aroused in Louis by the injudicious candor of her husband. Her diplomacy accepted the interstate amorality of that time and ours. Otherwise, she was a good woman, and there was hardly a man in Italy that would not have been glad to serve her. Bembo wrote to her that he desired to serve her and please her as if she were Pope. She spoke Latin better than any other woman of her time, but she never mastered the language. When Aldous Minucius began to print his choice editions of the classics, she was among his most enthusiastic customers. She employed scholars to translate Plutarch and Philostratus, and a learned Jew to translate the Psalms from the Hebrew so that she might assure herself of their original magnificence. She collected Christian classics, too, and read the fathers with courage. Probably she treasured books more as a collector than as a reader or a student. She respected Plato, but really preferred the chivalric romances that entertained even the Ariostos of her generation and the Tassos of the next. She loved finery and jewelry more than books and art. Even in her later years, the women of Italy and France looked to her as the glass of fashion and the queen of taste. It was part of her diplomacy to move ambassadors and cardinals with the combined allure of her person, her dress, her manners, and her mind. They thought they were admiring her erudition or her wisdom when they were relishing her beauty, her costume, or her grace. She was hardly profound, except perhaps in statesmanship. Like practically all her contemporaries, she listened to astrologers and timed her enterprises by the concurrence of the stars. She amused herself with dwarfs, maintained them as part of her entourage, and had six rooms and a chapel built to their measure for them in the castello. One of these favorites was so short, said a wit, that if it had rained an inch more he would have been drowned. She was fond, too, of dogs and cats, chose them with the finesse of a fancier, and buried them with solemn funerals in which the surviving pets joined with the ladies and gentlemen of the court. The castello, or regia, or Palazzo Ducale, over which she reigned, was a medley of buildings of various dates and authorship, but all in that style of outer fortress and inner palace which raised similar structures in Ferrara, Pavia, and Milan. Some components, like the Palazzo del Capitano, went back to the Buonacosi rulers in the 13th century. The harmonious Castello San Giorgio was a creation of the 14th. The Camera degli Sposi was the work of Lodovico Gonzaga and Mantegna in the 15th. Many rooms were rebuilt in the 17th or 18th. Some, like the sumptuous Sala degli Specchi, or Hall of Mirrors, were redecorated during the rule of Napoleon. All were elegantly fitted out, 
and the vast congeries of residential chambers, reception halls, and administrative offices looked out on courts or gardens or Virgil's meandering Mincio, or the lakes that bordered Mantua. In this labyrinth, Isabella occupied different quarters at different times. In her later years, she loved best a little apartment of four rooms, or camerini, known as Il Studiolo, or Il Paradiso. Here, and in another room called Il Grotto, she gathered her books, her objet d'art, and her musical instruments, themselves finished works of art. Next to her care for the preservation of Mantua's independence and prosperity, and sometimes above her friendships, the ruling passion of her life was the collection of manuscripts, statuaries, paintings, majolica, antique marbles, and little products of the goldsmith's art. She used her friends and employed special agents in cities from Milan to Rhodes to bargain and buy for her and to be on the alert for fines. She haggled because the treasury of her modest state was too narrow for her ideas. Her collection was small, but every item in it stood high in its class. She had statuary by Michelangelo, paintings by Montaigne, Perugino, Francia. Not content, she importuned Leonardo da Vinci and Giovanni Bellini for a picture, but they held her off as one who paid more in praise than in cash and doubtless, too, because she specified too immutably what each picture should represent and contain. In some cases, as when she paid 115 ducats, or $2,875, for Jan van Eyck's Passage of the Red Sea, she borrowed heavily to satisfy her eagerness for a masterpiece. She was not generous to Montaigne, but when that ogre of a genius died, she persuaded her husband to lure Lorenzo Costa to Mantua with a handsome salary. Costa decorated Gian Francesco Gonzaga's favorite retreat, the Palace of St. Sebastian, made portraits of the family, and painted a mediocre Madonna for the Church of Sant'Andrea. In 1524, Giulio Pipi, called Romano, the greatest of Raphael's pupils, settled at Mantua and astonished the court with his skill as architect and painter. Almost the entire ducal palace was redecorated according to his designs and by the brushes of himself and his pupils. Francesco Primaticcio, Niccolo Dell'Abate, and Michelangelo Anselmi. Federigo, Isabella's son, was ruler now, and since he, like Romano, had acquired at Rome a taste for pagan subjects and decorative nudes, he had the walls and ceilings of several rooms in the Castello painted with inviting pictures of Aurora, Apollo, the Judgment of Paris, the Rape of Helen, and other phases of classic myth. In 1525, on the outskirts of the town, Giulio began to build his most famous work, the Palazzo del Te. A vast rectangle of one-storied structures, in a simple design of stone blocks and Renaissance windows, surrounds what was once a pleasant garden but is now a neglected waste in the impoverished aftermath of war. The interior is a succession of surprises, rooms tastefully adorned with pilasters, carved cornices, painted spandrels, and coffered vaults walls, ceilings, and lunettes picturing the story of the Titans and the Olympians, Cupid and Psyche, Venus and Adonis, and Mars, Zeus, and Olympia, all in a revel of splendid nudes in the amorous and reckless taste of the later Renaissance. To crown these masterpieces of sexual license and gigantic strife, Primaticcio carved in stucco a grand processional relief of Roman soldiers in the manner of Montaigne's Triumph of Caesar, and almost with the chiseled excellence of Phidias. When Primaticcio and Delabate were summoned to Fontainebleau by Francis I, they brought to the royal palaces of France this style of decoration, with rosy nudes, which Giulio Romano had brought to Mantua from his work with Raphael in Rome. From the citadel of Christianity, pagan art radiated to the Christian world. The last years of Isabella mingled sweet and bitter in her cup. She helped her invalid husband to govern Mantua. Her diplomacy saved it from falling prey to Caesar Borgia, then to Louis XII, then to Francis I, then to Charles V. One after another she humored, flattered, charmed, when Gian Francesco or Federigo seemed on the edge of political disaster. Federigo, who succeeded his father in 1519, was an able general and ruler, but he allowed his mistress to displace his mother as ruler of the Mantuan court. Perhaps retreating from this indignity, Isabella went to Rome in 1525 to seek a red hat for her son, Ercole. 
Clement VII was noncommittal, but the cardinals welcomed her, made her suite in the Colonna Palace a salon, and kept her there so long that she found herself imprisoned in the palace during the sack of Rome, this in 1527. She escaped with her usual adroitness, won the coveted cardinalate for Ercole, and returned to Mantua in triumph. In 1529, attractive at fifty-five, she went to the Congress of Bologna, courted emperor and pope, helped the lords of Urbino and Ferrara to keep their principalities from being absorbed into the papal states, and persuaded Charles V to make Federigo a duke. In that same year, Titian came to Mantua and painted a famous portrait of her. The fate of this picture is uncertain, but the copy of it made by Rubens shows a woman still in the vigor and love of life. Bembo, visiting her eight years later, was amazed by her vivacity, the alertness of her mind, the scope of her interests. He called her the wisest and most fortunate of women, but her wisdom fell short of accepting old age cheerfully. She died in 1539, aged 64, and was buried with preceding rulers of Mantua in the Cappella dei Signori in the Church of San Francesco. Her son ordered a handsome tomb to be raised to her memory and joined her in death a year later. When the French pillaged Mantua in 1797, the tombs of the Mantuan princes and princesses were shattered, and the ashes they contained were mingled in the indiscriminate dust. Chapter 10. Ferrara, 1378-1534. 1. The House of Este. In the first quarter of the 16th century, the most active centers of the Renaissance were Ferrara, Venice, and Rome. The student who wanders through Ferrara today can hardly believe, until he enters the mighty Castello, that this slumbering city was once the home of a powerful dynasty, whose court was the most splendid in Europe, and whose pensioners included the greatest poet of the time. The city owed its existence partly to its position on the route of commerce between Bologna and Venice, partly to the agricultural hinterland that used it as a mart and was itself enriched by three branches of the Po. It was included in the territory given to the papacy by Pepin III in 756 and Charlemagne in 773, and was again deeded to the church by the Countess Matilda of Tuscany in 1107. While formally acknowledging itself to be a papal fief, it governed itself as an independent commune, dominated by rival mercantile families. Disordered by these feuds, it accepted Count Azzo VI of Este as its podesta in 1208, and made this office hereditary in his progeny. Este was a small imperial fief, some forty miles north of Ferrara, which had been given to Count Azzo I of Canossa by the Emperor Otho I in 961. In 1056 it became the seat of the family, and soon gave it its name. From this historic house came the later royal families of Brunswick and Hanover. From 1208 to 1597, the Estensi ruled Ferrara technically as vassals of the empire and the papacy, but practically as independent lords, with the title of Marquis or, after 1470, Duke. Under their government, the people prospered tolerably and supplied the needs and luxuries of a court that entertained emperors and popes and supported a notable retinue of scholars, artists, poets, and priests. Despite lawless cruelties and frequent wars, the Estensi retained the loyalty of their subjects through four centuries. When a legate of Pope Clement V expelled the Estensi and proclaimed Ferrara a papal state in 1311, the people found ecclesiastical rule more irksome than secular exploitation. They drove out the legate and restored the Estensi to power in 1317. Pope John XII laid an interdict upon the city. Soon the people, deprived of the sacraments, began to murmur. The Estensi sought reconciliation with the church and obtained it on hard conditions. They acknowledged Ferrara to be a papal fief, which they would rule as vicars of the popes, and they pledged themselves and their successors to pay from the revenues of the state an annual tribute of 10,000 ducats, possibly a quarter of a million dollars, to the papacy. During the long rule, from 1393 to 1441, of Niccolo III, the House of Este reached the acme of its power governing not only Ferrara, but also Rovigo, Modena, Reggio, Parma, and even briefly Milan. Niccolo married as widely as he ruled, having a long succession of wives and mistresses. One especially pretty and popular wife, Parisina Malatesta, committed adultery with her stepson Ugo. Niccolo had them both beheaded in 1425, 
and ordered that all Ferrari's women convicted of adultery should be put to death. When it became clear that this edict threatened to depopulate Ferrara, it was no longer enforced. For the rest, Niccolo ruled well. He reduced taxes, encouraged industry and commerce, summoned Theodorus Gaza to teach Greek in the university, and engaged Guarino da Verona to establish at Ferrara a school rivaling in fame and result the school of Vittorino da Feltre at Mantua. Niccolo's son, Leonello, who ruled from 1441 to 1450, was a rare phenomenon, a ruler both gentle and virile, refined and competent, intellectual and practical. Trained in all the arts of war, he cherished peace and became the favored arbiter and peacemaker among his fellow rulers in Italy. Taught letters and literature by Guarino, he became, a generation before Lorenzo de' Medici, one of the most cultivated men of the age. The learned Filelfo was astonished by Leonello's mastery of Latin and Greek, rhetoric and poetry, philosophy and law. This marquis was the scholar who first suggested that the supposed letters of St. Paul to Seneca were spurious. He established a public library, provided fresh funds and inspiration for the University of Ferrara, brought to its staff the best scholars that he could find, and participated actively in their discussions. No scandal or bloodshed or tragedy marred his reign except its tragic brevity. When he died at forty, all Italy mourned. A succession of able rulers continued the golden age that Leonello had begun. His brother Borso, from 1450 to 1471, was a man of sterner stuff, but he maintained the policy of peace, and Ferrara's prosperity became the envy of other states. He did not care for literature or art, yet he supported them amply. He administered his realm with skill and comparative justice, but he taxed his people heavily and spent much of their substance on court pageants and displays. He loved rank and title, and longed to be a duke like the Visconti of Milan. By expensive gifts, he persuaded the Emperor Frederick III to invest him with the dignity of Duke of Modena and Reggio, this in 1452, and marked the occasion with a costly festival. Nineteen years later, he secured from his other feudal lord, Pope Paul II, the title of Duke of Ferrara. His fame spread throughout the Mediterranean world. The Muslim sovereigns of Babylonia and Tunis sent him gifts, presuming him to be the greatest ruler in Italy. Borso was fortunate in his brothers, Leonello, who had given him the best of examples, and Ercole, who had refused to sanction a conspiracy to depose him, had remained his loyal aide to the end and now succeeded to his power. For six years, Ercole continued the reign of peace, pageantry, poetry, art, and taxation. He cemented friendship with Naples, by marrying King Ferrante's daughter, Eleonora of Aragon, and welcomed her with the most lavish festivities that Ferrara had ever seen, this in 1473. But in 1478, when Sixtus IV declared war on Florence because of its punishment of the Pazzi conspirators, Ercole joined Florence and Milan against Naples and the papacy. That war having ended, Sixtus induced Venice to join him in attacking Ferrara in 1482. While Ercole lay sick in bed, the Venetian forces advanced to within four miles of the city. The dispossessed peasantry crowded within the gates and joined in the general starvation. Then the temperamental pope, fearing that Venice, not the papacy or his nephew, would get Ferrara, made peace with Ercole, and the Venetians, retaining Rovigo, retired to their lagoons. The fields were planted again, food came into the city, trade was resumed, taxes could be gathered. Ercole complained that the fines levied for blasphemous profanity were falling away from the normal total of 6,000 crowns a year, possibly around $150,000. He could not believe that profanity was any less popular than before. He demanded strict enforcement of the law. Every penny was needed, for Ercole, perceiving that the people had multiplied beyond their housing, built an extension as large as the older city. He had this Adizione Herculea designed with such wide, straight streets as no Italian town had known since Roman days. The new Ferrara was the first really modern city in Europe. Within a decade, the growth and influx of population had filled the added space. Ercole raised churches, palaces, and convents, and coaxed holy women to make Ferrara their home. The focus of the people's life was the 12th century cathedral. The elite preferred the giant castello that Niccolo II had built in 1385 to protect the government from foreign attack or domestic revolt. 
Restored and transformed through seven generations, its massive towers still dominate the central square of the city. Below are the dungeons in which Parisina and many others died. Above are the spacious halls adorned by Dosodosi and his assistants, where Duke and Duchess held court, musicians played and sang, dwarfs pranced, poets recited their verses, buffoons put on their antic jests, male sought female, ladies and cavaliers danced through the night, and on quieter days in quieter rooms, dames and lasses read romances of chivalry. Isabella and Beatrice d'Este, born to Ercole and Eleonora in 1474 and 1475, grew up like fairy princesses in this environment of wealth and festival, war and song and art. But a fond grandfather lured Beatrice to Naples. A betrothed called her to Milan, and in that same year, 1490, Isabella left for Mantua. Their departure saddened many hearts in Ferrara, but their marriages strengthened the alliance of the Estenzi and the Sforzas and Gonzagas. Ippolito, one of several sons, was made an archbishop at eleven, a cardinal at fourteen, and became one of the most cultured and dissolute prelates of the age. We should in fairness note again that such ecclesiastical appointments, ignoring fitness and age, were part of the diplomatic alliances of the time. Alexander the Sixth, pope since 1492, was eager to please Ercole, for he aimed at making his daughter Lucrezia Borgia the Duchess of Ferrara. When he proposed to Ercole that Alfonso, son and heir of the duke, should marry Lucrezia, Ercole received the proposal coldly, for Lucrezia had not then the fumigated reputation that she has now. He finally consented, but after wringing from the eager father such concessions as made Alexander call him a haggling shopkeeper. The Pope was to give Lucrezia a dowry of one hundred thousand ducats, possibly one and a quarter million dollars. The annual tribute of Ferrara to the papacy was to be reduced from four thousand to one hundred florins and the duchy of Ferrara was to be settled by papal confirmation upon Alfonso and his heirs forever. Despite all this, Alfonso was reluctant until he saw the bride. We shall see later how he welcomed her. In 1505 he succeeded to the ducal throne. He was a new type among the Estensi. He had traveled through France, the Lowlands, and England, studying industrial and commercial techniques. Leaving to Lucrezia the patronage of arts and letters, he devoted himself to government, machinery, and pottery. With his own hands he made a painted fine majolica and founded the best canon of the time. He studied the art of fortification until he was the leading authority on the subject in Europe. He was normally a just man. He treated Lucrezia kindly, despite her epistolary flirtations. But when he dealt with external enemies or internal revolt, he gave scant play to sentiment. One of Lucrezia's ladies, Angela, charmed two of Alfonso's brothers, Ippolito and Giulio, in a moment of thoughtless arrogance, Angela taunted Ippolito by telling him that his whole person was worth less to her than the eyes of his brother. The cardinal, with a band of bravos, waylaid Giulio and looked on while these pierced Giulio's eyes with stakes in 1506. Giulio appealed to Alfonso to avenge him. The duke banished the cardinal, but soon allowed him to return. Stunned by Alfonso's apparent indifference, Giulio conspired with another brother, Ferrante, to murder both the duke and the cardinal. The plot was discovered, and Giulio and Ferrante were imprisoned in the cells of the Castello. Ferrante died there in 1540. Giulio was freed by Alfonso II in 1558, after fifty years of genteel confinement. He emerged an old man, white of hair and beard, and dressed in the fashion of half a century before. He died shortly after his release. Alfonso's qualities were what his government needed, for Venice was expanding into the Romagna and was plotting to absorb Ferrara, while Julius II, the new pope, resenting the concessions made to the Estensi in connection with Lucrezia's marriage, was resolved to reduce the principality to the status of an obedient and profitable fief. In 1508, Julius persuaded Alfonso to join with him and France and Spain in snubbing Venice. Alfonso agreed because he yearned to recover Rovigo, the Venetians concentrated their attack upon Ferrara. Their fleet, sailing up the Po, was destroyed by Alfonso's concealed artillery, and their soldiers were routed by Ferrari's troops under Cardinal Ippolito, who enjoyed war only next to Venery. When Venice seemed on the verge of defeat, Julius, not wishing to weaken irreparably the strongest Italian bulwark against the Turks, made peace with her and ordered Alfonso to do the same. 
Alfonso refused and found himself at war with both his enemy and his late ally. Reggio and Modena fell to the papal forces, and Alfonso seemed lost. In desperation, he went to Rome and asked the Pope for terms. Julius demanded the complete abdication of the Estensi and the absorption of Ferrara into the papal states. When Alfonso rejected these demands, Julius tried to arrest him. Alfonso escaped, and after three months of disguises, wanderings, and perils, reached his capital. Julius died in 1513. Alfonso retook Reggio and Modena. Leo X resumed the war of the papacy for Ferrara. Alfonso, always improving his artillery and shifting his diplomacy, held his own obstinately until Leo II died in 1521. Pope Adrian VI gave the indomitable duke an honorable settlement, and Alfonso was allowed for a spell to turn his talents to the arts of peace. 2. The Arts in Ferrara Ferrari's culture was purely aristocratic, and its arts sedulously served the few. The ducal family, so often at war with the papacy, had no stronger stimulus to piety than to give a devout example to the people. Some new churches were built, but of no memorable quality. The cathedral received in the 15th century an unprepossessing campanile, a choir in the Renaissance style, and a pretty Gothic loggia and virgin in its facade. Non ragionam di lor, ma guarda e passa. The architects of the time and their patrons preferred palaces. About 1495, Biagio Rossetti designed one of the finest, the Palazzo di Lodovico il Moro. According to a doubtful tradition, Lodovico had commissioned it in the thought that he might someday be driven from Milan. It was left unfinished when he was taken to France. Its cortile, with simple but graceful arcades, is among the lesser jewels of the Renaissance. Lovelier still was the court of the palace built for the Strozzi in 1499, and now named Bevilacqua, or drink water, from a later occupant. Imposing is the Palazzo dei Diamanti, designed by Rossetti in 1492 for Duke Ercole's brother Sigismondo, and faced with 12,000 marble bosses whose diamond shape gave the building its name. Pleasure palaces were in fashion and had fancy names, Belfiore, Belriguardo, La Rotonda, Belvedere, and above all, the summer palace of the Estensi, the Palazzo di Schifanoia, or Skip Annoyance, or, as Frederick the Great would say, Sans Souci, without care. Begun in 1391, finished by Borso about 1469, it served as one home of the court and as a dwelling for minor members of the ducal family. When Ferrara declined, the palace was turned into a tobacco factory and the murals that Cosa, Tura, and others had painted in the main hall were covered with calcimine. In 1840 this was removed, and seven of the twelve panels were salvaged. They constitute a remarkable record of the costumes, industries, pageantry, and sports of Borso's time, strangely mingled with personages from pagan mythology. These frescoes are the happiest product of a school of painting that for half a century made Ferrara a busy center of Italian art. Ferrari's painters humbly followed the Jotesque tradition until Niccolo III stirred the stagnant waters by bringing in foreign artists to compete with them. Jacopo Bellini from Venice, Mantegna from Padua, Pisanello from Verona. Leonello added stimulus by welcoming Ruggier van der Weyden in 1449, who helped to turn Italian painters to the use of oil. In the same year, Piero della Francesca came from Borgo San Sepolcro, to paint murals, now lost, in the ducal palace. What finally formed the Ferrara school was Cosimo Tura's zealous study of Montaigne's frescoes at Padua and of the techniques taught there by Francesco Squaccione. Tura became court painter to Borso in 1458, made portraits of the ducal family, shared in decorating the Schifanoia palace, and won such a claim that Raphael's father ranked him among the leading painters of Italy. Giovanni Santi apparently relished Cosimo's dignified and somber figures, his ornate architectural backgrounds, his landscapes of fantastic rocks. But Raffaello Santi would have missed in these pictures any element of tenderness or grace. We find those elements in Torres' pupil Ercole de Roberti, who succeeded his teacher as court painter in 1495. But this Hercules lacked power and vitality, unless we accept the Franz Halsey in concert once ascribed to him in the London Gallery. 
Francesco Cosa, the greatest of Tura's pupils, painted in the Schifanoia two masterpieces rich in both vitality and grace. The Triumph of Venus and the Races, revealing the charm and joy of life at the Ferrara court. When Borso paid him for these at the official rate, ten bolognini per foot of painted space, Cosa protested, and when Borso failed to see the point, Francesco took his talents to Bologna in 1470. Lorenzo Costa did likewise thirteen years later, and the school of Ferrara lost two of its best men. Dosso Dossi revitalized it by studying in Venice in the heyday of Giorgione, from 1477 to 1510. Returning to Ferrara, he became the favorite painter of Duke Alfonso I. Ariosto, his friend, ranked him and a forgotten brother among the immortals. We can understand why Ariosto liked Dosso, who brought into his pictures an outdoor quality almost illustrative of Ariosto's sylvan epic, and bathed them in the warm colors that he had borrowed from the sumptuous Venetians. It was Dosso and his pupils who decorated the Sala di Consiglio in the Castello with lively scenes of athletic contests in the ancient style, for Alfonso liked athletics more than poetry. In his later years, Dosso painted with uneven hand the allegorical and mythological scenes on the ceiling of the Sala dell'Aurora. Here, pagan motives, rampant in Italy, triumphed in a celebration of physical beauty and sensuous life. Perhaps the decadence that now began in Ferrari's art, due chiefly to the exhaustive cost of Alfonso's wars, had one source in this victory of flesh over spirit. The passion and grandeur of the old religious themes faded from a largely secular art, leaving it predominantly decoration. The most brilliant figure in this decline was Benvenuto Tizi, named Garofalo, from his native town. On two visits to Rome he became so enamored of Raphael's art that, though two years his senior, he enrolled as an assistant in the young master's studio. When family affairs recalled him to Ferrara, he promised Raphael to return, but Alfonso and the nobility gave him so many commissions that he could never tear himself away. He consumed his energy and divided his ability in producing a multitude of paintings, of which some seventy remain. They lack both force and finish, and yet one holy family in the Vatican shows how even the minor artists of the Renaissance could now and then touch greatness. The painters and the architects were only a fraction of the artists who labored to please the fortunates of Ferrara. Miniaturists produced there, as elsewhere in that eager age, works of a delicate beauty on which the eye rests longer and more contentedly than on many a famous painting. The Schifanoia Palace has preserved several of these gems of illumination and calligraphy. Niccolo III brought in tapestry weavers from Flanders. Ferrari's artists furnished designs. The patient art flourished under Leonello and Borso. The resulting tapestries decorated palace walls and were lent to princes and nobles for their special festivities. Goldsmiths were kept busy making ecclesiastical vessels and personal ornaments. Ferrandio of Mantua and Pisanello of Verona made here some of the finest medallions of the Renaissance. Last and least was sculpture. Cristoforo da Firenze molded the man, Niccolo Baroncelli the horse, for a bronze statue of Niccolo III. It was set up in 1451, two years before Donatello's Gattamelata rose in Padua. Beside it, in 1470, was placed a bronze statue of Duke Borso, calmly seated as became a man of peace. In 1796, both monuments were destroyed by revolutionists who branded the bronzes as mementos of tyranny and melted them into cannon to end all tyranny and all wars. Alfonso Lombardi adorned the alabaster chambers of the Castello with stately statuary. Then, like so many Ferrari's artists, he decamped to Bologna, where we shall find him in glory. The court of Ferrara was too narrow in its ideas, tastes, and fees to transmute evanescent wealth into immortal art. 3. Letters The intellectual life of Ferrara had two roots, the University and Guarino de Verona. Founded in 1391, the University had soon closed for lack of funds. Reopened by Niccolo II, it led a half-starved existence until Leonello, in 1442, reorganized and refinanced it with an edict whose prelude deserves commemoration. It is an ancient opinion, not only of the Christians but of the Gentiles, that the heavens, the sea, and the earth must someday perish. In like manner, of many magnificent cities, nothing but ruins leveled with the ground can now be seen, and Rome the conqueror herself lies in the dust and is reduced to fragments. 
while only the understanding of things divine and human, which we call wisdom, is not extinguished by length of years, but retains its rights in perpetuity. By 1474, the university had 45 well-paid professors, and the faculties of astronomy, mathematics, and medicine were rivaled in Italy only by those at Bologna and Padua. Guarino, born at Verona in 1370, went to Constantinople, lived there five years, mastered the Greek language, and returned to Venice with a cargo of Greek manuscripts. A legend told how, when a box of these was lost in a storm, his hair turned white overnight. He taught Greek at Venice, where he had taught Vittorino da Feltre among his pupils, and then at Verona, Padua, Bologna, and Florence, absorbing the classical scholarship of each city in turn. He was already fifty-nine when he accepted an invitation to Ferrara. There, as tutor to Leonello, Borso, and Ercole, he trained three of the most enlightened rulers in Renaissance history. As professor of Greek and rhetoric in the university, his success was the talk of Italy. So popular were his lectures that students made their way through any rigor of winter to wait outside the unopened doors of the room in which he was scheduled to speak. They came not only from Italian cities, but from Hungary, Germany, England, and France, and many of them went forth from his instruction to fill vital posts in education, law, and statesmanship. Like Vitorino, he supported poor students out of his personal funds. He lived in humble quarters, ate but one meal a day, and used to invite his friends not to feasts, but to fave e favole, beans and conversation. He was not quite the equal of Vitorino as a moral paragon. He could pen virulent invectives like any humanist, perhaps as a literary game. But his thirteen children were apparently begotten on one wife. He was temperate in everything but study, and he maintained health, vigor, and mental clarity till his ninetieth year. It was chiefly due to him that the Dukes of Ferrara supported education, scholarship, and poetry, and made their capital one of the most renowned cultural centers in Europe. The revival of antiquity brought with it a renewed acquaintance with classic drama. Plautus, son of the people, and Terence, manumitted darling of the aristocracy, came alive again after fifteen centuries and were acted on temporary stages at Florence and Rome, above all at Ferrara. Ercole I in particular loved the old comedies and spared no revenues in producing them. One representation of the Menechma cost him a thousand ducats. When Lodovico of Milan saw a performance of this play at Ferrara, he begged Ercole to send the players to repeat it at Pavia. Ercole not only sent them but went with them in 1493. When Lucrezia Borgia came to Ferrara, Ercole celebrated her hymeneals with five of Plautus's comedies performed by 110 actors with lavish interludes of music and ballet. Guarino, Ariosto, and Ercole himself translated Latin plays into Italian, and performances were given in the vernacular. It was through imitation of these classic comedies that Italian drama took form. Boyardo, Ariosto, and others wrote plays for the ducal company. Ariosto drew up plans, and... Dosso Dossi painted the fixed scenery for the first permanent theater of Ferrara and modern Europe in 1532. Music and poetry also won the patronage of the court. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 5, The Renaissance, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued. Cassette 9, Side 2. Music and poetry also won the patronage of the court. Tito Vespasiano Strozzi needed no ducal subsidies for his verse, for he was the scion of a rich Florentine family. He composed in Latin ten books of a poem in praise of Borso. Leaving it unfinished at his death, he bequeathed to his son Ercole the task of completing it. Ercole was well fitted for the assignment. He wrote excellent lyrics, Latin and Italian, and a longer poem, La Caccia, The Hunt, dedicated to Lucrezia Borgia. In 1508 he married a poetess, Barbara Torelli. Thirteen days later he was found dead near his home, his body savagely pierced with twenty-two wounds. This is a mystery story still unsolved after four centuries. Some have thought that Alfonso had approached Barbara, had been repulsed, and revenged himself by hiring assassins to kill his successful rival. It is unlikely, for Alfonso, as long as Lucrezia lived, showed her every sign of fidelity. The desolate young widow composed an elegy whose ring of sincerity is rare in the usually artificial literature of the Ferrara court. 
Why may I not go down to the grave with thee? She asks the slain poet. Would that my fire might warm this frigid ice, and turn with tears this dust to living flesh, and give to thee anew the joy of life. Then would I boldly, ardently, confront the man who snapped our dearest bond, and cry, O oh, cruel monster, see what love can do. In this courtly society, dowered with leisure and fair women, the French romances of chivalry were a daily food. In Ferrara, Provençal troubadours had sung their lays in Dante's time, and had left a mood of fanciful, not onerous, chivalry. Here and throughout northern Italy, the legends of Charlemagne, his knights, and his wars with the Moslem infidels had become almost as familiar as in France. The French trouvère had spread and swelled these legends as chansons de geste, and their recitals, piling episode upon episode, hero upon heroine, had become a mass of fiction monumental and confused, crying out for some Homer to weave the tales into sequence and unity. As an English knight, Sir Thomas Mallory had recently accomplished this with the legends of Arthur and the Round Table, so now an Italian nobleman took up the task for the cycle of Charlemagne. Matteo Maria Boiardo, Count of Scandiano, was among the most distinguished members of the Ferrara court. He served the Estensi as ambassador on important missions, and was entrusted by them with the administration of their largest dependencies, Modena and Reggio. He governed poorly, but sang well. He addressed passionate verses to Antonia Caprara, soliciting and publishing her charms, or reproaching her for lack of fidelity and sin. When he married Tadea Gonzaga, he turned his muse to graze in safer pastures, and began in 1486 an epic, Orlando Innamorato, recounting the troubled love of Orlando, that is, Roland, for the enchantress Angelica, and mingling with this romance a hundred scenes of tilt, tournament, and war. A humorous legend tells how Boyardo sought far and wide to find a properly resounding name for the boastful Saracen in his tale, and how, when he hit upon the mighty cognomen of Rodamante, the bells of the Count's fief, Scandiano, were set ringing for joy, as if aware that their lord was unwittingly giving a word to a dozen languages. It is hard for us in our own exciting times, agitated even in peace with the tilts and tournaments of hostile words, to interest ourselves in the imaginary wars and loves of Orlando, Rinaldo, Astolfo, Ruggiero, Agramante, Marfisa, Fiordalisa, Sacripante, Agricane, and Angelica, who might have stirred us by her beauty, disconcerts us by the supernatural enchantments that she practices. We are no longer bewitched by sorceresses. These are tales that befitted a comely audience in some palace bower or garden close, and indeed we are told the Count read these cantos at the Ferrara court, doubtless a canto or two at a time. We do Boyardo and Ariosto injustice when we try to take them an epic at a time. They wrote for a leisurely generation and class, and Boyardo for one that had not yet seen the invasion of Italy by Charles the Eighth. When that disillusioning humiliation came, and Italy saw how helpless she was, with all her art and poetry, against the ruthless powers of the North, Boyardo lost heart, and after writing sixty thousand lines he dropped his pen with a stanza of despair. O God Redeemer, even while I sing I see all Italy in flame and fire, brought by these Gauls who spurred with courage high, advanced to make a desert everywhere. He did well to end, and wisely died in 1494, before the invasion had reached full force. The noble sentiment of chivalry that had found rough utterance in his poetry evoked only the rarest response in the troubled generation that ensued. Though he had earned a niche in history by developing the modern romantic epic, his voice was soon forgotten in the wars and turmoil of Alfonso's reign, in the alien rape of Italy, and in the seductive beauty of Ariosto's gentler verse. 4. Ariosto As we approach the supreme poet of the Italian Renaissance, we must remind ourselves that poetry is not an untranslatable music, and that those of us to whom the Italian language is not a native boon must not expect to understand why Italy ranks Lodovico Ariosto only next to Dante among her bards, and reads the Orlando Furioso with an affectionate delight surpassing that which Englishmen take in Shakespeare's plays. We shall hear the words, but miss the melody. He was born on September 14, 1474, at Reggio Emilia, where his father was governor. In 1481 the family moved to Rovigo, 
but apparently Lodovico received his education in Ferrara. Like Petrarch, he was set to study law but preferred to write poetry. He was not much disturbed by the French invasion of 1494, and when Charles VIII prepared a second descent into Italy in 1496, Ariosto composed an ode in Horatian style, putting the matter in what seemed to him a proper perspective. What signifies to me the coming of Charles and his hosts? I shall rest in the shade, hearkening to the gentle murmur of the waters, watching the reapers at work. And thou, O oh my Phyllis, wilt stretch thy white hand among the enameled flowers, and weave me garlands to the music of thy voice. In 1500 the father died, leaving to his ten children a patrimony sufficient to support one or two. Lodovico, the oldest, became father of the family, and began a long struggle with economic insecurity. His anxieties warped his character into a timidity and angry subservience unintelligible to those who have never hungered between rhymes. In 1503 he entered the service of Cardinal Ippolito d'Este. Ippolito had little taste for poetry, and kept Ariosto uncomfortably busy with diplomatic errands and trivia, for which the poet received 240 lire, or about $3,000 a year, irregularly paid. He sought to improve his position by writing lauds of the cardinal's courage and chastity and defending the blinding of Giulio. Ippolito offered to raise his salary if he would take holy orders and become eligible for certain available benefices, but Ariosto disliked the clergy and preferred to philander rather than to burn. It was during his service with Ippolito that he wrote most of his plays. He had begun as an actor and had been one of the company that Ercole sent to Pavia. When he himself devised dramas, they bore the stamp of Terence or Plautus, and were frankly offered as imitations. His Casaria was performed at Ferrara in 1508, his Suppositi at Rome in 1519 before an approving Leo X. He continued to write plays till his last year, and left the best of them, Scholastica, unfinished at his death. Nearly all turn on the classic theme of how one or more young men, usually through the wits of their servants, may possess themselves, by marriage or seduction, of one or more young women. Ariosto's plays rank high in Italian comedy, low in the history of drama. It was again during his employment with Ippolito that the poet wrote most of his enormous epic, Orlando Furioso. Apparently the cardinal was no hard taskmaster after all. When Ariosto showed Ippolito the manuscript, the realistic prelate, according to an uncertain tradition, Sinon Vero Bentrovato, asked him, where, Messer Lodovico, have you found so much nonsense? Dante Gorbelerie. But the laudatory dedication seemed to make more sense, and the cardinal paid the cost of publishing the poem in 1515 and secured all rights and profits of its sale to Ariosto. Italy did not think the poem nonsense, or thought it delectable nonsense. Nine printings were bought up between 1524 and 1527. Soon the choicest passages were being recited or sung throughout the peninsula. Ariosto himself read much of it to Isabella d'Este in her illness at Mantua and rewarded her patience with the eulogy in later editions. He spent ten years, from 1505 to 1515, writing the Furioso, sixteen more in polishing it. Every now and then he added a canto until the whole ran to almost 39,000 lines, equivalent to the Iliad and the Odyssey combined. At first, he merely proposed to continue and expand Boyardo's Orlando Innamorato. He took from his predecessor the chivalric setting and theme, the loves and battles of Charlemagne's knights, the central characters, the loose episodic construction, the suspension of one narrative to pass to another, the magic operations that often turn the tale, even the idea of tracing the pedigree of the Estensi to the marriage of the mythical Ruggiero and Bradamante. And yet, while praising a hundred others, he never mentions Boyardo's name. No man is a hero to his debtor. Perhaps Ariosto felt that the theme and characters belonged to the cycle of legends themselves rather than to Boyardo. Like the Count, and unlike the legends, he stressed the role of love above that of war, and so proclaimed in his opening lines, Women I sing, and knights, and arms, and loves, and deeds of chivalry and bold emprise. The story carries out this program faithfully. It is a series of combats, some for Christianity against Islam, most for women. A dozen counts and kings contest Angelica. She flirts with them all, plays with them one against another, and is caught in an anticlimax when she falls in love with a handsome mediocrity 
and marries him before she has time to make the usual examination of his income. Orlando, who enters the story after eight cantos have rolled by, pursues her over three continents, neglecting, meanwhile, to go to the aid of his sovereign, Charlemagne, when the Saracens attack Paris. He goes mad on learning that he has lost her, in Canto 13, and recovers sanity sixteen cantos later when his lost wits are found in the moon and brought back to him by a predecessor of Jules Verne's lunar navigators. This central theme is confused and obfuscated by the interpolated adventures of a dozen other knights who pursue their respective women through forty-six cantos of seductive verse. The women enjoy the chase, perhaps excepting Isabella, who persuades Rodomonte to cut off her head rather than to deflower her, and earns a monument. The old legend of St. George is included. The beautiful Angelica is chained to the rocks beside the sea as a propitiatory offering to a dragon who hungers for a virgin annually. And before Ruggiero can arrive to rescue her, the poet contemplates her with Corregian appreciation. A people fierce, inhospitable, crude, exposed upon the shore to savage beast, a woman fairest of the fair, and nude, as when first nature her sweet form composed. No smallest veil enclosed the lilies white and vermal roses of her flesh, that bear midsummer's ardor and December's cold unhurt, and gleam on her resplendent limbs. She might have seemed to him a statue made of alabaster or some marble form, bound to the stone by sculptor's artifice, had he not seen a bright tear fall between the roses and white privets of her cheeks, bedewing breasts like apple sperm, and seen the breezes breathing on her golden hair. Ariosto does not take all this too seriously. He is writing to amuse. He deliberately charms us by the incantation of his verse into an unreal world, and mystifies his tale with fairies, magic weapons, and enchantments, winged horses touring the clouds, men turned into trees, fortresses melting at an imperious word. Orlando spits six Dutchmen on one spear, Astolfo creates a fleet by throwing leaves into the air and catches the wind in a bladder. Ariosto laughs with us at all this and smiles tolerantly, not sarcastically, at the tilts and shams of chivalry. He has an excellent sense of humor, salted with gentle irony. So he includes, in the waste deposited by the earth upon the moon, the prayers of hypocrites, the flatteries of poets, the services of courtiers, the donation of Constantine. Only now and then, in a few moral exordiums, does Ariosto pretend to philosophy. He was so completely the poet that he lost and consumed himself in forging and polishing a beautiful form for his verse. He had no energy left to pour it into an ennobling purpose or a philosophy of life. Italians love the Furioso because it is a treasury of exciting stories, with never a pretty woman too far away told in melodious and yet unaffected language, and in racy stanzas that lure us swiftly on from scene to scene. They forgive the long detours and descriptions, the innumerable and sometimes labored similes, for these too are dressed in sparkling verse. They are rewarded and silently shout bravo when the poet hammers out a striking line, as when he says of Zerbino, Nature made him and then broke the mold. They are not long disturbed by Ariosto's expectant flattery of the estensi, his paeans to Ippolito, his praise of Lucrezia's chastity. These obeisances were in the manner of the times. Machiavelli would stoop as low to conquer a subsidy, and a poet must live. But this became difficult when the cardinal decided to campaign in Hungary and desired Ariosto to accompany him. Ariosto demurred, and Ippolito freed him from further service and recompense in 1517. Alfonso saved the poet from penury by giving him an annual stipend of eighty-four crowns, plus three servants and two horses, and requiring almost nothing in return. After forty-seven years of obstinate but hardly celibate bachelordom, Ariosto now married Alessandra Benucci, whom he had loved when she was still the wife of Tito Vespasiano Strozzi. By her he had no children, but two natural sons had rewarded his premarital efforts. For three years, from 1522 to 1525, he served unhappily as governor of the Garpagnana, a mountainous region racked with brigandage but he was unfit for action or command, and gladly retired to spend the remaining eight years of his life in Ferrara. In 1528, he bought a plot of land on the outskirts of the city, and built a pretty house, still shown in the Via Ariosto, and maintained by the state. Across the front he inscribed Horatian lines of proud simplicity. 
small but suitable for me, hurtful to no one, not mean, yet acquired by my own funds, home. There he lived quietly, working occasionally in his garden, and revising or expanding the Furioso every day. Meanwhile, further emulating Horace, he had written to various friends seven poetical epistles that have come down to us under the name of satires. They are not as sharp and compact as those of his model, nor as bitter and lethal as juveniles. They were the product of a mind loving and never quite finding peace, bearing fretfully the whips and scorns of time, the proud man's contumely. They described the faults of the clergy, the simony rampant in Rome, the nepotism of worldly popes. They excoriate Ippolito for paying his menials better than his poet. They expound a cynical conception of women as rarely faithful or honest, and offer the advice of a tardy expert on choosing and taming a wife. They lament the indignities of a courtier's life, and wryly recount an unsuccessful visit to Leo X. I kissed his foot, he bent down from the holy seat, took my hand, and saluted me on both cheeks. Besides, he made me free of half the stamp dues I was bound to pay. Then, breast full of hope, but body soaked with rain and smirched with mud, I went and had my supper at the ram. Two satires mourn his narrow life at Garfagnana, his days spent in threatening, punishing, persuading, or acquitting. His muse frightened and paralyzed into silence by crimes, lawsuits, and brawls and his mistress so many miles away. The last epistle asks Bembo to recommend a Greek tutor for Ariosto's son, Virginio. The Greek must be learned, but also of sound principles, for erudition without morality is worse than worthless. Unhappily, in these days it is difficult to find a teacher of this sort. Few humanists are free from the most infamous of vices, and intellectual vanity makes most of them skeptics also. Why is it that learning and infidelity go hand in hand? Ariosto himself had through most of his life taken religion lightly, but like nearly all the intellects of the Renaissance, he made his peace with it in the end. Even from youth he had suffered from a bronchial catarrh, which was probably aggravated by his travels as courier for the cardinal. In 1532 the trouble sank deeper and became tuberculosis. He struggled against it as if not satisfied with the mere immortality of fame. He was only fifty-eight when he died in 1533. He had become a classic long before his death. Twenty-three years earlier, Raphael had painted him, in the Parnassus fresco of the Vatican, with Homer and Virgil, Horace and Ovid, Dante and Petrarch, among the unforgettable voices of mankind. Italy calls him her Homer, and the Furioso her Iliad. But even to an idolater of Italy this appears more generous than just. The world of Ariosto seems light and fantastic beside the ruthless siege of Troy. His knights, some as indistinguishable in their character as in their armor, hardly rise to the majesty of Agamemnon, the passion of Achilles, the wisdom of Nestor, the nobility of Hector, the tragedy of Priam. And who will equate the fair and flighty Angelica with the Dia Gynacon, the goddess among women, Helen, conqueror in defeat? And yet the last word must be as the first. Only those can judge Ariosto who know his language thoroughly, who can catch the nuances of his gaiety and his sentiment, and can respond to all the music of his melodious dream. 5. Aftermath It was the Italians themselves, with their lusty sense of humor, who provided an antidote to the romanticism of the two Orlandos. Six years before Ariosto's death, Girolamo Folengo published an Orlandino, in which the absurdities of the epics were caricatured with hilarious exaggerations. Girolimo heard the skeptical lectures of Pomponazzi at Bologna, adopted a curriculum of amours, intrigues, fisticuffs, and duels, and was expelled from the university. His father disowned him, and he became a Benedictine monk in 1507, perhaps as a means of subsistence. Six years later he fell in love with Girolima Dieda and eloped with her. In 1519 he published a volume of burlesques under the title of Macaronea, which thenceforth gave its name to a swelling literature of rough and ribald satire in mingled Latin and Italian verse. The Orlandino was a riotous mock epic in coarse and popular vernacular, pursuing a serious vein for a stanza or two, then startling the reader with a thought and phrase worthy of the most scatophilic privy counselor. The knights, armed with kitchen utensils, rush into the lists on limping mules. The leading churchman of the tale is the monk Grifarosto, Abbot grabbed the roast, 
whose library consists of cookbooks interspersed with victuals and wine, and all the tongues he knew were those of oxen and swine. Through him, Folengo satirizes the clergy of Italy to any Lutheran's content. The work was received with guffaws of applause, but the author continued to starve. Finally, he retired again to a monastery, wrote pious poetry, and died in the odor of sanctity at fifty-three in 1544. Rabelais relished him, and perhaps Ariosto, in his final years, joined in the merriment. Alfonso I kept his little state secure against all the assaults of the papacy, and at last took a reckless revenge by encouraging and abetting the German-Spanish army that besieged, captured, and plundered Rome in 1527. Charles V expressed appreciation by restoring to him Ferrara's ancient fiefs, Modena and Reggio, so that Alfonso transmitted his duchy undiminished to his heirs. In 1528, he sent his son Ercole to France to bring home a diplomatic bride from the royal family, René or Renata, tiny, somber, deformed, and secretly won by the heresy of Calvin. Alfonso, after Lucrezia's passing, consoled himself with the mistress, Laura Dianti, and perhaps married her before his death in 1534. He had outwitted every enemy but time. Chapter 11 Venice and Her Realm 1378 to 1534. 1. Padua. Under the dictatorship of the Cararesi, Padua was a major Italian power, rivaling and threatening Venice. In 1378, Padua joined Genoa in attempting to subjugate the island republic. In 1380, Venice, exhausted by her war with Genoa, ceded to the Duke of Austria the city of Treviso, strategically situated on her north. In 1383, Francesco I of Carrara bought Treviso from Austria. Soon afterward, he tried to take Vicenza, Udine, and Friuli. Had he succeeded, he would have commanded the roads from Venice to her iron mines at Agordo and the routes of Venetian trade with Germany. That is, Padua would have controlled vital sources of Venetian industry and commerce. Venice was saved by the skill of her diplomats. They persuaded Gian Galeazzo Visconti to join Venice in war against Padua. John, while doubtless distrusting Venice, seized the opportunity to extend his frontier eastward with Venetian connivance. Francesco I de Carrara was defeated and abdicated in 1389, and his son, namesake and successor, renewed in 1399 a treaty of 1338 that had acknowledged Padua to be a dependency of Venice. When Francesco II de Carrara resumed the struggle and attacked Verona and Vicenza, Venice declared war to the death, captured and executed him and his sons, and brought Padua under direct rule by the Venetian Senate, this in 1405. The weary city abandoned the luxury of a native exploiter, prospered under an alien but competent administration, and became the educational center of the Venetian domain. From all quarters of Latin Christendom, students came to its renowned university. Pico della Mirandola, Ariosto, Bembo, Guicciardini, Tasso, Galileo, Gustavus Vasa, who would be king of Sweden, John Sobieski, who would be king of Poland. The chair of Greek was founded in 1463 and occupied by Demetrius Calsandales, 16 years before he went to Florence. A century later, Shakespeare could still speak of Fair Padua, Nursery of Arts. One Paduan was himself a famous educational institution. Trained as a tailor, Francesco Squarcione developed a passion for classic art, traveled widely in Italy and Greece, copied or sketched Greek and Roman sculpture and architecture, collected ancient medals, coins, and statuary, and returned to Padua with one of the best classical collections of his time. He opened a school of art, installed his collection there, and gave his pupils two main directives— to study ancient art and the new science of perspective. Few of the 137 artists whom he formed remained in Padua, since most of them came from the outside. But in return, Giotto came from Florence to paint the arena frescoes, Altichiero came from Verona, circa 1376, to adorn a chapel in St. Anthony's, and Donatello left memorials of his genius in the cathedral and its square. Bartolomeo Bellano, a pupil of Donatello, set up two lovely female statues for Gadamelata's chapel in the same church. Pietro Lombardo of Venice added a fine figure of the condottiere's son and a splendid tomb for Antonio Roselli. 
Andrea Briosco, called Riccio, and Antonio and Tullio Lombardo carved for the Gattamalata Chapel some superb marble reliefs, and Riccio set up in the choir of the church one of the most imposing candelabra in Italy. He shared with Alessandro Leopardi of Venice and Andrea Morone of Bergamo in designing the unfinished church of Santa Giustina, this in 1502 and following, a chaste example of the Renaissance architectural style. It was from Padua and Verona that Jacopo Bellini and Antonio Pisanello brought to Venice the seeds of that Venetian school of painting through which the splendor of Venice was blazoned to the world. 2. Venetian Economy and Policy In 1378 Venice was at Nader. Her Adriatic trade was bottled up by a victorious Genoese fleet, her communications with the mainland were blocked by Genoese and Paduan troops, her people were starving, her government contemplated surrender. Half a century later she ruled Padua, Vicenza, Verona, Brescia, Bergamo, Treviso, Belluno, Feltre, Friuli, Istria, the Dalmatian coast, Lepanto, Patras, and Corinth. Secure in her many-moted citadel, she seemed immune to the political vicissitudes of the Italian mainland. Her wealth and power mounted until she sat like a throned queen at the head of Italy. Philippe de Comines, arriving as French ambassador in 1495, pictured her as the most triumphant city that I have ever seen. Pietro Casola, coming from hostile Milan about the same time, found it impossible to describe the beauty, magnificence, and wealth of this unique assemblage of 117 islands, 150 canals, 400 bridges, all dominated by the flowing promenade of the Grand Canal, which the traveled Comines pronounced the most beautiful street in the world. Whence came the wealth that supported this magnificence? Partly from a hundred industries, shipbuilding, iron manufactures, glass blowing, leather dressing and tooling, gem cutting and setting, textiles, all organized in proud guilds, or scuole, that united master and man in patriotic fellowship. But perhaps more of Venetian opulence came from the mercantile marine whose sails flapped on the lagoons, whose galleys took the products of Venice and her mainland dependencies and the German and other wares that scaled the Alps and carried them to Egypt, Greece, Byzantium, and Asia and returned from the east with silks, spices, rugs, drugs, and slaves. The exports of an average year were valued at ten million ducats, or two hundred fifty million dollars. No other city in Europe could equal this trade. The Venetian vessels could be seen in a hundred ports, from Trebizond in the Black Sea to Cadiz, Lisbon, London, Bruges, even in Iceland. On the Rialto, the commercial center of Venice, merchants could be seen from half the globe. Marine insurance covered this traffic, and a tax on imports and exports was the mainstay of the state. The annual income of the Venetian government in 1455 was 800,000 ducats, or about $20 million. In the same year, the revenue of Florence was some 200,000 ducats, of Naples, 310,000, of the Papal States, 400,000, of Milan, 500,000, of all Christian Spain, 800,000. This commerce dictated the policies, as it so largely financed the operations of the Venetian Republic. It raised to power a mercantile aristocracy that made itself hereditary and controlled all the organs of the state. It kept a population of 190,000, in 1422, profitably employed, but it left them dependent upon foreign markets, materials, and food. Imprisoned in her labyrinth, Venice could feed her people only by importing food. She could supply her industries only by importing lumber, metals, minerals, leather, cloth. And she could pay for these imports only by finding markets for her products and her trade. Dependent on the mainland for food, outlets, and raw materials, she fought a succession of wars to establish her control over northeastern Italy. Dependent likewise on non-Italian areas, she was anxious to dominate the regions that supplied her wants, the markets that took her goods, the routes by which her vital commerce passed. She became by manifest destiny an imperialistic power. So the political history of Venice turned on her economic needs. When the Scaligeri at Verona or the Cararese at Padua, or the Visconti at Milan attempted to spread their sway over northeastern Italy, Venice felt endangered and took to arms. Fearful that Ferrara might control the mouths of the Po, she tried to determine the choice or policy of the ruling Marquis there, 
and resented the claims of the papacy to Ferrara as its fief. Her own westward expansion angered Milan, which had expansive ideas of its own. When Filippo Maria Visconti attacked Florence in 1423, the Tuscan Republic appealed to Venice for aid, and pointed out that a Milan master over Tuscany would soon absorb all Italy north of the Papal States. In a debate often repeated in history, Doge Tommaso Mocenigo, dying, fled in the Venetian Senate the cause of peace. Francesco Foscari argued for an offensive war of defense. Foscari won, and Venice began with Milan a series of wars that lasted, with some lucid intervals, from 1425 to 1454. The death of Filippo Maria in 1447, the chaos of the Ambrosian Republic in Milan, and the capture of Constantinople by the Turks inclined the rival states to sign at Lodi, a treaty that left the island republic exhausted, but victorious. Her expansion in the Adriatic began with a legitimate excuse. Her geographical position as the northernmost port of the Mediterranean was the fortune of Venice, but it was of no worth without control of the Adriatic. The eastern coast offered in its isles and bays convenient lairs for pirate vessels, whose raids were a frequent loss and constant peril to Venetian shipping. When Venice bribed the crusaders to help her take Zara in 1202, she acquired a post from which year by year to clear out these pirate nests until all the Dalmatian coast accepted her sovereignty. When those same crusaders raped Constantinople in 1204, Venice received as her share of the spoils Crete, Salonica, the Cyclades, and the Sporides, precious links in a golden chain of trade. With leisurely pertinacity she took Durazzo, the Albanian coast, the Ionian islands, from 1386 to 1392, Friuli and Istria, from 1418 to 1420, Ravenna in 1441. She was now indisputably queen of the Adriatic and charged tolls to all non-Venetian vessels plying that sea. As the advance of the Ottoman Turks toward Constantinople made it difficult for that capital to defend the outlying possessions of Byzantium, many Greek islands and cities submitted themselves to Venice as the only power ready to protect them. In Cyprus, a stately queen, Caterina Cornaro, last of the Lusignan line, was persuaded that she could not hold her island against the Turks. She abdicated in favor of a Venetian governor in 1489 and a Venetian pension of 8,000 ducats a year. She retired to an estate at Azolo, near Treviso, set up an unofficial court, patronized literature and art, and became the subject or dedicatee of poems and operas and paintings by Gentile Bellini, Titian, and Veronese. All these laborious conquests of diplomacy or arms these outlets, guardians, and tributaries of Venetian trade faced in their turn the rising tide of the Ottoman. At Gallipoli in 1416, a Turkish garrison attacked a Venetian fleet. The Venetians fought with their usual courage and won a decisive victory. For a generation, the rival powers lived in a truce and commercial amity that shocked the Europe anxious to have Venice fight Europe's battle against the Turks. Even the fall of Constantinople did not disrupt this entente. Venice arranged a tolerable commercial treaty with the victorious Turks and exchanged courtesies with the conqueror. But now, Venetian access to the lucrative trade of the Black Seaports was dependent on Turkish permission and soon met with irritating limitations. When Pius II, voicing the sentiments of a Christian and the commercial interests of Europe, proclaimed a crusade against the Turks and received pledges of arms and men from the European powers, Venice responded to the call, hoping to repeat the strategy of 1204. But the powers welched on their promises, and Venice found herself alone at war with the Turks in 1463. For sixteen years she carried on this struggle. She was defeated and despoiled. By the peace that she signed in 1479, she ceded Negroponte, or Eubea, Scutari, and Morea to the Turks, paid a hundred thousand ducats as a war indemnity, and pledged ten thousand ducats a year for the privilege of trading in Turkish ports. Europe denounced her as a traitor to Christendom. When another pope proposed another crusade against the Turks, Venice turned a deaf ear. She agreed with Europe that trade was more important than Christianity. 3. Venetian Government Even her enemies admired her government and sent agents to study its structure and functioning. Its military organs were the most efficient navy and army in Italy. Besides her merchant fleet, which in need could be converted to men of war, Venice had, in 1423, a navy of 43 galleys and 300 auxiliary vessels. 
These were used even in wars with land powers in Italy. In 1439, they were dragged overland on rollers across mountains and valleys to be launched on the Lago di Garda, where they bombarded the possessions of Milan. While other Italian states still waged their wars with mercenaries, Venice built her army around a militia of her own loyal population, well-seasoned and trained, and armed with the latest muskets and artillery. For generals, however, she relied on condottieri, schooled in the Renaissance style of campaign by strategy. In her wars with Milan, Venice developed the talents of three famous condottieri, Francesco Camagnola, Erasmo da Narni, or Gattimilata, and Bartolomeo Coleoni, the last two distinguished by historic statues, the other by having his head cut off in the Venetian piazzetta on a charge of privately negotiating with the enemy. This government, which even Florentines sought to emulate, was a closed oligarchy of old families so long enriched by commerce that only the initiate could smell the money in their nobility. These families had managed to restrict membership in the Major Concilio to male descendants of persons who had sat in this great council before 1297. In 1315, the names of all eligibles were inscribed in a Libro d'Oro, or Book of Gold. Out of its 480 members, the council named 60, later 120, Fregadi, or invited men, to serve in yearly terms as a legislative senate. It appointed the heads of the numerous governmental departments, who together constituted an administrative collegio. And it selected as chief executive, always subject to the council, a doge or leader who presided over it in the senate and held office for life unless the council cared to depose him. The doge was aided by six privy councillors who with him composed the signoria. This signory and the senate were in practice the real government of Venice. The great council proved too large for effective action and became a body of electors exercising appointive and supervisory powers. It was an efficient constitution which normally maintained the people in a reasonable degree of prosperity, and it was capable of long-term and well-calculated policies that might have been impossible in a government subject to the fluctuations of public emotion or sentiment. The great majority of the population, though excluded from office, showed no active resentment against the ruling minority. In 1310, a group of excluded nobles under Bajamante Tiepolo rose in revolt, and in 1355, Doge Marino Faliero conspired to make himself dictator. Both attempts were easily suppressed. To guard against internal or external conspiracies, the Major Concilio yearly chose from its membership a council of ten as a committee of public safety. Through its secret sessions and trials, its spies and swift procedure, this Concilio di Dieci became for a time the most powerful body in the government. Ambassadors often reported to it secretly and held its instructions more binding than those of the Senate, and any edict of the Ten had the full force of law. Two or three of its members were delegated each month as inquisitori di Stato to search among the people and the officials for any suspicion of malfeasance or treason. Many legends arose around this Council of Ten, usually exaggerating its secrecy and severity. It published its decisions and sentences to the Great Council, though it allowed secret denunciations to be placed in the mouths of lion's heads scattered about the city, it refused to consider any unsigned charges or any that did not offer two witnesses, and even then a four-fifths vote was required before the accusation could be put on the agenda. Any person arrested had the right to choose two counsel for his defense before the ten. A condemnatory sentence had to receive a majority vote on five successive ballots. The number of persons imprisoned by the ten was very small. However, it was not above arranging the assassination of spies and of enemies of Venice in foreign states. In 1582, the Senate, feeling that the Council had served its purpose and had often exceeded its authority, reduced its powers, and from that date the Council of Ten existed only in name. The forty judges appointed by the Great Council provided an efficient and severe judiciary. The laws were clearly formulated and were strictly enforced against nobles and commoners alike. Penalties reflected the cruelty of the times. Imprisonment was often in narrow cells, admitting a minimum of light and air. Flogging, branding, mutilation, blinding, cutting out the tongue, breaking limbs on the wheel, and other delicacies were included among legal punishments. Persons condemned to death could be strangled in jail, or secretly drowned, or hanged from a window of the doge's palace, or burned at the stake. 
Persons guilty of atrocious crimes or sacrilegious theft were tortured with red-hot pincers, dragged along the streets by a horse, and then beheaded and quartered. As if to compensate for this ferocity, Venice opened her doors to political and intellectual refugees and dared to shelter Elisabetta Gonzaga and her Guido Baldo against the terrible Borgia when her sister-in-law Isabella had been frightened into letting her depart from her native Mantua. The administrative organization was probably the best in Europe in the 15th century, though corruption found its openings here, as in every government. A Bureau of Public Sanitation was established in 1385. Measures were taken to provide clean drinking water and to prevent the formation of swamps. Another bureau fixed the maximum prices that might be charged for food. A postal and courier service was set up not only for the government, but also for private correspondence and parcel transportation. Retired public servants were pensioned, and provision was made for their widows and orphans. The administration of dependent territories on the Italian mainland was relatively so just and competent that these districts prospered better under Venetian rule than ever before, and readily returned to Venetian allegiance after being detached from it by the chances of war. This book is continued on Cassette 10, Side 1. The Story of Civilization, Volume 5. The Renaissance, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued. Cassette 10, Side 1. The administration of dependent territories on the Italian mainland was relatively so just and competent that these districts prospered better under Venetian rule than ever before and readily returned to Venetian allegiance after being detached from it by the chances of war. Venetian administration of overseas dependencies was not so laudable. They were used chiefly as prizes of war, much of their soil was awarded to Venetian noblemen and generals, and the native population, while retaining their local institutions of government, seldom reached the higher offices. In her relations with other states, Venice was especially well served by her diplomats. Few governments possessed such acute observers and intelligent negotiators as Bernardo Giustiniani. Guided by the informed reports of her ambassadors, the careful statistical records of her bureaucracy, and the astute statesmanship of her senators, Venice repeatedly won in diplomacy what she had lost in war. Morally, this government was no better than others of the time, in penal legislation worse. It made and broke alliances according to fluctuations of advantage, allowing no scruple, no sentiment of fidelity to hamper policy. Such was the code of all Renaissance powers. The citizens readily accepted this code. They approved every Venetian victory, however won, they gloried in the strength and stability of their state and offered it in its need a patriotism and fullness of service unmatched among their contemporaries. They honored the doja only next to God. The doja was usually the agent, quite exceptionally the master of the council and the senate. His splendor far outshone his power. In his public appearances he was clothed in magnificent raiment and was heavy with gems. His official bonnet alone contained jewels to the value of 194,000 ducats, or about $4,850,000. Venetian painters may have learned from his garb the gorgeous colors that flowed from their brushes, and some of their most brilliant portraits are of doges in official robes. Venice believed in ceremony and display, partly to impress ambassadors and visitors, partly to awe the population, partly to give it pageantry in place of power. Even the Dodogoressa received a sumptuous coronation. The doja received foreign dignitaries and signed all important documents of state. His influence was pervasive and continuous through his lifelong tenure amid persons elected for a year. In theory, however, he was merely the servant and spokesman of the government. The long and colorful succession of doges marches through Venetian history, but only a few impressed their personalities upon the character or fortunes of the state. Despite the dying eloquence of Tommaso Mocenigo, the great council chose the expansionist Francesco Foscari to succeed him. Coming to the throne at the age of fifty, the new doge, in a reign of thirty-four years, from 1423 to 1457, carried Venice through blood and turmoil to the zenith of her power. Milan was defeated, Bergamo, Brescia, Cremona, Crema were won. But the growing autocracy of the victorious doge aroused the jealousy of the ten. They charged him with having won his election by bribery and, unable to prove this, they accused his son Jacopo of treasonable communication with Milan in 1445. 
Under the agony of the wheel, Jacopo admitted or pretended his guilt. He was exiled to Romania, but was soon permitted to live near Treviso. In 1450, one of the inquisitors of the Ten was assassinated. Jacopo was credited with the crime. He denied it, even under extreme torture. He was exiled to Crete, where he went mad with loneliness and grief. In 1456, he was brought back to Venice, charged again with secret correspondence with the government of Milan. He admitted it, was tortured to the verge of death, and was returned to Crete, where he died soon afterward. The old doja, who had borne the perils and responsibilities of a long and unpopular war with stoic fortitude, broke down before these trials, which not all his dignity could prevent. At eighty-six he became incapable of carrying the burdens of his office. He was deposed by the great council with a life annuity of two thousand ducats. He retired to his home, and there, a few days later, he died of a burst blood vessel as the bells of the Campanile announced the accession of a new doja. Boscari's victories had earned Venice the hatred of all the Italian states. None could any longer feel secure in the nearness of her grasping power. A dozen combinations were formed against her. Finally, in 1508, Ferrara, Mantua, Julius II, Ferdinand of Spain, Louis XII of France, and the Emperor Maximilian joined in the League of Cambrai to destroy her. Leonardo Loredano, from 1501 to 1521, was doja in that crisis. He led the people through it with an incredible tenacity only partly revealed in the handsome portrait of him by Giovanni Bellini. Nearly all that Venice had won on the mainland by a century of forceful expansion was taken from her. Venice herself was surrounded. Loredano minted his plate. The aristocracy brought forth its hidden wealth to finance resistance. The armorers forged a hundred thousand weapons, and every man armed himself to fight for island after island in what seemed to be a hopeless cause. Miraculously, Venice saved herself and recovered part of her mainland realm. But the effort exhausted her finances and her spirit. And when Loredano died, though fifty-seven years of Titian and most of Tintoretto and Veronese were still to come, Venice knew that in wealth and power her zenith and glory had passed. 4. Venetian Life the last decades of the fifteenth century and the early decades of the sixteenth were the period of greatest splendor in Venetian life. The profits of a world trade that had made its peace with the Turks and had not yet suffered severe curtailment from the rounding of Africa or the opening of the Atlantic poured into the islands, crowned them with churches, walled the canals with palaces, filled the palaces with precious metals and costly furniture, glorified the women with finery and jewelry, supported a brilliant galaxy of painters and overflowed in bright festivals of tapestried gondolas, masked liaisons, and babbling waters echoing with song. The life of the lower classes was the normal routine of toil, eased by Italian leisureliness and loquacity, and the inability of the rich to monopolize any but the most perfumed delights of love. Every humpbacked bridge in the Grand Canal teemed with men tra transporting the products of half the world. There were more slaves here than in other European cities. They were imported chiefly from Islam, not as laborers, but as domestic servants, personal guards, wet nurses, concubines. Doja Pietro Mocenigo, at the age of seventy, kept two Turkish slaves for his sexual entertainment. One Venetian record tells of a priest who sold a female slave to another priest, who on the following day had the contract annulled because he had found her with child. The upper classes, though so well served, were not idlers. Most of them, in their mature years, were active in commerce, finance, diplomacy, government, or war. The portraits we have of them show men rich in conscious personality, proud of their place, but also serious with a sense of obligation. A minority of them dressed in silks and furs, perhaps to please the artists who painted them. And a set of young bloods, La Compagnia della Scalza, the Company of the Hose, flaunted tight doublets, silk brocades, and striped hose embroidered with gold or silver, or inset with gems. But every young patrician sobered his dress when he became a member of the great council. Then he was required to wear a toga, for by a robe almost any male may be endowed with dignity, and any woman with mystery. Occasionally, in their magnificent palaces, or in their villa gardens at Murano or other suburbs, the nobles betrayed their secret wealth to lavishly entertain a visitor, or to celebrate some vital event in the history of their city or their family. When Cardinal Grimani, high in both the nobility and the church, gave a reception for Ranuccio Farnese in 1542, 
he invited 3,000 guests. Most of them came in cabined gondolas, smoothed with velvet and eased with cushions. And he provided them with music, acrobats, rope walking, dancing, and dinner. Normally, however, the Venetian nobility in this period lived, ate, and dressed in moderate style, and earned some fraction of their keep. Perhaps the middle classes were the happiest of all, and joined most light-heartedly in private and public merriment. They provided the lower hierarchy of the church, the bureaucracy of the government, the professions of physician, attorney, and pedagogue, the management of industry and the guilds, the mathematical operations of foreign commerce, the control of local trade. They are neither so harassed as the rich to preserve a fortune, nor so worried as the poor to feed and clothe their young. Like the other classes, they played cards, threw dice, and deployed chessmen across the hours, but they rarely gambled into ruin. They loved to play musical instruments, to sing and dance. As their houses or apartments were small, they made promenades and patios of the streets. These were almost free of horses and vehicles, since transport preferred the canals. So it was not unusual for the less sedate classes, of an evening or on some festal day, to form impromptu dances and choruses in the public squares. Every family had musical instruments and included some bearable voice. And when Adrian Willart led the great double choir in St. Mark's, the thousands who could get in to hear reversed their famous boast and became for a moment Christians first and Venetians afterward. The festivals of Venice, in their unrivaled setting of churches, palaces, and sea, were the most gorgeous in Europe. Every excuse was used for pomp and pageantry, the inauguration of a doja, some religious holy day or national holiday, the visit of a foreign dignitary, the conclusion of a favorable peace, the garingello or women's holiday, the anniversary of St. Mark or the patron saint of a guild. In the fourteenth century the joust was still the crowning event of a festival. Indeed, as late as 1491, when Venice received with stately ceremony the abdicated Queen of Cyprus, some troops from Crete held a joust on the frozen Grand Canal. But the joust seemed inappropriate to a naval power, and it was gradually replaced with some form of water festival, usually a regatta. The greatest feast of all the year was the Sposalizio del Mare, the solemn and colorful rite of marrying Venice, la serenissima, the most serene, to the Adriatic. When Beatrice d'Este came to Venice in 1493 as the captivating emissary of Lodovico of Milan, the Grand Canal was adorned throughout its length like some splendid avenue in Christmas time. The ship Bucentaur, symbolizing the Venetian state and all decorated in purple and gold, sailed to meet her. A thousand boats rowed or sailed around it, each adorned with garlands and bunting. So many were the vessels, said an enthusiastic chronicler, that for a mile around the water could not be seen. In a letter written from Venice on this occasion, Beatrice described a momaria given in her honor in the palace of the doges. It was a dramatic spectacle, mostly in pantomime, presented by masked actors called momari, or mummers. The Venetians were fond of divers such performances. They retained till 1462 the medieval mysteries, but popular demand caused these religious plays to be prefaced or interrupted with comic interludes of so loose and disorderly a character that they were forbidden in that year. Meanwhile, the humanist movement renewed Italian acquaintance with classic comedy. Plautus and Terence were staged by the Compagnia della Scalza and other groups. And in 1506, Fra Giovanni Armonio, monk, actor, and musician, presented in Latin in the convent of the Eremitani, Stefanium, the first modern comedy. From these beginnings, Venetian comedy progressed toward Goldoni, always competing with the harlequin and pantaloon of the Commedia dell'arte, and at times so rivaling this in uninhibited humor that church and state engaged in a running war with the Venetian stage. An earthy licentiousness and profanity sat side by side in the Venetian or Italian character with orthodox belief and hebdomadal piety. The populace crowded St. Mark's on Sundays and holy days, and drank homeopathic doses of the religion of terror and hope pictured in the mosaics or sculptured in statue or relief. The deliberate darkness of the pillared cavern intensified the effect of the icons and sermons, and even the prostitutes, hiding for a time the yellow handkerchief which the law required them to display as the badge of their tribe, came here after a weary night to cleanse themselves with prayer. The Venetian senate favored this popular piety and surrounded the doja and the state with all the awe of religious ritual. 
It imported at great cost, after the fall of Constantinople, the relics of Eastern saints, and offered to pay 10,000 ducats for the seamless coat of Christ. And yet that same senate, which Petrarch likened to an assembly of the gods, repeatedly flouted the authority of the church, ignored the most terrible papal decrees of excommunication and interdict, offered asylum to prudent skeptics, till 1527, sharply reproved a friar for attacking the Jews in 1512, and sought to make the church in Venice an appanage of the state. Bishops for Venetian sees were chosen by the senate, and were presented to Rome for confirmation. Such appointments were in many cases put into effect despite papal refusal to confirm them. After 1488, none but a Venetian could be appointed to a Venetian episcopate, and no revenues could be collected or used by any ecclesiastic in the Venetian realm who had not been approved by the government. Churches and monasteries were subject to state supervision, but no churchman could hold a public office. All legacies to monastic establishments paid a tax to the state. Ecclesiastical courts were carefully watched to see to it that guilty ecclesiastics should receive the same penalties as guilty laymen. The Republic long resisted the introduction of the Inquisition. When it yielded, it made all verdicts of the Venetian inquisitors subject to review and sanction by a senatorial commission, and only six sentences of death were issued in all the history of the Inquisition in Venice. The Republic proudly took the stand that in temporal matters it recognized no superior except the divine majesty. It openly accepted the principle that a general council of the bishops of the church is above the pope, and that an appeal may be made from a pope to a future council. When Sixtus IV laid an interdict on the city in 1483, the Council of Ten ordered all clergy to continue their services as usual. When Julius II renewed the interdict as part of his war against Venice, the Ten forbade the publication of the edict in Venetian territory, and had their agents in Rome affixed to the doors of St. Peter's an appeal from the pope to a future council, in 1509. Julius won that war and forced Venice to accept his spiritual authority as absolute. All in all, Venetian life was more attractive in its setting than in its spirit. The government was competent and showed high courage in adversity, but it was sometimes brutal and always selfish. It never thought of Venice as part of Italy and seemed to care little what tragedy might befall that divided land. It developed powerful personalities, self-reliant, shrewd, acquisitive, valiant, proud. We know a hundred of them in their portraits by artists whom they had just enough refinement to patronize. It was a civilization that, compared with the Florentine, lacked subtlety and depth, that, compared with the Milanese under Lodovico, lacked finesse and grace. But it was the most colorful, sumptuous, and sensually bewitching civilization that history has ever known. 5. Venetian Art 1. Architecture and Sculpture Sensuous color is the essence of Venetian art, even of its architecture. Many Venetian churches and mansions, some business buildings, had mosaics or frescoes on their fronts. The facade of St. Mark's gleamed with gilt and almost haphazard ornament. Every decade brought to it new spoils and forms, until the face of the great fane became a bizarre medley of architecture, sculpture, and mosaic, in which decoration drowned structure and the parts forgot the whole. To admire that facade with something fonder than wonder, one must take his stand 576 feet away, at the farther end of the Piazza San Marco. In that perspective, the brilliant conglomeration of Romanesque portals, Gothic ogees, classical columns, Renaissance railing, and Byzantine domes blends into one exotic phantasm, an Aladdin's magic dream. The Piazza was not then as ample and majestic as now. In the 15th century it was still unpaved. Part of it was occupied by vines and trees, a stonecutter's yard, and a latrine. In 1495 it was paved with brick. In 1500, Alessandro Leopardi cast for the three flagstaffs such pedestals as no later ones would ever surpass. And in 1512, Bartolomeo Buon the Younger raised the majestic Campanile. It fell ill in 1902, but was rebuilt on the same design. Not so pleasing are the offices of the procurators of St. Mark, the Procuratie Vecchie and Nuove, built between 1517 and 1640, and hemming in the piazza on north and south with their immense and monotonous facades. Between St. Mark's and the Grand Canal stood the chief glory of civic Venice, the Palace of the Doges. It underwent in this period so many renovations that little remained of its earlier form. 
Pietro Baseggio, rebuilt from 1309 to 1340, the southern wing facing the canal. Giovanni Buon and his son Bartolomeo Buon the Elder raised a new wing from 1424 to 1438 on the western or Piazzetta front and set up the Gothic Forte della Carta from 1438 to 1443 at the northwestern corner. This is called Door of the Paper because on a bulletin board near it the Signory posted its decrees. These southern and western facades, with their graceful Gothic arcades and balconies, are among the happiest products of the Renaissance. To the 14th and 15th centuries belong most of the sculptures on the facades and the superb carvings of the column capitals. Ruskin thought one of these capitals, beneath the figures of Adam and Eve, the finest in Europe. Within the court, Bartolomeo Buon the Younger and Antonio Rizzo built an ornate arch, named after Francesco Foscari, and mingling three architectural styles in unexpected harmony, Renaissance columns and lintels, Romanesque arches, Gothic pinnacles. In the niches of the arch, Rizzo placed two strange statues, Adam protesting his innocence and Eve wondering at the penalties of knowledge. Rizzo planned and Pietro Lombardo completed the eastern facade of the court, a delightful marriage of round and pointed arches with Renaissance cornices and balconies. It was Rizzo again who designed the Scala de Gigante, or Giant's Stairs, from the court to the first floor, a simple stately structure named from the gigantic statues of Mars and Neptune set up by Jacopo Sansovino at the head of the steps to symbolize Venetian mastery of land and sea. In the interior were prison cells, administrative offices, reception rooms, assembly halls for the Great Council, the Senate, and the Ten. Many of these rooms were, or were soon to be, decorated with the proudest murals in the history of art. While the Republic glorified itself in this architectural gem, the richer nobles, Giustiniani, Contarini, Gritti, Barbari, Loredani, Foscari, Vendramini, Grimani, bounded the Grand Canal with their palaces. We must picture these not in their present deterioration, but in their 15th and 16th century heyday, with their facades of white marble porphyry or serpentine, their Gothic windows and Renaissance colonnades, their carved portals opening on the water, their hidden courtyards adorned with statuary, fountains, gardens, frescoes, urns, their interiors with tile or marble floors, mighty fireplaces, inlaid furniture, Murano glass, silken canopies, hangings of gold or silver cloth, bronze chandeliers gilded, enameled or chased, coffered ceilings, and murals by men whose names have gone around the world. So, for example, the Palazzo Foscari was decorated with paintings by John Bellini, Titian, Tintoretto, Paris Bordone, Veronese. Perhaps these rooms were more magnificent than comfortable, the chairs too straight-backed, the windows drafty, and no mode of heating that could warm both sides of a room or a man at the same time. Some Venetian palaces cost 200,000 ducats, a law of 1476, tried to limit expenditures to 150 ducats per room, but we hear of rooms whose fixtures and furnishings cost 2,000. Probably the most ornate of the palaces was the Cadoro, named the House of Gold because the owner, Marino Contarini, ordered that almost every inch of the marble facade should be covered with decoration, much of it in gilt. Its Gothic balconies and tracery still make it the prettiest front on the canal. These millionaires, while feathering their own nests, spared something for the citadels of their incidental faith. Strange to say, St. Mark's was not till 1807 the Cathedral of Venice. Formerly it was the private chapel of the Doja and the shrine of the city's patron saint. It belonged, so to speak, to the religion of the state. The Episcopal See was attached to the minor church of San Pietro di Castello, in the northeastern corner of the city. In the same remote section, the Dominican friars had their seat, in the church of San Giovanni e Paolo. There, Gentile and Giovanni Bellini found their final rest. More important to history is the church of the Franciscans, Santa Maria Gloriosa dei Frari, built from 1330 to 1443, known in fond abbreviations as I Frari, the Friars. Externally it made no show, but its interior gathered fame through the years as the tomb of celebrated Venetians, Francesco Foscari, Titian, Canova, and as a gallery of art. 
Here Antonio Rizzo designed a noble monument for the doge Niccolo Tron. Gian Bellini set up his Frari Madonna, and Titian his Madonna of the Pizarro family. Here, above all, Titian's Assumption of the Virgin rises in majesty behind the altar. Lesser masterpieces adorned lesser fames. San Zaccaria offered its congregation inspiring Madonnas by Giovanni Bellini and Palma Vecchio. Santa Maria dell'Orto had Tintoretto's presentation of the Virgin and his bones. San Sebastiano received Veronese's remains and some of his finest paintings. And for San Salvatore, Titian painted an Annunciation in his ninety-first year. In the construction and decoration of the churches and palaces of Venice, a remarkable family of architects and sculptors played a persistent part. The Lombardi came to Venice from northwestern Italy, and so earned their cognomen, but their real name was Solari. They included the Cristoforo Solari, who carved the effigies of Lodovico and Beatrice, and his brother Andrea, a painter. Both men worked in Venice as well as Milan. Pietro Lombardo left his mark upon a score of buildings in Venice. He and his sons Antonio and Tullio designed the churches of San Giobbe and Santa Maria dei Miracoli, hardly to our current taste. The tombs of Pietro Mocenigo and Niccolo Marcello in Santi Giovanni e Paolo, of Bishop Zanetti in Treviso Cathedral, and of Dante in Ravenna, and the Palazzo Vendramin Calergi, in which Wagner died. And in most of these enterprises they supplied the sculpture as well as the architectural plans. Pietro himself did much architectural and sculptural work in the Palace of the Doges. Tullio and Antonio, aided by Alessandro Leopardi, set up the tomb of Andrea Vendramin in Santi Giovanni e Paolo, the greatest work of sculpture in Venice, excepting only the Coleoni of Verrocchio and Leopardi in the square before that church. For the adjoining Scuola di San Marco, or Fraternity of St. Mark, Pietro Lombardo designed a rich portal and a strange façade. Finally, a Sante Lombardo shared in building the Scuola di San Rocco, famous for its fifty-six paintings by Tintoretto. Largely through the work of this family, the Renaissance style of columns, architraves, and decorated pediments prevailed over Gothic ogives and pinnacles and Byzantine domes. In Venice, however, Renaissance architecture, still unsteady with Oriental influence, was too ornate and obscured its lines with ornament. The atmosphere and classic traditions of Rome were needed to give the new style its definitive and harmonious form. 2. The Bellini Next to St. Mark's and the Ducal Palace, the glory of Venetian art was in painting. Many forces conspired to make the painters the favorites of Venetian patronage. The church, here as elsewhere, had to tell the Christian story to its people, of whom only a few could read. She needed pictures and statuary to continue the passing effect of speech. So each generation and many churches and monasteries had to have annunciations, nativities, adorations, visitations, presentations, massacres of the innocents, flights into Egypt, transfigurations, last suppers, crucifixions, entombments, resurrections, ascensions, assumptions, martyrdoms. When tangible paintings faded or grew stale to a congregation, they might be sold to collectors or museums. They were periodically cleaned and occasionally repainted or retouched. Their authors, if reincarnated, might not recognize them today. This, of course, did not apply to murals, which usually disintegrated on their walls. Sometimes, to avoid this fatality, the picture was painted upon canvas and was then fixed to the wall, as in the Hall of the Great Council. In Venice, the state rivaled the church in appetite for murals, for these could feed patriotism and pride by celebrating the grandeur and ceremonies of the government, the triumphs of trade or war. The Scuole, too, might order murals and painted banners to commemorate their patron saints or their annual pageantry. Rich men wanted scenes of outdoor beauty or indoor love pictured on the walls of their palaces. They sat for portraits to cheat for a while the ironic brevity of fame. The Signory ordered a portrait of every doja in turn. Even the procurators of St. Mark so preserved their features for a careless posterity. It was in Venice that the portrait and the easel picture achieved most popularity. Until the middle of the fifteenth century, painting developed slowly in Venice. Then, like some flower catching the morning sun, it burst into unparalleled radiance, as Venetians found in it a vehicle of the color and life that they had learned to love. Perhaps some of that Venetian flair for color had come to the lagoons from the east, 
with merchants who imported Oriental ideas and tastes as well as goods, who brought back with them memories of gleaming tiles and gilded domes, and displayed in Venetian markets, churches, or homes, Oriental silks, satins, velvets, brocades, and cloth of silver or gold. Indeed, Venice never quite made up its mind whether it was an Occidental or an Oriental state. On the Rialto, East and West did meet. Othello and Desdemona could become man and wife. And if Venice and her painters could not learn color from the East, they could get it from the Venetian sky, observing its infinite variety of light and mist, and the splendor of sunsets touching campaniles and palaces, or mirrored in the sea. Meanwhile, the victories of Venetian arms and fleets, and the heroic recovery from threatened ruin, roused the pride and imagination of patrons and painters, and commemorated themselves in art. Wealth discovered that it was meaningless unless it could transform itself into goodness, beauty, or truth. An external stimulus was added to generate a Venetian school of painting. In 1409, Gentile da Fabriano was brought to Venice to decorate the Hall of the Great Council, and Antonio Pisano, called Pisanello, came from Verona to collaborate. We cannot say how well they performed, but it is probable that they stirred the Venetian painters to replace with softer contours and richer colors the dark and rigid hieratic forms of the Byzantine tradition and the pale and lifeless forms of the Jotesque school. Perhaps some minor influence came down over the Alps with Giovanni della Magna, who died in 1450, but Giovanni seems to have grown up and learned his art in Murano and Venice. With his brother-in-law, Antonio Viverini, he painted for the church of San Zaccaria, an altarpiece whose figures begin to have the grace and tenderness that would make the work of the Bellini a revelation to Venice. The greatest influence of all came from Sicily, or Flanders. Antonello da Messina grew up as a businessman and presumably had no thought in his youth that his name would be carried down for centuries in the history of art. While in Naples, he saw, if we accept Vasari's perhaps romantic account, an oil painting that had been sent to King Alfonso by some Florentine merchants in Bruges. From Cimabue, circa 1240 to circa 1302, to Antonello, from 1430 to 1479, Italian painting on wood or canvas had relied on tempera, mixing the colors with a gelatinous substance. Such colors left a rough surface, were maladapted to blending for delicate shades and gradations, and tended to crack and slake off even before the artist's death. Antonello saw the advantages of mixing pigments with oil, readier blending, easier handling and cleaning, brighter finish, greater permanence. He went to Bruges and there studied the oil technique of the Flemish painters, then basking in the heyday of Burgundy. Having occasion to go to Venice, he became so enamored of the city being himself greatly addicted to women and pleasure, that he spent there the remainder of his life. He abandoned business and gave all his industry to painting. For the Church of San Cassiano, he painted in oil an altarpiece that became a model for a hundred similar pictures. The Madonna enthroned between four saints, with musician angels at her feet, and full Venetian colors on the brocades and satins of the drapery. Antonello shared his knowledge of the new method with other artists, and the great age of Venetian painting began. Many nobles sat to him for their portraits, and several of these pictures survive. The crude, strong poet at Pavia, the condottiere in the Louvre, the portrait of a man, plump and quizzical, in the Johnson Collection in Philadelphia, the portrait of a young man in New York, and the self-portrait in London. At the height of his success, Antonello fell sick, developed pleurisy, and died at the age of forty-nine. The artists of Venice gave him a sumptuous funeral and acknowledged their debt in a generous epitaph. In this ground is buried Antoninus the painter, the highest ornament of Messina and all Sicily, celebrated not only for his pictures, which were distinguished by singular skill and beauty, but because with high zeal and tireless technique, through mixing colors with oil, he first brought splendor and permanence to Italian painting. Among the pupils of Gentile da Fabriano at Venice was Jacopo Bellini, founder of a brief but major dynasty in Renaissance art. After his tutelage, Jacopo painted in Verona, Ferrara, and Padua. There, his daughter married Andrea Mantegna, and through him, as well as more directly, Jacopo came under Squarcione's influence. When he returned to Venice, he brought with him, if we may mingle metaphors, a rubbing of the Paduan technique and an echo of the Florentine. All this, and the Venetian heritage, and later Antonello's tricks with oil, 
passed down to Jacopo's sons, the rival geniuses Gentile and Giovanni Bellini. Gentile was twenty-three when the family moved to Padua in 1452. He felt intimately the influence of his brother-in-law Mantegna. When he painted the shutters for the organ in the Padua Cathedral, he followed too carefully the hard figures and bold foreshortenings of the Eremitani frescoes. But in Venice a new gentleness appeared in his portrait of San Lorenzo Giustiniani. In 1474 the signory assigned to him and his half-brother Giovanni the task of painting or repainting fourteen panels in the Hall of the Great Council. These canvases were among the earliest Venetian pictures painted in oil. They were destroyed by fire in 1577, but the sketches that remain show that Gentile used for the pictures his characteristic narrative style, in which some major incident is portrayed at the center and a dozen episodes play at the side. Vasari saw the paintings and marveled at their realism, variety, and complexity. When Sultan Mohammed II sent a request to the signory for a good portrait painter, Gentile was chosen. In Constantinople, in 1474, he enlivened the Sultan's chambers and spirits with erotic pictures, and made of him a portrait and a medallion, both showing a powerful character drawn by an expert hand. Mohammed died in 1481. His successor, more orthodox, obeyed the Moslem ban on the painting of human figures, and scattered into oblivion all but those two of the works done by Gentile in the Turkish capital. Luckily, Gentile had returned to Venice in 1480, heavy with gifts and decorations from the old sultan. He rejoined Giovanni in the ducal palace and completed his contract with the signory. It rewarded him with a pension of two hundred ducats a year. In his old age he painted his greatest pictures. The Guild of St. John the Evangelist had what it believed to be a miracle-working relic of the true cross. It solicited Gentile to describe in three paintings the healing of an invalid by the relic, a Corpus Christi procession carrying it, and the miraculous finding of the lost fragment. The first panel has yielded its splendor to time. The second, painted when Gentile was seventy, is a brilliant panorama of dignitaries, choristers, and candle-bearers parading around the Piazza San Marco, with St. Mark's in the background appearing very much as it is today. In the third picture, painted at seventy-four, the relic has fallen into the San Lorenzo Canal. The people crowding the bywalks and bridges are panic-stricken, and many kneel in prayer. But Andrea Vendramin plunges into the water, recovers the relic, and then, buoyed up by it, moves with uninfected dignity toward the shore. Every figure in these crowded canvases is drawn with realistic fidelity, and again the artist delights in surrounding the main event with engaging episodes a boat slipping away from its stock while the gondolier watches the recovery of the relic, a nude black moor poised to dive into the stream. Gentile's last great picture was painted at the age of seventy-six for his own confraternity of St. Mark, and showed the apostle preaching in Alexandria. As usual, it is a crowd. Gentile preferred to take humanity wholesale. He died at seventy-eight in fifteen o seven, leaving the picture to be finished by his brother John. Giovanni Bellini, or Gian Bellini, or Giambellino, was only two years younger than Gentile, but outlived him by nine. In this span of eighty-six years he ranged the whole gamut of his art, tried and mastered a rich variety of genres, and brought Venetian painting to its first peak. At Padua he absorbed Mantegna's technical teaching without imitating his hard and statuesque style. And in Venice he adopted with unprecedented success the new method of mixing pigments with oil. He was the first Venetian to reveal the glory of color, and at the same time he attained to a grace and accuracy of line, a delicacy of feeling, a depth of interpretation that, even in the lifetime of his brother, made him the greatest and most sought-for painter in Venice. Churches and guilds and private patrons seemed never to tire of his Madonnas. He bequeathed the Virgin in a hundred forms to a dozen lands. The Venetian Academy alone has a host of them. Madonna with the sleeping child, Madonna with two holy women, Madonna con Bambino, Madonna degli Alberetti, Madonna with St. Paul and St. George, Madonna enthroned, and, best of this group, the Madonna of St. Job. This, we are told, is the first picture that Giovanni painted in oils, and it is one of the most brilliantly colored works in Venice, which is to say, in the world. The little Museo Correr at the western end of the Piazza San Marco has another Giambellino Madonna, tender and sad and lovely. San Zaccaria has a variation on the Madonna of St. Job. The Church of the Frari has a Madonna enthroned, 
a little stiff and severe and hemmed in by gloomy saints, but appealing in her rich blue robes. The zealous wanderer will find many more of John's virgins in Verona, Bergamo, Milan, Rome, Paris, London, New York, Washington. What more in color could be said of Our Lady after this polygraphic devotion? Perugino and Raphael would rival this multiplicity, and Titian in that same church of the Frari would find something more to say. Giovanni did not do so well with the sun. Christ's blessing in the Louvre is middling, but the sacred conversation near it is movingly beautiful. The famous Pietà in the Brera at Milan has been warmly praised, but it shows a duet of charmless faces holding up a dead Christ who seems to need nothing more for perfect physical condition than to be freed from too much attention. This harsh and crude burial picture, undated, belongs to Bellini's Montagnesque youth. How much more pleasing is the Santa Giustina in a private collection in Milan? Again somewhat stylized and posed, but with a delicacy of features, a modest drooping of the eyelids, a splendor of costume that makes this one of John's most successful efforts. It was apparently a portrait, and John was now so skilled in rendering a living face and soul that a hundred patrons begged to share his immortality. Look again at Doge Loredano. With what depth of understanding and keenness of eye and dexterity of hand Bellini has caught the unfaltering, serene power of the man who could lead his people to victory in a war for survival against the united assault of nearly all the great states of Italy and transalpine Europe. And then, rivaling the Leonardo who was creeping up on him in skill and fame, Giovanni tried his palate at bizarre landscapes, like that medley of rocks, mountains, castles, sheep, water, riven tree, and clouded sky, which St. Francis in the Frick Collection calmly confronts as he receives the stigmata. In his old age the master tired of repeating the usual sacred themes and experimented with allegory and classic mythology. He turned knowledge, happiness, truth, slander, purgatory, the church herself, into persons or stories and sought to bring them to life with alluring landscapes. Two of his pagan pictures hang in the Washington National Gallery, Orpheus Charming the Beasts and the Feast of the Gods, a picnic of bare-breasted women and half-naked, half-drunken men. The picture is dated 1514. It was painted for Duke Alfonso of Ferrara when the artist was 84 years old. We are reminded again of Alfieri's boast, that the man-plant grows more vigorously in Italy than elsewhere on the earth. Giovanni lived only a year after signing that testament of youth. His was a full and reasonably happy life, an astonishing procession of masterpieces, a kaleidoscope of warm colors on soft robes, an immense advance in grace, composition, and vitality upon the Joteschi and the Byzantophiles, a power of perception and individualization unseen in the arid figures and indiscriminate masses of Gentile's pictures, a fruitful mediation in time and style between a Montaigne who knew only Romans and a Titian who felt and pictured every phase of life from Flora to Charles V. One of John's pupils was Giorgione, who developed his master's idols of wood and stream. Titian worked with Giorgione and received the great tradition. Generation by generation, Venetian art was accumulating its knowledge, varying its experiments, and preparing its culmination. 3. From the Bellini to Giorgione The success of the Bellini made painting popular in Venice, where mosaics had held so long a sway. Studios multiplied, patrons opened their purses, and artists developed who, though they were not Bellini or Giorgione's, would have been the brightest stars in lesser galaxies. Vincenzo Catena painted so well that many of his pictures were credited to John Bellini or to Giorgione. Antonio Viverini's younger brother, Bartolomeo, met a conservative demand by applying to medieval themes the technique of squarcione and the fuller colors that painting had learned to mix and convey. Bartolomeo's nephew and pupil, Alvise Viverini, threatened for a time to rival John Bellini with pretty Madonnas and achieved a monumental altarpiece, Madonna with Six Saints, which passed from Italy to the Kaiser Friedrich Museum in Berlin. Alvise was a good teacher, for three of his pupils found moderate fame. Bartolomeo Montagna, we leave to Vicenza, Giovanni Battista Cima da Corneliano, worked for the Madonna market. One at Parma has a handsome figure of the archangel Michael, while another in Cleveland redeems itself with brilliant color. Marco Bazaiti painted a fine calling of the sons of Zebedee, 
in Venice, and a delightful portrait, a youth in the London National Gallery. Carlo Crivelli may also have been a pupil of the Viverini, however, he had to abscond from Venice soon after his seventeenth year. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. Civilization, Volume 5, The Renaissance, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 10, Side 2. Carlo Crivelli may also have been a pupil of the Viverini. However, he had to abscond from Venice soon after his seventeenth year, this in 1457. Having abducted the wife of a sailor, he was fined and jailed. Released, he sought safety in Padua, where he studied in Squarcione's school. In 1468, he moved to Ascoli and spent his remaining twenty-five years painting pictures for the churches there and thereabouts. Perhaps because he left Venice so soon, Crivelli hardly shared in the progressive movement of Venetian painting. He preferred tempera to oil, kept to the traditional religious subjects, and adopted an almost Byzantine scheme of subordinating representation to decoration. He gave his pictures an enamel finish, which went well with the gilded frames of the polyptics he filled. And though his Madonnas seem cold, there is a delicate grace in their drawing that presages Giorgione. Vettor, or Vittore Carpaccio, was a major among these miners. Starting with studies in perspective and design in the matter of Montaigne, he adopted the narrative style of Gentile Bellini, added to it a youthful preference for imaginary idols rather than contemporary events, and applied to his romantic themes a fully developed technique. Quite alien to his usually blithe spirit is an early picture, in New York, Meditation on the Passion, a macabre study of Saints Jerome and Onofrius, imagining Christ seated before them dead, with skull and crossbones at their feet, and a background of lowering clouds. When he was thirty-three in 1488, Carpaccio received an important commission, to paint for the school of Saint Ursula a series of pictures illustrating her history. In nine picturesque panels he told how the handsome Prince Conan of England had come to Brittany to wed Ursula, daughter of its king how she begged him to postpone the wedding until, with a train of eleven thousand virgins, she could make a pilgrimage to Rome, how Conan accompanied her lovingly, and all received the papal blessing, how then an angel appeared to Ursula and announced that she and her virgins must go to Cologne and be martyred, how she leaves the sorrowing Conan and, with her train, goes in calm dignity to Cologne, how its pagan kinglet proposes marriage to her, and when she refuses, slays all eleven thousand and one. The legend suited Carpaccio's fancy. He delighted in picturing the crowds of maidens and courtiers, and made nearly every one of them aristocratic and fair and colorfully dressed. And to the various scenes he brought not only his pictorial science, but his knowledge of actual things, the forms of architecture, the shipping in a bay, the patient procession of the clouds. In an interval of his nine years' labor with Ursula, Carpaccio painted for the school of St. John the Evangelist the healing of the demoniac by a relic of the Holy Cross. Daring comparison with Gentile Bellini, Vittore described a scene on a Venetian canal crowded with people, gondolas, and palaces. Here was all of Gentile's realism and detail, done with a brilliant finish beyond the older man's reach. Stirred by Carpaccio's success, the school of St. George of the Slavonians asked him to commemorate their patron saint on the walls of their Venetian oratory. Again he took nine years and painted nine scenes. They do not quite equal the Ursula series, but Carpaccio, now in his fifties, had not lost his flair for representing graceful figures in harmonious combinations, and architectural backgrounds fanciful in conception but convincing in presentation. St. George attacks the dragon in an impetuous charge. In contrast, St. Jerome is shown as the quiet scholar immersed in study in a surprisingly handsome room, with no other company than his lion. Every feature in the room is pictured with minute fidelity, even to the musical score so legible on a fallen scroll that Molmenti transcribed it for the piano. In 1508, Carpaccio and two obscure artists were appointed to set a value on a strange mural painted by a rising young artist on an outer wall of the Fondaco dei Tedeschi, the warehouse of the Teuton merchants near the Rialto Bridge. He judged it worth a fee of 150 ducats, or about 
Though Carpaccio still had 18 years of life in him, he painted only one more great picture, a presentation in the temple of 1510 for the chapel of the Sanudo family in the church of San Giobbe. There it had to compete with John Bellini's Madonna of St. Job. And though the Virgin and her attendant ladies are lovely, Giovanni, not Vittore, is the victor in this silent contest. Carpaccio, in a later century, might have been the master of the age. It was his misfortune that he came between Giovanni Bellini and Giorgione. 4. Giorgione It might seem strange that artists should be hired at high fees to paint a warehouse wall. But in 1507 the Venetians felt that life without color was dead, and the German traders there, some from the great Dürer's Nuremberg, had their own lusty sense of art. So they sublimated part of their profits into two murals, and had the luck to choose immortals for the task. The paintings soon succumbed to salt moisture in the sun, and only vague blotches remain, but even these attest the early fame of Giorgione da Castelfranco. He was then twenty-nine years old. We do not know his name. An old story made him the love child of an aristocratic Barbarelli and a woman of the people, but this may be an afterthought. In his thirteenth or fourteenth year, circa 1490, he was sent from Castelfranco to Venice to serve as apprentice to John Bellini. He developed rapidly, won substantial commissions, bought a house, painted a fresco on its front, and filled his home with music and revelry, for he played the lute well and preferred gay women in the flesh to the loveliest of them on canvas. What influences formed his wistful style, it is hard to say, for he was unlike the other painters of his day, except that he may have learned from Carpaccio some grace and charm. Probably the decisive influence came from letters rather than from art. When Giorgione was twenty-seven or twenty-eight, Italian literature was taking a bucolic turn. Sanazzaro published his Arcadia in 1504. Perhaps Giorgione read these poems and found in their pleasant fancies some suggestions of idealized landscapes and amours. From Leonardo, passing through Venice in 1500, Giorgione may have acquired a taste for a mystic, dreamy softness of expression, a delicacy of nuance, a refinement of manner that made him, for a tragically brief moment, the summit of Venetian art. Among the earliest works attributed to him, for in hardly any case can we be sure of his authorship, are two wood panels describing the exposure and rescue of the infant Paris, the story is an excuse for painting shepherds and rural landscapes breathing peace. In the first picture that is by common consent his, The Gypsy and the Soldier, we get a typically Georgianesque fancy. A casual woman, naked except for a shawl round her shoulders, sits on her discarded dress on the mossy bank of a rushing stream, nurses a child, and looks anxiously about her. Behind her stretches a landscape of Roman arches, a river and a bridge, towers and a temple, Curious trees, white lightning, and green storm-laden clouds. Near her is a comely youth holding a shepherd's staff, but richly garbed for a shepherd, and so pleased with the scene that he ignores the gathering storm. The story is uncertain. What the picture means is that Giorgione liked handsome youths, soft-contoured women, and nature even in its moods of wrath. In 1504 he painted for a bereaved family in the town of his birth, the Madonna of Castelfranco. It is absurd and beautiful. In the forefront, St. Liberale, in the shining armor of a medieval knight, holds a lance for the Virgin, and St. Francis preaches to the air. High aloft on a double pedestal, Mary sits with her babe, who leans recklessly out from his high perch. But the green and violet brocade at Mary's feet is a wonder of color and design. Mary's robes fall about her in wrinkles as lovely as wrinkles can ever be. Her face has the gentle tenderness that poets picture in the mates of their dreams, and the landscape recedes with Leonardesque mystery till the sky melts into the sea. When Giorgione and his friend Tiziano Vecelli received the assignment to paint the Fondaco dei Tedeschi, Giorgione chose the wall fronting the Grand Canal, and Titian took the Rialto side. Vasari, examining Giorgione's fresco half a century later, found it impossible to make head or tail of what another spectator described as trophies, nude bodies, heads in chiaroscuro, geometricians measuring the terrestrial globe, perspectives of columns, and between them men on horseback and other fantasies. However, the same writer adds, it may be seen how accomplished Giorgione was in handling colors in fresco. But his genius lay in conception rather than coloring. When he painted the sleeping Venus that was a priceless treasure of the Dresden Gallery, 
He might have thought of her in purely sensual terms as an inviting formation of molecules. Doubtless she is that too and marks the passage of Venetian art from Christian to pagan themes and sentiment. But there is nothing immodest or suggestive about this Venus. She lies asleep, precariously nude in the open air, on a red cushion and a white silken robe, her right arm under her head, her left hand serving as a fig leaf, one perfect limb outstretched over another raised beneath it. Seldom has art so simulated the velvet texture of feminine surfaces or so conveyed the grace of a natural pose. But on her face is a look of such innocence and peace as rarely accord with naked beauty. Giorgione here has put himself beyond good and evil and lets the aesthetic sense transiently dominate desire. In another piece, the Fête Champêtre, or Pastoral Symphony of the Louvre, the pleasure is frankly sexual and yet again has all the innocence of nature. Two nude women and two clothed men are enjoying a holiday in the countryside, a patrician youth in a doublet of gleaming red silk strumming a lute, beside him a disheveled shepherd painfully trying to bridge the gap between a simple and a cultivated mind, the aristocrat's lady in a graceful motion emptying a crystal pitcher into a well, the shepherd's lass waiting patiently for him to attend to her charms or her flute. No notion of sin has entered their heads. The lute and the flute have sublimated sex into harmony. Behind the figures rises one of the richest landscapes in Italian art. Finally, in the concert of the Pitti Palace, desire seems forgotten as irrelevantly primitive, and music is all, or becomes a bond of friendship subtler than desire. Until the nineteenth century, this most Georgianesque of all pictures was regularly accredited to Giorgione. Many critics now ascribe it to Titian. Since the matter is still doubtful, let us leave the authorship to Giorgione, because he loved music only next to women, and because Titian is rich enough in masterpieces to spare one to his friend. At the left a plumed youth stands, a bit lifeless and negative. A monk sits at a clavichord, his beautifully rendered hands on the keys, his face turned round to a bald cleric on our right. The cleric lays one hand on the monk's shoulder and holds in the other a cello resting on the floor. Has the music ended, or not yet begun? It does not matter. What moves us is the silent depth of feeling in the countenance of the monk, whose every fiber has been refined, and his every sentiment ennobled by music. He hears it long after all the instruments have been mute. That face, not idealized but profoundly realized, is one of the miracles of Renaissance painting. Giorgione lived a short life and apparently a merry one. He seems to have had many women and to have healed each broken romance with a new one soon begun. Vasari reports that Giorgione caught the plague from his latest love. All that we know is that he died in the epidemic of 1511 at the age of 34. His influence was already extensive. A dozen Georgianesque minor artists painted rural idols, conversation pieces, musical interludes, mask costumes, in vain efforts to capture the refinement and finish of his style, the airy overtones of his landscapes, the guileless eroticism of his themes. He left two pupils who were to make a stir in the world, Sebastiano del Piombo, who went off to Rome, and Tiziano Vicelli, the greatest Venetian of all. 5. Titian, The Formative Years, 1477 to 1533. He was born in the town of Pieve, in the Cadoric range of the Dolomites, whose rugged mountains were well remembered in his landscapes. When he was nine or ten, he was brought to Venice and was apprenticed successively to Sebastiano Zucato, Gentile Bellini, and Giovanni Bellini. In Giovanni's studio, he worked side by side with Giorgione, who was his senior by only a year. When that Keats of the Brush set up his own studio, Titian probably went with him as assistant or associate. He was so deeply influenced by Giorgione that some of his early pictures have been ascribed to Giorgione, and some of Giorgione's later pictures to Titian. The inimitable concert probably belongs to this period. Together they painted the Fondaco walls. From the plague that took Giorgione's life, or from the moratorium laid upon Venetian art by the War of the League of Cambrai, Titian fled to Padua in 1511. There he painted three frescoes for the Scuola del Santo, recording miracles of St. Anthony. If we may judge from their crudity, Titian at 35 had far to go before equaling the best work of Giorgione. Goethe, however, with penetrating hindsight, saw in them the promise of great things. Returning to Venice, 
petition addressed to the Doja and the Council of Ten, on May 31, 1513, a letter that recalls Leonardo's appeal to Lodovico a generation before. Illustrious Prince, High and Mighty Lords, I, Titian of Cadore, have from childhood upwards studied the art of painting, desirous of a little fame rather than of profit. And although in the past, and also in the present, I have been urgently invited by His Holiness the Pope and other lords to enter their service, I, as the faithful subject of Your Excellencies, have rather cherished the wish to leave behind me a memorial in this famous city. Therefore, if it seem good to Your Excellencies, I am anxious to paint in the Hall of the Great Council, employing therein all my powers. And to begin with, a canvas of the battle on the side of the Piazzetta, which is so difficult that no one has yet had the courage to attempt it. I should be willing to accept for my labor any reward that may be thought proper, or even less. Therefore, being as aforesaid studious only of honor and to please Your Excellencies, I beg to ask for the first broker's patent, for life, that shall fall vacant in the Fondaco de Tedeschi, irrespective of all promised reversions of such patent, and on the same conditions and with the same charges and exemptions as Messrs. Juan Bellin, or John Bellini, besides two assistants to be paid by the Salt Office, as well as all colors and necessaries, in return for which I promise to do the work above named with such speed and excellence as will satisfy the Signori. A broker's patent, or a censoria, was formerly an appointment as trade intermediary between Venetian and foreign merchants. Actually, in the case of the broker's patent with the German merchants in Venice, it made the holder the official painter of the state and paid him 300 crowns, or $3,750, a year for painting a portrait of the doja and such other pictures as the government might require. Apparently, Titian's proposal was tentatively accepted by the council. In any case, he began to paint the Battle of Cadore in the Ducal Palace. But his rivals persuaded the council to withhold the patent from him and to suspend the pay of his assistants, this in 1514. After negotiations that irritated all concerned, he received the post and pay of the patent without the title, this in 1516. He, in his turn, procrastinated and did not complete till 1537 the two canvases that he had begun in the Sala del Maggior Concilio. They were destroyed by fire in 1577. Titian developed leisurely, like any organism dowered with a century of life, but as early as 1508, he showed the spiritual penetration and technical power that were to put him above all his rivals in portraiture. A nameless portrait, once named Ariosto, has in it a memory of Giorgione's style, a poetic face and subtle eyes a little malicious, and sumptuous raiment that set a model for a thousand later works. And in this period, from 1506 to 1516, the maturing artist already knew how to paint women of ample loveliness, stemming from Giorgione and expanding toward Rubens. The movement from the Virgin to Venus continued in Titian, even while he painted religious pictures of great splendor and renown. The same hand that stirred piety with a gypsy Madonna and an adoration of the shepherds could turn to a woman at her toilet, and that incarnation of voluptuous innocence, the flora of the Uffizi Gallery. This gentle face and generous bosom probably served again in the daughter of Herodias. Salome is as thoroughly Venetian as the severed head is powerfully Hebraic. In or near the year 1515, Titian produced two of his most celebrated pictures. The Three Ages of Man shows a group of naked infants sleeping beneath a tree, a Cupid so soon inoculating them with the mad pursuit, a bearded octogenarian contemplating a skull, and a young couple happy in the spring of love, yet looking at each other wistfully as if foreseeing the erosive pertinacity of time. Sacred and Profane Love has a modern title that would surprise a resurrected Titian. When first mentioned, in 1615, the picture was called Beauty Adorned and Unadorned. Probably it aimed not to point a moral, but to adorn a tale. The profane nude is the most perfect figure in Titian's repertoire, the very Venus de Milo of the Renaissance. But the sacred lady is secular too. Her jeweled girdle draws the eye, her silken gown tempts the touch. Probably she is the same buxom courtesan who posed for Flora and the woman at her toilet. If the spectator looks long enough, he will see a complex landscape behind the figures, plants and flowers and a thick clump of trees, a shepherd tending his flock, two lovers, hunters and dogs chasing a hare, a town and its towers, a church and its campanile, a green Georgianesque sea, a clouded sky. 
What difference does it make that we cannot know just what the picture means? It is beauty made to stay a while, and is that not what Faust thought worth a soul? Having learned that female beauty, adorned or natural, would always find customers, Titian pursued the theme joyously. Early in 1516, he accepted the invitation of Alfonso I to paint some panels in the Castello at Ferrara. The artist was lodged there with two assistants for some five weeks, and presumably came frequently thereafter from Venice. For the Alabaster Hall, Titian painted three pictures that continued Giorgione's pagan mood. In the Bacchanal, men and women, some of them naked, drink, dance, and make love before a landscape of brown trees, blue lake, and silver clouds. A scroll on the ground bears a French motto, He who drinks and does not drink again does not know what drinking is. In the distance, an old Noah sprawls naked and drunk. Closer a lad and lass join in dance, their garments whirling in the breeze. In the foreground, a woman whose firm breasts display her youth lies nude and sleeping on the grass. And near her, an anxious child raises his dress to ease his bladder and bring the Bacchic cycle to completion. In Bacchus and Ariadne, the abandoned woman is startled by a Bacchic procession bursting through the woods, drunken satyrs, a naked male entwined with snakes, the nude god of wine leaping from his chariot to capture the fleeing princess. In these pictures, and the worship of Venus, the pagan renaissance is in full command. Meanwhile, Titian painted an arresting portrait of his new patron, the Duke Alfonso. A handsome, intelligent face, a corpulent body dignified with robes of state, a beautiful hand, hardly that of a potter and gunner, resting on a beloved cannon. This is the picture that stirred even Michelangelo to praise. Ariosto sat for a portrait and returned the compliment with a line in a later edition of the Furioso. Lucrezia Borgia, too, sat for the great portraitist, but no trace of that painting remains. And... Laura Dianti, Alfonso's mistress, may have posed for a picture that survives only in a copy in Modena. It was probably for Alfonso that Titian made one of his finest pictures, the tribute money. A Pharisee with the head of a philosopher, asking his question sincerely, and a Christ answering without resentment, brilliantly. It is characteristic of the times that Titian could pass from Bacchus to Christ, from Venus to Mary and back again, with no apparent loss to his peace of mind. In 1518 he painted for the Church of the Frari his greatest work, The Assumption of the Virgin. When it was placed behind the high altar, in a majestic marble frame, the Venetian diarist Sanudo thought the event worth noting. May 20th, 1518. Yesterday the panel painted by Titian for the Minorites was put up. To this day the site of the Frari Assumption is an event in any sensitive life. Near the center of the immense panel is the figure of the Virgin, full and strong, clothed in a robe of red and a mantle of blue, wrapped in wonder and expectation, lifted up through the clouds by an inverted halo of winged cherubim. Above her is an inevitably futile attempt to portray the deity, all raiment and beard, and hair disheveled by the winds of heaven. Finer is the angel that brings him a crown for Mary. Below are the apostles, a variety of magnificent figures, some gazing in astonishment, some kneeling in adoration, some reaching up as if to be taken with her into paradise. Standing before this powerful evocation, the unwilling skeptic mourns his doubts and acknowledges the beauty and aspiration of the myth. In 1519, Jacopo Pizarro, bishop of Paphos in Cyprus, in gratitude for the victory of his Venetian fleet over a Turkish squadron, commissioned Titian to paint another altarpiece for the Frari, for the chapel that had been dedicated there by his family. Titian knew the risk he was running in challenging comparison between his Madonna of the Pizarro family and his masterpiece so lately acclaimed. He worked for seven years on the new picture before he released it from his studio. He chose to represent the Virgin enthroned. But, defying precedent, he placed her at the right in a diagonal scheme that put the donor at the left, with St. Peter between them and St. Francis at her feet. The composition would have been thrown off balance but for the bright illumination focusing the mother and her child. Many an artist, tired of the traditional centralized or pyramidal structure of such pictures, welcomed and imitated the experiment. About 1523, Marquis Federigo Gonzaga invited Titian to Mantua. The artist did not stay long, for he had commitments in Venice and Ferrara, but he began a series of eleven paintings representing Roman emperors, These have been lost. On one of his visits he painted an attractive portrait of the young bearded Marquis. 
Federigo's mother, the splendid Isabella, was still living and sat for a picture. Finding the result uncomfortably realistic, she put it among her antiquities and asked Titian to copy a portrait that Francia had made of her forty years before. It was from this that Titian produced, circa 1534, the famous picture with the turban hat, the ornate sleeves, the stole of fur, the pretty face. Isabella protested that she had never been so beautiful, but she arranged to have this reminiscent portrait descend to posterity. Here for a while we leave Tiziano Vecelli. To understand his later career, we must fill in the background of political events in which his greatest patron, after 1533, Charles V, was intimately concerned. Titian was fifty-six in 1533. Who would have supposed that he still had forty-three years to live, and that he would paint as many masterpieces in his second half-century as in his first? 6. Minor Artists and Arts we must retrace our steps now and briefly honor two painters who were born after Titian but died long before his death. We bow in passing to Girolamo Savoldo, who came to Venice from Brescia and Florence and painted pictures of high excellence, the Madonna and Saints, now in the Brera Gallery, an ecstatic St. Matthew in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and a Magdalene in Berlin, far more tempting than the stout lady of that name in Titian. Giacomo Nigretti was named Palma from some hills near his birthplace, Serena, in the Bergamesque Alps. He became Palma Vecchio when his grandnephew Palma Giovanni also acquired fame. For a time he was considered the equal of Titian by their contemporaries. Perhaps some jealousy arose between them which was not eased by Titian's stealing of Giacomo's mistress. Giacomo had painted her as Violante. Titian had her posed for his flora. Like Titian, Palma handled sacred and profane themes with equal skill, if not with equal zest. He specialized in sacred conversations or holy families, but probably owed his fame to his portraits of Venetian blondes, full-bosomed women who dyed their hair to an auburn hue. Nevertheless, his finest pictures are religious. A Santa Barbara in the church of Santa Maria Formosa, the patron saint of the Venetian bombardiers, and the Jacob and Rachel of the Dresden Gallery, a handsome shepherd sharing a kiss with a buxom lass. Palma's portraits would have ranked with the best of his time and city had not Titian produced half a hundred deeper ones. His pupil, Bonifacio de Pitati, called Veronese from his birthplace, adopted the style of Giorgione's Fête Champetre and Titian's Diana to adorn Venetian walls and furniture with attractive landscapes and nudes and his Diana and Acteon is worthy of these masters. Lorenzo Lotto, less popular than Bonifacio in their day, has gained repute with the years. A shy, pious, melancholy spirit, he was not quite at home in Venice, where paganism resumed its sway as soon as the church bells and choirs ceased to sing. At the age of twenty in 1500, he produced one of the most original paintings of the Renaissance, the St. Jerome in the Louvre. No hackneyed image of the emaciated Eremite, but an almost Chinese study of somber chasms and mountainous rocks, amid which the old scholar is a minor element, at first hardly seen. This is the first European painting that reproduces nature in its wild dominance, rather than as an imaginary background. Passing to Treviso, Lorenzo painted for the Church of Santa Cristina a monumental altar back of the Madonna enthroned, which made his fame throughout northern Italy. Another success with a Madonna for the Church of San Domenico at Recanati earned him a call to Rome. There, Julius II commissioned him to paint some rooms in the Vatican. But when Raphael came, the frescoes that Lotto had begun were destroyed. Perhaps this humiliation helped to darken Lorenzo's mood. Bergamo better appreciated his peculiar talent for moderating the warm colors of Venetian art into softer tones more congruous with piety. Twelve years he labored there, modestly paid, but content to be first in Bergamo rather than fourth in Venice. For the church of San Bartolomeo, he painted an overcrowded but rather beautiful altarpiece, the Madonna in Majesty. Lovelier is an adoration of the shepherds at Brescia. The color, while full and pervasive, has a subdued tone more restful to eye and spirit than the brilliant effects of the great Venetian. A sensitive soul like Lotto's could at times penetrate more deeply into a personality than Titian. 
Few artists have caught the glow of healthy youth so intimately as in Lotto's portrait of a boy in the Castello at Milan. His self-portrait shows Lorenzo himself apparently well and strong, but he must have known much sickness and pain to represent illness so sympathetically as in The Sick Man of the Borghese Gallery, or in another of the same title in the Galleria Doria at Rome. An emaciated hand pressed over the heart, a look of pain and bewilderment on the face, as if asking why should he, so good or so great, be chosen by the germ. A more famous portrait, Laura di Pola, shows a woman of quiet beauty, also puzzled by life, and finding no answer except in religious faith. Lotto, too, came to that consolation. Restless, solitary, unmarried, he wandered from place to place, perhaps from philosophy to philosophy, until in his final years, from 1552 to 1556, he settled down as a resident in the convent of the Santa Casa at Loreto, near the holy house that pilgrims believed to have once sheltered the Mother of God. In 1554 he gave all his property to the convent and took an oblate's vows. Titian called him as good as goodness and as virtuous as virtue. Lotto had outlived the pagan renaissance and had sunk to rest, so to speak, in the arms of the Council of Trent. In that vibrant century, from 1450 to 1550, during which Venetian commerce suffered so many defeats and Venetian painting scored so many victories, the minor arts shared in the cultural exuberance. It was not for them a renaissance, for they were old and mature in Italy by Petrarch's time and merely continued their medieval excellence. Perhaps the mosaicists had lost some of their skill or patience. Even so, their work on St. Mark's was at least abreast of their age. The potters were now learning to make fine porcelain. Marco Polo had brought some from China. A sultan had sent fine specimens of it to the doja in 1461. By 1470, the Venetians were making their own. The glassblowers at Murano reached in this period the acne of their art, making cristallo of exquisite purity and design. The names of the leading glassblowers were known throughout Europe, and every royal house competed for their wares. Most of them used a mold or model. Some put the mold aside, blew a bubble into the molten glass as it poured from the furnace, and shaped the substance into cups, vases, chalices, ornaments of a hundred colors and a thousand forms. Sometimes, learning from the Moslems, they painted the surface with colored enamel or gold. The glass artisans kept jealously in their families the secret processes by which they achieved their miracles of fragile beauty and the Venetian government passed stern laws to prevent these esoteric subtleties from becoming known in other lands. In 1454, the Council of Ten decreed that if a workman carry into another country any art or craft to the detriment of the Republic, he will be ordered to return. If he disobeys, his nearest relatives will be imprisoned in order that the solidarity of the family may persuade him to return. If he persists in his disobedience, secret measures will be taken to have him killed, wherever he may be. The only known case of such an assassination was at Vienna in the 18th century. Despite the law, Venetian artists and artisans found their way over the Alps in the 16th century and brought their technique to France and Germany as gifts to the conquerors of Italy. Half the artisans of Venice were artists. Pewterers embellished dishes, platters, beakers and cups with graceful borders and floral designs. The armorers were famous for damascened cuirasses, helmets, shields, swords and daggers, and sheaths chased or engraved with elegant patterns. And other masters might make for short weapons ivory handles studded with gems. In Venice, about 1410, Baldassare degli Ambriachi, a Florentine, carved in bone the great altarpiece in 39 sections now in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. The woodcarvers not only made fine sculptural figures and reliefs like the circumcision in the Louvre, or the chest painted by Bartolomeo Montagna and formerly in the bombed Poldi Pezzoli Museum in Milan. They decorated the ceilings and doors and furniture of Venetian aristocrats with carvings, bosses, and intarsia, and chiseled the choir stalls of such churches as the Frari and San Zaccaria. Venetian jewelers met a heavy foreign as well as domestic demand, but took time to rise from quantity to quality. The goldsmiths, now under German instead of Oriental influence, turned out tons of plate, personal adornment, and decorative fixtures for everything from cathedrals to shoes. 
the illumination and calligraphy of manuscripts continued, slowly yielding to print. French and Flemish influences entered into the designs of Venetian textiles, but Venetian dyes and skills gave the products their favored texture and hues. It was from Venice that the Queen of France ordered 300 pieces of dyed satin in 1532. And it was in the soft and luxurious stuffs worked in Venetian shops and in the colors given them in Venetian bats that the great painters of Venice found models for the lordly and glowing robes that made half the brilliance of their art. Venice almost realized Ruskin's ideal of an economy in which every industry would be an art and every product would proudly express the personality and artistry of the artisan. Venetian Letters 1. Aldous Minutius Venice was in this period too busy living to care much for books, and still its scholars, libraries, poets, and printers shared in giving it a fair name. It took no prominent part in the humanist movement. Nevertheless, humanism had here one of its noblest exemplars, Ermolao Barbaro, who was crowned poet by an emperor at fourteen, taught Greek, translated Aristotle, served his fellow men as a physician, his country as a diplomat, and his church as a cardinal, and was killed by the plague at thirty-nine. Venetian women made as yet little pretense to education. They were content to be physically alluring or maternally fertile or finally venerable. But in 1530, Irene of Spilimbergo opened a salon for men of letters, studied painting under Titian, sang sweetly, played well on viol, harpsichord, and lute, and talked learnedly about ancient and modern literature. Venice gave protection to intellectual refugees from the Turks in the east and from the Christians in the west. Here, Aretino would laugh securely at popes and kings, as centuries later Byron would here celebrate their decay. Aristocrats and prelates formed clubs or academies for the cultivation of music and letters, and opened their homes and libraries to the assiduous, the melodious, and the erudite. Monasteries, churches, and private families collected books. Cardinal Domenico Grimani had 8,000, which he gave to Venice. Cardinal Bessarion did the same with his precious hoard of manuscripts. To house these and the remnants of Petrarch's bequest, the government twice ordered the erection of a public library. War and other distractions foiled the plan, at last, in 1536, the Senate engaged Jacopo Sansovino to build the Libreria Vecchia, architecturally the most handsome library in Europe. Meanwhile, Venetian printers were producing the finest printed books of the age, perhaps of all time. They were not the first in Italy. Sveinheim and Panarts, once aides to Johann Fust in Mainz, set up the first Italian press in a Benedictine monastery at Subiaco in the Apennines in 1464. In 1467 they transferred their equipment to Rome and published 23 books in the next three years. In 1469 or earlier, printing began in Venice and Milan. In 1471, Bernardo Cignini opened a printing establishment in Florence, to the dismay of Politian, who mourned that now the most stupid ideas can in a moment be transferred into a thousand volumes and spread abroad. Copyists, thrown out of work, vainly denounced the new gadget. By the end of the fifteenth century, 4,987 books had been printed in Italy, 300 in Florence, 629 in Milan, 925 in Rome, 2,835 in Venice. The superiority of Venice in this regard was due to Teobaldo Manucci, who changed his name to Aldo Manuzio and later Latinized it into Aldus Minucius. Born at Bassiano in the Romagna in 1450, he learned Latin at Rome and Greek at Ferrara, both under Guarino da Verona, and then himself lectured at Ferrara on the classics. Pico della Mirandola, one of his pupils, invited him to come to Carpi and tutor his two nephews, Leonello and Alberto Pio. Teacher and pupils developed a lasting mutual affection. Aldous added the name Pio to his own, and Alberto and his mother, Countess of Carpi, agreed to finance the first large-scale adventure in publishing. Aldous's plan was to collect, edit, print, and broadcast at nominal cost all the significant Greek literature that had been salvaged from the storms of time. It was a heady enterprise for a dozen reasons. Manuscripts were hard to get, 
Different manuscripts of the same classic varied dishearteningly in their text. Nearly all manuscripts were heavy with errors of transcription. Editors would have to be found and paid to collate and revise texts. Fonts of Latin and Greek type would have to be designed and cast. Paper would have to be imported in large quantities. Typesetters and pressmen would have to be engaged and trained. A machinery of distribution would need to be improvised. A book-buying public would have to be coaxed into existence on a wider base than ever before. And all this would have to be financed without the protection of copyright laws. Aldous chose Venice for his headquarters because its commercial connections made it an excellent center for distribution, because it was the richest city in Italy and had many magnates who might want to adorn their rooms with uncut books, and because it harbored scores of refugee Greek scholars who would be glad to be employed as editors or proofreaders. John of Speyer had already established the first printing press in Venice around 1469. Nicholas Jensen of France, who had learned the new art in Gutenberg's Mainz, set up another a year later. In 1479, Jensen sold his press to Andrea Torresano. In 1490, Aldous Minutius settled in Venice, and in 1499, he married Torresano's daughter. In his home near the church of Sant'Agostino, Aldous gathered Greek scholars, fed them, bedded them, and set them to editing classic texts. He talked Greek with them and wrote in Greek his dedications and prefaces. In his house, the new type was molded and cast, the ink was made, the books were printed and bound. His first publication in 1495 was a Greek and Latin grammar by Constantine Lascaris, and in that same year he began to issue the works of Aristotle in the original. In 1496 he published the Greek grammar of Theodorus Gaza, and in 1497 a Greek-Latin dictionary compiled by himself. For he continued to be a scholar even amid the hazards and tribulations of publishing. So in 1502, after years of study, he printed his own Rudimenta Grammaticae Linguae Latinae, with an introduction to Hebrew for good measure. From these technical beginnings, he went on to publish one after another of the Greek classics, from 1495 onward. Musius, Hero and Leander, Hesiod, Theocritus, Theognus, Aristophanes, Herodotus, Thucydides, Sophocles, Euripides, Demosthenes, Aeschines, Lysias, Plato, Pindar, Plutarchs, Moralia. In those same years, he put forth a large number of Latin and Italian works, from Quintilian to Bembo, and the Adagia of Erasmus, who, sensing the vital import of Aldo's enterprise, came in person to live with him for a time and edit not only his own Adagia, or Dictionary of Quotations, but Terence, Plautus, and Seneca, too. For the Latin books, Aldous had a graceful semiscript type designed, not, as legend said, from the handwriting of Petrarch, but by Francesco da Bologna, an expert calligrapher, this is the type that we now, from that origin, call italic. For the Greek texts, he cut a font based on the careful handwriting of his chief Greek scholar, Marcus Musurus of Crete. He marked all his publications with a motto, Festina Lente, Make Haste Slowly, and accompanied it with a dolphin symbolizing speed and an anchor standing for stability. This symbol, along with the pictured tower that Torrezano had used, established the custom of the printer's or publisher's colophon. All this worked at his enterprise quite literally night and day. This book is continued on Cassette 11, Side 1. The Story of Civilization, Volume 5, The Renaissance, Part 1, by Will Durant, Continued, Cassette 11, Side 1. Aldous worked at his enterprise quite literally night and day. Those who cultivate letters, he wrote in his preface to Aristotle's Organon, must be supplied with the books necessary for their purpose, and until this supply is secured, I shall not rest. Over the door of his study he placed a warning inscription. Whoever thou art, thou art earnestly requested by Aldous to state thy business briefly and to take thy departure promptly, for this is a place of work. 
He was so absorbed in his publishing campaign that he neglected his family and his friends and ruined his health. A thousand tribulations sapped his energy. Strikes disrupted his schedule. War suspended it for a year during the Venetian struggle for survival against the League of Cambrai. Rival printers in Italy, France, and Germany pirated the editions whose manuscripts had cost him dearly and whose texts he had paid scholars to revise. But the sight of his small and handy volumes, clearly typed and neatly bound, going forth to a widening public at a modest price, about two dollars in the currency of today, gladdened his heart and repaid his toil. Now, he told himself, the glory of Greece would shine upon all who cared to receive it. Inspired by his devotion, Venetian scholars joined with him to found the Ne Academia, or New Academy, in 1500, dedicated to the acquisition, editing, and publishing of Greek literature. The members at their meetings spoke only Greek. They changed their names to Greek forms. They shared the tasks of editing. Distinguished men labored in this academy, Bembo, Alberto Pio, Erasmus of Holland, Lineker of England. Aldous gave them much credit for the success of his enterprise, but it was his own energy and passion that carried it through. He died exhausted and poor in 1515, but fulfilled. His sons continued the work, but when their son, Aldo II, died in 1597, the firm dissolved. It had served its purpose faithfully. It had taken Greek literature from the half-hidden shelves of rich collectors and had scattered it so widely that even the ravaging of Italy in the third decade of the 16th century and the desolation of northern Europe by the Thirty Years' War could lose that heritage as it had been so largely lost in the dying ages of ancient Rome. 2. Bembo Besides helping to revive the literature of Greece, the members of the new academy contributed vigorously to the literature of their time. Antonio Coccio, called Sibelicus, chronicled Venetian history in his Decades. Andrea Navagero composed Latin poems so nearly perfect in form that his proud countrymen hailed him as having snatched the leadership of letters from Florence to Venice. Marino Sanudo kept a lively diary of current events in politics, literature, art, manners, and morals. The fifty-eight volumes of these diarii picture the life of Venice more fully and vividly than any history of any city in Italy. Sanudo wrote in the racy language of daily speech. His friend Bembo devoted half a long life to polishing an artificial style in Latin and Italian. Pietro imbibed culture in his cradle, for he was the child of rich and lettered Venetians. Moreover, as if to confirm his literary purity, he was born in Florence, proud home of the Tuscan dialect. He studied Greek in Sicily under Constantine Lascaris and philosophy at Padua under Pomponazzi. Perhaps, if we may judge from his conduct, for he seldom took sin very seriously, he imbibed some skepticism from Pomponazzi, who doubted the immortality of the soul. But he was too much of a gentleman to disturb the consolations of the faith. And when the reckless professor was accused of heresy, Bembo persuaded Leo X to deal with him leniently. Bembo's happiest days were spent at Ferrara from his 28th to his 36th year, from 1498 to 1506. There he fell in love, if only in a literary way, with Lucrezia Borgia, queen of that courtly court. He forgot her dubious background at Rome in the lure of her quiet grace, the glow of her Titian hair, the fascination of her fame. For fame, too, like beauty, can intoxicate. He wrote her in scholarly diction letters as tender as might comport with his safety in the precincts of that excellent gunner, her husband Alfonso. He dedicated to her an Italian dialogue on platonic love, Gli Azolani, in 1505. And he composed in her praise Latin elegiacs as elegant as any in Rome's Silver Age. She wrote to him carefully, and may have sent him that tress of her hair which is preserved with her letters to him in the Ambrosian Library at Milan. When Bembo moved from Ferrara to Urbino in 1506, he was at the height of his charm. He was tall and handsome, of noble birth and breeding, of distinguished presence, without obtrusive pride. He could write poetry in three languages, and his letters were already prized. His conversation was that of a Christian, a scholar, and a gentleman. His Azolani, published during his stay at Urbino, fell in with the spirit of that court. 
What topic could be more pleasant than love? What mise en scène fitter for such discourse than the gardens of Caterina Cornaro at Azolo? What occasion more suitable than the wedding of one of her maids of honor? Who could better speak of love, however platonic, than the three youths and three maidens into whose mouths Bembo put his savory mixture of philosophy and poetry? Venice, whose artists took hints and scenes from the book, Ferrara, whose duchess received the adoring dedication, Rome, where ecclesiastics were glad ragionar d'amore, Urbino, which boasted the author in the flesh, all Italy acclaimed Bembo as a master of delicate sentiment and polished style. When Castiglione idealized the courtier in discussions he had heard or imagined in the ducal palace at Urbino, he gave to Bembo the most distinguished role in the dialogue, and chose him to phrase the famed concluding passages on platonic love. In 1512, Bembo accompanied Giuliano de' Medici to Rome. A year later, Giuliano's brother became Leo X. Bembo was soon lodged in the Vatican as a secretary to the Pope. Leo liked his wit, his Ciceronian Latin, his easygoing ways. For seven years, Bembo was an ornament of the papal court, an idol of society, an intellectual father to Raphael, a favorite with millionaires and generous women. He was only in minor orders and accepted the opinion current in Rome that his trial marriage with the church did not forbid a little gracious venery. Vittoria Colonna, purest of the pure, doted on him. Meanwhile, at Venice, Ferrara, Urbino, Rome, he wrote such Latin poetry as Catullus or Tibullus might have penned. Elegies, idols, epitaphs, odes. Many, frankly pagan, some, like his Priapus, in the best vein of Renaissance licentiousness. The Latin of Bembo and Politian was idiomatically perfect, but it came at the wrong time. Had they been born fourteen centuries earlier, they would have been de rigueur in the schools of modern Europe. Writing in the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries, they could not be the voice of their country, their epoch, even of their class. Bembo realized this, and in an essay, Della Volgar Lingua, he defended the use of Italian for literary purposes. He tried to show the way by composing canzoni in the manner of Petrarch, but here his passion for polish devitalized his verse and turned his amours into poetic conceits. Nevertheless, many of these poems were set to music as madrigals, some by the great Palestrina himself. The sensitive Bembo found Rome a ghostly city after the death of his friends Bibiena, Chigi, and Raphael. He retired from his papal post in 1520 and, like Petrarch, sought help and ease in a rural home near Padua. Now, at fifty, he fell in love in no mild platonic way. For the next twenty-two years he lived in a free union with Donna Morosina, who gave him not only three children, but such comforts and consolations, such solicitude and care as had never graced his fame, and now came doubly welcome to his declining years. He still enjoyed the income of several ecclesiastical benefices, he used his wealth largely to collect fine paintings and sculptures, and among them Venus and Jove held an honored place beside Mary and Christ. His home became a goal of literary pilgrimage, a salon of artists and wits, and from that throne he laid down the laws of style for Italy. Even while papal secretary, he had cautioned his associate Sadoletto to avoid reading the epistles of St. Paul, lest their unpolished speech of the commonalty should mar his taste. Put away these trifles, Bembo told him, for such absurdities do not become a man of dignity. All Latin, he told Italy, must be modeled upon Cicero, all Italian upon Petrarch and Boccaccio. He himself, in his old age, wrote histories of Florence and Venice. They are beautiful and dead. But when his Morosina died, the great stylist forgot his rules, forgot Plato and Lucrezia and Castiglione, and wrote to a friend a letter that perhaps alone of all that flowed from his pen, invites remembrance. I have lost the dearest heart in the world, a heart which tenderly watched over my life, which loved it and sustained it neglectful of its own, a heart so much the master of itself, so disdainful of vain embellishments and adornments, of silk and gold, of jewels and treasures of price, that it was content with the single and, so she assured me, supreme joy of the love I bore it. This heart, moreover, had for vesture the softest, gracefulest, daintiest of limbs. It had at its service pleasant features, 
and the sweetest, most graciously endowed form that I have ever met in this land. He can never forget her dying words. I recommend our children to you and beseech you to have care for them, both for my sake and for yours. Be sure they are your own, for I have never deceived you. That is why I could take our Lord's body just now with a soul at peace. Then, after a long pause, she added, Rest with God, and a few minutes afterward closed her eyes forever, those eyes that had been the clear, shining, faithful stars of my weary pilgrimage through life. Four years later, he was still mourning her. Losing his ties with life, he became pious at last. And in 1539, Paul III could make him a priest and a cardinal. For his remaining eight years, he was a pillar and exemplar of the church. 7. Verona If now, leaving the egregious Aretino to a later chapter, we move out of Venice to her northern and western dependencies, we should find there, too, some radiance of the Golden Age. Treviso could boast that it had begotten Lorenzo Lotto and Paris Bordone, and its cathedral had an annunciation by Titian and a fine choir designed by the innumerable Lombardi. The little town of Pordenone gave its name to Giovanni Antonio de Sacchi and still shows in its Duomo one of his chefs-d'oeuvre, a Madonna with saints and donor. Giovanni was a man of buoyant energy and self-confidence, ready of wit and sword, willing to undertake anything anywhere. We find him painting in Udine, Spilimbergo, Treviso, Vicenza, Ferrara, Mantua, Cremona, Piacenza, Genoa, Venice, forming his style on Giorgione's landscapes, Titian's architectural backgrounds, and Michelangelo's muscles. He gladly accepted an invitation to Venice in 1527, anxious to pit his brush against Titian's. His St. Martin and St. Christopher, painted for the Church of San Rocco, achieved an almost sculptural effect by modeling with light and shade. Venice hailed him as a worthy rival of Titian. Pordenone resumed his travels, married thrice, and was suspected of killing his brother, was knighted by King John of Hungary, who had never seen any of his pictures, and returned to Venice in 1533 to resume his duel with Titian. Hoping to prod Titian on to finishing his battle picture in the Ducal Palace, the Signory engaged Pordenone to do a panel on the opposite wall. The competition between Leonardo and Michelangelo was here repeated in 1538 with a dramatic supplement. Pordenone wore a sword at his belt. His canvas, splendid in color, too violent in action, was a judge's second best, and Pordenone moved on to Ferrara to design some tapestries for Ercole II. Two weeks after arrival, he died. His friends said it was poisoning. His enemies said it was time. Vicenza, too, had heroes. Bartolomeo Montagna founded a school of painting rich in middling Madonnas. Montagna's best is the Madonna enthroned in the Brera. It cleaves safely to Antonello's model of two saints on the right, two on the left, and angels making music at the Virgin's feet. But these angels deserve their name and the Virgin, with comely features and graceful robe, is one of the finest figures in the crowded gallery of Renaissance Madonnas. Vicenza's heyday, however, awaited Palladio. Verona, after a proud history of 1,500 years, became a Venetian dependency in 1404, and remained so till 1796. Nevertheless, she had a healthy cultural life of her own. Her painters fell behind those of Venice, but her architects, sculptors, and woodworkers were not surpassed in the most serene capital. The 14th-century tombs of the Scaligers, though too ornate, suggest no lack of sculptors, and the equestrian statue of Can Grande della Scala, with the flowing caparison of the horse so vividly portraying motion, falls short only of the masterpieces of Donatello and Verrocchio. The most sought-for woodcarver in Italy was Fra Giovanni da Verona. He worked in many cities, but he devoted a large part of his life to carving and inlaying the choir stalls of Santa Maria in Organo in his native city. The great name in Veronese architecture was that rare and universal genius, Vasari calls him, Fra Giocondo. Hellenist, botanist, antiquarian, philosopher, and theologian, this remarkable Dominican friar was also one of the leading architects and engineers of his time. He taught Latin and Greek to the famous scholar Julius Caesar Scaliger, who practiced medicine in Verona before moving to France. 
Fra Giocondo copied the inscriptions on the classic remains in Rome and presented a book on the subject to Lorenzo de' Medici. His research has led to the discovery of the greater part of Pliny's letters in an old collection in Paris. While in that city, he built two bridges over the Seine. When the detritus of the river Brenta threatened to fill up the lagoons that made Venice possible, Fra Giocondo persuaded the Signory to order, at great cost, the diversion of the river to empty farther south. But for this procedure, Venice would not be today a miracle of liquid streets. Hence, Luigi Cornaro called Giocondo the second founder of the city. In Verona, his masterpiece is the Palazzo del Consiglio, a simple Romanesque loggia surmounted by an elegant cornice and crowned with statues of Cornelius Nepos, Catullus, Vitruvius, Pliny the Younger, and Emilius Macer, all ancient gentlemen of Verona. In Rome, Giocondo was made architect of St. Peter's with Raphael and Giuliano de Sangallo, but died in that year, 1514, aged 81. It was a well-spent life. Giocondo's work on the ruins of Rome excited another Veronese architect. Giovan Maria Falconetto, after drawing all the antiquities of his own locality, marched off to Rome to do the same thing there, and devoted twelve years on and off to the task. Returning to Verona, he took the losing side in politics and had to move to Padua. There, Bembo and Cornaro encouraged him in the application of classical design to architecture, and the generous centenarian housed, fed, financed, and loved Giovan Maria to the end of the artist's sixty-seven years. Falconetto designed a loggia for Cornaro's palace in Padua, two of that city's gates, and the church of Santa Maria delle Grazie. Giocondo, Falconetto, and San Michele constituted a trio of architects rivaled only in Rome. Michele San Michele gave himself chiefly to fortification. Son and nephew of Veronese architects, he went to Rome at sixteen and carefully measured the ancient buildings. After making a name for himself in designing churches and palaces, he was sent by Clement VII to build defenses for Parma and Piacenza. The distinguishing feature of his military architecture was the pentagonal bastion, from whose projecting balcony guns could be fired in five directions. When he examined the fortifications of Venice, he was arrested as a spy. But his examiners were so impressed by his knowledge that the Signory engaged him to construct fortresses in Verona, Brescia, Zara, Corfu, Cyprus, and Crete. Back in Venice, he built a massive fort on the Lido. In preparing for the foundations, he soon struck water. Following the example of Fra Giocondo, he sank a double cordon of connected piles, pumped the water from between the two circles, and set the foundations on this dry ring. It was a hazardous undertaking, whose success was in doubt to the last minute. Critics predicted that when heavy artillery should be fired from this fort, the structure would shake itself loose from its foundations and collapse. The scenery placed in it the stoutest cannon in Venice, and ordered them all fire at once. Pregnant women fled from the neighborhood to avoid premature deliveries. The cannon were fired, the fort stood firm, the mothers returned, and San Michele was the toast of Venice. In Verona he designed two majestic city gates, adorned with Doric columns and cornices. Vasari ranked these structures, architecturally, with the Roman theater and amphitheater that had survived in Verona from Roman days. He built the Palazzo Bevilacqua there, and the Grimani and Mocenigo palaces. He reared a campanile for the cathedral and a dome for San Giorgio Maggiore. His friend Vasari tells us that, though Michele in youth had indulged in some moderate adultery, he became in later life a model Christian, taking no thought for material gains and treating all men with kindness and courtesy. He bequeathed his skills to Jacopo Sansovino and a nephew whom he loved exceedingly. When news came to him that this nephew had fallen in Cyprus while fighting for Venice against the Turks, San Michele developed a fever and died in a few days, aged 73. This in 1559. To Verona belonged the finest medalist of the Renaissance, perhaps of all time. Antonio Pisano, known to history as Pisanello, always signed himself Pictor and thought of himself as a painter. Half a dozen of his paintings survive, and they are of excellent quality. But it is not these that have sustained his name through the centuries. Recapturing the skill and compact realism of Greek and Roman coin designs, Pisanello molded little circular reliefs, seldom more than two inches in diameter, combining finesse of workmanship with such fidelity to truth 
that his medallions are the most trustworthy representations we have of several Renaissance notables. These are not profound works. They have no philosophical overtones, but they are treasures of painstaking workmanship and historical illumination. Excepting Pisanello and the Corotos, Verona, in painting, remained medieval. After the fall of the Scaligers, it subsided quietly into a secondary role. It was not like Venice or Rialto, where merchants from a dozen lands rubbed elbows and faiths and wore out one another's dogmas with mutual attrition. It was not like Lodovico's Milan, a political power, nor like Florence, a focus of finance, nor like Rome, an international house. It was not so close to the Orient, nor so captivated by humanism as to tincture its Christianity with paganism. It continued content with medieval themes, and rarely reflected in its art the sensuous zest that evoked the nudes of Giorgione and Titian, Correggio and Raphael. In a later period, one of its sons, who indeed is known by its name, entered gaily into the pagan mood. But Paolo Veronese became in life a Venetian rather than a Veronese. Verona was becalmed. In the fourteenth century, its painters were still abreast of their times. Note how Padua called one of them, Altichiero de Zevio, to decorate the chapel of San Giorgio. Toward the end of that century, Stefano da Zevio went to Florence and learned the Giotesque tradition from Agnolo Gaddi. Returning to Verona, he painted frescoes that Donatello pronounced the best yet done in those parts. His pupil, Domenico Morone, advanced upon him by studying the works of Pisanello and the Bellini. The defeat of the Buonacosi in the Castello at Mantua emulates the multitudinous panoramas of Gentile. Domenico's son Francesco, by his murals, helped Fra Giovanni's woodwork to make the sacristy of Santa Maria in Organo one of the treasure rooms of Italy. Domenico's pupil, Girolamo dai Libri, at the age of sixteen, in 1490, painted in the same favorite church an altarpiece, Deposition from the Cross, which, when uncovered, reports Vasari, excited such wonder that the whole city ran to congratulate the artist's father. Its landscape was one of the best in fifteenth-century art. In another of Girolamo's pictures, a tree was so realistically portrayed that, on the word of a holy Dominican, birds tried to perch on its branches, and the grave Vasari himself avers that in a nativity that Girolamo painted for Santa Maria in Organo, you might count the hairs on the rabbits. Girolamo's father had received the name Di Libri from his skill in illuminating manuscripts. The son carried on the art and came to excel in it all other miniaturists in Italy. About 1462, Jacopo Bellini painted in Verona. One of the boys who served him was Liberale, who later received the name of his city. Through this Liberale da Verona, a touch of Venetian color and vitality entered Veronese painting. Liberale, like Girolamo, found that he prospered best by illuminating manuscripts. He earned 800 crowns, or about $20,000, in Siena by his miniatures. Badly treated in his old age by his married daughter, he bequeathed his estate to his pupil Francesco Torbido, who went to live with him, and died at the reasonable age of eighty-five in 1536. Torbido studied also with Giorgione, and improved upon Liberale, who forgave him. Another of Liberale's pupils, Giovan Francesco Carotto, was strongly influenced by Montaigne's masterly polyptic in San Zeno. He went to Mantua to study with the old master, and made such progress that Montaigne sent out Carotto's work as his own. Giovan Francesco made excellent portraits of Guidobaldo and Elisabetta, Duke and Duchess of Urbino. He returned to Verona a rich man, who could afford now and then to speak his mind. When a priest accused him of making lascivious figures, he asked, If painted figures move you so, how can you be trusted with flesh and blood? He was among the few Veronese painters who wandered from religious themes. If to these men we add Francesco Bonsignori, Paolo Morando, called Cavazzolo, Domenico Brusasorci, and Giovanni Carotto, Giovan Francesco's younger brother, the roster of Veronese painters in the Renaissance is relatively complete. They were almost all good men. Vasari has a moral pat on the back for nearly every one of them. Their lives were orderly for artists, and their work had a placid and wholesome beauty that reflected their natures and their environment. Verona sang a pious and tranquil minor chord in the Song of the Renaissance.
Chapter 12. Emilia and the Marches, 1378 to 1534. 1. Correggio. Fifty miles south of Verona, one comes to the old Via Emilia, or Emilian Way, which ran 175 miles from Piacenza through Parma, Reggio, Modena, Bologna, Imola, Forli, and Cesena to Rimini. We pass over Piacenza, and for the moment Parma, to note a little commune eight miles northeast of Reggio and sharing its name. Correggio is one of several towns in Italy that are remembered only through some genius to whom they gave a cognomen. Its ruling family also was called Correggio. One member was the Niccolo da Correggio, who wrote genteel verses for Beatrice and Isabella d'Este. It was a place where you might expect genius to be born and to die, but not to stay, for it had no significant art or clear tradition to give to ability, instruction, and form. But in the first decades of the 16th century, the house of Correggio was headed by Count Gilbert X and his wife, Veronica Gambara, one of the great ladies of the Renaissance. She could speak Latin, knew scholastic philosophy, wrote a commentary on patristic theology, composed delicate Petrarchian verses, was called the Tenth Muse. She made her little court a salon for artists and poets, and helped to spread that romantic worship of woman which was now replacing, among the upper classes of Italy, the medieval worship of Mary, and was molding Italian art toward the representation of feminine charms. On September 3, 1528, she wrote to Isabella d'Este that our Messer Antonio Allegri has just finished a masterpiece picturing Magdalene in the desert and expressing in full the sublime art of which he is a great master. It was this Antonio Allegri who unwittingly stole the name and made the fame of his town, though his family name might well have expressed the joyous nature of his art. His father was a small landed proprietor, prosperous enough to win for his son a bride with a dowry of 257 ducats, or about $6,425. When Antonio showed a flair for drawing and painting, he was apprenticed to his uncle Lorenzo Allegri. Who taught him further we do not know. Some say that he went to Ferrara to study with Francesco de Bianchi Ferrari, then to the studios of Francia and Costa at Bologna, then with Costa to Mantua, where he felt the influence of the massive frescoes of Mantegna. In any case, he spent most of his life in Correggio in comparative obscurity, and presumably he was the only one in the town who suspected that he would be ranked among the immortals. He seems to have studied the engravings that Marcantonio Raimondi had made from Raphael, and probably saw, if only in copy, the chief works of Leonardo. All these influences entered into his completely individual style. The sequence of his subjects corresponds to the decline of religion among the literate classes of Italy in the first quarter of the 16th century, and the rise of secular patronage and themes. His early works, even when painted for private purchasers, told again, and mostly for churches, the Christian story. The Adoration of the Magi, where the Virgin has the pretty girlish face that Correggio later confined to subordinate characters. The Holy Family, the Madonna of St. Francis, still traditional in all its features. The Repose on the Return from Egypt, freshly original in composition, coloring, and characterization. La Zingarelli, where the Virgin, leaning fondly over her babe, is drawn with full Correggian grace, and the Madonna adoring her child, which makes the infant the radiant source of the scene's illumination. His pagan turn came through an odd commission. In 1518, Giovanna da Piacenza, abbess of the convent of San Paolo in Parma, engaged him to decorate her apartment. She was a lady of more pedigree than piety, she chose as theme of the frescoes, Chaste Diana, Goddess of the Hunt. Over the fireplace, Correggio portrayed Diana in a splendid chariot. Above her, in sixteen radial sections converging in the cupola, he painted scenes from classical mythology. In one, a dog, too passionately hugged by a child, expresses with a remarkably pictured eye his fear of being choked with love, and shames by his alert beauty all the human and divine figures scattered about. From this time forward, the human body, mostly nude, became for Correggio the chief element in pictorial decoration, and pagan motives entered into even his Christian themes. The abbess had converted him from Christianity. 
His success made a stir in Parma and brought him lucrative assignments. About 1519, he painted the mystic marriage of St. Catherine. The Virgin and the Saint here were unspeakably beautiful. And yet, four years later, Correggio surpassed them when he used the same subject for the picture that is one of the treasures of the Louvre. Lovely faces, an alluring landscape, the magic play of light and shade upon flowing raiment and waving hair. In 1520, Correggio accepted an arduous commission from Parma to paint frescoes in the cupola and over the tribune and side chapels of a new Benedictine Abbey church, San Giovanni Evangelista. He toiled on this task for four years, and in 1523 he moved with his wife and children to Parma to be nearer his work. In the dome he represented the apostles, seated comfortably in a circle on soft clouds, fixing their gaze upon a Christ whose foreshortened figure seen from below gives an astonishing illusion of distance. The splendor of this dome is in the superbly modeled figures of the apostles, some of them quite nude rivaling the gods of Phidias, and perhaps echoing in their muscular splendor the figures that Michelangelo had painted on the Sistine Chapel ceiling twelve years before. In a spandrel between two arches, a powerful St. Ambrose discusses theology with an apostle John who is as handsome as any Parthenon Ephibus. Luscious youthful forms, theoretically angels, fill the interstices with angelic faces, buttocks, legs, and thighs. The Greek revival, already old in humanism and minutious, is here in full swing in Christian art. In 1522, the great cathedral of Parma opened its doors to the young artist and contracted to pay him a thousand ducats, or twelve thousand five hundred dollars, to paint the chapels, apse, choir, and dome. On this assignment, he worked at intervals through eight years, from 1526 till his death. For the dome, he chose the Assumption of the Virgin and shocked many of the cathedral canons by making this culminating picture a whirling panorama of human flesh. In the center, the Virgin, reclining on the air, floats up to heaven with arms outstretched to meet her son. Around and beneath her, a heavenly host of apostles, disciples, and saints, magnificent figures worthy of Raphael at his best, seems to puff her upward with the breath of adoration, and supporting her as a choir of angels, looking remarkably like healthy boys and girls in all the splendor of youthful nudity. These are the loveliest adolescent nudes in Italian art. One of the canons, confused by so many arms and legs, denounced the painting as a fricassee of frogs. Apparently other members of the chapter were dubious about this melee of human flesh celebrating a virgin, and Correggio's work on the cathedral seems to have been interrupted for a time. He was now in 1530 advancing middle age and longed for the peace of a settled life. He bought some acres outside Correggio, became, like his father, a landed proprietor, and strove to support his family and his farm with his brush. During and after his major enterprises, he produced a series of religious pictures, almost every one of them masterly. Magdalene Reading, The Virgin of St. Sebastian, The Fairest Virgin in Correggio, The Madonna della Scodella, with a bowl and an incomparable bambino, The Madonna di San Girolamo, sometimes called Il Giorno, or Day, in which the Jerome is worthy of Michelangelo, and the angel holding a book before the child is a vision of girlish beauty and the Magdalene laying her cheek upon the child's thigh is the purest and tenderest of sinners, and the warm, rich reds and yellows make a canvas worthy of Titian at his best. And finally, a companion picture, the Adoration of the Shepherds, which fancy has called La Notte, or Night. What interested Correggio in these pictures was not the religious sentiment, but the aesthetic values, the adoring devotion of the young mother, herself so comely, with oval face, glossy hair, dropped eyelids, slender nose, thin lips, full bosom, or the masculine muscles of athletic saints, or the demure loveliness of Magdalene, or the rosy flesh of a child. Correggio, coming down from cathedral scaffolds, refreshed himself with composite visions of beauties that might be. About 1523, a series of commissions from Federigo II Gonzaga invited the full expression of the pagan element in his art. Wishing to court the favor of Charles V, the Marquis ordered picture after picture, sent them as gifts to the Emperor, and received his coveted bauble, the title of Duke. For him, schooled in the paganism of Rome, Correggio painted a succession of mythological subjects, commemorating Olympian triumphs of love or desire. In The Education of Eros, Venus blindfolds Cupid, lest the human race should die. 
in Jupiter and Antiope, the god, disguised as a satyr, advances upon the lady as she lies in naked slumber on the grass. In Danae, a winged herald prepares for Jupiter's coming by undraping the fair maid, while beside her bed two puti play in happy indifference to the morality of the gods. In Io, Jupiter descends from his boredom in a concealing cloud and clasps with omnipotent hand a plump lady who hesitates gracefully and ends by yielding to the compliment of desire. In The Rape of Ganymede, a pretty boy is flown to heaven by an eagle in haste to meet the needs of the ambidextrous god of gods. In Leda and the Swan, the lover is a swan, but the motive is the same. Even in the Virgin and St. George, two naked cupids romp before the Virgin, and St. George in his flashing mail is the physical ideal of Renaissance youth. We must not conclude that Correggio was merely a sensualist with a flair for painting flesh. He loved beauty, perhaps immoderately, and in these mythologies he stressed the surface of it too exclusively, but in his Madonnas he had done justice to a profounder beauty. He himself, while his brush romped through Olympus, lived like an orderly bourgeois, devoted to his family, and seldom leaving home except to work. He was content with little, Vasari tells us, and lived as a good Christian should. He is reported to have been timid and melancholy. Who would not be melancholy coming every day into a world of deformed adults from a haunting dream of loveliness? Perhaps some quarrel arose about payment for the work in the cathedral. When Titian visited Parma, he heard echoes of the dispute and gave his opinion that if the dome could be inverted and filled with ducats, they would not adequately pay for what Correggio had painted there. In any case, the payments were curiously involved in the artist's premature death. In 1534 he received an installment of sixty crowns, all in coppers. Carrying this weight of metal, he set out from Parma on foot. He became overheated, drank too much water, took a fever, and died on his farm March 5, 1534, in the fortieth, some say forty-fifth, year of his age. For so short a life his achievement was stupendous, far greater than all that Leonardo or Titian or Michelangelo or anyone but Raphael could show in their first forty years. Correggio equals them all in grace of line, the soft modeling of contours, in portraying the living texture of human flesh. His coloring has a liquid and radiant quality, alive with reflections and transparencies, softer with its violet, orange, rose, blue, and silver hues than the glaring brilliance of the later Venetians. He was a master of chiaroscuro, of light and shade in their endless combinations and revelations. In some of his Madonnas, matter becomes almost a form and function of light. He experimented bravely with schemes of composition, pyramidal, diagonal, circular, but in his cupola frescoes he let unity slip through a superabundance of apostolic and angelic legs. He played too fondly with foreshortenings, so that the figures in his cupolas, though drawn as science might require, seem huddled and cramped and ungainly, like the ascending Christ of San Giovanni Evangelista. On the other hand, he cared nothing for mechanics, so that many of his characters, like Micawber, lack all visible means of support. He painted some religious subjects with exquisite tenderness, but his prevailing interest was in the body, its beauty, movements, attitudes, joys. And his later pictures symbolized the triumph of Venus over the Virgin, in 16th century Italian art. His influence in Italy and France was rivaled only by Michelangelo's. In the later 16th century, the Bolognese school of painting, led by the Caracci, took him as their model, and their followers, Guido Reni and Domenichino, founded upon Correggio an art of physical excellence and sensual sentiment. Charles Lebrun and Pierre Mignot, imported into France and deployed in Versailles, a rosy, voluptuous style of decoration through pagan figures, darting cupids, and chubby cherubim. Correggio, rather than Raphael, conquered France, and left upon its art an influence that lasted till Watteau. In Parma itself his work was continued and then transformed by Francesco Mazzuoli, called by Italian whim Il Parmigianino, the Parmesan. Born an orphan in 1504, he was reared by two uncles who were painters, so that his talent ripened rapidly. At seventeen he was commissioned to decorate a chapel of that same church, San Giovanni Evangelista, 
in which Correggio was painting the dome. In these frescoes, his style achieved an almost Correggian grace, to which he added his own peculiar love of fine raiment. About this time he painted a remarkable portrait of himself as seen in a mirror. This is one of the most engaging autoritrati in art, revealing a lad of refinement, sensitivity, and pride. When Parma was besieged by papal troops, his uncles packed up this and others of his pictures and sent Francesco with them to Rome in 1523 to study the works of Raphael and Michelangelo and seek the favor of Pope Clement VII. He was on the way to full success when the sack of Rome forced him to flee to Bologna in 1527. There a fellow artist robbed him of all his engravings and designs. Presumably by this time his protective uncles had died. He earned his bread by painting for Pietro Aretino the queenly Madonna della Rosa, formerly in Dresden, and for some nuns the Santa Margherita, which still survives in Bologna. When Charles V came there to reorganize a devastated Italy, Francesco made a portrait of him in oils. The emperor liked it and might have made the artist's fortune, but Parmigianino took the portrait back to his studio to give it a few finishing touches and never saw Charles again. He returned to Parma in 1531 and received a commission to paint a vault in the church of the Madonna della Steccata. He was now at the top of his powers, and his incidental products were of a high order. A Turkish slave who looks more like a princess, a marriage of St. Catherine matching Correggio's handling of this theme, with children of unearthly beauty, and an anonymous portrait allegedly of his mistress Antea, described as one of the most famous courtesans of the time, but here angelically demure, with robes too gorgeous for anyone less than a queen. But now Parmigianino, perhaps goaded on by his misfortunes and poverty, became ardently interested in alchemy and neglected his painting to set up furnaces for the improvisation of gold. The ecclesiastics of San Giovanni, unable to recall him to his work there, ordered his arrest for violation of contract. The painter fled to Casa Maggiore, lost himself in alembics and crucibles, let his beard grow, neglected his person and his health, caught a chill and fever, and died as suddenly as Correggio in 1540. 2. Bologna If we pass over Reggio and Modena in unseemly haste, it is not because they had no cherished heroes of sword or brush or pen. In Reggio, an Augustinian monk, Ambrogio Calipino, compiled a dictionary of Latin and Italian, which in successive editions grew into a polyglot lexicon of eleven languages, this in 1590. Little Carpi had a handsome cathedral designed by Baldassare Peruzzi in 1514. Modena had a sculptor, Guido Mazzoni, who shocked his townsmen by the realism of a terracotta Cristo morto, and the 15th-century choir stalls of the 11th-century cathedral matched the beauty of the facade and campanile. Pellegrino da Modena, who worked with Raphael in Rome and then returned to his native city, might have become a painter of note had he not been murdered by ruffians bent upon killing his son. Doubtless Renaissance violence snuffed out in their growth a regiment of potential geniuses. Bologna, standing at a main crossing of Italy's trade routes, continued to prosper, though her intellectual leadership was passing to Florence as humanism dethroned scholasticism. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 5, The Renaissance, Part 1, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 11, Side 2. Bologna, standing at a main crossing of Italy's trade routes, continued to prosper, though her intellectual leadership was passing to Florence as humanism dethroned scholasticism. Her university was now only one of many in Italy and could no longer read the law to pontiffs and emperors, but its medical school was still supreme. The popes claimed Bologna as one of the papal states, and Cardinal Albernoz had passingly enforced the claim in 1360 but the schism of the church between rival popes from 1378 to 1417 reduced papal control to a technicality. A rich family, the Bentivogli, rose to political mastery and maintained throughout the 15th century a mild dictatorship, which observed republican forms and acknowledged but ignored the overlordship of the popes. As capo or head of the senate, 
Giovanni Bentivoglio governed Bologna for 37 years, from 1469 to 1506, with sufficient wisdom and justice to win the admiration of princes and the affection of the people. He paved streets, improved roads, and built canals. He helped the poor with gifts and organized public works to mitigate unemployment. He actively supported the arts. It was he who brought Lorenzo Costa to Bologna. For him and his sons, Francia painted. Filelfo, Guarino, Arispa, and other humanists were welcomed to his court. During the later years of his rule, embittered by a conspiracy to depose him, he used harsh methods to maintain his ascendancy and forfeited the goodwill of the people. In 1506, Pope Julius II advanced upon Bologna with a papal army and demanded his abdication. He yielded peaceably and was allowed to depart intact and died in Milan two years later. Julius agreed that Bologna should thenceforth be ruled by its senate, subject to veto by a papal legate of legislation opposed by the church. The rule of the popes proved more orderly and liberal than that of the Bentivogli. Local self-government was unhindered, and the university enjoyed remarkable academic freedom. Bologna remained a papal state, in fact as well as name, till the advent of Napoleon in 1796. Renaissance Bologna was proud of its civic architecture. The Guild of Merchants raised an elegant mercanzia, or chamber of commerce, from 1382 and on, and the lawyers rebuilt in 1384 their imposing Palazzo dei Notari. The nobles built handsome palaces like the Bevilacqua, where the Council of Trent would hold its sittings in 1547, and the Palazzo Pallavicini, described by a contemporary as not unworthy of kings. The massive Palazzo del Podesta, seat of the government, received a new facade in 1492, and Bramante designed a stately spiral staircase for the Palazzo Comunale. Many facades had arcades on the street level, so that one might walk for miles in the heart of the city without being exposed, except at crossings, to sun or rain. While in the university, skeptics like Pomponazzi questioned the immortality of the soul, the people and their rulers built new churches, adorned or repaired old ones, and brought hopeful offerings to miracle-working shrines. The Franciscan friars added to their picturesque Church of San Francesco one of the fairest campaniles in Italy. The Dominicans enriched their Church of San Domenico with choir stalls painstakingly carved and inlaid by Fra Damiano of Bergamo and they engaged Michelangelo to carve four figures for the ornate arca, or tabernacle, in which the bones of their founder were zealously preserved. The great pride and tragedy of Bolognese art was the Cathedral of San Petronio. Far back in the 5th century, this Petronius had served the city as its bishop and had been deeply loved for his beneficence. In 1307, many worshippers claimed to have been healed of blindness, deafness, or other infirmities, by washing the diseased parts with water from the well beneath his shrine. Soon the city had to provide accommodations for hundreds of pilgrims seeking cures. In 1388 the communal council decreed that a church should be built for San Petronio, and on a scale that would humble the Florentines and their Duomo. It was to be 700 by 460 feet, with a dome rising to 500 feet from the ground. Money proved less ample than pride. Only nave and aisles to the transept were completed, and only the lower part of the façade. But that lower part is a masterpiece that attests the noble aspirations and taste of Renaissance art. The portal jams and architrave were carved with reliefs between 1425 and 1438, challenging in subjects and surpassing in power Ghiberti's gates to the Florentine baptistry, and yielding to them only in refinement of finish. And in the pediment, along with unprepossessing figures of Petronius and Ambrose, a Madonna and child, carved in the round, worthy of comparison with Michelangelo's Pietà. These works of Jacopo della Quercia, of Siena, were an inspiration to Michelangelo, and he might have been saved from the muscular exaggerations of his sculptural style had he accepted more of the classic purity in della Quercia's design. Sculpture rivaled architecture in Bologna. Properzia de Rossi carved a bas-relief for the façade of San Petronio, it won such praise that when Clement VII came to Bologna, he asked to see her, but she had died in that week. Alfonso Lombardi, whose reliefs won Michelangelo's praise, stood
stepped into history on the coattails of Titian. Learning that Charles V, during the conference at Bologna in 1530, was to sit for Titian, he persuaded the painter to take him along as a servant. And while Titian painted, Alfonso, partly concealed behind him, modeled the emperor in stucco. Charles spied him and asked to see his work. He liked it and asked Alfonso to copy it in marble. When Charles paid Titian a thousand crowns, he bade him give half to Alfonso. Lombardi brought the finished marble to Charles at Genoa and received an additional three hundred crowns. Now famous, Alfonso was taken to Rome by Cardinal Ippolito de' Medici and was commissioned by him to carve tombs for Leo X and Clement VII. But the cardinal died in 1535, and Alfonso, losing his commissions and his patron, followed him within a year to the grave. Painting in 14th century Bologna was chiefly illumination and when it graduated into murals, it followed a stiff Byzantine style. It was apparently two artists from Ferrara who aroused Bolognese painters from the rigor mortis of Byzantium. When Francesco Cosa came to make his home in Bologna in 1470, there was still in his painting a certain Montagnesque severity and sculptural hardness of line, but he had learned to infuse his figures with feeling as well as dignity, to set them in motion, and to bathe them in a living play of light. Lorenzo Costa arrived in Bologna when he was a lad of 23 in 1483 and stayed there for 26 years. He took a studio in the same house as Francia. The two men became fast friends and influenced each other to mutual advantage. Sometimes they painted a picture together. Costa won the praise and ducats of Giovanni Bentivoglio by painting an excellent Madonna enthroned in San Petronio. When Giovanni fled at the approach of the terrible Julius in 1506, Costa accepted an invitation to succeed Montaigne at Mantua. Meanwhile, Francesco Francia was making himself the head and crown of the Bolognese school. His father was Marco Raibolini, but as surnames were loose in Italy, Francesco became known by the name of the goldsmith to whom he was apprenticed. For many years he practiced the goldsmith's art, silver work, niello, enameling, and engraving. He was made master of the mint and engraved the coins of the city for both Bentivoglio and the popes. His coins were so distinguished by their beauty that they became collector's items, bringing high prices soon after his death. Vasari describes him as a lovable man, so pleasant in conversation that he could divert the most melancholy individuals and won the affection of princes and lords and all who knew him. We cannot say what turned Francia to painting. Bentivoglio discovered his talent and commissioned him, already forty-nine, to paint an altarpiece for a chapel in San Giacomo Maggiore, this in 1499. The dictator was pleased and engaged Francia to decorate his palace with murals. They were destroyed when the populace sacked the palace in 1507, but we have Vasari's word for it that these and other frescoes brought Francia such reverence in the city that he was reckoned as a god. Commissions poured in upon him, and perhaps he accepted too many to allow his best potentialities to mature. Mantua, Reggio, Parma, Luca, and Urbino received panels from his brush. The Pinacoteca Bolognese has a room full of them. Verona has a holy family, Turin, an entombment, the Louvre, a crucifixion, London, a dead Christ, and a striking portrait of Bartolomeo Bianchini, the Morgan Library, a virgin and child, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, a delightful portrait of Federigo Gonzaga in youth. None of these is of the first order, but each is gracefully drawn, softly colored, and suffused with a tenderness and piety that makes them heralds of Raphael. Francia's epistolary friendship with Raphael is one of the pleasantest episodes of the Renaissance. Timoteo Vitti was among Francia's pupils at Bologna from 1490 to 1495, and became at Urbino one of Raphael's earliest teachers. Possibly some quality of Francia passed to the young artist. When Raphael had achieved fame in Rome, he invited Francia to visit him. Francia excused himself as too old, but he wrote a sonnet in Raphael's praise. Raphael sent him a letter, dated September 5, 1508, rich in Renaissance courtesy. Monsignore Francesco, mio caro, I have just received your portrait, brought to me in good condition, for which I thank you very warmly. It is most beautiful, so lifelike that I sometimes mistake believing myself to be with you and to hear your words. I pray you to excuse and pardon the delay and postponement of my self-portrait, which, because of important and incessant occupation, I have not yet been able to execute with my own hand in accordance with our agreement. However, 
I send you meanwhile another drawing of the nativity done amid so many other things that I blush for it. I do this trifle rather in sign of obedience and love than for anything else. If in exchange I shall receive the drawing of your story of Judith, I shall place it among the things that are dearest and most precious to me. Monsignor Il Datario expects your little Madonna with great anxiety, and Cardinal Riario, the large one. I look for them with that pleasure and satisfaction with which I see and praise all your works, never seeing any others more beautiful or more devout and well done than yours. Meanwhile, take courage, take care of yourself and your wanted prudence, and be assured that I feel your afflictions as if they were my own. Continue to love me as I love you with all my heart, always entirely at your service, your Raffaele Sancho. We may allow here for some mannerly flourish, but that this mutual affection was real appears from another letter, in which Raphael sent his famous Saint Cecilia to Francia to be placed in a chapel at Bologna, and asked him as a friend to correct any errors he might find in it. Vasari relates that when Francia saw the picture he was so overwhelmed by its beauty and so painfully recognized his own inferiority that he lost all will to paint, grew ill, and presently died in the sixty-seventh year of his age, this in 1517. This is one of many dubious deaths in Vasari, but he adds graciously that there were other theories. Perhaps before his death Francia saw some engravings made in Rome by his pupil Marcantonio Raimondi from the drawings of Raphael. Visiting Venice, Mark saw some engravings by Albrecht Dürer on copper or wood. He spent almost all his travel money buying thirty-six wood engravings by the Nuremberg master on the Passion of Christ. He copied them on copper, made prints from the copies, and sold the prints as Dürer's works. Going to Rome, he engraved on copper a drawing by Raphael so faithfully that the painter allowed a great number of his drawings to be engraved and prints to be made and sold. Raimondi copied also the paintings of Raphael and others, transferred the copy to copper, and sold the prints. While he made a living in this novel way, the artists of Europe, without visiting Italy, could now know the design of the famous paintings of the Renaissance masters. Finiguera, Raimondi, and other successors did for art what Gutenberg and Aldus Minucius and others did for scholarship and literature. They built new lines of communication and transmission, and offered to youth at least the outlines of its heritage. 3. Along the Emilian Way Eastward from Bologna lies a string of minor towns that contributed their commensurate luster to the total splendor of the Renaissance. Little Imola had its Innocenzo da Imola, who studied with Francia, and left a holy family almost worthy of Raphael. Faenza gave its name and partial industry to Faenz. There, as in Gubbio, Pesaro, Castel Durante, and Urbino, Italian potters in the 15th and 16th centuries perfected the art of coating earthenware with opaque enamel and painting thereon with metallic oxides designs that on firing became brilliant purples, greens, and blues. Forley, anciently Forum Livii, was made famous by two painters and one virile heroine. Melozzo da Forli we defer to Rome, his favorite theater of operations. His pupil, Marco Palmizzano, painted the old Christian themes for a hundred churches or patrons, and left us a deceptively charming portrait of Caterina Sforza. Born out of wedlock to Galeazzo Maria Sforza, Duke of Milan, Caterina married the cruel and rapacious Girolamo Riario, despot of Forli. In 1488, his subjects rebelled, killed him, and captured Caterina and her children but troops loyal to her held the citadel. She promised her captors, if released, to go and persuade these soldiers to surrender. They agreed, but kept her children as hostages. Once in the castle she had its gates closed and vigorously directed the resistance of the garrison. When the rebels threatened to kill her children unless she and her men submitted, she defied them and told them from the ramparts that she had another child in her womb and could easily conceive more. Lodovico of Milan sent troops who effected her rescue. The rebellion was mercilessly suppressed, and Caterina's son, Ottaviano, was made Lord of Forli under his mother's iron thumb. We shall meet her again. North and south of the Emilian Way, two ancient capitals survive. Ravenna, once the retreat of Roman emperors, and San Marino, the inextinguishable republic. 
Around the 9th century convent of St. Marinus, who died in 366, a tiny settlement formed which, from its once easily defensible perch on a rocky mountaintop, remained immune to all the condottieri of the Renaissance. Its independence was formally recognized by Pope Urban VIII in 1631 and endures by the courtesy of the Italian government, which finds little there to tax. Ravenna recaptured a passing prosperity after the Venetians took it in 1441. Julius II reclaimed it for the papacy in 1509, and three years later a French army, having won a famous battle nearby, felt entitled to sack the city so thoroughly that it never recovered until the Second World War, which shattered it again. There, on a commission from Bernardo Bembo, father of the poet Cardinal, Pietro Lombardo designed the tomb in 1483 that houses Dante's bones. Rimini, where the Emilian Way just south of the Rubicon reached its Adriatic end, entered violently into Renaissance history through its ruling family, the Malatestas, or evil heads. They appear first toward the end of the 10th century as lieutenants of the Holy Roman Empire, governing the marches of Ancona for Otho III. By playing Guelph and Ghibelline factions against each other and making obeisance now to the emperor, now to the pope, they acquired actual though not formal sovereignty over Ancona, Rimini, and Cesena, and ruled them as despots acknowledging no lean factions against each other and making obeisance now to the emperor, now to the pope, they acquired actual though not formal sovereignty over Ancona, Rimini, and Cesena, and ruled them as despots acknowledging no morals except those of intrigue, treachery, and the sword. Machiavelli's prince was a feeble echo of their reality, blood and iron turned into ink, like Bismarck into Nietzsche. It was a Malatesta, Giovanni, who, in a monogamous moment, killed his wife Francesca de Rimini and his brother Paolo in 1285. Carlo Malatesta established the repute of the family in the patronage of arts and letters. Sigismondo Malatesta carried the dynasty to its zenith of power, culture, and assassination. His many mistresses gave him several children, in some instances with disturbing simultaneity. He married thrice and killed two wives on pretext of adultery. He was alleged to have made his daughter pregnant, to have attempted sodomy with his son, who repelled him with drawn dagger, and to have wreaked his lust upon the corpse of a German lady who had preferred death to his embrace. However, we have for these exploits only the word of his foes. To his final mistress, Isotta degli Atti, he gave unwanted devotion and ultimately marriage, and after her death he set up in the church of San Francesco a monument marked Divi Isotai Sacrum, sacred to the divine Isotta. He seems to have denied God and immortality. He thought it a merry prank to fill with ink the holy water stoop of a church and to watch the worshippers bespatter themselves as they entered. Crime had not enough varieties to exhaust his energy. He was an able general, known for reckless bravery and for resolute endurance of all the hardships incident to military life. He wrote poetry, studied Latin and Greek, supported scholars and artists, and delighted in their company. He was especially fond of Leon Battista Alberti, the Leonardo before da Vinci, and commissioned him to transform the Cathedral of San Francesco into a Roman temple. Leaving the 13th century Gothic church intact, Alberti fronted it with a classic façade modeled on the Arch of Augustus erected at Rimini in 27 B.C. He planned to cover the choir with a dome, but this was never built. The result is an unpleasant torso called by contemporaries Tempio Malatestiano. The art with which Sigismondo had the interior refinished was a paean to paganism. In a brilliant fresco by Piero della Francesca, Sigismondo was shown kneeling before his patron saint but this was almost the only Christian symbol left in the church. In one of the chapels, Isotta was buried, and on the tomb, an inscription was placed twenty years before her death, to Isotta of Rimini, in beauty and virtue the glory of Italy. In another chapel were representations of Mars, Mercury, Saturn, Diana, and Venus. The walls of the church were carved with marble reliefs of a high order, chiefly by Agostino di Duccio, representing satyrs, angels, singing boys and personified arts and sciences, and emblazoned with the initials of Sigismondo and Isotta. Pope Pius II, a lover of the classics, described the new structure as a nobile templum, so filled with pagan symbols that it seemed the shrine not of Christians, but of infidels worshipping heathen deities. 
At the Peace of Mantua in 1459, Pius compelled Sigismondo to restore his principalities to the church. When the doughty despot renewed his hold upon them, Pius hurled a bull of excommunication at him, charging him with heresy, parricide, incest, adultery, rape, perjury, treason, and sacrilege. Sigismondo laughed at the bull, saying that it had not perceptibly lessened his enjoyment of food and wine. But the patience, arms, and strategy of the scholar-pope proved too much for him. In 1463 he knelt in penitence before a papal legate, surrendered his realm to the church, and received absolution. Still afire with energy, he took command of a Venetian army, won several victories against the Turks, and returned to Rimini with what seemed to him a prize as precious as the bones of the greatest saint, the ashes of the philosopher Gemistus Pletho, the Greek Platonist who in effect proposed the replacement of Christianity with a Neoplatonic pagan faith. Sigismondo buried his treasure in a splendid tomb alongside his tempio. Three years later, in 1468, he died. We must not forget him in our composite image of the Renaissance. If Sigismondo represented the small but influential minority which had more or less openly ceased to accept the medieval Christian creed, we need only follow the Adriatic down from Rimini into the marches to Loreto to find a living symbol of the old religion still warm in Italian hearts. Every year during the Renaissance, as in our times, thousands of earnest pilgrims traveled to Loreto to visit the Casa Santa, or Holy House, in which, they were told, Mary and Joseph and Jesus had lived in Nazareth, and which, said the marvelous legend, had been miraculously transported by angels, first to Dalmatia in 1291, then in 1294 over the Adriatic to a laurel grove, or Lauretum, near Recanati. Around the little stone house, a marble screen was built from designs by Bramante, and Andrea Sansovino added sculptural decorations. And over the casa, a church called the Santuario was raised by Giuliano de Maiano and Giuliano de Sangallo in 1468 and following. On a small altar inside the holy house was a figure of Mary and her child in black cedar, which piety ascribed to the artist hand of Luke the Evangelist. Consumed by fire in 1921, the group was replaced by a reproduction, adorned with jewels and precious stones, and silver lamps keep lights burning before it day and night. This, too, was part of the Renaissance. 4. Urbino and Castiglione Twenty miles inland from the Adriatic, midway between Loreto and Rimini, hidden aloft on a scenic spur of the Apennines, the little principality of Urbino, forty miles square, was in the 15th century one of the most civilized centers on the earth. That fortunate territory, 200 years before, had come into the possession of a family, the Montefeltri, that made fortunes as condottieri and spent them as wisely as they were darkly earned. In a remarkable reign of 38 years, from 1444 to 1482, Federigo da Montefeltro ruled Urbino with a skill and justice unequaled even by Lorenzo the Magnificent. He began judiciously by being a pupil of Vittorino da Feltre, and his life was the finest encomium that noble teacher ever received. While governing Urbino, he hired himself out as a general to Naples, Milan, Florence, and the church. He never lost a battle, and never allowed war to touch his own soil. He captured a town by forging a letter, and sacked Volterra with superfluous thoroughness. Yet he was reputed the most merciful commander of the time. In civil life he was a man of high honor and fidelity. He earned enough as a condottiere to administer his state without oppressively taxing his people. He walked unarmed and unprotected among them, confident of their affectionate loyalty. Every morning he gave audience, in a garden open on all sides, to any who wished to speak to him. In the afternoon he rendered judgment in the Latin tongue. He relieved the destitute, dowered orphan girls, filled his granaries in time of plenty, sold grain cheaply in time of dearth, and forgave the debts of impoverished purchasers. He was a good husband, a good father, and a generous friend. In 1468 he built for himself, his court, and the five hundred members of his government a palace that served not so much as a bastion of defense as a center of administration and a citadel of letters and arts. Luciano Laurana, a Dalmatian, designed it so well that Lorenzo de' Medici sent Baccio Pontelli to make drawings of it. A facade of four stories, with four superimposed arches in the center, and a machicolated tower at each side, an inner cortile of graceful arcades, rooms now mostly bare but still revealing by their irremovable carvings and magnificent fireplaces 
the taste and luxury of the time. This was the center of the court where Castiglione molded his courtier. The rooms that most delighted Federigo were those in which he gathered his library and discoursed with the artists, scholars, and poets who enjoyed his friendship and patronage. He himself was the most widely accomplished man in the state. He preferred Aristotle to Plato and knew the ethics, politics, and physics thoroughly. He put history above philosophy, doubtless feeling that he could learn more about life by studying the record of human behavior than by tracing the web of human theory. He loved the classics without surrendering his Christianity. He read the Fathers and the Scholastics and heard Mass every day. In peace as well as war, he was a foil to Sigismondo Malatesta. His library was as well provided with patristic and medieval literature as with classic works. For fourteen years he kept thirty copyists transcribing Greek and Latin manuscripts until his library was the fullest in Italy outside the Vatican. He agreed with his librarian, Vespasiano da Bisticci, that no printed book should be allowed entry to the collection, for they thought of a book as a work of art in binding, lettering, and illumination, as well as a vehicle of ideas and almost every book in the palace was carefully handwritten on vellum, illustrated with miniatures, and bound in crimson leather with silver clasps. Miniature painting was a favorite art at Urbino. The Vatican Library, which purchased Federigo's collection, prizes particularly two volumes of the Urbino Bible, which the Duke commissioned Vespasiano and others to illustrate, bidding them, says Vespasiano, to make this most excellent of all books as rich and worthy as possible. To adorn the palace walls, Federigo brought in tapestry weavers, and the painters Eustus van Ghent from Flanders, Pedro Berughete from Spain, Paolo Uccello from Florence, Piero della Francesca from Borgo San Sepolcro, and Melozzo da Forli. Here, Melozzo painted two of his finest pictures, one now in London, the other in Berlin, showing the cultivation of the sciences, that is, literature and philosophy, at the court of Urbino, with a splendid portrait of Federigo. From these painters and from Francia and Perugino came the stimulus that developed Urbino's own school, led by the father of Raphael. When Caesar Borgia appropriated the art treasures of the palace in 1502, they were valued at 150,000 ducats, or about $1,875,000. Federigo had few enemies, many friends. Pope Sixtus IV made him a duke in 1474, Henry the Seventh of England made him a Knight of the Garter. When he died in 1482, he bequeathed a flourishing principality and an inspiring tradition of justice and peace. His son Guido Baldo did his best to follow in his steps, but disease interfered with his military pursuits and left him an invalid through most of his life. In 1488, he married Elisabetta Gonzaga, sister-in-law of Isabella, Marchioness of Mantua. Elisabetta, too, was a frequent invalid, made timid and gentle by physical weakness. Perhaps she was relieved to find that her husband was impotent. She was content, she said, to live with him as a sister, and on that basis they avoided the quarrels of man and wife. She became his mother rather than his sister, cared for him tenderly, never deserted him in his tragic tribulations. Her letters to Isabella are all the more precious because they reveal a delicacy of feeling, a warmth of family attachment, that are sometimes ignored in moral appraisals of the Renaissance. When, after a fortnight's visit at Urbino in 1494, the lively Isabella returned to Mantua, Elisabetta sent after her this touching note. Your departure made me feel not only that I had lost a dear sister, but that life itself had gone from me. I know not how else to soften my grief except by writing every hour to you and telling you on paper all that my lips desire to say. If I could express the sorrow I feel, I believe that you would come back out of compassion for me. And if I did not fear to vex you, I would follow you myself. But since both these things are impossible from the respect which I owe to your highness, all I can do is to beg you earnestly to remember me sometimes, and to know that I bear you always in my heart. One of the questions discussed at the court of Guido Baldo and Elisabetta was, after perseverance, what is the best proof of love? The answer was the sharing of joys and griefs. The young couple gave plenty of proof. In November 1502, Caesar Borgia, after flourishing protestations of friendship for Guido Baldo, suddenly turned his army up the road to Urbino, claiming that principality as a fief of the church. The ladies of Urbino brought to the duke their diamonds and pearls, their necklaces, bracelets, and rings to finance an impromptu mobilization for defense. 
But Borgia's treachery had left no time for effective resistance. What troops could now be mustered would be easy victims of the trained and ruthless force that was advancing. The bloodshed would be useless. Duke and Duchess left their power and wealth, fled to Città del Castello, and thence to Mantua, where Isabella received them with loving commiseration. Borgia, fearing that Guido Baldo would organize an army there, demanded that Isabella and her marquis should dismiss the exiles, and to protect Mantua, Guido Baldo and Elisabetta moved on to Venice, whose fearless senate gave them protection and sustenance. A few months later, Borgia and his father, Alexander VI, were struck down with acute malarial fever in Rome. The Pope died, Caesar recovered, but his finances collapsed. The people of Urbino rose against his garrison, drove it from the city, and joyously welcomed the return of Guido Baldo and Elisabetta in 1503. The Duke adopted his nephew, Francesco Maria della Rovere, as heir to his throne. And as Francesco was nephew also to Pope Julius II, the little principality remained for a decade secure. In the five ensuing years, from 1504 to 1508, the court of Urbino became the cultural model and paragon of Italy. Though fond of the classics, Guido Baldo encouraged the literary use of Italian, and it was at his court that one of the earliest Italian comedies, Bibiena's Calandra, received its first performance, circa 1508. Sculptors and painters carved and painted scenery for the occasion. The spectators sat on carpets, an orchestra hidden behind the stage provided music, children sang a prelude, ballets were danced between the acts. At the close, a Cupid recited some verses, Biles played a song without words, and a quartet sang a hymn to love. For though Urbino's was the most moral court in Italy, it was also the center of the movement that raised woman upon a pedestal and liked to talk of love, platonic or unphilosophical. The leading spirits in the cultural life of the court were Elisabetta, who had no viable alternative to platonic love, and Emilia Pio, who remained to the end of her life the chaste and grieving widow of Guido Baldo's brother. A livelier element was contributed to the circle by Bembo the poet and Bibiena the dramatist, an aesthetic dash by a famous singer, Bernardino Accolti, called Unico Aretino, the one and only Arezian, and the sculptor Cristoforo Romano, whom we have met in Milan. A seasoning of noble blood was provided by Giuliano de' Medici, son of Lorenzo, Ottaviano Fregoso, soon to be Doge of Genoa, his brother Federigo, destined to be a cardinal, Louis of Canossa, soon to be papal nuncio to France. Others now and then joined the group, high ecclesiastics, generals, bureaucrats, poets, scholars, artists, philosophers, musicians, distinguished visitors. This varied company gathered in the evening in the salon of the Duchess, gossiped, danced, sang, played games, and conversed. There the art of conversation, the polite and urbane, serious or humorous consideration of significant matters, reached its Renaissance peak. It was this genteel company that Castiglione described and idealized in one of the most famous books of the Renaissance, Il Cortigiano, the courtier, by which he meant the gentleman. He was himself an exemplary gentleman, a good son and husband, a man of honor and decency even amid the dissolute society of Rome, a diplomat esteemed by friend and foe, a loyal friend who had never had an unkind word for anyone, a gentleman, il cortigiano, the courtier, by which he meant the gentleman. He was himself an exemplary gentleman, a good son and husband, a man of honor and decency even amid the dissolute society of Rome, a diplomat esteemed by friend and foe, a loyal friend who had never had an unkind word for anyone, a gentleman in the best definition, as a man always considerate of all. Raphael caught his inmost character astonishingly well in the superb portrait that hangs in the Louvre. A wistful, meditative face, dark hair and soft blue eyes, too guileless to be successful in diplomacy except by the sheer charm of his integrity. Clearly a man who would love beauty, in women and art, in manners and style, with the sensitiveness of a poet and the comprehension of a philosopher. He was the son of Count Cristoforo Castiglione, who held an estate in the territory of Mantua and had married a Gonzaga relative of the Marquis Francesco. At eighteen, in 1496, he was sent to the court of Lodovico at Milan and pleased everyone by his good nature, good manners, 
and versatile excellence in athletics, letters, music, and art. When his father died, his mother urged him to marry and attend to the perpetuation of his line. But though Baldassare could write most elegantly of love, he was too platonic for matrimony. And he kept his mother waiting seventeen years before he yielded to her counsel. He joined the army of Guido Baldo, achieved nothing but a broken ankle, convalesced in the ducal palace at Urbino, and remained there for eleven years, enamored of the mountain air, the courtly company, the gracious conversation, and Elisabetta. She was not beautiful. She was six years older than he and almost as heavy, but her gentle spirit captivated his. He kept her picture behind a mirror in his room and composed secret sonnets in her praise. Guido Baldo eased the situation by sending him on a mission to England in 1506. But Baldassare seized the first excuse to hurry back. The Duke perceived that there was no harm in him and graciously consented to form with him and Elisabetta a platonic menage a trois. Castiglione stayed on till the Duke's death in 1508, continued in chaste devotion to the widow, and remained at Urbino until Leo X deposed the nephew of Guido Baldo and put upon the ducal throne a nephew of his own, this in 1517. He returned to his little patrimony near Mantua and disinterestedly married Ippolita Torelli, twenty-three years his junior. Then he began to fall in love with her, first as a child, then as a mother, he perceived that he had never really known woman or himself before, and the new experience brought him a profound and unprecedented happiness. But Isabella persuaded him to serve as Mantuan ambassador in Rome. He went reluctantly, leaving his wife behind in the care of his mother. Soon across the divisive Apennines a tender letter came. I have given birth to a little girl. I do not think you will be disappointed, but I have been much worse than before. I have had three bad spells of fever. I am better now, and I hope it will not return. I will write no more, as I am not very well yet, and I commend myself to you with all my heart, from your wife, who is a little exhausted with the pain, from your Ippolita. Ippolita died shortly after writing this letter, and Castiglione's love of life died with her. She continued to serve Isabella and the Marquis Federigo in Rome, but even at the polished court of Leo X, he missed not only the peace of his Mantuan home, but the integrity, kindliness, and grace that had made the Urbino circle almost the embodiment of his ideals. He had begun in Urbino in 1508, he finished in Rome, the book that carried him down to posterity. Its purpose was to analyze the conditions that produced and the conduct that distinguished a gentleman. Castiglione imagined that fine company at Urbino discussing the subject. Perhaps he reported, nicely refined, some of the conversations he had heard there. He used the names of the men and women who had spoken there, and gave them sentiments agreeing with their characters. So he put into the mouth of Bembo a paean to platonic love. He sent the manuscript to Bembo, asking if the now exalted secretary of the Pope had objections to this use of his name. The genial Bembo had none. Even so, the timid author kept his book unpublished till 1528. Then, a year before his death, he surrendered it to the world only because some friends forced his hand by circulating copies of it in Rome. Within ten years, it was translated into French, and in 1561, Sir Thomas Hovey made it a quaint and piquant English classic which every educated Elizabethan read. Castiglione was not quite sure, but he inclined to believe that the first requisite of a gentleman must be gentle birth. That is, it would be very difficult for one to acquire good manners and an easy grace of body and mind, except by being reared among persons already possessing these qualities. Aristocracy seemed a necessary depository, nursery, and vehicle of manners, standards, and tastes. Secondly, the gentleman must, early in life, become a good horseman and learn the arts of war. Enthusiasm for peaceful arts and letters must not be carried to the point of weakening in the citizens the martial qualities without which a nation is soon enslaved. Too much war, however, can make a man a brute. He needs, along with the hardening hardships of soldiering, the refining influence of women. No court, how great soever it be, can have any sightliness or brightness in it, or mirth, without women, nor can any courtier be gracious, pleasant, or hardy, that is to say brave, nor at any time undertake any gallant enterprise of chivalry unless he be stirred with the conversation and love of women. 
to wield this civilizing influence, woman must as far as possible be feminine, avoiding all imitation of the male in carriage, manners, speech, or dress. She must discipline her body to comeliness, her speech to kindness, her soul to gentleness. Therefore, she should learn music, dancing, literature, and the art of entertaining. In this way, she may achieve that inner beauty of spirit which is the stimulating object and genesis of true love. The body where beauty shineth is not the fountain whence beauty springeth, because beauty is bodiless. Love is nothing else but a certain coveting to enjoy beauty. But whoso thinketh in possessing the body to enjoy beauty, he is far deceived. This book ends by transforming the lusty chivalry of the Middle Ages into that pale platonic love which is the last disappointment that a woman will forgive. The ideal world of refined culture and mutual consideration that Castiglione had conceived collapsed in the brutal sack of Rome in 1527. Many times, reads a passage toward the end of his book, abundance of wealth is cause of great destruction, as in poor Italy, which hath been and still is a prey and booty in the teeth of strange nations, as well for the ill government as for the abundance of riches in it. He could in some measure reproach himself for the disaster. Clement VII sent him in 1524 as papal nuncio to Madrid to reconcile Charles V to the papacy. Clement's own behavior made the mission difficult, and it failed. When the news reached Spain that the troops of the emperor had invaded Rome, imprisoned the pope, and destroyed half the wealth and grace that Julius and Leo and a thousand artists had created there, life flowed out of Baldassare Castiglione as from a severed vein. And at Toledo in 1529, aged but 51, the gentlest gentleman of the Renaissance passed away. His body was taken to Italy, and his mother, who against her will survives her son, raised a tomb to his memory in the church of Santa Maria delle Grazie, outside of Mantua. Giulio Romano designed the monument, and Bembo composed for it an elegant inscription, but the finest words engraved on the stone were the verses that Castiglione himself had composed for the grave of his wife, whose remains were now, in accordance with his will, brought to lie beside his own. I do not live now, O sweetest spouse, for fate has taken my life from your body, but I shall live when I am laid in the same tomb with you, and my bones are joined with yours. This book is concluded on Cassette 12, Side 1. The Story of Civilization, Volume 5, The Renaissance, Part 1, by Will Durant. Concluded. Chapter 13, The Kingdom of Naples, 1378-1534. 1. Alfonso the Magnanimous Southeast of the Marches and the Papal States, all mainland Italy constituted the Kingdom of Naples. On the Adriatic side, it included the ports of Pescara, Bari, Brindisi, and Otranto. A bit inland, the city of Foggia, once the lively capital of the wondrous Frederick II. On the instep, the ancient port of Toronto. On the toe, another regio. On the southwestern coast, one scenic splendor after another, rising to the glory of Salerno, Amalfi, Sorrento, and Capri, and culminating in busy, noisy, loquacious, passionate, joyous Naples. It was the only great city in the realm. Outside of it and the ports, the country was agricultural, medieval, feudal. The land was tilled by serfs or slaves, or by peasants free to starve or to work for bread and a shirt, under barons whose ruthless rule of their great estates defied the authority of the throne. The king had little revenue from those lands, but had to finance his government and court from the returns of his own feudal domains, or by exploiting to the point of diminishing returns the royal control of commerce. The House of Anjou had begun a rapid decline with the escapades of Queen Joanna I, which ended when Charles of Durazzo had her strangled with a silken cord in 1382. Joanna II, though forty at her accession in 1414, was as excitable as the first. She married thrice, banished her second husband, and had the third murdered. Faced by revolt, she called to her aid King Alfonso of Aragon and Sicily, and adopted him as her son and heir in 1420. 
Rightly suspecting him of planning to replace her, she disowned him in 1423 and left her state to René of Anjou at her death in 1435. A long war of succession followed in which Alfonso, having sampled Naples, fought to seize its throne. While he was besieging Gaeta, he was captured by the Genoese and was brought before Filippo Maria Visconti at Milan. With consummate logic, surely never learned in schools, he persuaded the Duke that French power re-established in Naples, added to French power already pressing upon Milan from the north and Genoa from the west, would hold half of Italy in a vice, which the Visconti would be the first to feel. Filippo understood, freed his prisoner, and bade him Godspeed to Naples. After many battles and intrigues, Alfonso won. The rule of the House of Anjou at Naples, from 1268 to 1442, ended. That of the House of Aragon, from 1442 to 1503, began. This usurpation provided the legal basis for the French invasion of Italy in 1494, which was the first act in the tragedy of Italy. Alfonso was so pleased with his new royal seat that he left the rule of Aragon and Sicily to his brother John II. He was not an easy ruler. He taxed with a hard hand, allowed financiers to squeeze the people, then squeezed them in turn, and extorted money from Jews by threatening to baptize them. But most of his taxation fell upon the merchant class. Alfonso reduced the taxes levied from the poor and helped the destitute. The Neapolitans thought him a good king. He walked among them unarmed, unattended, and unafraid. Having no children by his wife, he begot some on the ladies of his court. His wife killed one of these rivals, and Alfonso never admitted the queen to his presence thereafter. He was a zealous churchgoer and listened to sermons faithfully. Nevertheless, he caught the humanist fever and supported classical scholars with so open a hand that they named him Il Magnanimo. He welcomed Vala, Filelfo, Manetta, and other humanists to his table and his treasury. He paid Poggio 500 crowns, or about $12,500, for a translation of Xenophon's Cyropedia into Latin. Paid Bartolomeo Fazio 500 ducats a year for writing An Historia Alfonsi, and 1,500 more when it was finished. In the one year 1458, he distributed 20,000 ducats, or half a million dollars, among literary men. He carried some classic with him wherever he went. At home and on campaigns, he had a classic read to him at meals, and students who wished to hear these readings were admitted to them. When the supposed remains of Livy were discovered at Padua, he sent Beccadelli to Venice to buy a bone, and he received it with all the awe and devotion of a good Neapolitan watching the flow of St. Januarius's blood. When Manetti orated to him in Latin, Alfonso was so fascinated by the Florentine scholar's idiomatic style that he allowed a fly to feast on the royal nose till the oration was complete. He gave his humanists full freedom of speech, even to heresy and pornography, and protected them from the Inquisition. The most remarkable of the scholars at Alfonso's court was Lorenzo Valla. Born in Rome in 1407, he studied the classics with Leonardo Bruni and became an enthusiastic, even fanatical Latinist, among whose many wars was a campaign to destroy Italian as a literary language and make good Latin live again. While teaching Latin and rhetoric at Pavia, he wrote a violent diatribe against the famous jurist Bartolus, laughing at his laborious Latinity and contending that only a man skilled in Latin and in Roman history could understand Roman law. The law students in the university defended Bartolus, the art students rallied around Valla, the debate graduated into riots, and Valla was asked to leave. Later, in Notes on the New Testament, he applied his linguistic learning and fury to Jerome's Latin translation of the Bible and revealed many an error in that heroic undertaking. Erasmus would later praise, epitomize, and use Valla's critique. In another treatise, Elegantiae Linguae Latinae, Valla gave his rules for Latin elegance and purity, ridiculed the Latin of the Middle Ages, and joyfully exposed the bad Latin of many humanists. In an age that adored Cicero, he preferred Quintilian. He was left with hardly a friend in the world. To confirm his isolation, he published in 1431 a dialogue on pleasure and the true good, which expounded the amoralism of the humanists with astonishing temerity. He used as persons of the dialogue three men still living, Leonardo Bruni to defend Stoicism, Antonio Beccadelli to vindicate Epicureanism, and Niccolo de Nicoli to reconcile Christianity and philosophy. 
Beccadelli was made to speak with such force that readers rightly assumed that his views were Valla's own. We must suppose, argued Beccadelli, that human nature is good, for it was created by God. Indeed, nature and God are one. Consequently, our instincts are good, and our natural desire for pleasure and happiness is in itself a justification of the pursuit of these as the proper object of human life. All pleasures, whether of the senses or of the intellect, are to be held legitimate until proved injurious. Now we have an imperious instinct to mate, and certainly no instinct for lifelong chastity. Such continence is therefore unnatural. It is an intolerable torment, and should not be preached as virtue. Virginity, Beccadelli was made to conclude, is a mistake and a waste, and a courtesan is of more value to mankind than a nun. So far as his means allowed, Valla lived this philosophy. He was a man of promiscuous passion, hot temper, and extreme speech. He wandered from city to city, seeking literary employment. He asked for a place in the papal secretariat and was turned away. When Alfonso took him up in 1435, the king of Aragon and Sicily was fighting for the throne of Naples and counted among his foes Pope Eugenius IV, 1431-1447, who claimed Naples as a lapsed papal fief. A reckless scholar like Valla, learned in history, skilled in polemics, and with nothing to lose, was a handy tool against the pope. Under Alfonso's protection, Valla wrote in 1440 his most famous treatise on the falsely believed and lying donation of Constantine. He assailed as a ridiculous forgery the Constitutum Constantini, by which the first Christian emperor transferred to Pope Sylvester I, from 314 to 335, full secular dominion over all Western Europe. Nicholas of Cusa had recently, in 1433, exposed the falsity of the donation in his De Concordantia Catholica, written for a council of Basel, also at odds with Eugenius IV. But Valla's historical and linguistic criticism of the document was so devastating, though he himself made many errors, that the question was settled once and for all. Valla and Alfonso were not content with scholarship. They waged war. I attack not only the dead but the living, said Valla, and he excoriated the relatively decent Eugenius with the most idiomatic abuse. Even were the donation authentic, it would be null and void, for Constantine could have no power to make it, and in any case the crimes of the papacy would already have annulled it. And if the donation was a forgery, Valla concluded, ignoring the territorial donations of Pepin and Charlemagne to the papacy, then the temporal power of the popes had been a thousand-year-long usurpation. From that temporal power had come the corruption of the church and the wars of Italy and the overbearing, barbarous, tyrannical priestly domination. Valla appealed to the people of Rome to rise and overthrow the papal government of their city and invited the princes of Europe to deprive the popes of all territorial possessions. It sounded like the voice of Luther, but it was Alfonso who inspired the pen. Humanism had become a weapon of war. Eugenius fought back with the Inquisition. Valla was summoned before its agents at Naples, he ironically professed his complete unorthodoxy and refused to say more. Alfonso ordered the inquisitors to let him alone, and they dared not disobey. Bala continued his attacks on the church. He showed that the works attributed to Dionysius the Areopagite were unauthentic, that the letter of Abgarus to Jesus, published by Eusebius, was a forgery, and that the apostles had had no hand in composing the Apostles' Creed. However, when he surmised that Alfonso was moving toward reconciliation with the papacy, he decided that he too had better make peace. He addressed an apology to Eugenius, retracting his heresies, reaffirming his orthodoxy, and asking pardon for his sins. The Pope made no answer, but when Nicholas V ascended the papal throne and sent out a call for scholars, Bala was made a secretary to the Curia in 1448 and was employed to make Latin translations from the Greek. He ended his life as a canon of St. John Lateran and was buried in holy ground in 1457. His friendly rival, Antonio Beccadelli, illustrated the morals of his time by writing an obscene book and receiving acclaim for it from the leading men of Italy. Born at Palermo in 1394 and therefore nicknamed Il Panormita, he imbibed his higher education and perhaps his ambiguous morals in Siena. About 1425 he composed under the title of Hermaphroditus, a series of Latin elegies and epigrams rivaling Marshall in Latinity and pornography. 
Cosimo de' Medici accepted the dedication, probably without reading the book. The virtuous Guarino da Verona praised the eloquence of its language. A hundred others added encomiums. Finally, the Emperor Sigismund placed a poet's crown upon Beccadelli's head in 1433. Priests denounced the volume, Eugenius proclaimed the excommunication of all who read it, friars publicly burned it at Ferrara, Bologna, Milan. Nevertheless, Beccadelli lectured summa cum laude in the universities of Bologna and Pavia, received a stipend of 800 scudi from the Visconti, and was invited to Naples as court historiographer. His History of the Memorable Words and Deeds of King Alfonso was written in such idiomatic Latin that Aeneas Silvius Piccolomini, Pope Pius II, himself no middling Latinist, considered it a model of Latin style. Beccadelli lived to be seventy-seven and died rich in honors and property. 2. Ferrante Alfonso left his kingdom to his putative son Ferdinand, who ruled from 1458 to 1494. Ferrante, as his people called him, was of dubious parentage. His mother was Margaret of Iar, who had other lovers besides the king. Fontano, Ferrante's secretary, affirmed that the father was a Valencian Morano, that is, a Christianized Spanish Jew. Bala was his tutor. Ferrante was not known for sexual profligacy, but he had most of the vices that can come from a passionate nature untamed by a firm moral code and aroused by apparently unreasonable hostility. Pope Calixtus III legitimated his birth but refused to recognize him as king. He declared the Aragonese line in Naples extinct and claimed the kingdom as a fief of the church. René of Anjou made another attempt to regain the throne bequeathed him by Joanna II. While he landed forces on the Neapolitan coast, the feudal barons rose in revolt against the House of Aragon and allied themselves with the foreign foes of the king. Ferrante confronted these simultaneous challenges with angry courage, overcame them, and revenged himself with somber ferocity. One by one he lured his enemies with pretended reconciliation, gave them excellent dinners, killed some of them after dessert, imprisoned others, let several starve to death in his dungeons, kept some of them in cages for his occasional delectation, and when they died had them embalmed and dressed in their favorite costumes and preserved them as mummies in his museum. These stories, however, may be war atrocities manufactured by historians in a hostile camp. It was this king who dealt so fairly with Lorenzo de' Medici in 1479. Revolution nearly upset him in 1485, but he recovered his footing, completed a long reign of thirty-six years, and died amid general rejoicing. The rest of the story of Naples belongs to the collapse of Italy. Ferrante did not continue Alfonso's patronage of scholars, but he engaged as his prime minister a man who was at once a poet, a philosopher, and a skillful diplomat. Giovanni Pontano developed, Beccadelli had founded, the Neapolitan Academy. Its members were men of letters who met periodically to exchange verses and ideas. They took Latin names, Pontano became Jovianus Pontanus, and loved to think that they were continuing, after a long and cruel interlude, the stately culture of imperial Rome. Several of them wrote a Latin worthy of the Silver Age. Pontanus composed Latin treatises on ethics, praising the virtues that Ferrante allegedly ignored, and an eloquent essay de principe, recommending to a ruler those amiable qualities which Machiavelli's prince, twenty years later, would contemn. Giovanni dedicated this exemplary tract to his pupil, Ferrante's son and heir, Alfonso II, 1494 to 1495, who practiced all that Machiavelli preached. Fontano taught in verse as well as in prose, and expounded in Latin hexameters the mysteries of astronomy and the proper cultivation of oranges. In a series of pleasant poems, he celebrated every species of normal love, the mutual itching of healthy youth, the tender attachment of newlyweds, the reciprocal satisfactions of marriage, the joys and griefs of parental love, the merger of mates into one being by the accumulation of the years. He described in verses seemingly as spontaneous as Virgil's, and with a surprising command of the Latin lexicon, the holiday life of the Neapolitans, the workers sprawling on the grass, the athletes at their games, 
the picnickers in their carts, the seductive girls dancing the tarantella to the clash of their tambourines, the lads and lasses flirting on the bayside promenade, the lovers keeping tryst, the blue bloods taking the baths at Bailly as if fifteen centuries had not passed since Ovid's raptures and despairs. Had Pontano written in Italian with the same felicity and grace with which he composed Latin verse, we should have ranked him with the bilingual Petrarch and Politian, who had the good sense to march with the present as well as Rome in the past. After Pontano, the most prominent member of the Academy was Jacopo Sanazzaro. Like Bembo, he could write Italian in the purest Tuscan dialect, far different from the Neapolitan speech. Like Politian and Pontano, he could mold Latin elegies and epigrams that would not have shamed Tabullus or Marshall. For one epigram praising Venice, Venice sent him six hundred ducats. Alfonso II, at war with Alexander VI, took Sanazzaro with him on his campaigns to shoot poetic darts into Rome. When the lusty pope, whose Borgia family carried a Spanish bull on its coat of arms, took Giulia Farnese as his alleged mistress, Sanazzaro gored him with two lines that must have made Alfonso's soldiers regret their ignorance of Latin. That once on Tyrian bull Europa sat, who doubts? A Spanish bull bears Julia. And when Caesar Borgia took the field against Naples, a barb went his way. Caesar or nothing Borgia would be called, but why not both, since he is both at once? Such sallies passed from mouth to ear in Italy and shared in forming the legend of the Borgias. In a gentler mood, Sanazzaro composed in 1526 a Latin epic on the virgin birth, De Partu Virginis. It was an astonishing tour de force. It used the classical machinery of the pagan gods, but brought them in as adjuncts to, eavesdroppers on, the gospel narrative and it dared comparison with Virgil by quoting the famous fourth eclogue in the body of the poem. It was excellent Latin and delighted Clement the Seventh, but not even a pope will lose himself in it today. The masterpiece of Sanazzaro was written in the living tongue of his people, in a medley of prose and verse, Arcadia, in 1504. Like Theocritus in ancient Alexandria, the poet had grown tired of cities and had learned to love rural fragrance and peace. It was an urban sentiment that Lorenzo and Politian had expressed, with evident sincerity, some twenty years before. The landscapes in the painting of the time marked a growing appreciation of the countryside, and men of the world began to babble of woods and fields, limpid streams, and virile shepherds piping amorous lays. Sanazzaro's book caught these fancies at their flow, and was carried to such fame and popularity as favored no other book of the Italian Renaissance. He led his readers into an imaginary world of strong men and beautiful women, none of these old and most of them nude. He described their splendor and that of natural scenes in a poetic prose that set a fashion in Italy and later in France and England, and he interspersed his prose with pardonable poetry. In this book the modern pastoral was born, perhaps less graceful than the ancient, more elongated and windy, but with interminable effect upon literature and art. Here, Giorgione, Titian, and a hundred artists after them would find themes for their pigments. Here, Edmund Spencer and Sir Philip Sidney would take impressions for their fairy queens and an English Arcadia. Sanazzaro had rediscovered a continent more enchanting than the new world of Columbus, a melodious utopia where any soul might enter at no other cost than literacy and might build its castle to its taste and whim without lifting a finger from the page. The art of the Regno was more masculine than its poetry, though there too the soft Italian touch showed its hand. Donatello and Michelozzo came down from Florence and set the pace with an imposing mausoleum for Cardinal Rinaldo Brancacci in the church of San Angelo Anilo. For the Castel Nuovo, begun by Charles I of Anjou in 1283, Alfonso the Magnanimous ordered a new gate, built from 1443 to 1470, which Francesco Laurana designed, and for which Pietro di Martino, and probably Giuliano de Maiano, carved handsome reliefs of the king's achievements in war and peace. The church of Santa Chiara, built for Robert the Wise in 1310, still contains the lovely Gothic monument set up by the brothers Giovanni and Pace da Firenze, soon after the king's death in 1343. The Cathedral of San Gennaro, of 1272, 
received a new Gothic interior in the 15th century. There, in the costly Capella del Tesoro, the blood of St. Januarius, protective patron of Naples, flows three times a year, ensuring the prosperity of a city weary with commerce and burdened with centuries, but consoled by faith and love. Sicily remained aloof from the Renaissance. She produced a few scholars like Arispa, a few painters like Antonello da Messina, but they soon migrated to the wider opportunities of the mainland. Palermo, Monreale, Cefalu had great art, but only as the relic of Byzantine, Moslem, or Norman days. The feudal lords who owned the land preferred the 11th to the 15th century and lived in nightly scorn or ignorance of letters. The people whom they exploited were too poor to have any cultural expression beyond their colorful dress, their religion of bright mosaics and somber hope, their songs and simple poetry of love and violence. The lovely island enjoyed its own Aragonese kings and queens from 1295 to 1409. Thereafter, for three centuries, it was a jewel in the crown of Spain. Lengthy as this brief survey of non-Roman Italy has seemed, it has done scant justice to the full and varied life of the passionate peninsula. Consideration of morals and manners, of science and philosophy, may be deferred till we have spent some chapters with the Renaissance popes. But even in those cities that we have touched, how many precious byways of life and art have escaped our eyes. We have said nothing of a whole branch of Italian literature, for the greatest novelle belonged to a later period. We have inadequately visualized the major role that the minor arts played in the adornment of Italian bodies, minds, and homes. What deformed or inflated botches were majestically transformed by the textile arts? What would some of the grandees and grand dames glorified by Venetian painting have been without their velvets, satins, silks, and brocades? They did well to cover their nakedness and brand nudity as a sin. Wise it was of them, too, to cool their summers with gardens, even though so formal, to beautify their homes with colored tiles on roof and floor, with iron wrought into lacery and arabesques, and copper vessels gleaming smooth, and figurines of bronze or ivory reminding them how fair might men and women be, and woodwork carved and marquetried and built to last a thousand years, and lustrous pottery brightening table and cupboard and mantelpiece and the miraculous embroidery of Venetian glass offering its fragile challenge to time, and the golden dyes and silver clasps of leather bindings around treasured classics illuminated by happy bondsmen of the pen. Many painters, like Sano di Pietro, chose to ruin their eyesight with drawing and coloring miniatures rather than spread their subtle and intimate dreams of beauty crudely over panels and walls. And sometimes, weary of walking through galleries, one could sit gladly for hours over the illumination and calligraphy of such manuscripts as still hide in the Schifanoia Palace at Ferrara, or in the Morgan Library at New York, or in the Ambrosiana at Milan. All these, as well as the greater arts, and the labor and love, chicanery and statesmanship, devotion and war, faith and philosophy, science and superstition, poetry and music, hatreds and humor of a lovable and volcanic people, combined to make the Italian Renaissance and to bring it to fulfillment and destruction in Medicean Rome. This concludes the reading of The Story of Civilization, Volume 5, The Renaissance, Part 1, by Will Durant. Part 2 continues the story and is available through the books on tape service. This book was read by Alexander Adams. Additional titles by Will Durant in the Books on Tape Library include Our Oriental Heritage and The Age of Faith. For additional information about them or for help with topics of related interest, please call our Customer Service Department or check our Catalog Index to find review material. This audiobook may be purchased by you and donated to your local library for your friends and neighbors to enjoy. Such a donation qualifies as a write-off for tax purposes. Books on Tape Incorporated produces many new unabridged audiobook titles each month. Please call our friendly operators toll free at 1 800 88 Books for information about our service, or to set up a library donation, or to speed your next title to you without delay. We hope you enjoyed this reading. Please continue listening to sample another Books on Tape bestseller. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. By arrangement with Monica Ariel Mile, Trustee Ethel B. Durant Trust, 
Monica Ariel Mile and William James Durant Easton, and was produced in 1995 by Books on Tape Incorporated, which holds the copyright there too. Neither this recording nor any part thereof may be reproduced or used for any purpose without prior written authority from Books on Tape Incorporated. This book is read by Alexander Adams. Book Four, The Roman Renaissance, 1378 to 1521. Chapter 14, The Crisis in the Church, 1378 to 1447. One, The Papal Schism, 1378 to 1417. Gregory the Eleventh had brought the papacy back to Rome, but would it stay there? The conclave that met to name his successor was composed of sixteen cardinals only four of whom were Italians. The principal authorities petitioned them to choose a Roman, or at least an Italian. And to support the suggestion, a crowd of Romans gathered outside the Vatican, threatening to kill all non-Italian cardinals, unless a Roman were made Pope. The frightened conclave, by a vote of fifteen to one, hastily elected in 1378 Bartolomeo Prignano, Archbishop of Bari, who took the name of Urban VI. Then they fled in fear of their lives but Rome accepted the compromise. Urban VI ruled the city and the church with impetuous and despotic energy. He appointed senators and municipal magistrates and reduced the turbulent capital to obedience and order. He shocked the cardinals by announcing that he proposed to reform the church and to begin at the top. Two weeks later, preaching publicly in their presence, he condemned the morals of the cardinals and the higher clergy in unmeasured terms. He forbade them to accept pensions, and ordered that all business brought to the curia should be dispatched without fees or gifts of any kind. When the cardinals murmured, he commanded them to cease your foolish chattering. When Cardinal Orsini protested, the Pope called him a blockhead. When the Cardinal of Limoges objected, Urban rushed at him to strike him. Hearing of all this, St. Catherine sent the fiery pontiff a warning. Do what you have to do with moderation, with goodwill and a peaceful heart for excess destroys rather than builds up. For the sake of the crucified Lord, keep these hasty movements of your nature a little in check. Urban, heedless, announced his intention to appoint enough Italian cardinals to give Italy a majority in the college. The French cardinals gathered in Anagni and planned a revolt. On August 9, 1378, they issued a manifesto declaring Urban's election invalid as having been made under duress of the Roman mob. All the Italian cardinals joined them, and at Fondi on September 20th, the entire college proclaimed Robert of Geneva to be the true pope. Robert, as Clement VII, took up his residence at Avignon, while Urban clung to his pontifical office in Rome. The papal schism so inaugurated was one more result of the rising national state. In effect, it was an attempt by France to retain the vital aid of the papacy in her war with England and in any future contest with Germany or Italy. The lead of France was followed by Naples, Spain, and Scotland. But England, Flanders, Germany, Poland, Bohemia, Hungary, and Portugal accepted Urban, and the church became the political plaything of the rival camps. The confusion reached a pitch that aroused the scornful laughter of expanding Islam. Half the Christian world held the other half to be heretical, blasphemous, and excommunicate. St. Catherine denounced Clement VII as a Judas, St. Vincent Ferrer applied the same term to Urban VI. Each side claimed that sacraments administered by priests of the opposite obedience were invalid, and that the children so baptized, the penitents so shriven, the dying so anointed, remained in a state of mortal sin, doomed to hell or limbo if death should supervene. Mutual hatred rose to a fervor equaled only in the bitterest wars. When many of Urban's newly appointed cardinals— plotted to place him in confinement as a dangerous incompetent, he had seven of them arrested, tortured, and put to death in 1385. His own death in 1389 brought no compromise. The fourteen cardinals surviving in his camp made Piero Tomacelli Pope Boniface IX, and the divided nations prolonged the divided papacy. When Clement VII died in 1394, the cardinals at Avignon named Pedro de Luna to be Benedict the Thirteenth. Charles the Sixth of France proposed that both popes should resign. Benedict refused. 
In 1399, Boniface IX proclaimed a jubilee for the following year. Realizing that many potential pilgrims would be kept at home by the chaos and insecurity of the times, he empowered his agents to give the full indulgence of the jubilee to any Christian who, having confessed his sins and done due penance, should contribute to the Roman church the sum that a trip to Rome would have cost him. The collectors were not scrupulous theologians. Many of them offered the indulgence without requiring confession. Boniface reproved them, but he felt that no one could make better use than he of money so secured. Even amid the acute pains of the stone, said his secretary, Boniface did not cease to thirst for gold. When some collectors tried to cheat him, he had them tortured till they disgorged. Other collectors were torn to pieces by the Roman mob for letting Christians get the jubilee indulgence without coming to spend money in Rome. Amid the jubilee celebrations and solemnities, the Colonna family aroused the people to demand the restoration of republican government. When Boniface refused, the Colonna led an army of 8,000 against him. The aging pope stood siege resolutely in Sant'Angelo. The people turned against the Colonna, the rebel army dispersed, and 31 leaders of the revolt were jailed. One of them was promised his life if he would serve as executioner of the rest. He consented and hanged thirty men, including his father and his brother. On the death of Boniface and the election of Innocent VII in 1404, revolt broke out again, and Innocent fled to Viterbo. The Roman mob, led by Giovanni Colonna, sacked the Vatican, smeared the emblems of Innocent with mud, and scattered papal registers and historic bulls through the streets. This in 1405. Then the people, bethinking themselves that Rome without the popes would be ruined, made their peace with Innocent, who returned in triumph and, a few days later, died in 1406. His successor, Gregory XII, invited Benedict XIII to a conference. Benedict offered to resign if Gregory would do likewise. Gregory's relatives dissuaded him from consent. Some of his cardinals withdrew to Pisa and called for a general council to elect a pope acceptable to all Christendom. The king of France again urged Benedict to resign. When Benedict again refused, France renounced its allegiance and adopted an attitude of neutrality. Deserted by his cardinals, Benedict fled to Spain. His cardinals joined with those who had left Gregory, and together they issued a call for a council to be held at Pisa on March 25, 1409. 2. The Councils and the Popes, 1409-1418 Rebellious philosophers almost a century before had laid the foundations of the con conciliar movement. William of Ockham protested against identifying the church with the clergy. The church, he said, is the congregation of all the faithful. That whole has authority superior to any part. It may delegate its authority to a general council, which should have the power to elect, reprove, punish, or depose the pope. A general council, said Marsilius of Padua, is the gathered intelligence of Christendom. How shall any one man dare set up his own intelligence above it? Such a council should be composed not only of clergy, but also of laymen elected by the people, and its deliberations should be free from domination by the Pope. Heinrich von Langenstein, a German theologian at the University of Paris, in a tract, Concilium Pacis, in 1381, applied these ideas to the papal schism. Whatever logic there might be, said Heinrich, in the arguments of the popes for their supreme God-derived authority, a crisis had arisen from which logic offered no escape. Only a power outside the popes and superior to the cardinals could rescue the church from the chaos that was crippling her. And that authority could only be a general council. Jean Gerson, chancellor of the University of Paris, in a sermon preached at Tarascon before Benedict XIII himself, reason that since the exclusive power of the Pope to call a general council had failed to end the schism, that rule must be abrogated for the emergency, and a general council must be otherwise summoned and must assume the authority to end the crisis. The Council of Pisa met as scheduled. In the majestic cathedral gathered twenty-six cardinals, four patriarchs, twelve archbishops, eighty bishops, eighty-seven abbots, the generals of all the great monastic orders, delegates from all major universities, 300 doctors of canon law, ambassadors from all the governments of Europe except those of Hungary, Naples, Spain, Scandinavia, and Scotland. The council declared itself canonical, valid in church law, and ecumenical, representing the whole Christian world. 
a claim which ignored the Greek and Russian Orthodox Church. It summoned Benedict and Gregory to appear before it. Neither appearing, it declared them deposed and named the Cardinal of Milan as Pope Alexander V in 1409. It instructed the new Pope to call another general council before May 1412 and adjourned. It had hoped to end the schism, but as both Benedict and Gregory refused to recognize its authority, the result was that there were now three popes instead of two. Alexander V did not help matters by dying in 1410. His cardinals chose as his successor John XXIII, the most unmanageable man to occupy the papal throne since his predecessor of that name. Baldassare Cosa had been made papal vicar of Bologna by Boniface IX. He had governed the city like a condottieri, with absolute and unscrupulous power. He had taxed everything, including prostitution, gambling, and usury. According to his secretary, he had seduced two hundred virgins, matrons, widows, and nuns. But he was a man of precious ability in politics and war. He had accumulated great wealth and commanded a force of troops personally loyal to him. Perhaps he could conquer the papal states for Gregory and reduce Gregory to impecunious submission. John the Twenty-Third delayed as long as he could to call the council decreed at Pisa. But in 1411 Sigismund became head of the Romans, and the uncrowned but generally acknowledged head of the Holy Roman Empire. He compelled John to call a council, and chose Constance for its seat as free from Italian intimidation and open to imperial influence. Taking the initiative from the church like another Constantine, Sigismund invited all prelates, princes, lords, and doctors in Christendom to attend. Everybody in Europe responded except the three popes and their retinues. So many dignitaries came at their own dignified leisure that half a year was spent in assembling them. When finally John the Twenty-Third consented to open the council on November 5, 1414, only a fraction had arrived of the three patriarchs, twenty-nine cardinals, thirty-three archbishops, one hundred and fifty bishops, one hundred abbots, three hundred doctors of theology, fourteen thousand deputies, twenty-six princes, one hundred and forty nobles, and four thousand priests who were to make the completed council the largest in Christian history and the most important since the Council of Nicaea in 325 had established the creed of the Church. Where normally Constance had sheltered some six thousand inhabitants, it now successfully housed and fed not only some five thousand delegates to the council, but to attend to their wants a host of servants, secretaries, peddlers, physicians, quacks, minstrels, and... 1,500 prostitutes. The council had hardly formulated its procedure when it was faced with the dramatic desertion of the Pope who had convened it. John the Twenty-Third was shocked to learn that his enemies were preparing to present to the assembly a record of his life, crimes, and incontinence. A committee advised him that this ignominy could be averted if he would agree to join Gregory and Benedict in a simultaneous abdication. He agreed but suddenly he fled from Constance disguised as a groom on March 20th, 1415, and found refuge in a castle at Schaffhausen with Frederick, Archduke of Austria, and foe to Sigismund. On March the 29th he announced that all the promises made by him in Constance had been drawn from him through fear of violence and could have no binding force. On April 6th the council issued a decree, Sacra Sancta, which one historian has called the most revolutionary official document in the history of the world. This holy synod of Constance, being a general council and legally assembled in the Holy Spirit for the praise of God and for ending the present schism, and for the union and reform of the Church of God in its head and its members, ordains, declares, and decrees as follows. First, it declares that this synod represents the Church militant and has its authority directly from Christ, and everybody of whatever rank or dignity, including also the Pope, is bound to obey this council in those things that pertain to the faith, to the ending of this schism, and to a general reform of the Church in its head and members. Likewise, it declares that if anyone, of whatever rank, condition, or dignity, including also the Pope, shall refuse to obey the commands, statutes, ordinances, or orders of this holy council, or of any other holy council properly assembled, in regard to the ending of the schism or to the reform of the Church, he shall be subject to proper punishment." and, if necessary, recourse shall be had to other aids of justice. Many cardinals protested against this decree, fearing that it would end the power of the College of Cardinals to elect the Pope. The Council overrode their opposition, and thereafter they played but a minor role in its activities. 
The council now sent a committee to John XXIII to ask for his abdication. Receiving no definite answer, it accepted, on May 25th, the presentation of 54 charges against him as a pagan, an oppressor, a liar, a simoniac, a traitor, a lecher, and a thief. Sixteen other accusations were suppressed as too severe. On May 29th, the council deposed John XXIII, and broken at last, he accepted the decree. Sigismund ordered him confined in the castle of Heidelberg for the duration of the council. He was released in 1418, and found asylum and sustenance as an old man with Cosimo de' Medici. The council celebrated its triumph with a parade through Constance. When it returned to business, it found itself in a quandary. If it should choose another pope, it would be restoring the threefold division of Christendom, for many districts still obeyed Benedict or Gregory. Gregory rescued the council by an act at once subtle and magnanimous. He agreed to resign, but only on condition that he should be allowed to reconvene and legitimate the council by his own papal authority. On July 4, 1415, the council, so reconvened, accepted Gregory's resignation, confirmed the validity of his appointments, and named him legate governor of Ancona, where he lived quietly the two remaining years of his life. Benedict continued to resist, but his cardinals left him and made their peace with the council. On January 26, 1417, the council deposed him. He retired to his family stronghold near Valencia and died there at ninety, still counting himself pope. In October, the council passed a decree, frequence, requiring that another general council should be convened within five years. On November 17th, an electoral committee of the council chose Cardinal Odone Colonna as Pope Martin V. All Christendom accepted him, and after 39 years of chaos, the Great Schism came to an end. The council had now accomplished its first purpose, but its victory on this point defeated its other purpose, to reform the Church. When Martin V found himself Pope, he assumed all the powers and prerogatives of the papacy. He displaced Sigismund as president of the council, and with courteous and subtle address negotiated with each national group in the council a separate treaty of ecclesiastical reform. By playing off each group against the others, he persuaded each to accept a minimum of reform, couched in carefully obscure language which each party might interpret to save its emoluments and its face. The council yielded to him because it was tired. It had labored for three years, it longed for home, and felt that a later synod could take up in sharper detail the problem of reform. On April 22, 1418, it declared itself dissolved. 3. The Triumph of the Papacy, 1418-1447 Martin V, though himself a Roman, could not go at once to Rome. The roads were held by the condottiere Braccio de Montone. Martin thought it safer to stay in Geneva, then Mantua, then Florence. When at last he reached Rome in 1420, he was shocked by the condition of the city, by the dilapidation of the buildings and the people. The capital of Christendom was one of the least civilized cities in Europe. If Martin continued a characteristic abuse by appointing his Colonna relatives to places of income and power, it may be because he had to strengthen his family in order to have some physical security in the Vatican. He had no army, but upon the papal states from every side pressed the armed forces of Naples, Florence, Venice, and Milan. The papal states, for the most part, had again fallen into the hands of petty dictators who, though they called themselves vicars of the Pope, had assumed practically sovereign powers during the division of the papacy. In Lombardy, the clergy had for centuries been hostile to the bishops of Rome. Beyond the Alps lay a disordered Christendom that had lost most of its respect for the papacy and grudged it financial support. Martin faced these difficulties with courage and success. Although he had inherited an almost empty treasury, he allotted funds for the partial rebuilding of his capital. His energetic measures drove the brigands from the roads and Rome. He destroyed a robber stronghold at Montelipo and had its leaders beheaded. He restored order in Rome and codified its communal law. He appointed one of the early humanists, Poggio Bracciolini, to be a papal secretary. He engaged Gentile da Fabriano, Antonio Pisanello, and Masaccio to paint frescoes in Santa Maria Maggiore and St. John in the Lateran. He named men of intellect and character, like Giuliano Cesarini, Louis Alamon, Domenico Capranica, and Prospero Colonna to the College of Cardinals. 
He reorganized the Curia to effective functioning, but found no way to finance it except by selling offices and services. Since the church had survived for a century without reform, but could hardly survive a week without money, Martin judged money to be more urgently needed than reform. Pursuant to the Frequent's decree of Constance, he called a council to meet at Pavia in 1423. It was sparsely attended. Plague compelled its transference to Siena. When it proposed to assume absolute authority, Martin ordered it to dissolve, and the bishops, fearing for their sees, obeyed. To soothe the spirit of reform, Martin issued in 1425 a bull detailing some admirable changes in the procedure and financing of the Curia. But a thousand obstacles and objections arose, and the proposals faded in the quick oblivion of time. In 1430, a German envoy to Rome sent to his prince a letter that almost sounded the tocsin of the Reformation. Greed reigns supreme in the Roman court, and day by day finds new devices for extorting money from Germany under pretext of ecclesiastical fees. Hence much outcry and heartburnings. Also many questions in regard to the papacy will arise, or else obedience will at last be entirely renounced, to escape from these outrageous exactions of the Italians. And this latter course, as I perceive, will be acceptable to many countries. Martin's successor faced the accumulated problems of the papacy from the background of a devout Franciscan monk, ill-equipped for statesmanship. The papacy was a government more than a religion. The popes had to be statesmen, sometimes warriors, and could rarely afford to be saints. Eugenius IV was sometimes a saint. True, he was obstinate and dourly inflexible, and the gout that gave him almost constant pain in his hands helped his sea of troubles to make him impatient and unsociable. But he lived ascetically, ate sparingly, drank nothing but water, slept little, worked hard, attended conscientiously to his religious duties, bore no malice against his enemies, pardoned readily, gave generously, kept nothing for himself, and was so modest that in public he seldom raised his eyes from the ground. Yet few popes have earned so many foes. The first were the cardinals who had elected him. As the price of their votes, and to protect themselves from such one-man rule as that of Martin, they had induced him to sign capitula, literally headings, promising them freedom of speech, guarantees for their offices, control over half the revenues, and consultation with them on all important affairs. Such capitulations set a precedent regularly followed in papal elections throughout the Renaissance. Furthermore, Eugenius made powerful enemies of the Colonna. Believing that Martin had transferred too much church property to that family, he ordered restoration of many parcels, and had Martin's former secretary tortured almost to death to elicit information in the matter. The Colonna made war upon the Pope. He defeated them with soldiery sent him by Florence and Venice, but in the process he aroused the hostility of Rome. Meanwhile, the Council of Basel, called by Martin, met in the first year, 1431, of the new pontificate, and proposed again to assert the supremacy of the councils over the popes. Eugenius ordered it to dissolve. It refused, commanded him to appear before it, and sent Milanese troops to attack him in Rome. The Colonna seized the chance for revenge. They organized a revolution in the city and set up a republican government, this in 1434. Eugenius fled down the Tiber in a small boat pelted by the populace with arrows, pikes, and stones. He found refuge in Florence, then in Bologna. For nine years he and the Curia were exiles from Rome. The majority of the delegates to the Council of Basel were French. They aimed, as the Bishop of Tours frankly said, either to wrestle the apostolic see from the Italians, or so to despoil it that it will not matter where it abides. The Council therefore assumed one after another the prerogatives of the papacy. It issued indulgences, granted dispensations, appointed to benefices, and required that annats should be paid to itself and not to the Pope. Eugenius again ordered its dissolution. It countered by deposing him in 1439, and naming Amadeus VIII of Savoy as anti-Pope Felix V. The schism was renewed. To complete the apparent defeat of Eugenius, Charles VII of France convened at Bourges in 1438 an assembly of French prelates, princes, and lawyers, which proclaimed the supremacy of councils over popes and issued the pragmatic sanction of Bourges. Ecclesiastical offices were henceforth to be filled through election by the local chapter or clergy, but the king might make recommendations. 
Appeals to the papal curia were forbidden except after exhausting all judicial possibilities in France. The collection of annats by the Pope was prohibited. This sanction in effect established an independent Gallican church and made the king its master. A year later, a diet at Mainz adopted measures for a similar national church in Germany. The Bohemian church had separated itself from the papacy in the Hussite revolt. The Archbishop of Prague called the Pope the Beast of the Apocalypse. The whole edifice of the Roman Church seemed shattered beyond repair. The nationalistic reformation seemed established a century before Luther. Eugenius was rescued by the Turks. As the Ottomans came ever nearer to Constantinople, the Byzantines decided that Constantinople was worth a Roman mass and that a reunion of Greek with Roman Christianity was an indispensable prelude to securing military aid from the West. The Emperor John VIII sent an embassy to Martin V in 1431 to propose a council of both churches. The Council of Basel dispatched envoys to John in 1433, explaining that the council was superior in power to the Pope, was under the protection of the Emperor Sigismund, and would procure money and troops for the defense of Constantinople if the Greek church would deal with the council rather than with the Pope. Eugenius sent his own embassy, offering aid on condition that the proposal of union should be laid before a new council to be called by him at Ferrara. John decided for Eugenius. The Pope summoned to Ferrara such of the hierarchy as were still loyal to him. Many leading prelates, including Cesarini and Nicholas of Cusa, abandoned Basel for Ferrara, feeling that the matter of prime importance was the negotiation with the Greeks. The council at Basel lingered on, but with mounting exasperation, and declining prestige. The news that Christendom, divided between the Greek and the Roman churches since 1054, was now to be united, stirred all Europe. On February 8, 1438, the Byzantine emperor, the patriarch Joseph of Constantinople, 17 Greek metropolitans and a large number of Greek bishops, monks, and scholars, arrived at Venice, still partly a Byzantine city. At Ferrara, Eugenius received them with a pomp that must have meant little to the ceremonious Greeks. After the opening of the council, various commissions were appointed to reconcile the divergences of the two churches on the primacy of the Pope, the use of unleavened bread, the nature of the pains of purgatory, and the procession of the Holy Ghost from the Father and or the Son. For eight months, the pundits argued these points but could come to no agreement. Meanwhile, plague broke out in Ferrara. Cosimo de' Medici invited the council to move to Florence and be housed at the expense of himself and his friends. It was so ordered, and some would date the Italian Renaissance from that influx of learned Greeks into Florence in 1439. There it was agreed that the formula acceptable to the Greeks, that the Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father through the Son, ex patre per filium procedit, meant the same as the Roman formula, proceeds from the Father and the Son ex patre filioque procedit, and by June 1439 an accord was reached on purgatorial pains. The primacy of the Pope led to hot debates, and the Greek emperor threatened to break up the council. The conciliatory archbishop Bessarion of Nicaea contrived a promise that recognized the universal authority of the Pope, but reserved all the existing rights and privileges of the Eastern churches. The formula was accepted, and on July 6th, 1439, in the great cathedral that only three years before had received from Brunellesco its majestic dome, the decree uniting the two churches was read in Greek by Bessarion and in Latin by Cesarini. The two prelates kissed, and all the members of the council, with the Greek emperor at their head, bent the knee before that same Eugenius who had seemed so recently the despised and rejected of men. The joy of Christendom was brief. When the Greek emperor and his suite returned to Constantinople, they were met with insults and ribaldry. The clergy and population of the city repudiated the submission to Rome. Eugenius kept his part of the bargain. Cardinal Cesarini was sent to Hungary at the head of an army to join the forces of Ladislas and Hunyadi. They were victorious at Nish, entered Sofia in triumph on Christmas Eve of 1443, and were routed at Varna by Murad II in 1444. The anti-Union party in Constantinople won the upper hand, and the patriarch Gregory, who had supported Union, fled to Italy. Gregory fought his way back to St. Sophia and read the decree of Union there in 1452. But from that time the great church was shunned by the people. The anti-Union clergy anathematized all adherents of Union, 
refused absolution to those who had attended the reading of the decree, and exhorted the sick to die without the sacraments rather than receive them from an uniate priest. The patriarchs of Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem repudiated the robber synod of Florence. Mohammed II simplified the situation by making Constantinople a Turkish capital in 1453. He gave the Christians full freedom of worship and appointed as patriarch Gennadius, a devoted foe of unity. Eugenius returned to Rome in 1443 after his legate general, Cardinal Vitileschi, had suppressed the chaotic republic and the turbulent Colonna with a ferocity unequaled by the Vandals or the Goths. The Pope's stay at Florence had acquainted him with the developments of humanism and art under Cosimo de' Medici, and the Greek scholars who had attended the Council of Ferrara and Florence had aroused in him an interest in the preservation of the classic manuscripts that the imminent fall of Constantinople might forfeit or destroy. He added to his secretariat Poggio, Flavio Biondo, Leonardo Bruni, and other humanists who could negotiate with the Greeks in Greek. He brought Fra Angelico to Rome and had him paint frescoes in the chapel of the sacrament at the Vatican. Having admired the bronze gates that Ghiberti had cast for the Florentine baptistry, Eugenius commissioned Filarete to make similar doors for the old church of St. Peter in 1433. It was significant, though already it aroused hardly any comment, that the sculptor placed upon the portals of the chief church in Latin Christendom not only Christ and Mary and the Apostles, but Mars and Roma, Hero and Leander, Jupiter and Ganymede, even Leda and the Swan. In the hour of his victory over the Council of Basel, Eugenius brought the pagan Renaissance to Rome. Chapter 15. The Renaissance Captures Rome, 1447-1492 1. The Capital of the World When Pope Nicholas V mounted the oldest throne in the world, Rome was hardly a tenth of the Rome that had been enclosed by the walls of Aurelian, A.D. 270-275, and was smaller in area and population, 80,000, than Venice, Florence, or Milan. Since the ruin of the major aqueducts by the barbarian invasions, the Seven Hills had been without a reliable water supply. Some minor aqueducts remained, some springs, many cisterns and wells, but a large proportion of the inhabitants drank the water of the Tiber. Most of the people lived in the unhealthy plains, subject to inundation from the river and to malarial infection from the neighboring swamps. The Capitoline Hill was now called Monte Caprino, from the goats or Capri, that nibbled its slopes. The Palatine Hill was a rural retreat, almost uninhabited. The ancient palaces from which it derived its name were dusty quarries. The Borgo Vaticano, or Vatican Town, was a small suburb across the river from the central city, and huddled about the decaying shrine of St. Peter. Some churches, like Santa Maria Maggiore or Santa Cecilia, were beautiful within, but plain without and no church in Rome could compare with the Duomo of Florence or Milan. No monastery could rival the Certosa di Pavia. No town hall rose to the dignity of the Palazzo Vecchio, or the Castello Sforzesco, or the Palace of the Doges, or even the Palazzo Publico of Siena. Nearly all the streets were muddy or dusty alleys. Some were paved with cobblestones. Only a few were lit at night. They were swept only on extraordinary occasions, like a jubilee, or the formal entry of some very important person. The economic support of the city came partly from pasturage and the production of wool and the cattle that grazed in the environing fields, but chiefly from the revenues of the church. There was little agriculture and only petty trade. Industry and commerce had well-nigh disappeared through lack of protection from brigand raids. There was almost no middle class, only nobles, ecclesiastics, and commoners. The nobles who owned nearly all the land that had not fallen to the church, exploited their peasantry without Christian compunction or hindrance. They suppressed revolt and waged their feuds with bravi, strong-armed ruffians kept in their employ and trained to beat or kill. The great families, above all the Colonna and the Orsini, seized tombs, baths, theaters, and other structures in or near Rome and turned them into private fortresses, and their rural castles were designed for war. The nobles were usually hostile to the popes, or strove to name and govern them. Time and again they created such disorder that the popes fled. Pius II prayed that any other city might be his capital. When Sixtus IV and Alexander VI warred against such men, 
it was in a forgivable effort to win some security for the papal see. Normally, the ecclesiastics ruled Rome, for they had the church's varied revenue to spend. The inhabitants were dependent upon that influx of gold from a dozen countries, upon the employment it enabled churchmen to provide, and upon the charity that it allowed the popes to dispense. The people of Rome could not be enthusiastic about any reform of the church that would lessen that golden flow. Precluded from rebellion, they substituted for it a sharpness of satire unequaled elsewhere in Europe. A statue in the Piazza Navona, probably a Hellenistic Hercules, was renamed Foschino, perhaps from a nearby tailor, and became the bulletin board of the latest squibs, usually in the form of Latin or Italian epigrams, and often against the reigning pope. The Romans were religious, at least on occasion. They crowded to receive the papal blessing, and were proud to imitate ambassadors by kissing the papal feet. But when Sixtus IV, suffering from gout, failed to appear for a scheduled benediction, they cursed him with Roman virulence. Moreover, since Eugenius IV had abrogated the Roman Republic, the popes were the secular rulers of Rome, and received the contumely usually awarded to governments. It was the misfortune of the papacy to be seated amid the most lawless population in Italy. The popes felt themselves thoroughly justified in claiming a degree and area of temporal power. As the heads of an international organization, they could not afford to be the captives of any one state, as they had been in effect in Avignon. So trammeled, they could hardly serve all peoples impartially, much less realize their majestic dream of being the spiritual governors of every government. Though the donation of Constantine was a palpable forgery, as Nicholas admitted by hiring Vala, the donation of central Italy to the papacy by Pepin in 755, confirmed by Charlemagne in 773, was an historical fact. The popes had coined their own money at least as far back as 782, and for centuries no one had questioned their right. The unification of local powers, feudal or martial, in a central government was taking place in the papal states as in the other nations of Europe. If the popes from Nicholas V to Clement VII ruled their states as absolute monarchs, they were following the fashion of the times, and they could with reason complain when reformers like Chancellor Gerson of the University of Paris proposed democracy in the church, but deprecated it in the state. Neither state nor church was ready for democracy at a time when printing had not yet begun or spread. Nicholas V became pope seven years before Gutenberg printed his Bible, thirty years before printing reached Rome, forty-eight years before the first publication of Aldus Minucius. Democracy is a luxury of disseminated intelligence, security, and peace. The secular rule of the popes directly applied to what antiquity had called Latium, now Lazio, a small province lying between Tuscany, Umbria, the Kingdom of Naples, and the Tyrrhenian Sea. Beyond this, they claimed also Umbria, the Marches, and the Romagna, the ancient Romania. These four regions together made a broad belt across central Italy from sea to sea. They contained some twenty-six cities, which the popes, when they could, ruled by vicars, or divided among provincial governors. Furthermore, Sicily and the whole kingdom of Naples were claimed as papal fiefs on the basis of an agreement between Pope Innocent III and Frederick II. And the payment of an annual feudal fee by these states to the papacy became a major source of quarrels between the Regno and the popes. Finally, the Countess Matilda had bequeathed to the popes in 1107 as her feudal domain practically all of Tuscany, including Florence, Lucca, Pistoia, Pisa, Siena, and Arezzo. Over all these, the popes claimed the rights of a feudal sovereign, but rarely were able to give effect to their claim. Harassed by internal corruption, military and fiscal incompetence, and the confusion of European with Italian politics, and of ecclesiastical with secular affairs, the papacy struggled through centuries to preserve its traditional territories from internal usurpation by condottieri and from external encroachment by other Italian states. So Milan repeatedly tried to appropriate Bologna, Venice seized Ravenna and sought to absorb Ferrara, and Naples stretched tentative tentacles into Latium. To meet these attacks, the popes seldom depended on their little army of mercenaries, but played the covetous states one against another in a balance of power policy, striving to keep any one of them from growing strong enough to swallow papal terrain. 
Machiavelli and Guicciardini rightly traced the disunion of Italy in part to this policy of the popes. And the popes rightly pursued it as their only means of sustaining their political and spiritual independence through their temporal power. As political rulers, the popes felt compelled to adopt the same methods as their secular compeers. They distributed, sometimes they sold, offices or benefices to influential persons, even to minors, to pay political debts, or to advance political purposes, or to reward or support men of letters or artists. They arranged marriages for their relatives into politically powerful families. They used armies like Julius II, or the diplomacy of deceit like Leo X. They put up with, sometimes profited from, a degree of bureaucratic venality probably no greater than that which prevailed in most governments of the time. The laws of the papal states were as severe as those of others. Thieves and counterfeiters were hanged by papal vicars as a more or less bitter necessity of government. Most of the popes lived as simply as the supposedly requisite display of official ceremony would permit. The worst tales we read of them were legends set afloat by irresponsible satirists like Berni, or disappointed place hunters like Aretino, or the Roman agents, for example, in Fesura, of powers in violent or diplomatic conflict with the papacy. As for the cardinals who administered the ecclesiastical and political affairs of the Church, they thought of themselves as senators of a wealthy state, and lived accordingly. Many of them built palaces, many patronized letters or arts, some indulged themselves with mistresses. They genially accepted the easy moral code of their reckless time. As a spiritual power, the Renaissance popes faced the problem of reconciling humanism with Christianity. Humanism was half pagan, and the Church had once set herself to destroy paganism root and branch, creed and art. She had encouraged or countenanced the demolition of pagan temples and statuary. The Cathedral of Orvieto, for example, had only recently been built with marbles taken partly from Carrara, partly from Roman ruins. A papal legate had sold marble blocks from the Colosseum to be burned for lime. As late as 1461, the Palazzo Venezia had been begun with further spoliation of that Flavian amphitheater. Nicholas himself, in his architectural enthusiasm, used 2,500 cartloads of marble and travertine from the Colosseum, the Circus Maximus, and other ancient structures to rebuild the churches and palaces of Rome. To reverse that attitude, to preserve and collect and cherish the remaining art and classics of Rome and Greece, required a revolution in ecclesiastical thought. The prestige of humanism was already so high, the impetus of the neo-pagan movement was so strong, her own leaders were so deeply tinged with it, that the Church had to find place for these developments in the Christian life, or risk losing the intellectual classes of Italy, perhaps later of Europe. Under Nicholas V, she opened her arms to humanism, placed herself bravely and generously on the side, at the head, of the new literature and art. And for an exhilarating century, from 1447 to 1534, she gave to the mind of Italy such ample freedom, incredibilis libertas, said Filelfo, and to the art of Italy such discriminating patronage, opportunity, and stimulus, that Rome became the center of the Renaissance and enjoyed one of the most brilliant epochs in the history of mankind. 2. Nicholas V, 1447-1455 to 1455. Raised in poverty at Sarzana, Tommaso Parentuccelli somehow found means to attend the University of Bologna for six years. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 5, The Renaissance, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 1, Side 2. Raised in poverty at Sarzana, Tommaso Parentuccelli somehow found means to attend the University of Bologna for six years. When his funds ran out, he went to Florence and served as tutor in the homes of Rinaldo degli Albizzi and Palla di Strozzi. His purse replenished, he returned to Bologna, continued his studies, and received at twenty-two the doctorate in theology. Niccolò degli Albergati, Archbishop of Bologna, made him controller of the archiepiscopal household and took him to Florence to attend Eugenius IV in the Pope's long exile there. In these Florentine years, the priest became a humanist without ceasing to be a Christian. He developed a warm friendship with Bruni, Marzupini, Manetti, Arispa, 
and Poggio, and joined their literary gatherings. Soon, Thomas of Sarzana, as the humanists called him, was aflame with their passion for classical antiquity. He spent almost all his income on books, borrowed money to buy costly manuscripts, and expressed the hope that some day his funds would suffice to gather into one library all the great books in the world. In that ambition, the Vatican Library had its origin. Cosimo engaged him to catalog the Martian Library, and Tommaso was happy among the manuscripts. He could hardly know that he was preparing himself to be the first Renaissance Pope. For twenty years he served Albergati in Florence and Bologna. When the bishop died in 1443, Eugenius appointed Parentucelli to succeed him. And three years later the Pope, impressed by his learning, his piety, and his administrative ability, made him a cardinal. Another year passed. Eugenius passed away, and the cardinals, deadlocked between the Orsini and Colonna factions, raised Parentucelli to the papacy. Who would have thought, he exclaimed to Vespasiano da Bistici, that a poor bell-ringer of a priest would be made pope to the confusion of the proud? The humanists of Italy rejoiced, and one of them, Francesco Barbaro, proclaimed that Plato's vision had come true. A philosopher had become king. Nicholas V, as he now called himself, had three aims, to be a good pope, to rebuild Rome, and to restore classical literature, learning, and art. He conducted his high office with modesty and competence, gave audience at almost any hour of the day, and managed to get along amicably with both Germany and France. The anti-pope Felix V, realizing that Nicholas would soon win all Latin Christendom to his allegiance, resigned his pretensions and was gracefully forgiving. The rebellious but disintegrating Council of Basel moved to Lausanne and dissolved in 1449. The conciliar movement was ended, the papal schism was healed. Demands for reform of the Church still came from beyond the Alps. Nicholas felt incapable of achieving that reform in the face of all the office holders who would lose by it. Instead, he hoped that the Church would regain, as the leader in the revival of learning, the prestige that she had lost at Avignon and in the schism. Not that his support of scholarship was motivated by political ends. It was a sincere, almost an amorous passion. He had made arduous trips over the Alps in search of manuscripts. It was he who had unearthed at Basel the works of Tertullian. Now, dowered with the revenues of the papacy, he sent agents to Athens, Constantinople, and divers cities in Germany and England to seek and buy or copy Greek or Latin manuscripts, pagan or Christian. He installed a large corps of copyists and editors in the Vatican. He called almost every prominent humanist in Italy to Rome. All the scholars in the world, wrote Vespasiano, in fond exaggeration, came to Rome in the time of Pope Nicholas, partly of their own accord, partly at his request. He rewarded their work with the liberality of a caliph thrilled by music or poetry. The subdued Lorenzo Valla received five hundred ducats, or about twelve thousand five hundred dollars, for putting Thucydides into Latin dress. Guarino da Verona received fifteen hundred ducats for translating Strabo. Niccolò Perotti, five hundred for Polybius. Poggio was put to translating Diodorus Siculus. Theodorus Gaza was lured from Ferrara to make a new translation of Aristotle. Pilelfo was offered a house in Rome, an estate in the country, and ten thousand ducats to render into Latin the Iliad and the Odyssey. The Pope's death, however, prevented the execution of this Homeric enterprise. These rewards were so great that some scholars, mirabile dictu, hesitated to accept them. The Pope overcame their scruples by playfully warning them, Don't refuse. You may not find another Nicholas. When an epidemic drove him from Rome to Fabriano, he took his translators and copyists with him, lest any of them should succumb to the plague. Meanwhile, he did not neglect what might be called the Christian classics. He offered five thousand ducats to anyone who would bring him the Gospel of St. Matthew in the original tongue. He engaged Genozzo Manetti and George of Trebizond to translate Cyril, Basil, Gregory Nazianzen, Gregory of Nyssa, and other patrological literature. He commissioned Manetti and aides to make a new version of the Bible from the original Hebrew and Greek. This, too, was frustrated by his death. These Latin translations were hurried and imperfect, 
that they for the first time opened Herodotus, Thucydides, Xenophon, Polybius, Diodorus, Appian, Philo, and Theophrastus to students who could not read Greek. Referring to these translations, Philelpho wrote, Greece has not perished, but has migrated to Italy, which in former days was called Greater Greece. Manetti, with greater gratitude than accuracy, calculated that more Greek authors were translated during the eight years of Nicholas's pontificate than in all the preceding five centuries. Nicholas loved the appearance and form as well as the contents of books. Himself, a calligraphist, he had his translations written carefully upon parchment by expert scribes. The leaves were bound in crimson velvet, secured by silver clasps. As the number of his books mounted, finally to 824 Latin and 352 Greek manuscripts, and these were added to previous papal collections, the problem arose of housing the 5,000 volumes, the largest store of books in Christendom, in such a way that their complete transmission to posterity might be assured. The construction of a Vatican library was one of Nicholas's dearest dreams. He was a builder as well as a scholar, and from the outset of his pontificate he had resolved to make Rome worthy of leading the world. A jubilee year was at hand in 1450. A hundred thousand visitors were expected. They must not find Rome a shabby ruin. The prestige of the church and the papacy required that the citadel of Christianity should confront pilgrims with noble edifices combining taste and beauty with noble proportions, which would immensely conduce to the exaltation of the chair of St. Peter. So Nicholas, on his deathbed, apologetically explained his aim. He restored the walls and gates of the city, repaired the Aqua Vergine aqueduct, and had an artist construct an ornamental fountain at its mouth. He engaged Leon Battista Alberti to design palaces, public squares, and spacious avenues shielded from sun and rain by arcaded porticos. He had many streets paved, many bridges renewed, the Castle of Sant'Angelo repaired. He lent money to prominent citizens to help them build palaces that would be an ornament to Rome. At his bidding, Bernardo Rossellino renovated Santa Maria Maggiore, San Giovanni Laterano, San Paolo and San Lorenzo Fuori le Mura, outside the walls, and the forty churches that Gregory I had designated as Stations of the Cross. He made majestic plans for a new Vatican palace that, with its gardens, would cover all the Vatican Hill and would house the Pope and his staff, the cardinals, and the administrative offices of the Curia. He lived to complete his own chambers, later occupied by Alexander VI and called the Appartamento Borgia, the library, now the Pinacoteca Vaticana, and the rooms or stanze later decorated by Raphael. He brought Benedetto Bonfigli from Perugia and Andrea del Castagno from Florence to paint frescoes, now lost, on the Vatican walls. And he persuaded the aging Fra Angelico to return to Rome and paint in the Pope's own chapel the stories of St. Stephen and St. Lawrence. He planned to tear down the old and crumbling Basilica of St. Peter, and raise over the Apostles' tomb the most imposing church in the world. It was left for Julius II to take up this audacious aim. All this, he hoped, could be financed from the proceeds of the Jubilee. Nicholas announced this as a celebration of the restored peace and unity of the Church, and the sentiment went well with the peoples of Europe. The migration of pilgrims from every quarter of Latin Christendom was of unprecedented magnitude. Eyewitnesses compared it to the movement of myriads of ants. The crowding in Rome was so extreme that the Pope limited to five, then three, then two days, the maximum length of any visitor's stay. On one occasion, two hundred persons were killed in a crush that swept many into the Tiber. Nicholas thereafter tore down houses to widen the approaches to St. Peter's. As the pilgrims brought rich offerings, the financial returns from the Jubilee exceeded even the Pope's expectations— and covered the expense of his new buildings and his outlay for scholars and manuscripts. The other cities of Italy suffered a shortage of money because, a Perugian complained, it all flowed into Rome. But in Rome the innkeepers, money changers, and tradesmen profited hugely, and Nicholas was able to deposit 100,000 florins, or about two and a half million dollars, in the bank of the Medici alone. The countries beyond the Alps rumbled with discontent, at the efflux of gold into Italy. Even in Rome, some disaffection troubled the new prosperity. 
Nicholas's government of the city was enlightened and just from his point of view, and he had made a concession to Republican hopes by nominating four citizens who were to appoint all municipal officials and control all taxes levied in the city. But the senators and nobles whose class had ruled Rome during the Avignon papacy and the schism fretted under the papal government, and the populace resented the transformation of the Vatican into a palace fortress secure against such assaults as had driven Eugenius from Rome. The Republican ideas preached by Arnold of Brescia and Cola di Rienzo still agitated many minds. In the year of Nicholas's accession, a leading burgher, Stefano Porcaro, made a fiery speech demanding the restoration of self-government. Nicholas sent him into comfortable exile as Podesta of Anagni, but Porcaro found his way back to the capital and raised the cry of liberty before an excited carnival crowd. Nicholas banished him to Bologna, but left him full freedom except for the necessity of daily showing himself to the papal legate there. Nevertheless, the undiscourageable Stefano managed, from Bologna, to organize a complicated plot among three hundred of his followers in Rome. On the Feast of the Epiphany, while the Pope and the Cardinals were at Mass in St. Peter's, an attack was to be made on the Vatican, its treasury was to be seized to provide funds for establishing a republic, and Nicholas himself was to be taken prisoner. Porcaro secretly left Bologna on December 26, 1452, and joined the conspirators on the eve of the planned attack. But his absence from Bologna was noted, and a courier brought warning to the Vatican. Stefano was traced, found, and imprisoned, and on January 9th he was beheaded at Sant'Angelo. The Republicans denounced the execution as murder. The humanists condemned the plot as monstrous infidelity to a benevolent pope. Nicholas was shaken and changed by the discovery that a large section of the citizenry looked upon him as a despot, however benevolent. Harrowed with suspicion, embittered by resentment, tortured by gout, he aged rapidly. When news came to him that the Turks had entered Constantinople over the corpses of 50,000 Christians and had turned St. Sophia into a mosque in 1453, all the glory of his pontificate seemed a fitful vanity. He appealed to the European powers to join in a crusade to recapture the fallen citadel of Eastern Christianity. He called for a tenth of all the revenue of Western Europe to finance the effort and pledged a tenth of papal, curial, and other ecclesiastical revenues and all war between Christian nations was to cease on pain of excommunication. Europe hardly listened. People complained that money raised by previous popes for crusades had been used for other purposes. Venice preferred a commercial entente with the Turks. Milan took advantage of Venetian difficulties by retaking Brescia. Florence looked with satisfaction on Venice's loss of eastern trade. Nicholas bowed to reality, and the lust of life cooled in his veins. Worn out with feudal diplomacy and punished for the sins of his predecessors, he died in 1455 at the age of 58. He had restored peace within the church. He had restored order and splendor to Rome. He had founded the greatest of libraries. He had reconciled the church and the Renaissance. He had kept his hands free from war, had avoided nepotism, had struggled to turn Italy from suicidal strife. Amid unprecedented revenues, he himself had led a simple life, loving the church and his books, and extravagant only in his gifts. A grieving chronicler expressed the feeling of Italy when he described the scholar-pope as wise, just, benevolent, gracious, peaceable, affectionate, charitable, humble, endowed with every virtue. It was the verdict of love, and Porcaro might have demurred, but we may let it stand. 3. Calixtus III 1455 to 1458. The disunion of Italy determined the papal election that followed. The factions, unable to agree on an Italian, chose a Spanish cardinal, Alfonso Borgia, who took the name of Calixtus III. He was already seventy-seven. He could be depended upon to die soon and allow the cardinals another and perhaps more profitable choice. A specialist in canon law and diplomacy, he had a legalistic mind and cared little for the classical scholarship that had enamored Nicholas. The humanists, who had no indigenous root in Rome, languished during his pontificate, except that Valla, now quite reformed, was still a papal secretary. Calixtus was a good man who loved his relatives. 
Ten months after his coronation, he raised to the cardinalate two of his nephews, Luis Juan de Mila and Rodrigo Borgia, and Don Jaime of Portugal, respectively twenty-five, twenty-four, and twenty-three years of age. Rodrigo, the future Alexander VI, had the additional handicap of being carelessly candid about his mistresses. However, Calixtus gave him, in 1457, the most lucrative post at the papal court, that of vice-chancellor. In the same year, he made him also commander-in-chief of the papal troops. So began, or grew, the nepotism by which pope after pope gave church offices to his nephews or other relatives, who were sometimes his sons. To the anger of the Italians, Calixtus surrounded himself with men of his own country. Rome was now ruled by Catalans. The Pope had reasons. He was a foreigner in Rome. The nobles and republicans were plotting against him. He wished to have near him men whom he knew, and who could protect him from intrigue while he attended to his prime interest, a crusade. Moreover, the Pope was resolved to have friends in a college of cardinals perpetually struggling to make the papacy a constitutional as well as an elective monarchy, subject in all its decisions to the cardinals as a senate or privy council. The popes opposed and overcame this movement precisely as the kings fought and defeated the nobles. In each case, absolute monarchy won. But perhaps the replacement of a local with a national economy and the growth of international relations in scope and complexity required for the time a centralization of leadership and authority. Calixtus wore out his last energies in a vain attempt to stir Europe to resist the Turks. When he died, Rome celebrated the end of its rule by barbarians. When Cardinal Piccolomini was named his successor, Rome rejoiced as it had not rejoiced over any pope during the last two hundred years. 4. Pius II, 1458-1464 Enea Silvio de Piccolomini began his career in 1405 in the town of Corsignano, near Siena, of poor parents with a noble pedigree. The University of Siena taught him law, it was not to his taste, for he loved literature, but it gave keenness and order to his mind and prepared him for the tasks of administration and diplomacy. At Florence he studied the humanities under Filelfo, and from that time he remained a humanist. At twenty-seven he was engaged as secretary by Cardinal Caprinica, whom he accompanied to the Council of Basel. There he fell in with a group hostile to Eugenius IV. For many years thereafter he defended the conciliar movement against the papal power. For a time he served as secretary to the antipope Felix V. Perceiving that he had hitched his wagon to a falling star, he coaxed a bishop to introduce him to the emperor Frederick III. Soon he received a post in the royal chancery, and in 1442 he accompanied Frederick to Austria. For a while he remained moored. In those formative years he seemed quite formless, merely a clever climber who had no sturdy principles, no goal but success. He passed from cause to cause without losing his heart, and from woman to woman with a gay inconstancy that seemed to him, and to most of his contemporaries, the proper training for the obligations of matrimony. He wrote for a friend a love letter designed to melt the obstinacy of a girl who preferred marriage to fornication. Of his several illegitimate children he sent one to his father, asking him to rear it, and confessing that he was neither holier than David nor wiser than Solomon. The young devil could quote scripture to his purpose. He wrote a novel in the manner of Boccaccio. It was translated into almost every European tongue, and plagued him in the days of his sanctity. Though his further advancement seemed to require taking holy orders, he shrank from the step because, like Augustine, he doubted his capacity for continence. He wrote against the celibacy of the clergy. Amid these infidelities he remained faithful to letters. That same sensitivity to beauty which had corrupted his morals, enamored him of nature, delighted him with travel, and formed his style until he had made himself one of the most engaging writers and eloquent orators of the fifteenth century. He wrote, nearly always in Latin, in nearly every species of composition—fiction, poetry, epigrams, dialogues, essays, histories, travel sketches, geography, commentaries, memoirs, a comedy— and always with a verve and grace that rivaled Petrarch's liveliest prose. He could phrase a state paper, prepare or improvise an address, with persuasive subtlety and captivating fluency. It is characteristic of the age that Aeneas Silvius, beginning almost from nothing, 
raised himself to the papacy on the point of his pen. His verses had no enduring depth or worth, but they were smooth enough to get him the poet's crown from the hand of the complacent Frederick III in 1442. His essays had a light-hearted charm that glossed over their author's lack of conviction or principle. He could pass from a discourse on the miseries of court life, as rivers flow to the sea, so vices flow to courts, to a treatise on the nature and care of horses. It was another sign of the times that at his long letter on education, addressed to King Ladislas of Bohemia but intended for publication, quoted, with one exception, only pagan authors and instances, stressed the glory of humanistic studies, and urged the king to fit his sons for the hardships and responsibilities of war. Serious matters are settled not by laws, but by arms. His travel notes are the best of their kind in Renaissance literature. He described with avid interest not only cities and rural scenes, but industries, products, political conditions, constitutions, manners, and morals. And not since Petrarch had any Italian written so fondly well of the countryside. He was the only Italian in centuries who loved Germany. He had a good word for the boisterous burghers who filled the air with song and themselves with beer, instead of murdering one another in the streets. He called himself Varia Videndi Cupidus, eager to see a variety of things. And one of his frequent sayings was, A miser is never satisfied with his money, nor a wise man with his knowledge. Turning his facile plume to history, he composed short biographies of illustrious contemporaries, De Viris Claris, a life of Frederick III, an account of the Hussite Wars, and an outline of universal history. He planned a larger universal history and geography, continued to work on it during his pontificate, and completed the section on Asia, which Columbus read with interest. As Pope, he composed from day to day commentarii, or memoirs, giving the history of his reign to his final illness. He read and dictated till midnight as he lay in bed, says his contemporary Plotina, nor did he sleep above five or six hours. He apologized for giving papal time to literary composition. Our time has not been taken from our duties. We have given to writing the hours due to sleep. We have robbed our old age of its rest, that we might hand down to posterity all that we know to be memorable. In 1445, the emperor sent Aeneas Silvius as envoy to the pope. He, who had a hundred times written against Eugenius, made his apologies so eloquently that the kindly pontiff readily forgave him, and from that day the soul of Aeneas belonged to Eugenius. He became a priest in 1446, and at forty-one reconciled himself to chastity. Henceforth he lived an exemplary life. He kept Frederick loyal to the papacy, and by skillful, sometimes devious diplomacy, restored the allegiance of the German electors and prelates to the apostolic see. His visits to Rome and Siena reawakened his love of Italy. Gradually he loosened his ties with Frederick and attached himself in 1455 to the papal court. He had always wanted to be back in the excitement and politics of his native land. In Rome he would be at the very center of things. Who could say but in the tumult and shuffle of events he might not become pope? In 1449 he was made bishop of Siena. In 1456 he became Cardinal Piccolomini. When the time came to choose a successor to Calixtus, the Italians in the conclave, to prevent the election of the French cardinal de Tudeville, gave their votes to Piccolomini. The Italian cardinals were resolved to keep the papacy and the sacred college Italian, not only for their personal reasons, but through fear that a non-Italian pope might again disrupt Christendom by favoring his own country or taking the papacy from Italy. No one held against Aeneas the sins of his youth, the merry Cardinal Rodrigo Borgia cast a decisive vote for him. The majority felt that Cardinal Piccolomini, though so recently capped in red, had the qualifications of a man of wide experience, a successful diplomat well posted on troublesome Germany, and a scholar whose learning would heighten the luster of the papacy. He was now fifty-three, and his adventurous life had taken such toll of his health that he seemed already an old man. On a voyage from Holland to Scotland in 1435, he had encountered frighteningly rough seas, taking twelve days from Slois to Dunbar, and had vowed, if saved, to walk barefoot to the nearest shrine of the Virgin. This proved to be at Whitekirk, ten miles away. He kept his vow, walked the full distance with bare feet on snow and ice, 
contracted gout, and suffered severely from it all the rest of his life. By 1458 he had stone in the kidneys and a chronic cough. His eyes were sunken, his face pale. At times, says Plotina, nobody could tell that he was alive but by his voice. As Pope he lived simply and frugally. His household expenses in the Vatican were the lowest on record. When his duties allowed, he retired to a rural suburb, where he entertained himself not like a pope, but as an honest, humble rustic. Sometimes he held consistories or received ambassadors under shady trees, or amid an olive grove, or by a cooling spring or stream. He called himself, punning on his name, Silvarum Amator, lover of woods. As pope, he took his name from Virgil's recurrent phrase, Pius Aeneas. If we may with custom moderately mistranslate the adjective, he lived up to it. He was pious, faithful to his duties, benevolent and indulgent, temperate and mild, and won the affection of even the cynics of Rome. He had outgrown the sensualism of his youth and was morally a model pope. He made no attempt to conceal his early amours or his propaganda for the councils against the papacy, but he issued a bull of retraction in 1463, humbly asking God and the Church to forgive his errors and sins. The humanists, who had expected lavish patronage from a humanist pope, were disappointed to find that, while he enjoyed their company and gave several of them places in the curia, he dispensed no luscious fees but conserved the papal funds for a crusade against the Turks. He continued in his leisure moments to be a humanist. He studied the ancient ruins carefully and forbade their further demolition. He amnestied the people of Arpino because Cicero had been born there. He commissioned a new translation of Homer and employed Plotina and Biondo in his secretariat. He brought Mino da Fiesole to carve and Filippino Lippi to paint in the churches of Rome. He indulged his vanity by building, from designs by Bernardo Rossellino, a cathedral and Piccolomini Palace in his native Corsignano, which he renamed Pienza after himself. He had the poor noble's pride of ancestry and was too loyal to his friends and relatives for the good of the church. The Vatican became a Piccolomini hive. Two admirable scholars graced his pontificate. Flavio Biondo, a papal secretary since Nicholas V, was a symbol of the Christian Renaissance. He loved antiquity and spent half his life describing its history and relics, but he never ceased to be a devout, orthodox, and practicing Christian. Pius valued him as guide and friend and profited from his company on tours of the Roman remains. For Biondo had written an encyclopedia in three parts, Roma Instaurata, Roma Triumphans, and Italia Illustrata, recording the topography, history, institutions, laws, religion, manners, and arts of ancient Italy. Greater still was his Historarium ab Inclinatione Romanorum, an immense decline and fall of the Roman Empire, from 476 to 1250, the first critical history of the Middle Ages. Biondo was no stylist, but he was a discriminating historian. Through his work, the legends that Italian cities had cherished of their Trojan or like-fancied origins died away. The undertaking was too ambitious even for Biondo's seventy-five years. It was unfinished at his death in 1463, but it set to later historians an example of conscientious scholarship. John Cardinal Bessarion was a living vehicle of the Greek culture that was entering Italy. Born at Trebizond, he received at Constantinople a thorough schooling in Greek poetry, oratory, and philosophy. He continued his studies under the famous Platonist Gemistus Pletho at Mystra. Coming to the Council of Florence as Archbishop of Nicaea, he took a leading part in the reunion of Greek and Latin Christianity. Returning to Constantinople, he and other uniates were repudiated by the lower clergy and the people. Pope Eugenius made him a cardinal in 1439, and Bessarion moved to Italy, bringing with him a rich collection of Greek manuscripts. At Rome, his house became a salon of humanists. Poggio, Valla, and Plotina were among his closest friends. Valla called him Latinorum Graecissimus, Graecorum Latinissimus, the most learned Hellenist among the Latins, the most accomplished Latinist among the Greeks. He spent nearly all his income in purchasing manuscripts or having them copied. He himself made a new translation of Aristotle's Metaphysics. But as a disciple of Gemistus, he favored Plato, 
and led the Platonic camp in a hot controversy that raged at the time between Platonists and Aristotelians. Plato won that campaign, and the long rule of Aristotle over Western philosophy came to an end. When Nicholas V appointed Bessarion legate at Bologna to govern the Romagna and the Marches, Bessarion acquitted himself so well that Nicholas called him Angel of Peace. For Pius II, he undertook difficult diplomatic missions in a Germany again seething with revolt against the Roman Church. Toward the end of his life, he bequeathed his library to Venice, where it now forms a precious part of the Bibliotheca Marciana. In 1471, he narrowly missed election to the papacy. He died a year later, honored throughout the world of scholarship. His missions to Germany failed, partly because the efforts of Pius II to reform the church were frustrated, and partly because a new attempt to levy a tithe for a crusade revived transalpine antipathy to Rome. At the outset of his pontificate, Pius appointed a committee of high prelates to formulate a program of reform. He accepted a plan submitted by Nicholas of Cusa and embodied it in a papal bull, but he found that no one in Rome wanted reform. Almost every second dignitary there profited from one or another immemorial abuse. Apathy and passive resistance defeated Pius, and meanwhile his difficulties with Germany, Bohemia, and France used up his energy, and the crusade that he planned absorbed his devotion and cried for funds. He had to content himself with reproving cardinals for licentious lives and with sporadic improvements of monastic discipline. In 1463 he addressed a final appeal to the cardinals. People say that we live for pleasure, accumulate wealth, bear ourselves arrogantly, ride on fat mules and handsome palfreys, trail the fringes of our cloaks after us, and show round plump faces beneath the red hat and the white hood, keep hounds for the chase, spend much on actors and parasites, and nothing in defense of the faith. And there is some truth in their words. Many among the cardinals and other officials of our court do lead this kind of life. If the truth be confessed, the luxury and pomp at our court is too great, and this is why we are so detested by the people that they will not listen to us, even when we say what is just and reasonable. What do you think is to be done in such a shameful state of things? We must inquire by what means our predecessors won authority and consideration for the Church. We must maintain that authority by the same means. Temperance, chastity, innocence, zeal for the faith, contempt of earth, the desire for martyrdom— have exalted the Roman Church and made her mistress of the world. The Pope, who as Aeneas Silvius had been so uniformly successful as a diplomat, had to bear one setback after another in his dealings with the European powers. Louis XI gave him a brief triumph by revoking the pragmatic sanction of Bourges, but when Pius refused to aid the House of Anjou in its plans for recapturing Naples, Louis in effect revoked his revocation. Bohemia persisted in the revolt that John Hus had started. The Reformation had begun there a century before Luther, and the new king, George Podiebrad, was giving it his powerful support. The German hierarchy continued to league with German princes in resisting collection of the tithe, and renewed the old cry for a general council to reform the church and sit in judgment upon the Pope. Pius responded by issuing in 1460 the bull Execrabilis, which condemned and forbade any attempt to convene a general council without papal initiative and consent. If, he argued, such a council could be summoned at any time by opponents of papal policy, papal jurisdiction would be in constant jeopardy, and ecclesiastical discipline would be paralyzed. These disputes fettered the efforts of the Pope to unify Europe against the Turks. On the very day of his coronation, he expressed his horror at the advance of the Moslems along the Danube to Vienna, and through the Balkans into Bosnia. Greece, Epirus, Macedonia, Serbia, Bosnia, were falling to the enemies of Christianity. Who could say when they would leap across the Adriatic into Italy? A month after his coronation, Pius issued an invitation to all Christian princes to join him in a great congress at Mantua, and lay plans to rescue Eastern Christendom from the Ottoman tide. He himself arrived there on May 27, 1459. Arrayed in the most gorgeous vestments of his office, he was borne through the city on a litter held up by the nobles and vassals of the church. He addressed great throngs in one of the most moving orations of his career. But no king or prince came from beyond the Alps, and none sent representatives with powers to commit his state to war. Nationalism, 
which was to achieve the Reformation, was already strong enough to make the papacy an ineffectual suppliant before the thrones of the kings. The cardinals urged the Pope to return to Rome. Neither did they relish the thought of yielding a tithe of their income to the crusade. Some decamped to their pleasures. Some asked Pius to his face did he wish them to die of fever in Mantua's summer heat. The pontiff waited patiently for the emperor, but Frederick III, instead of coming to the aid of the man who in the past had served him well, declared war on Hungary in an effort to add to his realm the very nation that was most actively preparing to resist the Turks. France again made its cooperation conditional on papal support of a French campaign against Naples. Venice held back for fear that her remaining possessions in the Aegean would be the first sacrifice in a war of Christian Europe against the Ottomans. At last, in August, an embassy came from Duke Philip the Good of Burgundy. In September, Francesco Sforza appeared. Other Italian princes followed his lead, and on the 26th, the Congress held its first sitting, four months after the arrival of the Pope. Four months more passed in argument. Finally, by agreeing to the division of Turkish and formerly Byzantine territory in Europe among the victorious powers, Pius won Burgundy and Italy to his plan for a holy war. All Christian laymen were to contribute to the cause a thirtieth of their income, all Jews a twentieth, all clergy a tenth. The Pope returned to Rome in almost complete exhaustion, but he gave orders for the construction of a papal fleet and prepared, despite gout and cough and stone, to lead the crusade himself. And yet his nature shrank from war, and he dreamed of a peaceful victory. Perhaps encouraged by rumors that Mohammed II, born of a Christian mother, had secret leanings toward Christianity, Pius addressed to the Sultan in 1461 an earnest appeal to accept the gospel of Christ. He had never been more eloquent. Were you to embrace Christianity, there is no prince on earth who would surpass you in glory or equal you in power. We would acknowledge you as emperor of the Greeks and the East, and what you have now taken by violence and retained by injustice would then be your lawful possession. Oh, what a fullness of peace it would be! The golden age of Augustus, sung by the poets, would return. If you were to join yourself to us, the whole of the East would soon turn to Christ. One will could give peace to the entire world, and that will is yours. Mohammed made no reply. Whatever his theology, he knew that his final protection against Western arms lay not in the promises of the Pope, but in the religious ardor of his people. Pius turned more realistically to collecting the clerical tithe. A windfall sustained him in 1462 when rich deposits of alum were found in papal soil at Tolfa in western Latium. Several thousand men were put to work mining the substance so valued by dyers. Soon the mines were yielding 100,000 florins per year to the Holy See. Pius announced that the discovery was a miracle, a divine contribution to the Turkish war. The Papal States were now the richest government in Italy, with Venice a close second, Naples third, then Milan, Florence, Modena, Siena, Mantua. Venice, perceiving the resolute earnestness of the Pope, accelerated its preparations. The other powers held back or offered merely token aid. The collection of taxes for the crusade met with formidable resistance almost everywhere. Francesco Sforza cooled to the enterprise as promising to strengthen Venice by redeeming her lost possessions and trade. Genoa, which had pledged eight triremes, withheld them. The Duke of Burgundy urged the Pope to wait for a better day. But Pius announced that he would go to Ancona, expect there the union of new papal and Venetian fleets, cross with them to Ragusa, join Skanderbeg of Bosnia and Matthias Corvinus of Hungary, and lead in person the advance against the Turks. Nearly all the cardinals protested. They had no appetite for marching through the Balkans, they warned the Pope that Bosnia was reeking with heretics and plague. The ailing pontiff nevertheless took the cross of a crusader, bade farewell to Rome, not expecting to see it again, and sailed with his fleet for Ancona on June 18, 1464. Meanwhile, the armies that were supposed to meet him faded away as if by oriental magic. The troops originally promised by Milan did not come. Those which Florence sent were so poorly equipped as to be useless. When Pius reached Ancona on July 19th, he found that most of the crusaders who had assembled there had deserted, weary of waiting and worried for food. Plague broke out in the Venetian fleet as it left the lagoons and caused a delay of twelve days. Broken-hearted by the vanishing of his armies and the non-appearance of the Venetian armada, 
Pius languished at Ancona, sick to the verge of death. Finally, the fleet was sighted. The Pope sent his galleys to meet them, and had himself carried to a window from which he could see the harbor. As the combined navies came in sight, he died on August 14, 1464. Venice recalled her vessels, the remaining soldiers dispersed, the crusade collapsed. The brilliant and versatile climber who had craved success after success had reached the throne of thrones, had graced it with urbane scholarship and Christian benevolence, and had drunk to the dregs the gall of failure, humiliation, and defeat. But he had redeemed the errors of his youth with the devotion of his maturity, and had shamed the cynicism of his peers with the nobility of his death. 5. Paul II, 1464 to 1471. The lives of great men oft remind us that a man's character can be formed after his demise. If a ruler coddles the chroniclers about him, they may lift him to posthumous sanctity. If he offends them, they may broil his corpse on a spit of venom or roast him to darkest infamy in a pot of ink. Paul II quarreled with Plotina. Plotina wrote the biography upon which most estimates of Paul depend and handed him down to posterity as a monster of vanity, pomp, and greed. There was some truth in the indictment, though not much more than might be found in any biography untempered with charity. Pietro Barbo, Cardinal of San Marco, was proud of his handsome appearance, as nearly all men are. When elected Pope, he proposed, probably in humor, to be called Formosus, good-looking. He allowed himself to be dissuaded, and took the title of Paul II. Simple in his private life, yet knowing the hypnotic effect of magnificence, he kept a luxurious court, and entertained his friends and guests with costly hospitality. On entering the conclave that elected him, he, like the other cardinals, had pledged himself, if chosen, to wage war against the Turks, to summon a general council, to limit the number of cardinals to twenty-four and the number of papal relatives among them to one, and to create no man a cardinal under thirty years of age, and to consult the cardinals on all important appointments. Paul, elected, repudiated these capitulations as nullifying time-honored traditions and powers. He consoled the cardinals by raising their yearly revenue to a minimum of 4,000 florins, or about $100,000. He himself, coming of a mercantile family, relished the security of florins, ducats, scudi, and gems that held a fortune in a ray of light. He wore a tiara that outweighed a palace in worth. As cardinal, he had kept the goldsmiths busy with orders for jewels, medals, and cameos, these and costly relics of classic art he had collected in the sumptuous Palazzo San Marco, which he had built for himself at the foot of the capital. With all his acquisitiveness he stooped to no simony, repressed the sale of indulgences, and governed Rome with justice, if not with mercy. He is worst remembered by his quarrel with the Roman humanists. This book is continued on Cassette 2, Side 1. The Story of Civilization, Volume 5, The Renaissance, Part 2 by Will Durant. Continued. Cassette 2, Side 1. He is worst remembered by his quarrel with the Roman humanists. Some of these were secretaries to the Pope or the Cardinals. Most of them filled less dignified positions as abbreviatores, writers of briefs or keepers of records for the curia. Whether as a measure of economy, or to rid the Collegium Abbreviatorum of the fifty-eight Sienese whom Pius II had appointed to it, Paul disbanded the whole group, gave its work to other departments, and left some seventy humanists jobless or reduced to less lucrative posts. The most eloquent of these dismissed humanists was Bartolomeo de Sacchi, who took the Latin name Platina from his native Piadena, near Cremona. He appealed to the Pope to re-employ the dismissed men. When Paul refused, he wrote him a threatening letter. Paul had him arrested and kept him for four months in Sant'Angelo, bound with heavy chains. Cardinal Gonzaga secured his release, but Plotina, Paul thought, would bear watching. The leader of the humanists in Rome was Giulio Pomponio Leto, allegedly the natural son of Prince Sanseverino of Salerno. Coming to Rome in youth, he attached himself to Valla as a disciple and succeeded him as professor of Latin in the university. He became so enamored of pagan literature that he lived and had his being not in the Rome of Nicholas V or Paul II, but in that of the Catos or the Caesars. He was the first to edit the agricultural classics of Varro and Columella, and he sedulously followed their precepts in tending his vineyard. He remained content in learned poverty, spent half his time among the historic ruins, wept at their spoliation and desolation, Latinized his name to Pomponius Letus, and walked to his classroom in ancient Roman dress. 
Hardly any hall could hold the crowd that gathered at dawn to hear his lectures. Some students came at midnight to secure a place. He despised the Christian religion, denounced its preachers as hypocrites, and trained his scholars in the Stoic rather than the Christian morality. His home was a museum of Roman antiquities, a meeting place for students and teachers of Roman lore. About 1460 he organized them into a Roman academy, whose members took pagan names, gave such names to their children in baptism, exchanged the Christian faith for a religious worship of the Genius of Rome, performed Latin comedies, and celebrated the anniversary of Rome's foundation with pagan ceremonies in which the officiating members were termed sacerdotes, and Letus was called Pontifex Maximus. Some enthusiastic members dreamed of restoring the Roman Republic. Early in 1468, a citizen laid before the papal police a charge that the academy was plotting to depose and arrest the pope. Certain cardinals supported the charge and assured the pontiff that a rumor in Rome was predicting his early death. Paul ordered the arrest of Letus, Plotina, and other leaders of the academy. Pomponius wrote humble apologies and professions of orthodoxy. After due chastening, he was released and resumed his lecturing, but with such careful conformity that when he died in 1498, forty bishops attended his funeral. Plotina was tortured to elicit evidence of a conspiracy. No such evidence was anywhere found, but Plotina, despite a dozen letters of apology, was kept in prison for a year. Paul decreed the dissolution of the academy as a nest of heresy and forbade the teaching of pagan literature in the schools of Rome. His successor allowed the academy to reopen reformed and gave the penitent Plotina charge of the Vatican Library. There, Plotina found the materials for his graphic and elegant biographies of the popes, in Vitas Sumorum Pontificum. And when he came to Paul II, he took his revenge. His indictment might with more justice have been reserved for Sixtus IV. 6. Sixtus IV, 1471-1484 Of the eighteen cardinals who met to choose a new pontiff, fifteen were Italian, Rodrigo Borgia was Spanish, de Tudville was French, Vasarian was Greek. One participant later described the election of Cardinal Francesco della Rovere as due to intrigue and bribery, ex artibus et corruptilis. But this seems to have meant only that various offices were promised to various cardinals for their votes. The new pope illustrated the admirable equality of opportunity, among Italians, to reach the papacy. He was born of a peasant family at Pecorile, near Savona. Repeatedly ill as a child, he was consecrated to St. Francis by his mother in prayer for his recovery. At nine he was sent to a Franciscan convent, and later entered the Minorite order. For a while he served as tutor in the Della Rovere family, whose name he took as his own. He studied philosophy and theology at Pavia, Bologna, and Padua, and taught them there and elsewhere to classes so crowded that almost every learned Italian of the next generation was said to have been his pupil. When at fifty-seven he became Sixtus IV, his reputation was that of a scholar distinguished for learning and integrity. Almost overnight, by one of the strangest transformations in papal history, he became a politician and a warrior. Finding Europe too divided and its governments too corrupt for a crusade against the Turks, he decided to confine his secular efforts to Italy. There, too, of course, he found division. In the Papal States, the authority of the Pope largely flouted by local rulers, in Latium a rule by noble violence ignoring the Papal power, and in Rome a mob so disorderly that at his coronation it stoned his litter in anger at a crush caused by a stoppage of the cavalcade. Sixtus proposed to restore order in Rome, to reinvigorate legatine authority in the Papal States, and to bring Italy under the unifying rule of the Pope. Surrounded by chaos, distrustful of strangers, and subject to family affection, Sixtus appointed his avid nephews to positions of power and revenue. It was the prime curse of his pontificate that those whom he loved best proved worst, and took such venal advantage of their place that all Italy came to despise them. The favorite nephew was Pietro, or Piero Riario, a youth of some charm, cheerful, witty, courteous, generous, but so fond of luxury and sensual delights that even the rich benefices bestowed upon him by the Pope failed to finance the tastes of this formerly mendicant friar. Sixtus made him a cardinal at twenty-five in 1471, 
and gave him the bishoprics of Treviso, Senegalia, Spalato, Florence, and other dignities, with a total income of sixty thousand ducats, or one and a half million dollars a year. Pietro spent all and more on vessels of silver and gold, fine raiment, tapestries, embroideries, a pretentious retinue, expensive public games, and the patronage of painters, poets, and scholars. The festivities, including a banquet that lasted six hours, with which he and his cousin Giuliano welcomed to Rome Ferrante's daughter Eleonora, marked a height of extravagance hardly equaled there since Lucullus or Nero. Dizzy with power, Pietro made a triumphal tour of Florence, Bologna, Ferrara, Venice, and Milan, enjoying regal honors everywhere as a prince of the blood, displaying his mistresses in costly attire, and making plans to become pope on or before the death of his uncle. But on his return to Rome, he died in 1474 of his excesses at the age of 28, having spent 200,000 ducats in two years and owing 60,000 more. His brother Girolamo was made commander of the papal armies and lord of Imola and Forli. We have already disposed of him there. Another nephew, Leonardo della Rovere, was made prefect of Rome, and when he died, his brother Giovanni succeeded him. The ablest of these innumerable nephews was Giuliano della Rovere, who will require a chapter as Julius II. His life was reasonably decent, and he rose to the papacy over every obstacle by force of intellect and character. The plans of Sixtus to strengthen the papal states disturbed the other governments of Italy. Lorenzo de' Medici, as we have before related, schemed to get Imola for Florence. Sixtus outplayed him, and replaced the Medici with the Pazzi as bankers for the papacy. Lorenzo tried to ruin the Pazzi, they tried to kill him. Sixtus agreed to the conspiracy, but deprecated murder. Go and do what you will, he told the plotters, provided there be no killing. The result was a war that lasted from 1478 to 1480, until the Turks threatened to overrun Italy. When that danger subsided, Sixtus was free to resume his liberation of the papal states. Late in 1480, the Ordelafi line of dictators died out at Forli, and the people asked the Pope to take over the city. Sixtus bade Girolamo govern Imola and Forli together. Girolamo suggested taking Ferrara next, and persuaded Sixtus and Venice to join in war upon Duke Ercole in 1482. Ferrante of Naples sent troops to defend his son-in-law. Florence and Milan also helped Ferrara and the Pope, who had begun his reign with plans for European peace, found that he had plunged all Italy into war. Harassed by Naples on the south, by Florence in the north, and by disturbances in Rome, Sixtus came to terms with Ferrara after a year of chaos and bloodshed. When the Venetians refused to follow suit, he excommunicated them, and joined Florence and Milan in war upon his late ally. The nobles of the capital had felt justified by the example of a warlike pontiff in renewing their exhilarating feuds. It was one of the polite customs of Rome to plunder the palace of a cardinal just elected to the papacy. In so handling the palace of one of the della Rovere cardinals, a young aristocrat, Francesco di Santa Croce, had been wounded by a member of the della Valle family. The youth revenged himself by cutting the tendon of della Valle's heel. Della Valle's relatives avenged him by cleaving Francesco's head. Prospero di Santa Croce revenged Francesco by killing Piero Margani. The feud spread through the city, the Orsini and the papal forces supporting the Santa Croce, the Colonna defending the Valle. Lorenzo Odoni Colonna was captured, tried, tortured into a confession, and put to death in Sant'Angelo, though his brother Fabrizio surrendered two Colonna fortresses to Sixtus in the hope of having Lorenzo spared. Prospero Colonna joined Naples in war on the Pope, ravaged the Campania, raided Rome. Sixtus engaged Roberto Malatesta of Rimini to come and lead the papal troops. Roberto defeated the Neapolitan and Colonna forces at Campo Morto, returned to Rome victorious, and died of fever contracted in the Campania swamps. Girolamo Riario took his place, and Sixtus officially blessed the artillery that his nephew directed against the Colonna citadels. But while the Pope's spirit willed war, his body collapsed under the strain of successive crises. In June 1484, he too came down with fever. On August 11th, news came to him that his allies had made peace with Venice over his protests. He refused to ratify it. 
The next day he died. Sixtus was in many ways a preview of Julius II, as Girolamo Riario rehearsed the career of Caesar Borgia. A stern imperial priest who loved war and art and power, Sixtus pursued his purposes without scruple or finesse, but with wild energy and unhesitating courage to the end. Like later warrior popes, he made enemies who tried to weaken his arms by blackening his name. Some gossips accounted for his lavish support of Pietro and Girolamo Riario by calling them his sons. Others, like Infesura, called them his lovers, and did not hesitate to term the Pope a sodomite. The picture is bad enough without these incredible and unsupported allegations. After exhausting on his nephews the treasury that Paul II had left full, Sixtus financed his wars by selling ecclesiastical offices to the highest bidder. A hostile Venetian ambassador quotes him as saying that a pope needs only pen and ink to get whatever sum he wishes. But this is equally true of most modern governments, whose interest-bearing bonds correspond in many ways with the salary-bearing sinecures sold by the popes. Sixtus, however, was not content with this scheme. He kept throughout the papal states a monopoly on the sale of corn. He sold the best abroad and the rest to his people at a goodly profit. He had learned this trick from the other rulers of his time, like Ferrante of Naples. Presumably he charged no more than private engrossers would have done, since it is an unwritten law of economics that the price of a product depends on the gullibility of the purchaser. But the poor grumbled forgivably at the thought that their hunger fed the luxuries of the riarios. Despite these and other devices for raising revenues, Sixtus left debts totaling 150,000 ducats, or three and three quarters million dollars. A substantial portion of his revenues was spent on art and public works. He tried, unsuccessfully, to drain the pestilential marshes around Foligno, and at last dreamt of draining the Pontine swamps. He had the major streets of Rome straightened, widened, and paved. He improved the water supply, restored bridges, walls, gates, and towers, spanned the Tiber with the Ponte Sisto that bears his name, built a new Vatican library and the Sistine Chapel above it, founded the Sistine Choir, and rebuilt the ruined hospital of Santo Spirito, whose main ward, 365 feet long, could accommodate a thousand patients. He reorganized the University of Rome and opened to the public the Capitoline Museum that Paul II had established. This was the first public museum in Europe. During his pontificate, and largely under the direction of Baccio Pontelli, the churches of Santa Maria della Pace and Santa Maria del Popolo were erected, and many others were repaired. In Santa Maria del Popolo, Mino da Fiesole and Andrea Bregno sculptured a noble tomb for Cardinal Cristoforo della Rovere, circa 1477. And in Santa Maria in Aracoeli, Pinturicchio pictured the career of San Bernardino of Siena in some of the finest frescoes in Rome, circa 1484. The Sistine Chapel was designed by Giovannino de Dolci, simply and unpretentiously, for semi-private worship by the popes and high ecclesiastics. It was beautified with a marble sanctuary screen by Mino da Fiesole and by spacious frescoes recounting on the south wall scenes from the life of Moses and on the north wall corresponding scenes from the life of Christ. For these paintings, Sixtus called to Rome the greatest masters of the time, Perugino, Signorelli, Pinturicchio, Domenico and Benedetto Ghirlandaio, Botticelli, Cosimo Roselli, and Piero di Cosimo. Sixtus offered an additional reward for the best picture of the fifteen painted there by these men. Roselli, knowing his own inferiority in design, decided to stake all on brilliant coloring. His fellow artists laughed at his lavish spread of ultramarine and gold, but Sixtus gave him the prize. The warrior pope brought other painters to Rome and organized them into a protective guild under the aegis of St. Luke. It was for Sixtus that Melozzo da Forli did his best work. Coming to Rome about 1472, after studying with Piero della Francesca, he painted in the church of Santi Apostoli a fresco of the Ascension, which aroused the enthusiasm of Vasari. All but a few fragments of it disappeared when the church was rebuilt, around 1702 and following. Gracious and tender are the angel and the virgin of the Annunciation in the Uffizi Gallery, but finer still the Angeli Musicanti, one with a viol, one with a lute, in the Vatican. Melozzo's masterpiece was painted as a fresco in the Vatican Library and was later transferred to canvas. Against the ornate pillars and ceiling of the library, six figures are portrayed with veracity and power.
Sixtus, seated, massive and regal. At his right, the gay Pietro Riario. Standing before him, the tall dark Giuliano della Rovere. Kneeling before him, the high-browed Platina, receiving appointment as librarian. And behind him, Giovanni della Rovere and Count Girolimo Riario. It is a living picture of an eventful pontificate. In 1475, the Vatican Library contained 2,527 volumes in Latin and Greek. Sixtus added 1,100 more, and for the first time threw the collection open to the public. He restored the humanists to favor, though he paid them with preoccupied irregularity. He called Filelfo to Rome, and that warrior of the pen praised the Pope enthusiastically until his annual salary of six hundred florins, or fifteen thousand dollars, fell into arrears. Joannes Argaropoulos was invited from Florence to Rome, where his lectures on the Greek language and literature were attended by cardinals, bishops, and foreign students like Reutlin. Sixtus also brought to Rome the German scientist Johann Müller, Regio Montanus, and commissioned him to correct the Julian calendar. But Müller died a year later in 1476, and calendar reform had to wait a century more until 1582. It is remarkable that a Franciscan friar and professor of philosophy and theology should have become the first secularizing pope of the Renaissance, or more precisely, the first Renaissance pope whose chief interest was to establish the papacy as a strong political power in Italy. Perhaps excepting the case of Ferrara, whose able rulers had faithfully paid their feudal dues, Sixtus was perfectly justified in seeking to make the papal states papal and to make Rome and its environs safe for the popes. History might forgive, as it has forgiven Julius II, his use of war for these ends. It might acknowledge that his diplomacy merely followed the amoral principles of other states. But it finds no pleasure in watching a pope conspire with assassins, bless cannon or wage war with a thoroughness that shocked his time. The death of a thousand men at Campo Morto was a heavier loss of life than any battle yet fought in Renaissance Italy. The morality of the Roman court was further lowered by reckless nepotism and unblushing simony, and the costly and decent revels of his kin. In these and other ways, Sixtus IV made straight the way for Alexander VI, and contributed, as he responded, to the moral disintegration of Italy. It was Sixtus who appointed Torquemada to head the Spanish Inquisition, Sixtus who provoked by the virulence and license of Roman satire, gave the inquisitors in Rome power to prohibit the printing of any book they did not like. At his death he might have admitted many failures, against Lorenzo, Naples, Ferrara, Venice, and even the Colonna were not yet subdued. Three significant successes he had achieved. He had made Rome a fairer and healthier city, he had given it invigorating drafts of fresh air, and he had restored the papacy to its place among the most powerful monarchies, in Europe. 7. Innocent the Eighth, 1484-1492 The failure of Sixtus was confirmed by the chaos that ruled Rome after his death. Mobs sacked the papal granaries, broke into the banks of the Genoese, attacked the palace of Girolamo Riario. Vatican attendants stripped the Vatican of its furniture. The noble factions armed themselves, Barricades were thrown up in the streets. Girolimo was forced to quit his campaign against the Colonna and lead his troops back to the city. The Colonna recaptured many of their citadels. A conclave was hastily assembled in the Vatican, and an exchange of promises and bribes between Cardinal Borgia and Cardinal Giuliano della Rovere secured the election of Giovanni Battista Cibo of Genoa, who took the name of Innocent VIII. He was fifty-two, tall and handsome, kindly and peaceable to the point of complacent weakness, of moderate intelligence and experience. A contemporary described him as not wholly ignorant. He had at least one son and one daughter, probably more. He acknowledged them candidly, and after taking priestly orders, he led an apparently celibate life. Though the Roman wits wrote epigrams about his children, few Romans held it against the Pope that he had been so fertile in his youth but they raised eyebrows when he declared the marriages of his children and grandchildren in the Vatican. In truth, Innocent was content to be a grandfather, to enjoy domestic affection and ease. He gave Felician two hundred ducats for dedicating to him a translation of Herodotus, but for the rest he hardly bothered his head about the humanists. He continued leisurely and quite by proxy the repair and adornment of Rome. He engaged Antonio Paliuolo to build the Villa Belvedere in the Vatican Gardens, 
and Andrea Mantegna to paint frescoes in a chapel adjoining it. But for the most part, he left the patronage of letters and art to magnates and cardinals. In a similar mood of genial laissez-faire, he entrusted foreign policy first to Cardinal della Rovere, then to Lorenzo de' Medici. The powerful banker offered his richly dowered daughter, Madalena, as a bride for the Pope's son, Franceschetto Cibo. Innocent was agreeable and signed an alliance with Florence in 1487. Thereafter, he allowed the experienced and pacific Florentine to guide the papal policy. For five years, Italy enjoyed peace. The age of Innocent was amused by one of the strangest comedies in history. After the death of Mohammed II in 1481, his sons Bajazet II and Jem fought a civil war for the Ottoman throne. Defeated at Brusa, Jem sought to escape death by surrendering to the Knights of St. John in Rhodes in 1482. Their grand master, Pierre de Gousson, held him as a threat over Bajazet. The Sultan agreed to pay the Knights 45,000 ducats yearly, ostensibly for Jem's maintenance, actually as an inducement not to set up Jem as a pretender to the Turkish Sultanate and a useful ally in a Christian crusade. To better safeguard so lucrative a prisoner, Dobusson sent him to knightly custody in France. The Sultan of Egypt, Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain, Matthias Corvinus of Hungary, Ferrante of Naples, and Innocent himself, all offered large sums to Dobusson to transfer Jem to their care. The Pope won because, in addition to ducats, he promised the Grand Master a red hat and helped Charles VIII of France to secure the hand and province of Anne of Brittany. So, on March the 13th, 1484, the Grand Turk, as Jem was now called, was escorted in princely cavalcade through the streets of Rome to the Vatican and received courteous and luxurious imprisonment. Bajazet, to ensure the honorable intentions of the Pope, sent him three years' salary for the upkeep of Jem and in 1492 he dispatched to Innocent what he assured him was the head of the lancet that had pierced the side of Christ. Some cardinals were skeptical, but the Pope arranged that the relic should be brought from Ancona to Rome. When it reached the Porta del Popolo, he himself received it and bore it in solemn ceremony to the Vatican. Cardinal Borgia held it aloft for the people's reverence and then returned to his mistress. Despite the Sultan's contribution to the support of the Church, Innocent found it troublesome to make ends meet. Like Sixtus IV and most of the rulers of Europe, he replenished his coffers by charging fees for appointment to office, and finding this lucrative, he created new offices to sell. By raising the number of papal secretaries to twenty-six, he realized 62,400 ducats. He increased to fifty-two the frombatores, whose heavy task was to place a leaden seal on papal decrees, and received 2,500 ducats from each appointee. Such practices might have been no worse than selling annuity insurance, had it not been that the incumbents reimbursed themselves not merely by their salaries, but by candid venality in their functions. For example, two papal secretaries confessed that in two years they had forged more than fifty papal bulls granting dispensations. The angry pope had the men hanged and burned for stealing beyond their station. This in 1489. Everything in Rome seemed purchasable, from judicial pardons to the papacy itself. The unreliable Infesura tells of a man who committed incest with his two daughters, then murdered them, and was let off by paying eight hundred ducats. When Cardinal Borgia was asked why justice was not done, he is reputed to have answered, God desires not the death of a sinner, but rather that he should pay and live. The Pope's son, Franceschetto Cibo, was an unprincipled scoundrel. He forced his way into private homes for evil purposes. He saw to it that of the fines levied in the ecclesiastical courts of Rome, a substantial portion should go to himself, and he spent his spoils in gambling. One night he lost 14,000 ducats, or $350,000, to Cardinal Raffaele Riario. He complained to the Pope that he had been cheated, and Innocent tried to recover the sum for him, but the Cardinal professed to have already used up the sum on the immense Palazzo della Cancelleria that he was building. The secularization of the papacy, its absorption in politics, war, and finance, had filled the College of Cardinals with appointees noted for their administrative ability, their political influence, or their capacity to pay for their hats. Despite his promise to keep the college down to twenty-four members, Innocent added to it eight men, most of whom were eminently unsuited to such a dignity. So the cardinalate was conferred upon the thirteen-year-old Giovanni de' Medici as part of a bargain with Lorenzo. Many of the cardinals were men of high education, benevolent patrons of literature, music, drama, and art. A few of them were saintly. Several had taken only minor orders, 
and were not yet priests. Many of them were frankly secular. Their political, diplomatic, and fiscal duties required them to be men of the world, capable of meeting on a level of knowledge and subtlety the similar officials of Italian or transalpine governments. Some of them imitated the Roman nobles, fortified their palaces, and retained armed men to protect themselves from these nobles, and the Roman mob, and other cardinals. Perhaps the great Catholic historian pastor is a bit too severe on them, in view of their secular functions. Lorenzo de' Medici's low estimate of the College of Cardinals in the time of Innocent VIII was unfortunately only too well-founded. Of the worldly cardinals, Ascanio Sforza, Riario, Orsini, Sclafenatus, Jean de la Balou, Giuliano della Rovere, Savelli, and Rodrigo Borgia were the most prominent. All of these were deeply infected with the corruption that prevailed in Italy amongst the upper classes in the age of the Renaissance. Surrounded in their splendid palaces, with all the most refined luxury of a highly developed civilization, these cardinals lived the lives of secular princes, and seemed to regard their ecclesiastical garb simply as one of the adornments of their rank. They hunted, gambled, gave sumptuous banquets and entertainments, joined in all the rollicking merriment of the carnival tide, and allowed themselves the utmost license in morals. This was especially the case with Rodrigo Borgia. The disorder at the top reflected and enhanced the moral chaos of Rome. Violence, thievery, rape, bribery, conspiracy, revenge were the order of the day. Each dawn revealed in the alleys men who had been killed during the night. Pilgrims and ambassadors were waylaid, were sometimes stripped naked as they approached the capital of Christendom. Women were attacked in the streets or in their homes. A piece of the true cross, encased in silver, was stolen from the sacristy of Santa Maria in Trastevere. Later the wood, shorn of its setting, was found in a vineyard. Such religious skepticism was widespread. Over five hundred Roman families were condemned for heresy, but were let off with fines. Perhaps the mercenary curia of Rome was preferable to the mercenary and murderous inquisitors who were now ravaging Spain. Even priests had their doubts. One was accused of substituting, for the words of transubstantiation in the Mass, his own formula, O fatuous Christians who adore food and drink as God. As the end of Innocent's pontificate approached, prophets appeared who proclaimed impending doom, and in Florence the voice of Savonarola was rising to brand the age as that of Antichrist. On September 20th, 1492, says a chronicler, there was a great tumult in the city of Rome and the merchants closed their shops. People who were in the fields and vineyards returned home in haste because it was announced that Pope Innocent VIII was dead. Strange stories were told of his dying hours, how the cardinals placed Gem under special guards lest Franceschetto Cibo should appropriate him, how cardinals Borgia and Della Rovere had almost come to blows beside the deathbed, and the dubious Infesura is our oldest authority for the report that Three boys died from giving too much of their blood in a transfusion designed to revive the failing pope. Innocent bequeathed 48,000 ducats, or about $600,000, to his relatives and passed away. He was buried in St. Peter's, and Antonio Pagliuolo covered his sins with a splendid tomb. Chapter 16 The Borgias, 1492-1503 1. Cardinal Borgia. The most interesting of the Renaissance popes was born at Hativa, Spain, on January 1st, 1431. His parents were cousins, both of the Borjas, a family of some slight nobility. Rodrigo received his education at Hativa, Valencia, and Bologna. When his uncle became a cardinal, and then Pope Calixtus III, a strange path was opened for the young man's advancement in an ecclesiastical career. Moving to Italy, he respelled his name Borgia, was made a cardinal at twenty-five, and at twenty-six received the fruitful office of vice-chancellor, head of the entire curia. He performed his duties competently, earned some repute as an administrator, lived abstemiously, and made many friends in either sex. He was not yet, would not be till his thirty-seventh year, a priest. He was so handsome in his youth, so attractive in the grace of his manners, his sensual ardor and cheerful temperament, his persuasive eloquence and gay wit, that women found it hard to resist him. Brought up in the easy-going morality of fifteenth-century Italy, and perceiving that many a cleric, 
many a priest allowed himself the pleasure of women, this young Lothario in the purple decided to enjoy all the gifts that God had given him and them. Pius II reproved him for attending an immodest and seductive dance in 1460, but the Pope accepted Rodrigo's apology and continued him as vice-chancellor and trusted aide. In that year, Rodrigo's first son, Pedro Luis, was born, or begotten, and perhaps also his daughter, Girolima, who was married in 1482. Their mothers are not known. Pedro lived in Spain till 1488, came to Rome in that year, and died soon afterward. In 1464, Rodrigo accompanied Pius II to Ancona, and there contracted some minor sexual disease, because, said his doctor, he had not slept alone. About 1466, he formed a more permanent attachment with Vanozza de Catanei, some twenty-four years old. Unfortunately, she was married to Domenico d'Arignano, but Domenico left her in 1476. To Rodrigo, who had become a priest in 1468, Vanozza bore four children. In 1474, Giovanni. In 1476, Cesare, whom we shall call Caesar. In 1480, Lucrezia. In 1481, Geoffrey. These four were ascribed to Vanozza on her tombstone, and were at one time or another acknowledged by Rodrigo as his own. Such persistent parentage suggests an almost monogamous union, and perhaps Cardinal Borgia, in comparison with other ecclesiastics, may be credited with a certain domestic fidelity and stability. He was a tender and benevolent father. It was a pity that his efforts to advance his children did not always bring glory to the church. When Rodrigo set his eye on the papacy, he found a tolerant husband for Vanozza and helped her to prosperity. She was twice widowed, married again, lived in modest retirement, rejoiced in the rise of her children to fame and wealth, mourned her separation from them, earned a reputation for piety, died at seventy-six in 1518, and left all her substantial property to the church. Leo X sent his chamberlain to attend her ceremonious funeral. We should betray a lack of historical sense were we to judge Alexander VI from the moral standpoint of our age, or rather of our youth. His contemporaries looked upon his pre-papal sexual sins as only canonically mortal, but in the moral climate of his time, venial and forgivable. Even in the generation between the reproof given him by Pius II and Rodrigo's elevation to the papacy, public opinion had become more lenient toward unobtrusive sexual digressions from clerical celibacy. Pius II himself, besides spawning some loved children in his pre-sacerdotal youth, had once advocated the marriage of priests. Sixtus IV had had several children. Innocent VIII had brought his into the Vatican. Some condemned the morals of Rodrigo, but apparently no one mentioned them when the conclave met to choose a successor to Innocent. Five popes, including the reasonably virtuous Nicholas V, had granted him lucrative benefices through all these years, had entrusted him with difficult missions and responsible posts, and had apparently, Pius II for a moment accepted, taken no notice of his philoprogenitive exuberance. What men remarked in 1492 was that he had been vice-chancellor for thirty-five years, had been appointed and reappointed to that office by five successive popes, and had administered the office with conspicuous industry and competence, and that the external magnificence of his palace concealed a remarkable simplicity of private life. Jacopo de Volterra, in 1486, described him as a man of an intellect capable of anything, and of great sense. He is a ready speaker, is of an astute nature, and has wonderful skill in conducting affairs. He was popular with the Romans, having amused them with games. When news reached Rome that Granada had fallen to the Christians, he regaled Rome with a bullfight in Spanish style. Perhaps the cardinals assembling in conclave on August 6, 1492, were also interested in his wealth, for in five administrations he had become the richest cardinal, excepting de Tudeville, in the memory of Rome. They relied upon him to make substantial presents to those who should vote for him, and he did not fail them. To Cardinal Sforza he promised the vice-chancellorship, several rich benefices, and the Borgia Palace in Rome. To Cardinal Orsini the sea and ecclesiastical revenues of Cartagena, the towns of Monticello and Soriano, and the governorship of the Marches. To Cardinal Savelli, Civita Castellana, and the bishopric of Majorca, and so on. Infesora described the process as Borgia's evangelical distribution of his goods to the poor. 
It was not an unusual procedure. Every candidate had used it for many conclaves past, as every candidate uses it in politics today. Whether money bribes were also used is uncertain. The decisive vote was cast by Cardinal Gerardo, ninety-six years old, and hardly in possession of his faculties. Finally, all the cardinals rushed to the winning side and made the election of Rodrigo Borgia unanimous on August 10, 1492. When asked by what name he wished to be called as Pope, he answered, by the name of the invincible Alexander. It was a pagan beginning for a pagan pontificate. 2. Alexander VI The choice of the conclave was also the choice of the people. Never had any papal election brought so much rejoicing. Never had a coronation been so magnificent. The populace delighted in the panoramic cavalcade of white horses, allegorical figures, tapestries and paintings, knights and grandees, troops of archers and Turkish horsemen, seven hundred priests, cardinals, colorfully clad, and finally Alexander himself, sixty-one years old but majestically straight and tall, overflowing with health and energy and pride, serene of countenance and of surpassing dignity, said an eyewitness, and looking like an emperor even while blessing the multitude. Only a few sober minds, like Giuliano della Rovere and Giovanni de' Medici, expressed some apprehension lest the new pope, known to be a fond father, would use his power to aggrandize his family rather than to cleanse and strengthen the church. He began well. In the thirty-six days between the death of Innocent and the coronation of Alexander, there had been two hundred and twenty known murders in Rome. The new pope made an example of the first captured assassin. The culprit was hanged, his brother was hanged with him, and his house was pulled down. The city approved this severity. Crime hid its head, order was restored in Rome, and all Italy was glad that a strong hand was at the helm of the church. Art and literature marked time. Alexander did considerable building in and out of Rome, financed a new ceiling for Santa Maria Maggiore with a gift of American gold from Ferdinand and Isabella, remodeled the mausoleum of Hadrian into the fortified castle of Sant'Angelo, and redecorated its interior to provide cells for papal prisoners and more comfortable quarters for harassed popes. He built between the castle and the Vatican a long covered corridor which gave him refuge from Charles VIII in 1494 and saved Clement VII from a Lutheran noose in the sack of Rome. Pinturicchio was engaged to adorn the Appartamento Borgia in the Vatican. Four of these six rooms were restored and opened to the public by Leo XIII. A lunette in one of them contains a vivid portrait of Alexander, a happy face, a prosperous body, gorgeous robes. In another room, a virgin teaching the child to read was described by Vasari as a portrait of Giulia Farnese, an alleged mistress of the Pope. Vasari adds that the picture also contained the head of Pope Alexander adoring her, but no picture of him is there visible. He rebuilt the University of Rome, called to its several distinguished teachers, and paid them with unheard-of regularity. He liked drama and was pleased to have the students of the Roman Academy stage comedies and ballets for his family festivals. He preferred light music to heavy philosophy. In 1501, he re-established censorship of publications by an edict requiring that no book might be printed without the approval of the local archbishop. But he allowed a wide freedom of satire and debate. He laughed off the bites of the town wits and rejected Caesar Borgia's proposal that such snipers should be disciplined. Rome is a free city, he told the Ferrari's ambassador, where everyone can say or write whatever he pleases. They say much evil of me, but I don't mind. His administration of church affairs was, in the early years of his pontificate, unusually efficient. Innocent VIII had left a debt in the treasury. It needed all the financial ability of Alexander to restore the papal finances. It took him two years to balance the budget. The Vatican staff was reduced, and expenses were curtailed, but records were strictly kept and salaries were promptly paid. Alexander performed the laborious religious ritual of his office with fidelity, but with the impatience of a busy man. His Magister Ceremoniarum was a German, Johann Burkhardt, who helped to perpetuate the fame and infamy of his employer by recording in a diarium nearly all that he saw, including much that Alexander would have wished unseen. To the cardinals the Pope gave, as he had promised in the conclave, and he was even more generous to those who, like Cardinal de' Medici, had longest opposed him. 
A year after his accession, he created twelve new cardinals. Several were men of real ability. Some were appointed at the request of political powers that it was wise to conciliate. Two were scandalously young, Ippolito d'Este, fifteen, and Caesar Borgia, eighteen. One of them, Alessandro Farnese, owed his elevation to his sister, Giulia Farnese, who was believed by many to be a mistress of the Pope. The sharp-tongued Romans, not foreseeing that they would one day acclaim Alessandro as Paul III, called him Il Cardinale della Gonella, the Cardinal of the Petticoat. The strongest of the older cardinals, Giuliano della Rovere, was displeased to find that he, who had often ruled Innocent VIII, had little influence with Alexander, who had made Cardinal Sforza his favorite counselor. In a huff, Giuliano retired to his episcopal see at Ostia and formed a guard of armed men. A year later he fled to France and besought Charles VIII to invade Italy, summon a general council, and depose Alexander as a shamelessly simoniacal pope. Meanwhile, Alexander was facing the political problems of a papacy caught between the millstones of scheming Italian powers. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. The Story of Civilization, Volume 5, The Renaissance, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 2, Side 2. Meanwhile, Alexander was facing the political problems of a papacy caught between the millstones of scheming Italian powers. The papal states had again fallen into the hands of local dictators who, while calling themselves vicars of the church, had snatched the opportunity provided by the weakness of Innocent VIII to re-establish the practical independence that they or their predecessors had lost under Albornoz or Sixtus IV. Some papal cities had been seized by neighboring powers. So Naples had taken Sora and Aquila in 1467, and Milan had appropriated Forli in 1488. Alexander's first task, then, was to bring these states under a centralized papal rule and taxation, as the kings of Spain, France, and England had subdued the feudal lords. This was the mission that he assigned to Caesar Borgia, who accomplished it with such speed and ruthlessness as made Machiavelli gape with admiration. Closer to Rome, and more immediately harassing, was the turbulent autonomy of the nobles, theoretically subject, actually hostile and dangerous, to the popes. The temporal weakness of the papacy since Boniface VIII, who died in 1303, had allowed these barons to maintain a medieval feudal sovereignty on their estates, making their own laws, organizing their own armies, fighting at will their private and reckless wars, to the ruin of order and commerce in Latium. Soon after Alexander's succession, Franceschetto Cibo sold to Virginio Orsini for 40,000 ducats, or half a million dollars, estates left him by his father, Innocent VIII. But this Orsini was a high officer in the Neapolitan army. He had received from Ferrante most of the money for the purchase. In effect, Naples had secured two strategic strongholds in papal territory. Alexander reacted by forming an alliance with Venice, Milan, Ferrara, and Siena, raising an army, and fortifying the wall between Sant'Angelo and the Vatican. Ferdinand II of Spain, fearing that a combined attack upon Naples would end the Aragon power in Italy, persuaded Alexander and Ferrante to negotiate. Orsini paid the Pope 40,000 ducats for the right to retain his purchases, and Alexander betrothed his son Geoffre, then thirteen, to Sancia, the pretty granddaughter of the Neapolitan king, in 1494. In return for Ferdinand's happy mediation, Alexander awarded him the two Americas. Columbus had discovered the Indies some two months after Alexander's succession, and had presented them to Ferdinand and Isabella. Portugal claimed the New World by virtue of an edict of Calixtus III in 1479, which had confirmed her claim to all lands on the Atlantic coast. Spain retorted that the edict had in mind only the eastern Atlantic. The states were near war when Alexander issued two bulls, on May 3rd and 4th, 1493, allotting to Spain all discoveries west and to Portugal all those east of an imaginary line drawn from pole to pole a hundred Spanish leagues west of the Azores and Cape Verde Islands, in each case on condition that the lands discovered were not already inhabited by Christians, and that the conquerors would make every effort to convert their new subjects to the Christian faith. The grant of the Pope, of course, merely confirmed a conquest of the sword, 
but it preserved the peace of the peninsular powers. No one seems to have thought that non-Christians had any rights to the lands in which they dwelt. If Alexander might distribute continents, he found it difficult to hold the Vatican. When Ferrante of Naples died in 1494, Charles VIII decided to invade Italy and restore Naples to French rule. Fearing deposition, Alexander went to the extraordinary step of soliciting help from the Sultan of the Turks. In July 1494, he sent a papal secretary, Giorgio Bocciardo, to warn Bajazet II that Charles VIII was planning to enter Italy, take Naples, depose or control the Pope, and use Jem as a pretender to the Ottoman throne in a crusade against Constantinople. Alexander proposed that Bajazet should make common cause with the papacy, Naples, and perhaps Venice, against the French. Bajazet received Bocciardo with oriental courtesy, sent him back with the 40,000 ducats due for the maintenance of Jem, and with an envoy of his own to Alexander. At Senegalia, Bocciardo was captured by Giovanni della Rovere, brother to the disaffected cardinal. The 40,000 ducats were seized, together with five letters allegedly from the sultan to the pope. One letter proposed that Alexander should put Jem to death and send the dead body to Constantinople. Upon its receipt, the sultan would pay the pope 300,000 ducats, or three and three-quarters million dollars, with which your highness may buy some dominions for your children. Cardinal della Rovere gave copies of the letters to the French king. Alexander claimed that the cardinal had forged the letters and had invented the whole story. The evidence supports the authenticity of Alexander's message to Bajazet, but discounts the sultan's reply as probably forged. Venice and Naples had already entered into similar negotiations with the Turks. Francis I would later do likewise. To rulers, religion, like almost everything else, is a tool of power. Charles came, advanced through friendly Milan and frightened Florence, and approached Rome in December of 1494. The Colonna supported him by preparing to invade the capital. A French fleet seized Ostia, Rome's port at the mouth of the Tiber, and threatened to stop the supply of grain from Sicily. Many cardinals, including Ascanio Sforza, declared for Charles. Virginio Orsini opened his castles to the king. Half the cardinals in Rome besought him to depose the pope. Alexander withdrew to Castel Sant'Angelo and sent envoys to treat with the conqueror. Charles did not wish, by attempting to remove the pope, to rouse Spain against him. His goal was Naples, whose wealth was ever in the thoughts of his officers. He made peace with Alexander on condition of an unimpeded passage for his army through Latium, papal forgiveness of the pro-French cardinals, and the surrender of Jem. Alexander yielded, returned to the Vatican, enjoyed Charles's three genuflections before him, graciously prevented him from kissing the papal feet, and received from the king the formal obedience of France. That is, all plans for deposing Alexander were withdrawn. On January 25, 1495, Charles moved on to Naples, taking Jem with him. On February 25, Jem died of bronchitis. Gossip said that the subtle Alexander had given him a slow poison, but no one any longer credits that tale. Once the French were gone, Alexander recovered his courage. Now, probably, he made up his mind that strong papal states, a good army and a good general were necessary to the safety of the popes from secular domination. With Venice, Germany, Spain, and Milan, he formed a holy league on March 31, 1495, ostensibly for mutual defense and for war against the Turks, secretly for the expulsion of the French from Italy. Charles took the hint, retreated through Rome to Pisa. Alexander, to avoid him, sojourned in Orvieto and Perugia. When Charles fled back to France, Alexander returned in triumph to Rome. He demanded of Florence that it should join the League and expel or silence Savonarola, friend of France and foe of the Pope. He reorganized the papal army, put his oldest surviving son Giovanni at its head, and bade him conquer for the papacy the revolted Orsini fortresses in 1496. But Giovanni was no general. He was defeated at Soriano, returned to Rome in disgrace, and pursued the careless gallantries that probably caused his early death. Nevertheless, Alexander recovered the strongholds sold to Virginio Orsini and recaptured Ostia from the French. Apparently victorious over all obstacles, he bade Pinturicchio paint on the walls of the papal apartment in Sant'Angelo frescoes picturing the triumph of the Pope over the king. Alexander was at the top of his curve. 3. The Sinner 
Rome applauded him for his internal administration and his successful, though hesitant, diplomacy. It reproved him mildly for his love affairs, vigorously for feathering the nests of his children, bitterly for appointing to office in Rome a host of Spaniards whose alien mien and speech set Italian teeth on edge. A hundred Spanish relatives of the Pope had flocked to Rome. Ten papacies, said one observer, would not have sufficed for all these cousins. Alexander himself was by this time fully Italian in his culture, policy, and ways, but he still loved Spain, spoke Spanish too frequently with Caesar and Lucrezia, elevated nineteen Spaniards to the cardinalate, and surrounded himself with Catalan servants and aides. Finally, the jealous Romans, half in humor, half in wrath, called him the Morano Pope, implying his descent from Christianized Spanish Jews. Alexander excused himself on the ground that many Italians, especially in the College of Cardinals, had proved faithless to him, and that he had to have about him a nucleus of supporters bound to him by a personal loyalty based on their awareness that he was their sole protector in Rome. He, and the princes of Europe down to Napoleon, argued likewise in promoting relatives to positions of trust and power. He hoped for a while that his son Giovanni might help him to protect the papal states, but Giovanni had inherited his father's sensitivity to women without Alexander's capacity to govern men. Perceiving that of his sons only Caesar had in him the iron and gall necessary to play the game of Italian politics in that violent age, Alexander conferred upon him a maze of benefices whose income would finance the youth's rising power. Even the gentle Lucrezia was an instrument of policy, and found herself promoted to the governorship of a city or the bed of a valuable duke. The Pope's fondness for Lucrezia led him to such shows of affection that cruel gossip accused him of incest, and pictured him as competing with his sons for her love. On two occasions, when he had to be absent from Rome, Alexander left Lucrezia in charge of his rooms in the Vatican, with authority to open his correspondence and attend to all routine business. Such delegation of power to a woman was frequent in the ruling houses of Italy, as in Ferrara, Urbino, and Mantua, but it mildly shocked even blasé Rome. When Geoffrey and Sancia arrived from Naples after their wedding, Caesar and Lucrezia went out to meet them. All four then hurried to the Vatican, and Alexander was happy to have them near him. Other popes, to conceal their infamy, says Guicciardini, were wont to term their offspring nephews, but Alexander took delight in letting all the world know that they were his children. The city had forgiven the pope his pristine Bonozza, but marveled at his current Julia. Julia Farnese was noted for her beauty, above all for her golden hair. When she let it down and it hung to her feet, it was a sight that would have stirred the blood of men less meddlesome than Alexander. Her friends called her La Bella. Sanudo speaks of her as the Pope's favorite, a young woman of great beauty and understanding, gracious and gentle. In 1493, Infesura described her as attending Lucrezia's nuptial banquet in the Vatican and called her Alexander's concubine. Matarazzo, the Perugian historian, used the same term for Julia, but probably copied Infesura and a Florentine wit in 1494 called her Sposa di Cristo, Bride of Christ, a phrase usually reserved for the Church. Some scholars have sought to clear Julia on the ground that Lucrezia, who has been made respectable by research, remained her friend to the end, and that Julia's husband, Orsino Orsini, built a chapel to her honored memory. In 1492, Julia gave birth to a daughter, Laura, who was officially listed as begotten by Orsini, but Cardinal Alessandro Farnese recognized the girl as Alexander's child. By yet another woman, the Pope was credited with having a mysterious son, born about 1498, and known in Burchard's diary as Infants Romanus. It is not certain, but one more or less hardly matters. There is no question that Alexander was a sensual man, full-blooded to a degree painfully uncongenial to celibacy. When he gave a public festival in the Vatican, at which a comedy was performed in February 1503, he rumbled with amusement, and was pleased to have fair women crowd about him and seat themselves gracefully on footstools at his feet. He was a man. He seems to have felt, like many clergymen of the time, that clerical celibacy was a mistake of Hildebrand's, and that even a cardinal should be permitted the pleasures and tribulations of female company. He showed feelings of husbandly tenderness for Vanozza, and perhaps a paternal solicitude for Julia. On the other hand, his devotion to his children, sometimes overriding his fidelity to the interests of the church, could well be used to argue the wisdom of the canon law requiring celibacy of a priest. In these middle years of his pontificate, before Caesar Borgia overshadowed it, Alexander had many virtues. 
though he bore himself with proud dignity at public functions. In private he was jovial, good-natured, sanguine, eager to enjoy life, capable of a hearty laugh at seeing, from his window, a parade of masked men with long false noses of great size in the form of the male member. He was a bit stout now, if we may trust Pinterecchio's apparently honest picture of him, praying on the apartamento wall. And yet all reports concur that he lived frugally, on so plain a fare that the cardinals shunned his table. He was unsparing of himself in administration, working till late at night and watching actively over the affairs of the church everywhere in Christendom. Was his Christianity a pretense? Probably not. His letters, even those concerning Julia, are warm with phrases of piety that were not indispensable in private correspondence. He was so much a man of action and had so thoroughly absorbed the easy morals of his time that he only sporadically noted any contradiction between Christian ethics and his life. Like most persons completely orthodox in theology, he was completely worldly in conduct. He seems to have felt that in his circumstances the papacy needed a statesman, not a saint. He admired sanctity, but thought it belonged to monasticism and private life rather than to a man compelled to deal at every step with subtle and acquisitive despots or unscrupulous and treacherous diplomats. He ended by adopting all their methods and the most questionable devices of his predecessors in the papacy. Needing funds for his government and his wars, he sold offices, took over the estates of dead cardinals, and exploited the jubilee of 1500 to the full. Dispensations and divorces were given as profitable parts of political bargains. So King Ladislaus VII of Hungary paid 30,000 ducats for the annulment of his marriage with Beatrice of Naples. Had Henry VIII such an Alexander to deal with, he would have remained to the end a defender of the faith. When the Jubilee threatened to be a financial disappointment because would-be pilgrims stayed home through fear of robbery, pestilence, or war, Alexander, not to be cheated, and following pontifical precedents, issued a bull on March 4, 1500, detailing by what payments Christians might obtain the Jubilee indulgence without coming to Rome, at what cost penitents might gain absolution from consanguineous marriages, and how much a clergyman should pay to be forgiven simony and irregularity. On December 16th he extended the Jubilee till Epiphany. The collectors promised payers that the funds gathered in by the Jubilee would be used in a crusade against the Turks. The promise was kept in the case of Polish and Venetian collections, but Caesar Borgia used Jubilee proceeds to finance his campaigns for the recovery of the Papal States. To further celebrate the Jubilee, Alexander, on September 28, 1500, created twelve new cardinals, who paid a total of 120,000 ducats for their appointment. And these promotions, says Guicciardini, were made not of such as had the most merit, but of those that offered the most money. In 1503 he named nine additional cardinals at a commensurate price. In the same year he created, ex nihilo, eighty new offices in the Curia, and these places, according to the hostile Venetian ambassador Giustiniani, were sold at 760 ducats each. A satirist attached to the statue of Pasquino in 1503 a stinging pasquinade. Vendit Alexander Claves, Altaria Christum, Vendere Jure Potest, Emirat Ipse Prius. The keys, the altars, Alexander sells, and Christ, with right, since he has paid for them. By canon law, the property left by an ecclesiastic at his death reverted to the church, except as the Pope might otherwise allow. Alexander regularly gave such dispensations except in the case of cardinals. Under pressure from the victorious but money-consuming Caesar Borgia, Alexander made it a general principle to appropriate the fortunes left by high ecclesiastics. In this way, substantial sums came into the treasury. Some cardinals eluded the Pope by making large gifts in expectation of death, and some, during their lives, deliberately squandered great sums on their funeral monuments. When Cardinal Michiel died in 1503, his house was immediately stripped of its wealth by the agents of the Pope, who, if we may believe Giustiniani, netted 150,000 ducats. Alexander complained that only 23,832 were in cash. Deferring fuller consideration of the alleged poisonings by Alexander or Caesar Borgia of high ecclesiastics who took too long to die, we may provisionally accept the conclusion of recent research that there is no evidence that Alexander VI poisoned anybody. This does not quite clear him. He may have been too clever for history, but he could not escape the satirists pamphleteers and other wits who sold their deadly epigrams to his opponents. 
We have seen how Sanazzaro belabored Pope and son with lethal couplets in the strife between the papacy and Naples. Infesura served the Colonna with his scandal-mongering pen, and Geronimo Mancione was worth a regiment to the Savelli barons. Alexander, as part of his campaign against the Campania nobles, issued in 1501 a bull detailing the crimes and vices of the Savelli and the Colonna. Its exaggerations were bettered in Mancioni's famous letter to Silvio Savelli, retailing the vices and crimes of Alexander and Caesar Borgia. This document was widely circulated and did much to create the legend of Alexander as a monster of perversions and cruelty. Alexander won the Battle of the Sword, but his noble foes, unchecked by his enemy Pope Julius II, won the Battle of the Word and transmitted their picture of him to history. He paid too little attention to public opinion and rarely answered the slanders that so mercilessly multiplied the reality of his faults. He was resolved to build a strong state and thought that it could not be done by Christian means. His use of the traditional tools of statecraft, propaganda, deception, intrigue, discipline, war, was bound to offend those who preferred a Christian church to a strong one and those to whose advantage it was that the papacy and the papal states should be disorganized and weak among the nobles of Rome and the powers of Italy. Occasionally Alexander stopped to examine his life by evangelical standards, and then he admitted himself to be a simoniac, a fornicator, even, through war, a destroyer of human lives. Once, when his lucky star seemed suddenly to fall and all his proud and happy world seemed shattered, he lost his Machiavellian amoralism, confessed his sins, and vowed to reform himself and the church. He loved his son Giovanni even more than his daughter Lucrezia. When Pedro Luis died, Alexander sought to it that Giovanni should receive the Duchy of Gandia in Spain. It was easy to love the lad. He was so handsome, kindly, gay. The fond father did not perceive that the youth was made for Eros, not for Mars. He made him a general, and the young commander proved incompetent. Giovanni thought a beautiful woman more precious than a captured city. On June 14, 1497, he supped with his brother Caesar and other guests at the home of his mother Venozza. As they were returning, Giovanni parted from Caesar and the rest, saying that he wished to visit a lady of his acquaintance. He was never seen alive again. When his disappearance was noted, the anxious Pope sent out an alarm. A boatman confessed that he had seen a body thrown into the Tiber on the night of the 14th. Asked why he had not reported it, he replied that in the course of his life he had seen a hundred such disposals, and had learned not to trouble himself about them. The river was dragged, the body was found, stabbed in nine places. Apparently the young duke had been attacked by several men. Alexander was so broken with grief that he shut himself up in a private chamber and refused food, and his moans could be heard in the street. He ordered a search for the murderers, but perhaps he soon reconciled himself to letting the case remain a mystery. The body had been recovered near the castle of Antonio Pico della Mirandola, whose pretty daughter had allegedly been seduced by the duke. Many contemporaries, like the Mantuan ambassador Scalona, ascribed the death to thugs hired by the count, and this is still the likeliest explanation. Others, including the Florentine and Milanese ambassadors at Rome, attributed the crime to some member of the Orsini clan, then at war with the Pope. Some scandal-sippers said that Giovanni had made love to his sister Lucrezia and had been killed by retainers of her husband Giovanni Sforza. No one at the time accused Caesar Borgia. Caesar, now twenty-two, had apparently been on the best of terms with his brother. He was a cardinal and was moving in his own line of advancement. Not till fourteen months later did he turn to a military career. He derived no advantage from his brother's death. He could hardly have anticipated that Giovanni would leave him on the way home from Venozza. Alexander, so far from suspecting Caesar at this time, appointed him Giovanni's executor. The first known mention of Caesar as the possible murderer occurs in a letter written by the Ferrarese ambassador, Pigna, on February 22, 1498, eight months after the event. Not till Caesar had shown his character in all its ruthless force did popular opinion connect him with the crime. Then Machiavelli and Guicciardini agreed in laying it at his door. He might have been capable of it at a later stage of his development, and Giovanni opposed him in some vital policy. But of this particular murder he almost certainly was innocent. When the Pope had recovered his self-control, he called a consistory of the cardinals on June 19, 1497, received their condolences, told them that he had loved the Duke of Gandia more than anyone else in the world, and attributed the blow, the heaviest that could have befallen him, to God as a punishment for his sins. He went on, We on our part are resolved to amend our life and to reform the Church, 
Henceforth, benefices shall be given only to deserving persons and in accordance with the votes of the cardinals. We renounce all nepotism. We will begin the reform with ourselves and so proceed through all ranks of the church till the whole work is accomplished. A committee of six cardinals was appointed to draw up a program of reform. It labored earnestly and presented to Alexander a bull of reform so excellent that if its provisions had been put into effect, they might have saved the church from both the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation. But when Alexander faced the question of how the revenues of the papacy, without the fees paid for ecclesiastical appointments, could finance the papal government, he found no acceptable answer. Meanwhile, Louis XII was preparing a second French invasion of Italy, and soon Caesar Borgia proposed to recapture the papal states from their recalcitrant vicars. The dream of a powerful political structure that would give the church a physical and financial leverage in a rebellious and fluent world absorbed the spirit of the Pope. He deferred the reforms from day to day. At last he forgot them in the exciting successes of a son who was conquering a realm for him and making him every ounce a king. 4. Caesar Borgia Alexander had many reasons to be proud of his now oldest son. Caesar was blond of hair and beard, as many Italians wanted to be, keen of eye, tall and straight, strong, and a stranger to fear. Of him, as of Leonardo, his courage and skill, he left the arena to the professionals. He introduced the sport into the Romagna, as well as at Rome, but after a few amateur matadors had been gored, it was sent back to Spain. To think of him as an ogre is to miss him widely. One contemporary called him a young man of great and surpassing cleverness and excellent disposition, cheerful, even merry, and always in good spirits. Another described him as far superior in looks and wit to his brother, the Duke of Gandia. Men noted his grace of manner, his simple but costly garb, his commanding glance, and air of one who felt that he inherited the world. Women admired but did not love him. They knew that he took them lightly and lightly cast them aside. He had studied law in the University of Perugia, enough to sharpen the natural shrewdness of his mind. He spared little time for books or culture, though like everybody he wrote verses now and then. Later he flaunted a poet on his staff. He had a discriminating appreciation of the arts. When Cardinal Raffaello Riario refused to buy a Cupid because it was no antique but the work of an unknown Florentine youth, Michelangelo Buonarroti, Caesar gave a good price for it. He was clearly not made for an ecclesiastical career, but Alexander, having bishoprics rather than principalities at his disposal, made him Archbishop of Valencia in 1492, then Cardinal in 1493. No one took such appointments as religious. They were means of supplying income to youths who had influential relatives and who might be trained for the practical management of ecclesiastical property and personnel. Caesar took minor orders but never became a priest. Since canon law excluded bastards from the cardinalate, Alexander, in a bull of September 19, 1493, declared him the legitimate son of Venozza and Darignano. It was inconvenient that in a bull of August 16, 1482, Sixtus IV had described Caesar as the son of Rodrigo, bishop and vice-chancellor. The public winked and smiled, accustomed to see legal fictions veil untimely truths. In 1497, shortly after Giovanni's death, Caesar went to Naples as papal legate and had the thrill of crowning a king. Perhaps the touch of a crown stirred his blood. On his return to Rome, he importuned his father to let him renounce his ecclesiastical career. There was no way of releasing him from it except through Alexander's frank admission to the College of Cardinals that Caesar was his illegitimate son. It was so done, and the appointment of the young bastard to the cardinalate was duly declared invalid, on August 17, 1498, his illegitimacy restored, Caesar turned with zest to the game of politics. Alexander hoped that Federigo III, king of Naples, would accept Caesar as husband for his daughter, Carlotta. But Federigo had different tastes. Deeply offended, the Pope turned to France, hoping to secure its help in reclaiming the Papal States. An opportunity came when Louis XII asked for the annulment of a marriage that had been forced upon him in his youth, and which he claimed had never been consummated. In October 1498, Alexander sent Caesar to France bearing a decree of divorce for the king and two thousand ducats with which to woo a bride. Pleased with the divorce, further pleased by a papal dispensation to marry Anne of Brittany, widow of Charles VIII, 
Louis offered Caesar the hand of Charlotte d'Albray, sister to the King of Navarre. Moreover, he made Caesar Duke of Valentinois and Diwa, two French territories to which the papacy had some legal claim. In May 1499, the new Duke, Valentino, as he was henceforth called in Italy, married the good, beautiful, and wealthy Charlotte, and Rome, told the news by Alexander, lit bonfires of rejoicing over the marriage of their prince. The marriage committed the papacy to an alliance with the king who was openly planning to invade Italy and take Milan and Naples. Alexander was as guilty in 1499 as Lodovico and Savonarola had been in 1494. This alliance undid all the work of the Holy League that Alexander had helped to form in 1495, and it prepared the scene for the wars of Julius II. Caesar Borgia was among the notables who escorted Louis XII into Milan on October 6, 1499. Castiglione, who was there, described Duke Valentino as the tallest and handsomest man in all the king's stately retinue. His pride matched his appearance. His ring bore the inscription, Fais ce que doit, advien que pourra. Do what you must, whate'er be tied. His sword was engraved with scenes from the life of Julius Caesar, and bore two mottos. On one side, alea iacta est, the die is cast. On the other, out Caesar, out Nullus, either Caesar or nobody. In this bold youth and happy warrior, Alexander found at last the general he had long sought to lead the armed forces of the church in the reconquest of the papal states. Louis contributed three hundred French lances, four thousand Gascons and Swiss were recruited, and two thousand Italian mercenaries. It was a small army with which to overcome a dozen despots, but Caesar was eager for the adventure. To add spiritual to military weapons, the Pope issued a bull, solemnly declaring that Caterina Sforza and her son, Ottaviano, held Imola and Forli, Pandolfo Malatesta held Rimini, Giulio Varano held Camerino, Astore Manfredi held Faenza, Guidobaldo held Urbino, Giovanni Sforza held Pesaro, only by usurping lands, property, and rights long pertaining in law and justice to the Church that they were all tyrants who had abused their powers and exploited their subjects, and that they must now resign or be expelled by force. Possibly, as some charged, Alexander dreamed of welding these principalities into a kingdom for his son. It is unlikely, for Alexander must have known that neither his successors nor the other states of Italy would long tolerate a usurpation more illegal and unwelcome than any that it would have replaced. Caesar himself may have dreamed of such a consummation, Machiavelli hoped so, and would have rejoiced to see so strong a hand unite all Italy and expel all invaders. But to the end of his life Caesar protested that he had no other aim than to win the states of the Church for the Church, and would be content to be a governor of the Romagna as a vassal of the Pope. In January 1500 Caesar and his army marched over the Apennines to Forli. Imola surrendered at once to his deputy, and the citizens of Forli threw open the gates to welcome him. But Caterina Sforza, as she had done twelve years before, bravely held the citadel with her garrison. Caesar offered her easy terms. She preferred to fight. After a brief siege, the papal troops forced their way into the Rocca and put the defenders to the sword. Caterina was sent to Rome and was lodged as an unwilling guest in the Belvedere wing of the Vatican. She refused to resign her right to rule Forli and Imola. She tried to escape and was transferred to Sant'Angelo. After eighteen months, she was released and entered a nunnery. She was a brave woman, but quite a virago. She was a feudal ruler of the worst type, and in her dominions, as elsewhere in the Romagna, Caesar was regarded as an avenger commissioned by heaven to redress ages of oppression and wrong. But Caesar's first triumph was brief. His foreign troops mutinied because Caesar had insufficient funds to pay them. They were hardly appeased when Louis XII recalled the French detachment to help him recapture the Milan that Lodovico had for a moment regained. Caesar led his remaining army back to Rome and received almost the honors of a victorious Roman general. Alexander gloried in his son's success. The Pope, reported the Venetian ambassador, is more cheerful than ever. He appointed Caesar papal vicar for the conquered cities and began to lean fondly on his son's advice. The receipts from the Jubilee and from the sale of red hats replenished the treasury, and Caesar could now plan a second campaign. He offered a convincing sum to Paolo Ursini to join the papal forces with his armed men. Paolo came, and several other nobles followed suit. 
With this clever stroke, Caesar enlarged his army and protected Rome from baronial raids during the absence of the papal troops beyond the Apennines. Perhaps by similar inducements and the promise of spoils, he enlisted the services and soldiers of Gian Paolo Baglioni, lord of Perugia, and engaged Vitalozzo Vitelli to lead the artillery. Louis XII sent him a small regiment of lancers, but Caesar was no longer dependent upon French reinforcements. In September 1500, at Alexander's urging, he attacked the castles occupied by hostile Colonna and Savelli in Latium. One after another surrendered. Soon Alexander was enabled to make a tour in safety and triumph through regions long lost to the papacy. He was received everywhere with popular acclaim, for the feudal barons had not been loved by their subjects. When Caesar set out on his second major campaign in October 1500, he had an army of 14,000 men, with a retinue of poets, prelates, and prostitutes to service his troops. Anticipating their arrival, Pandolfo Malatesta vacated Rimini, and Giovanni Sforza fled from Pizarro. The two cities welcomed Caesar as a liberator. At Faenza, Astori Manfredi resisted, and the people supported him loyally. Borgia offered generous terms. Manfredi rejected them. The siege lasted all winter. Finally, Faenza surrendered on Caesar's promise of leniency to all. He behaved handsomely to the citizens, and was so warm in praising Manfredi's resolute defense that the defeated apparently fell in love with the victor, and remained with him as part of his staff or retinue. Astore's younger brother did the same, though both were free to go wherever they wished. For two months they followed Caesar in all his wanderings, and were treated with all respect. Then, suddenly on reaching Rome, they were thrown into the Castel Sant'Angelo. There they remained for a year. Then, on June 2nd, 1502, their bodies were thrown up by the Tiber. What made Caesar or Alexander condemn them is not known. Like a hundred other strange events in the history of the Borgias, the case remains a mystery that only the uninformed can solve. Caesar, now adding Duke of Romagna to his titles, studied the map and decided to complete the task assigned him by his father. Camerino and Urbino remained to be taken. Urbino, though doubtless papal in law, was almost a model state as politics then went. It seemed a disgraceful thing to depose so loved a couple as Guidobaldo and Elisabetta, and perhaps they would now have consented to be papal vicars, in fact as well as name. But Caesar argued that the city blocked his easiest avenue to the Adriatic, and might, in hostile hands, cut off his communications with Pizarro and Rimini. We do not know if Alexander agreed. It seems incredible, for about this time he persuaded Guido Baldo to lend the papal army his artillery. It is more likely that Caesar deceived his father, or changed his own plans. On June 12, 1502, now with Leonardo da Vinci as his chief engineer, he set out on his third campaign, apparently headed for Camerino. Suddenly he turned north and approached Urbino so rapidly that its invalid ruler had barely time to escape, leaving the city to fall undefended into Caesar's hands on June 21st. If this move was made with Alexander's knowledge and consent, it was one of the most despicable treacheries in history, though Machiavelli would have been thrilled by its subtlety. The victor treated the inhabitants with feline gentleness, but appropriated the precious art collection of the fallen duke and sold it to pay his troops. Meanwhile, his general Vitelli, apparently on his own authority, seized Arezzo, long since an appanage of Florence. The shocked signory sent the bishop of Volterra with Machiavelli to appeal to Caesar at Urbino. He received them with successful charm. I am not here to play the tyrant, he told them, but to extinguish tyrants. He agreed to check Vitelli and restore Arezzo to Florentine allegiance. In return, he demanded a definite policy of mutual friendliness between Florence and himself. The bishop thought him sincere, and Machiavelli wrote to the signory with undiplomatic enthusiasm. This lord is splendid and magnificent, and is so bold that there is no enterprise so great that it does not seem to him small. To gain glory and dominions he robs himself of repose, and knows neither danger nor fatigue. He comes to a place before his intentions are understood. He makes himself well liked among his soldiers, and has chosen the best men in Italy. These things make him victorious and formidable, with the aid of perpetual good fortune. On July 20th Camerino surrendered to Caesar's lieutenants, and the papal states were papal again. Directly or by proxy, Caesar gave them such good government as seemed to vindicate his claim to be a deposer of tyrants. Later, all of them but Urbino and Faenza would mourn his fall. Hearing that Gian Francesco Gonzaga, Elisabetta's brother and Isabella's husband, had gone with several other prominent men to Milan to turn Louis XII against him, 
Caesar hurried across Italy, confronted his enemies, and quickly regained the favor of the king in August 1502. It is deserving of a note that up to this point, and even after his most questionable exploit, a bishop, a king, and a diplomat, later famous for subtlety, should have joined in admiring Caesar and accepting the justice of his conduct and his aims. Nevertheless, Italy was dotted with men who prayed for his fall. Venice, though it had made him an honorary citizen, Gentiluomo di Venezia, was not happy to see the papal states so strong again and controlling so much of the Adriatic shore. Florence fretted at the thought that Forli, only eight miles from Florentine territory, was in the hands of an incalculable and unscrupulous young genius of statecraft and war. Pisa offered itself to his rule in December 1502. He politely refused. But what if he changed his course, as on the way to Camerino? The gifts that Isabella sent him were perhaps a blind to disguise the resentment she and Mantua felt against his rape of Urbino. The Colonna and Savelli, and in less degree the Orsini, had been ruined by his victories, and merely bided their time to raise some coalition against him. His own best men, who had led his cohorts brilliantly, were not sure but that he might attack their territories next, some of which were also claimed by the Church. John Paolo Baglioni trembled for his hold on Perugia, Giovanni Bentivoglio for his rule in Bologna. Paolo Orsini and Francesco Orsini, Duke of Gravina, wondered how long it would be before Caesar would do to the Orsini clan what he had done to the Colonna. Vitelli, raging at being forced to relinquish Arezzo, invited these men, and Oliverotto of Fermo, and Pandolfo Petrucci of Siena, and representatives of Guidobaldo, to meet at La Magione on Lake Trasimene in September 1502. There they agreed to turn their troops against Caesar, capture and depose him, end his rule in the Romagna and the marches, and restore the dispossessed lords. It was a formidable plot, whose success would have brought to a sorry issue the best laid plans of Alexander and his son. The conspiracy began with brilliant victories. Revolts were organized in Urbino and Camerino with the support of the people. The papal garrisons there were expelled. Guido Baldo returned to his palace on October 18, 1502. Everywhere the fallen lords raised their heads and planned to return to power. Caesar suddenly found that his lieutenants would not obey him and that his forces were reduced to a point where he could not possibly hold his conquests. In this crisis, Cardinal Ferrari opportunely died. Alexander hurriedly appropriated the 50,000 ducats left by him and sold some of the cardinal's benefices. He turned over the receipts to Caesar, who rapidly raised a new army of 6,000 men. In the meantime, Alexander negotiated individually with the conspirators, made them fair promises, and won so many of them back to obedience that by the end of October they had all made their peace with Caesar. It was an astonishing feat of diplomacy. Caesar received their apologies with silent skepticism, and he noted that though Guido Baldo again fled from Urbino, the Orsini still held the duchy's strongholds with their troops. In December, Caesar's lieutenants, at his bidding, besieged Senegalia on the Adriatic. This book is continued on Cassette 3, Side 1. The Story of Civilization, Volume 5, The Renaissance, Part 2 by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 3, Side 1. In December, Caesar's lieutenants, at his bidding, besieged Senegalia on the Adriatic. The town soon yielded, but the governor of the castle refused to surrender it except to Caesar himself. A message was sent to the duke at Cesena. He hastened down the coast, followed by 2,800 soldiers especially devoted to him. Arriving at Senegalia, he greeted with apparent cordiality the four leaders of the conspiracy, Vitellozzo Vitelli, Paolo and Francesco Orsini, and Oliverotto. He invited them to a conference with him in the governor's palace. When they came, he had them arrested, and that very night, December 31, 1502, he had Vitelli and Oliverotto strangled. The two Orsini were kept in prison till Caesar could communicate with his father. Apparently, Alexander's views agreed with his sons, and on January 18th, the two men were put to death. Caesar prided himself on his clever stroke at Senegalia. He thought Italy should thank him for ridding it so neatly of four men who were not only feudal usurpers of church lands, but had been reactionary oppressors of helpless subjects. Perhaps he felt a qualm or two, for he excused himself to Machiavelli. It is proper to snare those who are proving themselves past masters in the art of snaring others. Machiavelli fully agreed with him, 
and considered Caesar at this time the bravest and wisest man in Italy. Paolo Jovio, historian and bishop, called the quadruple extinction of the conspirators Bellissimo Ingano, a most lovely ruse. Isabella d'Este, playing safe, sent Caesar congratulations and a hundred masks to amuse him after the fatigues and struggles of this glorious expedition. Louis XII hailed the coup as a deed worthy of the great days of Rome. Alexander was now free to express his full rage at the conspiracy against his son and the reclaimed cities of the church. He claimed to have evidence that Cardinal Orsini had plotted with his relatives to assassinate Caesar. He had the cardinal and several other suspects arrested on January 3, 1503. He seized the cardinal's palace and confiscated all his goods. The cardinal died in prison on February 22nd, probably through excitement and exhaustion. Rome speculated that the pope had had him poisoned. Alexander advised Caesar to root out the Orsini completely from Rome and the Campania. Caesar was not so anxious. Perhaps he too was exhausted. He delayed returning to the capital and then set out unwillingly to besiege Giulio Orsini's mighty fortress at Cherry on March 14, 1503. In this siege, perhaps in others, Borgia used some of Leonardo's war machines. One was a movable tower, holding 300 men and capable of being raised to the top of the enemy's walls. Giulio surrendered and went with Caesar to the Vatican to ask for peace. The Pope granted it on condition that all Orsini castles in papal territory should be given up to the Church. It was done. In the meantime, Perugia and Fermo had quietly accepted the governors sent them by Caesar. Bologna was still unredeemed, but Ferrara had joyfully received Lucrezia Borgia as its duchess. Aside from these two major principalities, which would occupy Alexander's successors, the reconquest of the papal states was complete and Caesar Borgia, at twenty-eight, found himself the governor of a realm equaled in size in the peninsula only by the kingdom of Naples. He was now by common consent the most remarkable and powerful man in Italy. For a time he remained in unwanted quiet at the Vatican. We should have expected him at this point to send for his wife. He did not. He had left her with her family in France, and she had borne him a child during his wars. Occasionally he wrote to her and sent her gifts, but he never saw her again. The Duchesse de Valentinois lived a modest and retired life in Bourges, or in the Chateau de la Montfeuille in the Dauphiné, waiting hopefully to be sent for or to have her husband come to her. When he was ruined and deserted, she tried to go to him. When he died, she hung her house with black and remained in mourning for him until her death. Perhaps he would have sent for her later, had he been given more than a few months of peace. More likely, he looked upon the marriage as purely political and felt no obligation to tenderness. There was apparently only a modicum of tenderness in him, and he kept most of that for Lucrezia, whom he loved as much as he could love a woman. Even when hurrying from Urbino to Milan to circumvent his foes with Louis XII, he had gone considerably out of his way to visit his sister at Ferrara, then dangerously ill. Returning from Milan, he stopped there again, held her in his arms while physicians bled her and stayed with her till she was out of danger. Caesar was not made for marriage. He had mistresses, but none for long. He was too consumed by the will to power to let any woman enter possessively into his life. In Rome he lived in privacy, almost in concealment. He worked at night and was rarely seen by day. But he worked hard, even in this period of seeming rest. He kept close watch on his appointees in the states of the church, punished those who misused their position, had one appointee put to death for cruelty and exploitation, and always found time to see men who needed his instructions on the government of the Romagna or the maintenance of order in Rome. Those who knew him respected his shrewd intelligence, his capacity for going directly to the heart of the matter, for seizing every opportunity that chance presented, and for taking quick, decisive, and effective action. He was popular with his soldiers, who secretly admired the saving severity of his discipline. They highly approved of the bribes, stratagems, and deceits by which he reduced the number and persistence of his enemies and the battles and casualties of his troops. Diplomats were chagrined to find that this swift-moving and fearless young general could outthink them and outreason them in their shrewdest subtleties, and could at need match all their charm and tact and eloquence. His flair for secrecy made him an easy victim for the satirists of Italy, and for the ugly rumors that hostile ambassadors or deposed aristocrats might invent or spread. It is impossible today to separate fact from fiction in these lurid reports. 
A favorite story was that Alexander and his son made a practice of arresting rich ecclesiastics on trumped-up charges and releasing them on the payment of large ransoms or fines. So, it was alleged, the bishop of Cesena, for a crime whose nature was not divulged, was cast into Sant'Angelo and was freed on paying ten thousand ducats to the Pope. We cannot say whether this was justice or robbery. In fairness to Alexander, we should bear in mind that it was then the custom of both secular and ecclesiastical courts to make crime pay the court by replacing expensive imprisonment with lucrative fines. According to the Venetian ambassador Giustiniani and the Florentine ambassador Vittorio Soderini, Jews were frequently arrested on charges of heresy and could prove their orthodoxy only by substantial contributions to the papal treasury. It is possible, but Rome was known for its relatively decent treatment of the Jews, and no Jew was considered a heretic or was prosecuted by the Inquisition for being a Jew. Many rumors charged the Borgias with poisoning rich cardinals to accelerate the reversion of their estates to the church. Some such casualties seemed so well attested, rather by repetition than by evidence, that Protestant historians generally accepted them as late as the judicious Jacob Burckhardt, 1818-1897. And the Catholic historian Pastor believed it extremely probable that Caesar poisoned Cardinal Michiel in order to obtain the money that he wanted. This conclusion was founded on the fact that under Julius II, extremely hostile to Alexander, a subdeacon, Aquino de Coloredo, being put to the torture, confessed that he had poisoned Cardinal Michiel at the behest of Alexander and Caesar. A twentieth-century historian may be excused for being skeptical of confessions elicited by torture. An enterprising statistician has shown that the death rate among cardinals was no higher in Alexander's pontificate than before or afterward. But there is no doubt that Rome, in the last three years of that reign, thought it dangerous to be a cardinal and rich. Isabella d'Este wrote to her husband to be careful what he said about Caesar, for he does not scruple to conspire against those of his own blood. Apparently she accepted the tale that he had killed the Duke of Gandia. Roman gossip talked about a slow poison, Cantarella, whose base was arsenic, and which, dropped as a powder into food or into drink, even into the sacramental wine of the Mass, would produce a leisurely death difficult to trace to its human cause. Historians now generally reject the slow poisons of the Renaissance as legendary, but believe that in one or two cases the Borgias poisoned rich cardinals. Further research may reduce these cases to zero. Worse stories are told of Caesar. To amuse Alexander and Lucrezia, we are assured, he released into a courtyard several prisoners who had been sentenced to death, and, from a safe point, showed his bowmanship by shooting fatal arrows into one after another of the convicts as they sought some refuge from his shafts. Our sole authority for this tale is the Venetian envoy Capello. It is rather less probable that Caesar did this than that a diplomat should lie. Much history of the Renaissance popes has been written on the authority of war propaganda and diplomatic lies. The most incredible of the Borgia horrors appears in the usually reliable diary of Alexander's master of ceremonies, Burkhardt. Under October 30th, 1501, the Diarium describes a dinner in the apartment of Caesar Borgia in the Vatican, at which nude courtesans chased chestnuts scattered over the floor while Alexander and Lucrezia looked on. The story appears also in the Perugian historian Matarazzo, who took it not from Burckhardt, for the Diarium was still secret, but from gossip that ranged out of Rome through Italy. The thing was known far and wide, he says. If so, it is strange that the Ferrarese ambassador, who was in Rome at the time, and was later commissioned to investigate the morals of Lucrezia and her fitness to marry Alfonso, son of Duke Ercole, made no mention of the story in his report, but, as we shall see, gave a most favorable account of her. Either he was bribed by Alexander, or he ignored unverified gossip. But how did the story get into Burkhardt's diary? He does not profess to have been present, and could hardly be, for he was a man of sturdy morals. Normally he included in his notes only such events as he had witnessed, or such as had been reported to him on good authority. Was the story interpolated into the manuscript? Of the original manuscript, only twenty-six pages survive, all concerning the period following Alexander's final illness. Of the remainder of the diarium, only copies exist. All these copies carry the story. It may have been interpolated by a hostile scribe who thought to liven a dry chronicle with a juicy tale. Or Burkhardt may for once have allowed gossip to creep into his notes, or the original may have marked it as gossip. Probably the story was based on an actual banquet, and the lurid fringe was added by fancy or spite. 
The Florentine ambassador, Francesco Pepe, always hostile to the Borgias, since Florence was almost always at odds with them, reported on the morrow of the affair that the Pope had stayed up till a late hour in the apartments of Caesar the night before, and there had been dancing and laughter. There is no mention of the courtesans. It is incredible that a Pope who was at this time making every effort to marry his daughter to the heir of the Duchy of Ferrara should have risked the marriage and a vital diplomatic alliance by allowing Lucrezia to witness such a spectacle. But let us look at Lucrezia. 5. Lucrezia Borgia, 1480-1519 Alexander admired, perhaps feared, his son, but he loved his daughter with all the emotional intensity of his nature. He seems to have taken profounder pleasure in her moderate beauty, in her long golden hair, so heavy that it gave her headaches, in the rhythm of her light form dancing, and in the filial devotion that she gave him through all contumely and bereavements, than he ever derived from the charms of Venoza or Giulia. She was not particularly fair, but she was described in her youth as dolce ciera, sweet face. And amid all the coarseness and looseness of her times and her environment, through all the disillusionments of divorce and the horror of seeing her husband murdered almost before her eyes, she kept this sweet face to her pious end, for it was a frequent theme in Ferrari's poetry. Pinturicchio's portrait of her, in the Borgia apartment of the Vatican, agrees well with this description of her in her youth. Like all Italian girls who could afford it, she went to a convent for her education. At an unknown age, she passed from the house of her mother, Venoza, to that of Donna Adriana Mila, a cousin of Alexander. There she formed a lifelong friendship with Adriana's daughter-in-law, Giulia Farnese, alleged mistress of her father. Favored with every good fortune except legitimacy, Lucrezia grew up in a gay and joyous girlhood, and Alexander was happy in her happiness. This carefree youth was ended by marriage. Probably she was not offended when her father chose a husband for her. That was then normal procedure for all good girls, and produced no more unhappiness than our own reliance on the selective wisdom of romantic love. Alexander, like any ruler, thought that the marriages of his children should advance the interests of the state. This, too, doubtless seemed reasonable to Lucrezia. Naples was then hostile to the papacy, and Milan was hostile to Naples, so her first marriage bound her, at the age of thirteen, to Giovanni Sforza, aged twenty-six, lord of Pesaro and nephew to Lodovico, regent of Milan, this in 1493. Alexander amused himself paternally by arranging a handsome home for the couple in Cardinal Zeno's palace, close to the Vatican. But Sforza had to live at Pesaro part of the time and took his young bride with him. She languished on those distant shores, far from her doting father and the excitement and splendor of Rome. And after a few months, she returned to the capital. Later, Giovanni joined her there. But after Easter of 1497, he stayed at Pizarro and she at Rome. On June 14th, Alexander asked him to consent to an annulment on the ground of the husband's impotence, the only ground recognized by canon law for annulling a valid marriage. Lucrezia, whether in grief or in shame, or to circumvent scandalmongers, retired to a convent. A few days later, her brother, the Duke of Gandia, was slain, and the delicate wits of Rome suggested that he had been murdered by agents of Sforza for attempting to seduce Lucrezia. Her husband denied his impotence and hinted that Alexander was guilty of incest with his daughter. The Pope appointed a committee, headed by two cardinals, to inquire into whether the marriage had ever been consummated. Lucrezia took oath that it had not, and they assured Alexander that she was still a virgin. Ludovico proposed to Giovanni that he should demonstrate his potency before a committee, including the papal legate at Milan. Giovanni forgivably refused. However, he signed a formal admission that the marriage had not been consummated. He returned to Lucrezia her dowry of 31,000 ducats, and on December 20th, 1497, the marriage was annulled. Lucrezia, who had borne no offspring to Giovanni, bore children to both her later husbands but Sforza's third wife in 1505 gave birth to a son, presumably his own. It was formally assumed that Alexander had broken the marriage in order to make a politically more profitable marriage. There is no evidence for this assumption. It is more likely that Lucrezia told the pitiful truth of the matter, but Alexander could not let her remain husbandless. Seeking a rapprochement with the papacy's bitter enemy, Naples, he proposed to King Federigo the union of Lucrezia with Don Alfonso, Duke of Bichelier, the bastard son of Federigo's heir, Alfonso II. The king agreed, and a formal betrothal was signed in June of 1498. Federigo's proxy on this occasion was Cardinal Sforza, uncle to the divorced Giovanni. Ludovico of Milan also had encouraged Federigo to accept the plan. Apparently, Giovanni's uncles felt no resentment at the annulment of his marriage. 
In August, the wedding was celebrated in the Vatican. Lucrezia facilitated matters by falling in love with her husband. It helped that she could mother him, for she was eighteen now, and he was a child of seventeen. But it was their misfortune to be important. Politics entered even their marriage bed. Caesar Borgia, rejected in Naples, went to France for a bride in October of 1498. Alexander entered into alliance with Louis XII, the declared enemy of Naples. The young Duke of Bichelier was increasingly ill at ease in a Rome filled up with French agents. Suddenly he fled to Naples. Lucrezia was broken-hearted. To appease her and heal the breach, Alexander appointed her regent of Spoleto in August of 1499. Alfonso rejoined her there. Alexander visited them at Nepi, reassured the youth, and brought them back to Rome. There Lucrezia was delivered of a son who was named Rodrigo after her father. But again their happiness was brief. Whether because Alfonso was uncontrollably high-strung or because Caesar Borgia symbolized the French alliance, Alfonso took a passionate dislike to him, which Borgia disdainfully returned. On the night of July 15, 1500, some bravos attacked Alfonso as he was leaving St. Peter's. He received several wounds, but managed to reach the house of the Cardinal of Santa Maria in Portico. Lucrezia, summoned to him, fainted on seeing his condition. She soon recovered, and with her sister Sancha, tended him anxiously. Alexander sent a guard of sixteen men to protect him from further injury. Alfonso slowly convalesced. One day he saw Caesar walking in a nearby garden. Convinced that this was the man who had hired his assassins, Alfonso seized bow and arrow, aimed at Caesar, and shot to kill. The weapon narrowly missed its mark. Caesar was not the man to give an enemy a second chance. He called his guards and sent them up to Alfonso's room, apparently with orders to slay him. They pressed a pillow upon his face until he died, perhaps under the eyes of his sister and his wife. Alexander accepted Caesar's account of the matter, gave Alfonso a quiet burial, and did what he could to console the inconsolable Lucrezia. She retired to Napi, and there signed her letters La Infelicissima Principessa, the most miserable princess, and ordered masses for the repose of Alfonso's soul. Strange to relate, Caesar visited her at Napi on October 1st, 1499, only two and a half months after Alfonso's death, and stayed overnight as her guest. Lucrezia was malleable and patient. She seems to have looked upon the killing of her husband as the natural reaction of her brother to an attempt upon his life. She does not appear to have believed that Caesar had hired the unsuccessful assassins of Alfonso, though this seems the most probable explanation of another Renaissance mystery. During the remainder of her life she gave many proofs that her love for her brother had survived all trials. Perhaps because he too, like her father, loved her with Spanish intensity, the wits of Rome, or rather of hostile Naples, continued to accuse her of incest. One synoptic scribe called her the Pope's daughter, wife, and daughter-in-law. This, too, she bore with quiet resignation. All students of the epoch are now agreed that these charges were cruel calumnies, but such libels formed her fame for centuries. That Caesar killed Alfonso with a view to remating her to better political result is improbable. After a period of mourning, she was offered to an Orsini, then to a Colonna, matches hardly as advantageous as that with the son of the heir to the Neapolitan throne. Not till November 1500 do we hear of Alexander proposing her to Duke Ercole of Ferrara for Ercole's son Alfonso, and not till September 1501 was she betrothed to him. Presumably Alexander hoped that a Ferrara ruled by a son-in-law, and a Mantua long since bound to Ferrara by marriage, would in effect be papal states. And Caesar seconded the plan as offering greater security for his conquests, and an elegant background for an attack upon Bologna. Ercole and Alfonso hesitated for reasons already retailed. Alfonso had been offered the hand of the Countess of Angoulême, but Alexander topped his offer with the pledge of an immense dowry and practical remission of the annual tribute that Ferrara had been paying to the papacy. Even so, it is hardly credible that one of the oldest and most prosperous ruling families in Europe would have received Lucrezia as wife to the future duke had it believed the lurid stories bandied about by the intellectual underworld of Rome. As neither Ercole nor Alfonso had yet seen Lucrezia, they followed customary procedure in such diplomatic meetings and asked the Ferrari's ambassador in Rome to send them a report on her person, her morals, and her accomplishments. He replied as follows. Illustrious Master, Today, after supper, Don Gerardo Serracini and I betook ourselves to the illustrious Madonna Lucrezia, 
to pay our respects in the name of Your Excellency and His Majesty Don Alfonso. We had a long conversation regarding various matters. She is a most intelligent and lovely, and also an exceedingly gracious lady. Your Excellency and the illustrious Don Alfonso, so we were led to conclude, will be highly pleased with her. Besides being extremely graceful in every way, she is modest, lovable, and decorous. Moreover, she is a devout and God-fearing Christian. Tomorrow she is going to confession, and during Christmas week she will receive communion. She is very beautiful, but her charm of manner is still more striking. In short, her character is such that it is impossible to suspect anything sinister of her. But on the contrary, we look for only the best. Rome, December 23, 1501. Your Excellency's Servant, Joannes Lucas. The excellent and illustrious Estenzi were convinced and sent a magnificent body of knights to escort the bride from Rome to Ferrara. Caesar Borgia equipped two hundred cavaliers to accompany her and supplied musicians and buffoons to amuse the arduous travel hours. Alexander, proud and happy, provided her with a retinue of one hundred eighty persons, including five bishops. Vehicles especially built for the trip and one hundred fifty mules carried her trousseau, and this included a dress valued at 15,000 ducats, or about $187,500, a hat worth 10,000, and 200 bodices costing 100 ducats each. On January 6, 1502, having privately taken leave of her mother, Venozza, Lucrezia began her bridal tour across Italy to join her fiancé. Alexander, after bidding her goodbye, went from point to point on the line of procession to catch another glimpse of her, as she rode on her little Spanish horse, all caparisoned in harness of leather and gold. He watched until she and her retinue of a thousand men and women were out of sight. He suspected that he would never see her again. Rome had probably never witnessed such an exit before, nor Ferrara such an entry. After twenty-seven days of travel, Lucrezia was met outside the city by Duke Ercole and Don Alfonso, with a superb cavalcade of nobles, professors, seventy-five mounted archers, eighty trumpeters and fifers, and fourteen floats carrying high-born ladies sumptuously dressed. When the procession reached the cathedral, two rope-walkers descended from its towers and addressed compliments to Lucrezia. As the ducal palace was reached, all prisoners were given their liberty. The people rejoiced in the beauty and smiles of their future duchess, and Alfonso was happy to have so splendid and charming a bride. 6. The Collapse of the Borgia Power the final years of Alexander were apparently happy and prosperous. His daughter was married into a ducal family and was respected by all Ferrara. His son had brilliantly accomplished his assignments as general and administrator, and the papal states were flourishing under excellent government. The Venetian ambassador describes the Pope in those last years as cheerful and active, apparently quite easy of conscience. Nothing worries him. He was seventy years old on January 1st, 1501, but, reported the ambassador, he seems to grow younger every day. On the afternoon of August 5, 1503, Alexander, Caesar, and some others dined in the open air at the villa of Cardinal Adriano da Cornetto, not far from the Vatican. All remained in the gardens till midnight, for the heat indoors was exhausting. On the 11th, the cardinal was attacked by a severe fever, which lasted three days and then subsided. On the 12th, both the Pope and his son were bedded with fever and vomiting. Rome, as usual, talked of poison. Caesar, said gossip, had ordered the poisoning of the cardinal to secure his fortune. By mistake, the poisoned food had been eaten by nearly all the guests. Historians now agree with the physicians who treated the Pope that the cause was malarial infection invited by prolonged exposure to the night air of midsummer Rome. In that same month, malarial fever laid low half the household of the Pope, and many of these cases proved fatal. In Rome, there were hundreds of deaths from the same cause in that season. Alexander lingered for thirteen days between life and death, occasionally recovering to the extent of resuming the conferences of diplomacy. On August 13th, he played cards. The doctors bled him repeatedly, probably once too much, depleting his natural strength. He died on August 18th. Soon afterward, the body became black and fetid, lending color to hasty rumors of poison. Carpenters and porters, joking and blaspheming, says Burkhardt, had trouble forcing the swollen corpse into the coffin designed for it. Gossip added that a little devil had been seen at the moment of death, carrying Alexander's soul to hell. The Romans rejoiced at the passing of the Spanish Pope. Riots broke out, the Catalans were chased from the city or were killed in their tracks. Their houses were plundered by the mob. 
One hundred dwellings were burned to the ground. The armed troops of the Colonna and the Orsini entered the city on August 22nd and 23rd over the protests of the College of Cardinals, said Guicciardini, the patriotic Florentine. The whole city of Rome ran together with incredible alacrity and crowded about the corpse in St. Peter's Church and were not able to satisfy their eyes with the sight of a dead serpent who, with his immoderate ambition and detestable treachery, with manifold instances of horrid cruelty and monstrous lust, and exposing to sale all things without distinction, both sacred and profane, had intoxicated the whole world. Machiavelli agreed with Guicciardini. Alexander did nothing but deceive and thought of nothing else during the whole of his life, nor did any man bow with stronger oaths to observe promises which he afterwards broke. Nevertheless, he succeeded in everything, for he was well acquainted with this part of the world. These condemnations were based on two assumptions, that the tales told of Alexander in Rome were true, and that Alexander was unjustified in the methods that he used to reclaim the papal states. Catholic historians, while defending Alexander's right to restore the temporal power of the papacy, generally join in condemning Alexander's methods and morals, says the honest pastor. He was universally described as a monster, and every sort of foul crime was attributed to him. Modern critical research has in many points judged him more fairly and rejected some of the worst accusations made against him. But even though we must beware of accepting without examination all the tales told of Alexander by his contemporaries, and though the bitter wit of the Romans found its favorable exercises in tearing him to pieces without mercy, and attributing to him in popular pasquinades and scholarly epigrams a life of incredible foulness, still so much against him has been clearly proved that we are forced to reject the modern attempts at whitewashing him as an unworthy tampering with truth. From the Catholic point of view, it is impossible to blame Alexander too severely. Protestant historians have sometimes shown a generous lenience to Alexander. William Roscoe, in his classic Life and Pontificate of Leo X, from 1827, was among the first to say a good word for the Borgia Pope. Whatever were his crimes, there can be no doubt that they have been highly overcharged. That he was devoted to the aggrandizement of his family, that he employed the authority of his elevated station to establish a permanent dominion in Italy in the person of his son, cannot be doubted. But when almost all the sovereigns of Europe were attempting to gratify their ambition by means equally criminal, it seems unjust to brand the character of Alexander with any peculiar and extraordinary share of infamy in this respect. While Louis of France and Ferdinand of Spain conspired together to seize upon and divide the kingdom of Naples by an example of treachery that can never be sufficiently execrated, Alexander might surely think himself justified in suppressing the turbulent barons who had for ages rent the dominions of the church with intestine wars and in subjugating the petty sovereigns of the Romagna, over whom he had an acknowledged supremacy, and who had in general acquired their dominions by means as unjustifiable as those which he adopted against them. With respect to the accusation so generally believed of a criminal intercourse between him and his own daughter, it might not be difficult to show its improbability. In the second place, the vices of Alexander were accompanied, though not compensated, by many great qualities, which in the consideration of his character ought not to be passed over in silence. Even by his severest adversaries he is allowed to have been a man of elevated genius, of a wonderful memory, eloquent, vigilant, and dexterous in the management of all his concerns. Bishop Crichton summarized Alexander's character and achievements in general agreement with Roscoe's judgment, and far more mercifully than Pastor. A later judgment is more favorable still by the Protestant scholar Richard Garnett in the Cambridge Modern History. Alexander's character has undoubtedly gained by the scrutiny of modern historians. It was but natural that one accused of so many crimes, and unquestionably the cause of many scandals, should alternately appear as a tyrant and a voluptuary. Neither description suits him. The groundwork of his character was extreme exuberance of nature. The Venetian ambassador calls him a carnal man, not implying anything morally derogatory, but meaning a man of sanguine temperament, unable to control his passions and emotions. This perplexed the cool, unimpassioned Italians of the diplomatic type, then prevalent among rulers and statesmen, and their apprehensions of unduly prejudiced Alexander, who in truth was not less but more human than most princes of his time. This excessive carnality wrought in him for good and ill. Unrestrained by moral scruples, or by any spiritual conception of religion, he was betrayed by it into gross sensuality of one kind, though in other respects he was temperate and abstemious. In the more respectable guise of family affection, it led him to outrage every principle of justice, 
though even here he only performed a necessary work, which could not, as one of his agents said, have been accomplished by holy water. On the other hand, his geniality and joyousness preserved him from tyranny in the ordinary sense of the term. As a ruler, careful of the material weal of his people, he ranks among the best of his age. As a practical statesman, he was the equal of any contemporary. But his insight was impaired by his lack of political morality. He had nothing of the higher wisdom which comprehends the characteristics and foresees the drift of an epoch, and he did not know what a principle was. Those of us who share Alexander's sensitivity to the charms and graces of women cannot find it in their hearts to throw stones at him for his amours. His pre-papal deviations were no more scandalous than those of Aeneas Silvius, who fares so well with the historians, or of Julius II, whom time has graciously forgiven. It is not recorded that these two popes took such care of their mistresses and their children as Alexander did of his. Indeed, there was something familial and domestic about Alexander that would have made him a relatively respectable man if the laws of the Church, as well as the customs of Renaissance Italy and Protestant Germany and England, had allowed the marriage of the clergy. His sin was not against nature, but against a rule of celibacy soon to be rejected by half of Christendom. We cannot say that his relation with Giulia Farnese was carnal. So far as we know, neither Venozza, nor Lucrezia, nor Giulia's husband expressed any objection to it. Perhaps it was the simple delight of a normal man in the lure and vivacity of a beautiful woman. Our judgment of Alexander's politics must distinguish between his ends and his means. His purposes were entirely legitimate, to recover the patrimony of Peter, essentially the ancient Latium, from disorderly feudal barons, and to regain from usurping despots the traditional states of the Church. The methods used by Alexander and Caesar in realizing these aims were all those used by other states then and now, war, diplomacy, deceit, treachery, violation of treaties, and desertion of allies. Alexander's abandonment of the Holy League, his purchase of French soldiers and support at the price of surrendering Milan to France, were major crimes against Italy. And those secular means that states use and consider indispensable in the lawless jungle of international strife offend us when employed by a pope pledged to the principles of Christ. Whatever danger the Church ran of becoming subject to some domineering government, as to France at Avignon, if she lost her own territories, it would have been better for her to sacrifice all temporal power and be as poor again as the Galilean fishermen than to adopt the ways of the world to achieve her political ends. By adopting them and financing them, she gained a state and lost a third of Christendom. Caesar Borgia, slowly recovering from the same illness that had killed the Pope, found himself enmeshed in a dozen unanticipated perils. Who could have foreseen that he and his father would be incapacitated at the same time? While the doctors bled him, the Colonna and the Orsini quickly recovered the castles that he had taken from them. The deposed lords of the Romagna, with the encouragement of Venice, began to claim their principalities, and the Roman mob, already out of hand, might at any moment, now that Alexander was dead, plunder the Vatican and seize the funds upon which Caesar depended for the payment of his troops. He sent some armed men to the Vatican, they compelled Cardinal Casanova at sword's points to give up the treasury. So Caesar repeated Caesar after fifteen centuries. They brought back to him one hundred thousand ducats in gold and three hundred thousand ducats worth of plate and jewelry. At the same time, he sent galleys and troops to prevent his strongest enemy, Cardinal Giuliano della Rovere, from reaching Rome. He felt that unless he could persuade the conclave to elect a pope favorable to him, he was lost. The cardinals insisted that the troops of Caesar, the Orsini, and the Colonna should leave Rome before an unintimidated election could be held. All three groups yielded. Caesar retired with his men to Civita Castellana, while Cardinal Giuliano entered Rome and led, in the conclave, the forces hostile to all Borgias. On September 22, 1503, the rival factions in the college chose Cardinal Francesco Piccolomini as a compromise pope. He took the name Pius III, in honor of his uncle Aeneas Silvius. He was a man of learning and integrity, though he was also the father of a large family. He was sixty-four and suffered from an abscess in his leg. He was friendly to Caesar and allowed him to return to Rome. But on October 18th, Pius III died. Caesar saw that he could no longer prevent the election of Cardinal della Rovere, who was clearly the ablest man in the college. In a private interview with Giuliano, Caesar affected an apparent reconciliation. 
he promised Giuliano the support of the Spanish cardinals, who were loyal to Caesar, and Giuliano promised, if elected, to confirm him as Duke of the Romagna and commander of the papal troops. Some other cardinals Giuliano bought with simple bribery. Giuliano della Roveri was chosen pope on October 31, 1503, and took the name Julius II, as if to say that he too would be a Caesar and better Alexander. His coronation was postponed till November 26th because the astrologers predicted for that day a propitious conjunction of stars. Venice did not wait for a lucky star. It seized Rimini, besieged Faenza, and gave every sign of taking over as much of the Romagna as possible before the church could organize her forces. Julius bade Caesar go to Imola and recruit a new army for the protection of the papal states. Caesar agreed and proceeded to Ostia with a view to sailing to Pisa. At Ostia, a message from the Pope commanded him to surrender his control of the Romagna fortresses. In a crucial error suggesting that sickness had impaired his judgment, Caesar refused, though it should have been obvious that he was now dealing with a man whose will was at least as strong as his own. Julius ordered him to return to Rome. Caesar obeyed and was subjected to house arrest. There, Guidobaldo, who now not only was restored to Urbino but was the newly appointed commander of the papal armies, came to see the fallen Borgia. Caesar humbled himself before the man whom he had deposed and despoiled, gave him the watchwords of the fortresses, returned to him some precious books and tapestries left from the Urbino pillage, and begged his intercession with Julius. Cesena and Forley refused to honor the watchwords until Caesar was set at liberty. Julius refused to release him until Caesar persuaded the Romagna castles to yield to the Pope. Lucrezia implored her husband to help her brother. Alfonso, still only heir, not occupant of the ducal throne, did nothing. She appealed to Isabella d'Este. Isabella did nothing. Probably she and Alfonso knew that Julius was immovable. Caesar finally gave the word of surrender to his loyal supporters in the Romagna. The Pope freed him, and he fled to Naples on April 19, 1504. There he was welcomed by Gonzalo de Cordoba, who gave him a safe conduct. His courage, returning sooner than his good sense, he organized a small force and was preparing to sail with it to Piombino, near Leghorn, when he was arrested by Gonzalo on orders from Ferdinand of Spain. The Catholic king had been urged to the action by Julius, who did not propose to have Caesar start a civil war. In August, Caesar was transported to Spain and fretted in prison there for two years. Lucrezia again sought to have him freed, but in vain. His deserted wife pled for him with her brother Jean d'Albray, king of Navarre. A plan of escape was devised, and in November 1506 Caesar was again a free man at the court of Navarre. He soon found a chance to repay d'Albray. The Count of Lorraine, a vassal of the king, rebelled. Caesar led part of Jean's army against the Count's fortress at Viana. The Count made a sortie which Caesar repulsed. Caesar pursued the defeated too recklessly. The Count, reinforced, turned upon him. Caesar's few troops fled. Caesar, with only one companion, stood his ground and fought till he was cut down and killed on March 12, 1507. He was thirty-one years old. It was an honorable end to a questionable life. There are many things in Caesar Borgia that we cannot stomach. His insolent pride, his neglect of his faithful wife, his treatment of women as mere instruments of passing pleasure, his occasional cruelty to his enemies, as when he condemned to death not only Giulio Verano, lord of Camerino, but Giulio's two sons, and apparently ordered the death of the two Manfredi. Severities that compare shamefully with the calm mercies of the man whose name he bore. Usually he acted on the principle that the achievement of his purpose justified any means. He found himself surrounded with lies and managed to lie better than the rest until Julius lied to him. He was almost certainly innocent of his brother Giovanni's death. He was probably the man who set the thugs upon the Duke of Bichelier. He lacked, perhaps through illness, the strength to face his own misfortunes with courage and dignity. Only his death brought a gleam of nobility into his life. But even he had virtues. He must have had extraordinary ability to rise so rapidly, to learn so readily the arts of leadership, negotiation, and war. Given the difficult task of restoring, with only a small force at his command, the papal power in the papal states, he accomplished it with surprising rapidity of movement, skill of strategy, and economy of means. Empowered to govern as well as to conquer, 
he gave the Romagna the fairest rule and most prosperous peace that it had enjoyed in centuries. Ordered to clear the Campania of rebellious and troublesome vassals, he did it with a celerity that Julius Caesar himself could hardly have surpassed. With such achievements mounting to his head, he may well have played with the dream that Petrarch and Machiavelli entertained, to give Italy, if necessary by conquest, the unity that would enable her to stand against the centralized strength of France or Spain. But his victories, his methods, his power, his dark secrecy, his swift, incalculable attacks made him the terror instead of the liberator of Italy. The faults of his character ruined the accomplishments of his mind. It was his basic tragedy that he had never learned to love. Except again Lucrezia. What a contrast she offered to her fallen brother in the modesty and prosperity of her final years. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. Story of Civilization, Volume 5, The Renaissance, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued. Cassette 3, Side 2. What a contrast she offered to her fallen brother in the modesty and prosperity of her final years. She who in Rome had been the subject and victim of every scandal-monger was loved by the people of Ferrara as a model of feminine virtue. She tried there to forget all the horrors and tribulations of her past. She recaptured with due restraint the joyousness of her youth and added to it a generous interest in the needs of others. Ariosto, Tebaldeo, Bembo, Tito, and Ercole Strozzi praised her profitably in their verse. They called her Pulcherima Virgo, most beautiful maiden, and no one blinked an eye. Perhaps Bembo tried to play Abelard to her Eloise, and Lucrezia now became something of a linguist, speaking Spanish, Italian, French, and reading a little Latin and less Greek. We are told that she wrote poetry in all these tongues. Aldous Minutius dedicated to her his edition of the Strozzi poems, and implied in the preface that she had offered to underwrite his great printing enterprise. Amid all these learned concerns, she found time to bear to her third husband, four sons and a daughter. Alfonso was well pleased with her in his uneffusive way. In 1506, having occasion to leave Ferrara, he appointed her his regent, and she fulfilled her duties with such good judgment that the Ferraris were inclined to pardon Alexander for having once left her in charge of the Vatican. In the last years of her brief life, she devoted herself to the education of her children and to works of charity and mercy. She became a pious Franciscan tertiary. On June 14, 1519, she was delivered of her seventh child, but it was stillborn. She never rose from that bed of pain. On June 24, aged 39, Lucrezia Borgia, more sinned against than sinning, passed away. Chapter 17 Julius II, 1503 to 1513. 1. The Warrior. If we place before us Raphael's searching and profound portrait of Julius II, we shall see at once that Giuliano della Rovere was one of the strongest personalities that ever reached the papal chair. A massive head bent with exhaustion and tardy humility, a wide high brow, a large pugnacious nose, grave, deep set, penetrating eyes lips tight with resolution, hands heavy with the rings of authority, face somber with the disillusionments of power. This is the man who for a decade kept Italy in war and turmoil, freed it from foreign armies, tore down the old St. Peter's, brought Bramante and a hundred other artists to Rome, discovered, developed, and directed Michelangelo and Raphael, and through them gave to the world a new St. Peter's and the Sistine Chapel ceiling and the Stanze of the Vatican. Voilà un homme! Here is a man. His violent temper presumably characterized him from his first breath. Born near Savona in 1443, a nephew of Sixtus IV, he reached the cardinalate at twenty-seven, and fumed and fretted in it for thirty-three years before being promoted to what had long seemed to him his manifest due. He paid no more regard to his vow of celibacy than most of his colleagues. His master of ceremonies at the Vatican later reported that Pope Julius would not allow his foot to be kissed because it was disfigured ex morbo gallico, with the French disease. He had three illegitimate daughters, but he was too busy fighting Alexander to find time for the unconcealed parental fondness that in Alexander so offended the cherished hypocrisies of mankind. 
He disliked Alexander as a Spanish intruder, denied his fitness for the papacy, called him a swindler and a usurper, and did all he could to unseat him, even to inviting France to invade Italy. He seemed made as a foil and contrast to Alexander. The Borgia Pope was jovial, sanguine, good-natured, if we accept a possible poisoning or two. Julius was stern, jovian, passionate, impatient, readily moved to anger, passing from one fight to another, never really happy except at war. Alexander waged war by proxy, Julius in person. The sexagenarian pope became a soldier, more at ease in military garb than in pontifical robes, loving camps and besieging towns, having guns pointed and assaults delivered under his commanding eyes. Alexander could play, but Julius moved from one enterprise to another, never resting. Alexander could be a diplomat. Julius found it extremely difficult, for he liked to tell people what he thought of them. Often his language overstepped all bounds in its rudeness and violence, and this fault increased perceptibly as he grew older. His courage, like his language, knew no limits. Stricken with illness time and again in his campaigns, he would confound his enemies by recovering and leaping upon them once more. Like Alexander, he had had to buy a few cardinals to ease his way to the papacy, but he denounced the practice in a bull of 1505. If in this matter he did not reform with inconvenient precipitation, he rejected nepotism almost completely, and rarely appointed relatives to office. In selling church benefices and promotions, however, he followed Alexander's example, and his grants of indulgences shared with the building of St. Peter's in angering Germany. He managed his revenues well, financed war and art simultaneously, and left Leo a surplus in the treasury. In Rome, he restored social order, which had declined in Alexander's later years, and he governed the states of the church with wise appointments and policies. He allowed the Orsini and the Colonna to reoccupy their castles, and sought to tie these powerful families to loyalty by marriages with his relatives. When he came to power, he found the states of the church in turmoil, and half the work of Alexander and Caesar Borgia undone. Venice had seized Faenza, Ravenna, and Rimini in 1503. Giovanni Sforza had returned to Pizarro. The Baglioni were again sovereign in Perugia, and the Bentivogli in Bologna. The loss of revenues from these cities threatened the solvency of the Curia. Julius agreed with Alexander that the spiritual independence of the Church required her continued possession of the Papal States, and he began with Alexander's mistake by asking the help of France and of Germany and Spain to boot against his Italian enemies. France consented to send 8,000 men in exchange for three red hats. Naples, Mantua, Urbino, Ferrara, and Florence pledged small detachments. In August 1506, Julius left Rome at the head of his own modest force, 400 cavalry, his Swiss guards, and four cardinals. Guido Baldo, the restored Duke of Urbino, was in military command of the papal troops, but the Pope rode at their head in person a sight not seen in Italy for many centuries past. Gian Paolo Baglioni, calculating that he could not defeat such a coalition, came to Orvieto, surrendered to the Pope, and asked forgiveness. I forgive your mortal sins, growled Julius, but the first venial sin you commit I will make you pay for them all. Trusting to his religious authority, Julius entered Perugia with only a small guard, and before his soldiers could reach the gates... Baglioni might have ordered his men to arrest him and close the gates, but he dared not. Machiavelli, who was on hand, marveled that Baglioni should lose a chance to do a deed which would have left an eternal memory. He might have been the first to show priests how little a man is esteemed who lives and rules as they do. He would have done a deed whose greatness would have outweighed all its infamy and the danger which might have followed. Machiavelli, like most Italians, objected to the temporal power of the papacy and to popes who were also kings but Baglioni valued his neck, and possibly his soul, more than his posthumous fame. Julius spent little time in Perugia. His real goal was Bologna. He led his little army over the rough roads of the Apennines to Cesena, and then turned upon Bologna from the east while the French attacked it from the west. Julius reinforced the attack by issuing a bull of excommunication against the Bentivogli and their adherents, and offering a plenary indulgence to any man who should kill any of them. This was a new brand of war. Giovanni Bentivoglio fled, and Julius entered the city borne in a litter on men's shoulders and hailed by the people as a liberator from tyranny. This on November 11th, 1506. He bade Michelangelo make a colossal statue of him for the portal of San Petronio, and then returned to Rome. 
There he rode through the streets in a triumphal car and was greeted as a victorious Caesar. But Venice still held Faenza, Ravenna, Rimini, and failed to estimate properly the martial spirit of the Pope. Risking Italy to get the Romagna, Julius invited France, Germany, and Spain to help him subdue the Queen of the Adriatic. We shall see later how vigorously they responded in the League of Cambrai in 1508, seeking not to help Julius, but to dismember Italy. In joining them, Julius allowed his justifiable resentment against Venice to overcome his love of Italy. While his allies attacked Venice with armies, Julius aimed at her one of the most forthright bulls of excommunication and interdict in history. He won. Venice restored the stolen cities to the church and accepted the most humiliating terms. Her envoys received absolution and the removal of the interdict in a long ceremony that sorely tried their knees. This in 1510. Regretting his invitation to the French, Julius now reversed his policy to expelling them from Italy and convinced himself that God was reversing the divine policy accordingly. But when the French ambassador announced to him a French victory over the Venetians and added, God willed it, Julius angrily retorted, The devil willed it. Now he turned his martial eye to Ferrara. Here was an acknowledged papal fief, but through Alexander's concessions at Lucretia's betrothal it paid only a token tribute to the papacy. Moreover, Duke Alfonso, after joining in war against Venice at the Pope's behest, refused to make peace at his behest, and remained an ally of France. Julius resolved that Ferrara must become wholly a papal state. He began his campaign with another bull of excommunication in 1510, by which the son-in-law of one pope became to another a son of iniquity and a root of perdition. Without much difficulty, Julius, with Venetian aid, took Modena. While his troops were resting there, the pope made the mistake of going to Bologna. Suddenly news came to him that a French army, instructed to help Alfonso, was at the gates. The papal forces were too distant to help him. Within Bologna were only nine hundred soldiers, and the people of the city, who had been oppressed by the papal legate Cardinal Alidosi, could not be relied upon to offer resistance to the French. Sick abed with fever, Julius for a moment despaired and thought of drinking poison. He was about to sign a humiliating peace with France when Spanish and Venetian reinforcements arrived. The French retreated, and Julius sped them on their way with a lusty excommunication for one and all. Meanwhile, Ferrara had armed itself so strongly that Julius judged his forces inadequate to take it. Not to be cheated of military glory, he led his troops in person to besiege Mirandola, a northern outpost of the Ferrara Duchy, this in 1511. Though now sixty-eight, he tramped through deep snow, violated precedent by campaigning in winter, presided over councils of strategy, directed operations and the placement of cannon, inspected his troops, relished the life of a soldier, and let no man surpass him in martial oaths and jests. Sometimes the troops laughed at him. More often they applauded his courage. When enemy fire killed a servant at his side, he moved to other quarters. When these two were reached by Mirandola's artillery, he returned to his first station, shrugging his bent shoulders at the danger of death. Mirandola surrendered after two weeks of resistance. The Pope ordered that all French soldiers found in the city should be put to death. Perhaps by mutual arrangement, none was found. He protected the city from pillage and preferred to feed and finance his army by selling eight new cardinalates. He sought rest in Bologna, but there he was soon again besieged by the French. He fled to Rimini, and the French restored the Bentivogli to power. The people cheered the return of their ousted despots. They demolished the castle that Julius had built, threw down the statue that Michelangelo had made of him, and sold it as bronze scrap to Alfonso of Ferrara. The grim duke cast it into a cannon, which he christened La Giulia, in honor of the Pope. Julius launched another bull, excommunicating all who had shared in the overthrow of papal authority at Bologna. The French troops responded by retaking Mirandola. At Rimini, Julius found affixed to the door of San Francesco a document signed by nine cardinals, which summoned a general council to meet at Pisa on September 1, 1511, to examine into the conduct of the Pope. Julius returned to Rome broken in health, overwhelmed with disaster, but not bowing to defeat, says Guicciardini. Though the Pope found himself so grossly deceived by his flattering hopes, yet he seemed in his deportment to resemble what the fabulous writers have reported of Antaeus, who, as often as he was disabled by the force of Hercules, on touching the ground recovered still greater strength and vigor. Adversity had the same effect on the Pope, 
for when he seemed to be most depressed and most dejected, he recovered his spirits and rose again with greater firmness and constancy of mind and with more pertinacious resolution. To counter the disaffected cardinals, he published a call for a general council to meet at the Lateran Palace on April 19, 1512. He labored night and day to build a formidable alliance against France. He was approaching success when he was seized with a severe illness on August 17, 1511. For three days he hovered near death. On August 21st he remained unconscious so long that the cardinals prepared for a conclave to choose his successor. At the same time, Pompeo Colonna, bishop of Rieti, appealed to the Roman people to rise against papal rule of their city and re-establish Rienzo's republic. But on the 22nd, Julius regained consciousness. Overruling his doctors, he drank a substantial draft of wine. He surprised all and disappointed many by recovering. The republican movement faded away. On October 5th, he announced that he had formed a holy league of the papacy, Venice, and Spain. On November 17th, Henry VIII joined it for England. So reinforced, he deposed from their dignities the cardinals who had signed the summons to Pisa and forbade such a council to meet. At the command of the French king, the Florentine seigneury gave permission for the banned council to meet at Pisa. Julius declared war upon Florence and plotted to restore the Medici. A group of twenty-seven ecclesiastics, with representatives of the king of France and some French universities, met at Pisa on November 5, 1511. But the inhabitants were so threatening and Florence so reluctant that the council retired to Milan on November 12th. There, under the protection of the French garrison, the schismatic councillors could bear in timid safety the taunts of the people. Having won this battle of the bishops, Julius turned again to war. He purchased the alliance of the Swiss, who dispatched an army to attack the French at Milan. The attack failed, and the Swiss returned to their cantons. On Easter Sunday, April 11, 1512, the French, under Gaston de Foix, decisively helped by Alfonso's artillery, overwhelmed the composite army of the League at Ravenna. Practically all the Romagna passed under French control. Julius's cardinals begged him to make peace. He refused. The council at Milan celebrated the victory by proclaiming the Pope deposed. Julius laughed. On May 2nd, he was carried in his litter to the Lateran Palace, where he opened the Fifth Lateran Council. He soon left it to its own slow development while he hurried back to battle. On May 17th, he announced that Germany had joined the Holy League against France. The Swiss, repurchased, entered Italy through the Tyrol and advanced to meet a French army disorganized by victory and the death of their leader. Now outnumbered, the French abandoned Ravenna, Bologna, even Milan, and the schismatic cardinals retreated to France. Once more, the Bentivogli fled, and Julius was master of Bologna and the Romagna. He seized the opportunity to take also Parma and Piacenza. And now he could hope to win Ferrara, which could no longer rely on aid from France. Alfonso offered to come to Rome and ask for absolution in terms of peace if the Pope would give him a safe conduct. Julius did. Alfonso came and was graciously absolved. But when he refused to exchange Ferrara for little Asti, Julius pronounced his safe conduct invalid and threatened him with imprisonment and arrest. Fabrizio Colonna, who had conveyed the safe conduct to the Duke, felt that his own honor was involved. He helped Alfonso to escape from Rome. After arduous adventures, Alfonso made his way back to Ferrara, and there resumed the arming of his forts and walls. And now at last the demonic energy of the warrior Pope ran out. Late in January 1513, he took to his bed with a complication of ailments. Merciless gossip said that his trouble was an aftermath of the French disease. Others said that it came from immoderate eating and drinking. When no treatment availed to reduce his fever, he reconciled himself to death, gave instructions for his funeral, urged the Lateran Council to go on with its work without interruption, confessed himself a great sinner, bade farewell to his cardinals, and died with the same courage with which he had lived. This on February 20th, 1513. All Rome mourned him, and an unprecedented throng came to bid him goodbye and to kiss the feet of the corpse. We cannot estimate his place in history until we have studied him as the liberator of Italy, as the builder of St. Peter's, and as the greatest patron of art that the papacy has ever known. But his contemporaries were right in viewing him chiefly as a statesman and a warrior. They feared his incalculable energy, his terribilita, his curses and apparently unappeasable wrath. But they sensed behind all his violence a spirit capable of compassion and love. They saw him defending the Papal States as unscrupulously and ruthlessly as the Borgias, 
but with no view to aggrandize his family. All but his enemies applauded his aims, even when they shuddered at his language and mourned his means. He did not govern the reclaimed states as well as Caesar Borgia had done, for he was too fond of war to be a good administrator. But his conquests were lasting, and the papal states remained henceforth loyal to the church until the revolution of 1870 ended the temporal power of the popes. Julius sinned, like Venice, Lodovico, Alexander, by calling foreign armies into Italy, but he succeeded better than his predecessors and successors in freeing Italy from these powers when they had served his turn. Perhaps he weakened Italy in saving it, and taught the barbarians that they might fight out their quarrels on the sunny plains of Lombardy. There were elements of cruelty in his greatness. He was misled by acquisitiveness in attacking Ferrara and in taking Piacenza and Parma. He dreamed not only of preserving the legitimate possessions of the church, but of making himself the master of Europe, the dictator to kings. Guicciardini condemned him for bringing empire to the apostolic see by arms and the shedding of Christian blood, rather than troubling himself to set an example of holy life. But it could hardly be expected of Julius in his place and age that he should abandon the papal states to Venice and other assailants and risk the survival of the church on purely spiritual grounds, when all the world about him recognized no rights but those that armed themselves with power. He was what he had to be in the circumstances and atmosphere of his time, and his time forgave him. 2. Roman Architecture, 1492-1513 The most lasting part of his work was his patronage of art. Under him, the Renaissance moved its capital from Florence to Rome, and there reached its zenith in art, as under Leo X it would reach its peak in literature and scholarship. Julius did not care much for literature. It was too quiet and feminine for his temperament. But the monumental in art accorded well with his nature and life. So he subordinated all other arts to architecture, and left a new St. Peter's as an index of his spirit and a symbol of the church whose secular power he had saved. That he should have financed Bramante, Michelangelo, Raphael, and a hundred more, as well as a dozen wars, and have left 700,000 florins in the papal treasury is one of the wonders of history and one of the causes of the Reformation. No other man ever brought so many artists to Rome. It was he, for example, who invited Guillaume de Marcia from France to set up the fine stained-glass windows of Santa Maria del Popolo. It was characteristic of his vast conceptions that he should try to reconcile Christianity and paganism in art, as Nicholas V had done in letters. For what are the stanze of Raphael but a pre-established harmony of classic mythology and philosophy, Hebrew theology and poetry, Christian sentiment and faith? And what could better represent the union of pagan and Christian art and feeling than the portico and dome, the interior columns, statuary, paintings, and tombs of St. Peter's? Prelates and nobles, bankers and merchants, now crowding into an enriched Rome, followed the Pope's lead and built palaces with almost imperial splendor and opulent rivalry. Broad avenues were cut through or from the chaos of the medieval city. Hundreds of new streets were opened. One of them still bears the great Pope's name. Ancient Rome rose out of its ruins and became again the home of a Caesar. St. Peter's aside, it was, in Rome, an age of palaces rather than of churches. Exteriors were uniform and plain. A vast rectangular facade of brick or stone or stucco, a portal of stone usually carved in some decorative design. On each floor, uniform rows of windows topped with triangular or elliptical pediments, and almost always a crowning cornice, whose elegant configuration was a special test and care of the architect. Behind this unpretentious front, the millionaires concealed a luxury of ornament and display seldom revealed to the jealous popular eye. A central well, usually surrounded or divided by a broad staircase of marble. On the ground floor, simple rooms for transacting business or storing goods. On the first, our second floor, the piano nobile, the spacious halls for reception and entertainment, and galleries of art, with pavements of marble or sturdy colored tile. The furniture, carpets, and textiles of exquisite material and form. The walls strengthened with marble pilasters, the ceilings coffered in circles, triangles, diamonds, or squares, and on walls and ceilings paintings by famous artists, usually of pagan themes, for fashion now decreed that Christian gentlemen, even of the cloth, should live amid scenes from classical mythology. 
and on the upper floors the private chambers for lords and ladies, for liveried lackeys, for children and nurses, tutors and governesses, and maids. Many men were rich enough to have, besides their palaces, rural villas as refuges from the city's din or summer heat, and these villas too might conceal sybaritic glories of ornament and comfort, and mural masterpieces by Raphael, Peruzzi, Giulio Romano, Sebastiano del Piombo. This palace and villa architecture was in many ways a selfish art, in which the wealth drawn from unseen and countless laborers and distant lands vaunted itself in gaudy decoration for a few. In this respect, ancient Greece and medieval Europe had shown a finer spirit, devoting their wealth not to private luxury, but to the temples and cathedrals that were the possession, pride, and inspiration of all, the home of the people as well as the house of God. Of the architects outstanding at Rome in the pontificates of Alexander the Sixth and Julius the Second, two were brothers, and a third was their nephew. Giuliano da Sangallo began as a military engineer in the Florentine army, passed to the service of Ferrante of Naples, and became a friend of Giuliano della Rovere in the early days of the latter's cardinalate. For Giuliano the cardinal, Giuliano the architect turned the abbey of Grotoferrata into a castle fortress. Probably at Alexander's behest, he designed the great coffered ceiling of Santa Maria Maggiore, and gilded it with the first gold brought from America. He accompanied Cardinal della Rovere into exile, built a palace for him in Savona, went with him to France, and returned to Rome when his patron at last became Pope. Julius invited him to submit plans for the new St. Peter's. When those of Bramante were preferred, the old architect reproached the new Pope, but Julius knew what he wanted. Sangallo outlived both Bramante and Julius, and was later appointed Administer et Coadiutor to Raphael in the building of St. Peter's, but he died two years later. Meanwhile, his younger brother, Antonio da Sangallo, had also come from Florence as architect and military engineer for Alexander VI, and had built the imposing church of Santa Maria di Loreto for Julius. And a nephew, Antonio Picconi da Sangallo, had begun in 1512 the most magnificent of the Renaissance palaces of Rome, the Palazzo Farnese. The greatest name in the architecture of this age was that of Donato Bramante. He was already fifty-six when he came from Milan to Rome in 1499, but his study of the Roman ruins fired him with youthful zeal to apply classical forms to Renaissance building. In the court of a Franciscan convent near San Pietro in Montorio, he designed a circular tempietto, or little tempo, with columns and cupola so classical in form that architects studied and measured it as if it had been a newly discovered masterpiece of ancient art. From that beginning, Bramante passed through a succession of chefs dœuvre the cloister of Santa Maria della Pace, the elegant cortile of San Damaso. Julius overwhelmed him with assignments, both as architect and as military engineer. Bramante laid out the Via Giulia, finished the Belvedere, began the Logier of the Vatican, and designed a new St. Peter's. He was so interested in his work that he cared little for money, and Julius had to command him to accept appointments whose revenue would maintain him. Some rivals, however, accused him of embezzling papal funds and using shoddy materials in his buildings. Others described him as a jovial and generous soul, whose home became a favorite resort of Perugino, Signorelli, Pinturicchio, Raphael, and other artists in Rome. The Belvedere, or Belvedere, was a summer palace built for Innocent VIII and situated on a hill some hundred yards away from the rest of the Vatican. It took its name from the beautiful view, or Belvedere, that extended before it, and it gave its name to various sculptures that were housed in it or its court. Julius had long been a collector of ancient art. His prized possession was an Apollo discovered during the pontificate of Innocent VIII. When he became Pope, he placed it in the courtile of the Belvedere, and the Apollo Belvedere became one of the famous statues of the world. Bramante gave the palace a new façade and garden court, and planned to connect it with the Vatican proper by a series of picturesque structures and gardens, but both he and Julius died before the plan could be carried out. If we attribute the Reformation proximately to the sale of indulgences for the building of St. Peter's, the most momentous event in the pontificate of Julius was the demolition of the old St. Peter's and the beginning of the new. According to the received tradition, the old church had been built by Pope Sylvester I in 326, over the grave of the Apostle Peter near the Circus of Nero. In that church many emperors, from Charlemagne onward, had been crowned, and many popes. Repeatedly enlarged, 
It was in the 15th century a spacious basilica with nave and double aisles, flanked with smaller churches, chapels, and convents. But by the time of Nicholas V it showed the wear of eleven centuries. Cracks veined its walls, and men feared that it might at any moment collapse, perhaps upon a congregation. So in 1452, Bernardo Rossellino and Leon Battista Alberti were commissioned to strengthen the edifice with new walls. The work had hardly begun when Nicholas died, and succeeding popes, needing funds for crusades, suspended it. In 1505, after considering and rejecting various other plans, Julius II determined to tear down the old church and build an entirely new shrine over what was said to be St. Peter's grave. He invited several architects to submit designs. Bramante won with a proposal to rear a new basilica on the plan of a Greek cross, with arms of equal length, and to crown its transept crossing with a vast dome. In the famous phrase ascribed to him, he would raise the dome of the Pantheon upon the Basilica of Constantine. In Bramante's intent, the new majestic edifice would cover 28,900 square yards, 11,600 more than the area covered by St. Peter's today. Excavation was begun in April 1506. On April 11th, Julius, aged 63, descended a long and trembling rope ladder to a great depth to lay the foundation stone. The work progressed slowly as Julius and his funds were more and more absorbed in war. In 1514, Bramante died, happily not knowing that his design would never be carried out. Many good Christians were shocked at the thought of destroying the venerable old cathedral. Most of the cardinals were strongly opposed, and many artists complained that Bramante had recklessly shattered the fine columns and capitals of the ancient nave when, with better care, he might have taken them down intact. A satire published three years after the architect's death told how Bramante, on reaching St. Peter's Gate, had been severely rebuked by the apostle and had been refused admittance to paradise. But, said the satirist, Bramante did not like the arrangement of paradise anyway, nor the steep approach to it from the earth. I will build a new, broad and commodious road so that old and feeble souls may travel on horseback, and then I will make a new paradise with delightful residences for the blessed. When Peter rejected this proposal, Bramante offered to go down to hell and build a new and better inferno, since the old one must by this time be almost burned out. But Peter returned to the question, Tell me seriously, what made you destroy my church? Bramante tried to comfort him. Pope Leo will build you a new one. Well then, said the apostle, you must wait at the gate of paradise until it is finished. It was finished in 1626. 3. The Young Raphael 1. Development, 1483-1508 After Bramante's death, Leo X named to succeed him as architectural director of the work at the new St. Peter's, a young painter thirty-one years old. Too young to bear on his shoulders the weight of Bramante's dome, but the happiest, most successful, and best-loved artist in history. His good fortune began when he was born to Giovanni de Santi, then the leading painter at Urbino. Some pictures survived from Giovanni's brush. They suggest an indifferent talent. But they show that Raphael, named after the fairest of the archangels, was brought up in the odor of painting. Visiting artists like Piero della Francesca often stayed at Giovanni's home, and Giovanni was sufficiently familiar with the art of his time to write intelligently of a dozen Italian and some Flemish painters and sculptors in his rhymed Chronicle of Urbino. Giovanni died when Raphael was only eleven, but apparently the father had already begun to transmit the art to his son. Probably Timoteo Vitti, who returned to Urbino from Bologna in 1495 after studying with Francia, continued the instruction and brought to Raphael what he had learned from Francia, Tura, and Costa. Meanwhile, the boy grew up in circles that had access to the court, and that refined society that Castiglione was to describe in the courtier was beginning to spread among the lettered classes of Urbino the graces of character, manners, and speech that Raphael would illuminate with his art and his life. The Ashmolean Museum at Oxford has a remarkable drawing attributed to Raphael in the period between 1497 and 1500, and traditionally supposed to be a self-portrait. The face almost of a girl, the soft eyes of a poet, these are the features that we shall meet again darker and a little wistful, in the engaging self-portrait, circa 1506, in the Petey Gallery. 
Picture the youth of the earlier portrait passing at sixteen from quiet and orderly Urbino to a Perugia where despotism and violence were the order of the day. But Perugino was there, whose fame was filling Italy. Raffaello's guardian uncles felt that the boy's manifest talent deserved instruction from the best painters in Italy. They could have sent him to Leonardo at Florence, where he might have imbibed some deepening strain of that master's esoteric lore. But there was something peculiar about the great Florentine, something a bit left-handed, literally sinister, in his loves which disturbed all good uncles. Perugia was closer to Urbino, and Perugino was returning to Perugia in 1499 with presumably all the technical tricks of Florentine painters at the tips of his brushes. So for three years the handsome lad worked for Pietro Vanucci, helped him to decorate the cambio, mastered his secrets, and learned how to paint virgins as blue and devout as Perugino's own. The Umbrian Hills, above all around the Assisi that Raphael could cite from the Perugian Plateau, gave teacher and pupil a full supply of such noble and devoted mothers, fair with forms of youth, yet molded to a trustful piety by the Franciscan air that they breathed. When Perugino went again to Florence in 1502, Raphael remained in Perugia and fell heir to the demand that his master had developed for religious pictures. In 1503 he painted for the Church of St. Francis a coronation of the Virgin, now in the Vatican. The apostles and Magdalene, standing around an empty sarcophagus, gaze upward to where, on the pavement of clouds, Christ places a crown upon Mary's head, while graceful angels celebrate her with the music of lute and tambourines. There are many signs of immaturity in the picture, the heads insufficiently individualized, faces inexpressive, hands ill-formed, fingers rigid, and Christ himself, obviously older than his pretty mother, moving as awkwardly as a commencement graduate. But in the angel musicians, the grace of their motion, the flow of their draperies, the soft contour of their features, Raphael gives a pledge of his future. The picture was apparently successful, for in the following year another church of San Francesco, in Citta del Castello, some thirty miles from Perugia, ordered from him a similar picture, a sposalizio, or marriage of the Virgin, now in Brera. It repeats some figures from the earlier painting and copies the form of a similar picture by Perugino. But the Virgin herself has now the peculiar mark and grace of Raphael's women, the head modestly inclined, the oval face tender and demure, the smooth curve of shoulder and arm and raiment. Behind her is a woman more buxom and alive, blonde and lovely. To the right, a youth in tight garb shows that Raphael has studied the human form sedulously. And now all the hands are well drawn, and some are beautiful. About this time, Pinturicchio, who had made Raphael's acquaintance in Perugia, invited him to Siena as assistant. There, Raphael made sketches and cartoons for some of the brilliant frescoes with which Pinturicchio, in the library of the cathedral, told such portions of Aeneas Silvius's story as befitted a pope. In that library, Raphael was struck by an antique statuary group, the Three Graces, that Cardinal Piccolomini had brought from Rome to Siena. The young artist made a hasty drawing of it, apparently to help his memory. He seems to have recognized in these three nudes a different world and morality than those that had been impressed upon him in Urbino and Perugia, a world in which woman was a joyful goddess of beauty rather than the sorrowful mother of God, and in which the worship of beauty was considered as legitimate as the exaltation of purity and innocence. The pagan side of Raphael, which would later paint rosy nudes in the bathroom of a cardinal and place Greek philosophers beside Christian saints in the chambers of the Vatican, developed now in quiet company with that aspect of his nature and his art which would produce the mass of Bolsena and the Sistine Madonna. In Raphael, more than in any other hero of the Renaissance, the Christian faith and the pagan rebirth would live in harmonious peace. Shortly before or after his visit to Siena, he returned briefly to Urbino. There he painted for Guido Baldo two pictures that probably symbolized the Duke's triumph over Caesar Borgia, a St. Michael and a St. George, both now in the Louvre. Never before, so far as we know, had the artist succeeded so well in representing action the figure of St. George drawing his sword back to strike while his horse rears up in terror and the dragon claws at the knight's leg, is startling in its vigor and yet pleasing in its grace. Raphael the draftsman was coming into his own. And now Florence called him, as it had called Perugino and a hundred other young painters. 
He seemed to feel that unless he could live for a while in that stimulating hive of competition and criticism, and learn at first hand the latest developments in line and composition and color, in fresco and tempera and oil, he would never be more than a provincial painter, talented but limited, and fated at last for obscure domesticity in the town of his birth. Late in 1504, he set out for Florence. He behaved there with his usual modesty, studied the ancient sculptures and architectural fragments that had been gathered into the city, went to the Carmine and copied Masaccio, sought out and pored over the famous cartoons that Leonardo and Michelangelo had made for paintings in the Hall of Council in the Palazzo Vecchio. Perhaps he met Leonardo. Certainly for a time he yielded to that elusive master's influence. It seemed to him now that beside Leonardo's adoration of the Magi, Mona Lisa, and the Virgin Child and St. Anne, the paintings of the Ferrara, Bologna, Siena, Urbino schools were struck with the rigor of death, and even the Madonnas of Perugino were pretty puppets, immature young women of the countryside suddenly endowed with an uncongenial divinity. How had Leonardo acquired such grace of line, such subtlety of countenance, such shades of coloring? In a portrait of Madalena Doni, now in the Pitti, Raphael obviously imitated the Mona Lisa, he omitted the smile, for Madonna Doni apparently had none. But he pictured well the robust form of a Florentine matron, the soft, plump, ringed hands of moneyed ease, and the rich weave and color of the garments that dignified her form. About the same time he painted her husband, Angelo Doni, dark, alert, and stern. From Leonardo he passed to Fra Bartolomeo, visited him in his cell at San Marco, wondered at the tender expression, the warm feeling, the soft contours, the harmonious composition, the deep full colors of the melancholy friar's art. This book is continued on Cassette 4, Side 1. Story of Civilization, Volume 5, The Renaissance, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 4, Side 1. From Leonardo he passed to Fra Bartolomeo, visited him in his cell at San Marco, wondered at the tender expression, the warm feeling, the soft contours, the harmonious composition, the deep full colors of the melancholy friar's art. Fra Bartolomeo would visit Raphael in Rome in 1514, and wonder in his turn at the swift descent of the modest artist to the pinnacle of fame in the capital of the Christian world. Raphael became great partly because he could steal with the innocence of Shakespeare, could try one method and manner after another, take from each its precious element, and blend these gleanings in the fever of creation into a style unmistakably his own. Bit by bit he absorbed the rich tradition of Italian painting. Soon he would bring it to fulfillment. Already in his Fiorentine period, from 1504 to 1505, and from 1506 to 1507, he was painting pictures now famous throughout Christendom and beyond, the Budapest Museum has a portrait of a young man, perhaps a self-portrait, with the same beret and side glance of the eyes as in the Alto Ritratto of the Pitti Gallery. When Raphael was but twenty-three, he painted the lovely Madonna del Granduca, also in the Pitti, whose perfectly oval face and silken hair and small mouth and Leonardesque eyelids lowered in pensive affection were fra framed in a warm contrast of green veil and red robe. Ferdinand II, Grand Duke of Tuscany, found such pleasure in contemplating this picture that he took it with him on his travels, whence its name. Quite as beautiful as the Madonna del Cardellino of the Goldfinch in the Uffizi. The infant Jesus is no masterpiece of conception of design, but the playful St. John, arriving triumphantly with the captured bird, is a delight to mind and eye and the face of the Virgin is an unforgettable representation of a young mother's tolerant tenderness. Raphael gave this painting as a wedding present to Lorenzo Nazi. In 1547, an earthquake crushed Nazi's mansion and broke the picture into fragments. The pieces were so cleverly reunited that only a Berenson, seeing it in the Uffizi, could surmise its vicissitudes. The Madonna in the Meadow, in Vienna, is a less successful variant, here, however, Raphael gives us a remarkable landscape, bathed in the soft blue light of an evening falling quietly upon green fields, unruffled stream, towered town, and far-off hills. La Belle Jardinière, 
in the Louvre hardly deserves to be the most famous of the Florentine Madonnas. It almost duplicates the Madonna of the Meadow, makes the Baptist absurd from nose to foot, and only redeems itself with an ideal infant standing with chubby feet upon the Virgin's bare foot, looking up at her with loving confidence. The last and most ambitious of them in this period was the Madonna del Baldacchino in the Pitti. The Virgin Mother enthroned under a canopy, or baldacchino, with two angels parting its folds, two saints at each side, two angels singing at her feet. All in all, a conventional performance, famous only because it is Raphael's. In 1505, he interrupted his stay in Florence to visit Perugia and execute two commissions there. For the nuns of St. Anthony, he painted an altarpiece, which is now one of the most precious pictures in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Within a frame beautifully carved, the Virgin sits on a throne, looking like Wordsworth's nun breathless with adoration. In her lap, the child raises a hand to bless the infant St. John. Two exquisite female figures, St. Cecilia and St. Catherine of Alexandria, flank the Virgin. In the foreground, St. Peter frowns and St. Paul reads, and above, in a lunette, God the Father, surrounded by angels, blesses the mother of his son, and with one hand upholds the world. In one panel of the predella, Christ prays on the Mount of Olives while the apostles sleep, and in another Mary supports the dead Christ while Magdalene kisses his pierced feet. The perfect composition of the ensemble, the appealing figures of the female saints, meditative and wistful, the powerful conception of the passionate Peter, and the unique vision of Christ on the Mount, make this Colonna Madonna the first indubitable masterpiece of Raphael. In that same year of 1506, he painted a less imposing picture, a Madonna, now in the National Gallery in London, for the Ansidei family. The Virgin, straightly enthroned, teaches the child how to read. At her left, St. Nicholas of Bari, gorgeous in his episcopal robes, is also studious. At her right, the Baptist, suddenly thirty while his playmate is still an infant, points the traditional finger of the forerunner at the Son of God. From Perugia, Raphael seems to have gone again to Urbino in 1506. Now he painted for Guido Baldo a second St. George, now in Leningrad, this time with a lance, a handsome young knight sheathed in armor whose gleaming blue displays another phase of Raphael's skill. Probably on the same visit, he painted for his friends the most familiar of his self-portraits, now in the Pitti. Black beret over long black locks, face still youthful, and with no trace yet of beard, long nose, small mouth, soft eyes. Altogether a haunting face that might have been Keats's, revealing a spirit clean and fresh and sensitive to every beauty in the world. Late in 1506 he returned to Florence. There he painted some of his less renowned pictures, St. Catherine of Alexandria, now in London, and the Nicolini Cooper Madonna and Child, now in Washington. About 1780, the third Earl Cooper smuggled this out of Florence in the lining of his carriage. It is not one of Raphael's finest, but Andrew Mellon paid $850,000 to add it to his collection in 1928. A far greater picture was begun by Raphael at Florence in 1507, the Entombment of Christ, now in the Borghese Gallery. It was ordered for the Church of San Francesco in Perugia by Atalanta Baglioni, who, seven years before, had knelt in the street over her own dying son. Perhaps through Mary's grief she expressed her own. Taking Perugino's deposition as his model, Raphael grouped his figures in a masterly composition, almost with the power of Montaigne, the emaciated dead Christ, born in a sheet by a virile and muscular youth and a bearded straining man, a splendid head of Joseph of Arimathea, a lovely Magdalene leaning in horror over the corpse, Mary fainting into the arms of attendant women. Every body in a different attitude, yet all rendered with anatomical verity and Corregian grace. A somber symphony of reds, blues, browns, and greens, mingling in a luminous unity, with a Georgianesque landscape showing the three crosses of Golgotha under an evening sky. In 1508, Raphael received at Florence a call that changed the current of his life. The new Duke of Urbino, Francesco Maria della Rovere was a nephew of Julius II. Bramante, a distant relative of Raphael, was now a favorite with the Pope. Apparently both the Duke and the architect recommended Raphael to Julius. 
Soon an invitation was sent the young painter to come to Rome. He was glad to go for Rome, not Florence, was now the exciting and stimulating center of the Renaissance world. Julius, who had lived for four years in the Borgia apartment, had tired of seeing Giulia Farnese playing virgin on the wall. He wished to move into the four chambers once used by the admirable Nicholas V, and he wanted these stanze or rooms to be decorated with paintings congenial to his heroic stature and aims. In the summer of 1508, Raphael went to Rome. 2. Raphael and Julius II, 1508-1513 Rarely since Phidias had so many great artists gathered in one city and year. Michelangelo was carving figures for Julius's gigantic tomb and was painting the Sistine Chapel ceiling. Bramante was designing the new St. Peter's. Fra Giovanni of Verona, master woodworker, was carving doors and chairs and bosses for the stanze. Perugino, Signorelli, Peruzzi, Sodoma, Lotto, Pinturicchio had already painted some of the walls. And Ambrogio Foppa, called Cardosa, the Cellini of his age, was making gold in every way. Julius assigned to Raphael the Stanza della Segnatura, so-called because usually in this room the Pope heard appeals and signed pardons. He was so pleased with the youth's first paintings here, and saw in him so excellent and pliable an agent to execute the grand conceptions that seethed in the papal brain, that he dismissed Perugino, Signorelli, and Sodoma, ordered their paintings whitewashed, and offered to Raphael the opportunity to paint all the walls of the four rooms. Raphael persuaded the Pope to retain some of the work done by the earlier artists. Most of it, however, was covered over, so that the major paintings might have the unity of one mind and hand. For each room, Raphael received twelve hundred ducats, or about fifteen thousand dollars. And on the two rooms that he did for Julius, he spent four and a half years. He was now twenty-six. The plan for the Stanza della Segnatura was lordly and sublime. The paintings were to represent the union of religion and philosophy, of classic culture and Christianity, of church and state, of literature and law, in the civilization of the Renaissance. Probably the Pope conceived the general plan and chose the subjects in consultation with Raphael and the scholars of his court, Ingarami and Sodaletto, later Bembo and Bibiena. In the great semicircle formed by one side wall, Raphael pictured religion in the persons of the Trinity and the saints, and theology in the form of the fathers and doctors of the Church discussing the nature of the Christian faith as centered in the doctrine of the Eucharist. How carefully he prepared himself for this first test of his ability to paint on a monumental scale may be seen from the thirty preliminary studies that he made for this Disputa del Sacramento. He recalled Fra Bartolomeo's last judgment in Santa Maria Nuova at Florence and his own adoration of the Trinity in San Severo at Perugia, and on them he modeled his design. The result was a panorama so majestic as almost to convert the most obdurate skeptic to the mysteries of the faith. At the top of the arch, radial lines converging upward make the uppermost figures seem to bend forward. At the bottom, the converging lines of a marble pavement give the picture depth. At the summit, God the Father, a solemn, kindly Abraham, holds up the globe with one hand and with the other blesses the scene. Below him, the sun sits, naked to the waist, as in a shell. On his right, Mary in humble adoration. On his left, the Baptist, still carrying his shepherd's staff, crowned with a cross. Beneath him, a dove represents the Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity. Everything is here. Seated on a fluffy cloud around the Savior are twelve magnificent figures of Old Testament or Christian history. Adam, a bearded Michelangelesque athlete, almost nude. Abraham, a stately Moses holding the tables of the law. David, Judas Maccabeus, Peter and Paul, St. John writing his Evangel, St. James the Greater, St. Stephen, St. Lawrence, and two others of debated identity. Among them and in the clouds, everywhere except in the beards, cherubim and seraphim dart in and out, and angels weave through the air on the wings of song. Dividing and uniting this celestial assembly from an earthly throng below are two cherubim holding the gospel, and a monstrance displaying the host. Around this a varied assemblage of theologians gathers to consider the problems of theology. St. Jerome with his Vulgate and his Lion, 
St. Augustine dictating the city of God, St. Ambrose in his episcopal robes, Popes Anacletus and Innocent III, the philosophers Aquinas, Bonaventura, and Duns Scotus, the doer Dante crowned as if with thorns, the gentle Fra Angelico, the angry Savonarola, another Julian revenge on Alexander VI, and finally, in a corner, bald and ugly, Raphael's protecting friend Bramante. In all these human figures, the young artist has achieved an astonishing degree of individualization, making each face a credible biography, and in many of them a degree of superhuman dignity ennobles the whole picture and theme. Probably never before had painting so successfully conveyed the epic sublimity of the Christian creed. But could the same youth, now twenty-eight, represent with equal force and grandeur the role of science and philosophy among men? We have no evidence that Raphael had ever done much reading. He spoke with his brush and listened with his eyes. He lived in a world of form and color in which words were trivial things unless they issued in the significant actions of men and women. He must have prepared himself by hurried study, by dipping into Plato and Diogenes Laertius and Marsilio Ficino, and by humble conversation with learned men, to rise now to his supreme conception, the School of Athens, half a hundred figures summing up rich centuries of Greek thought, and all gathered in an immortal moment under the coffered arch of a massive pagan portico. There on the wall directly facing the apotheosis of theology in the Disputa is the glorification of philosophy, Plato of the Jove-like brow, deep eyes, flowing white hair and beard, with the finger pointing upward to his perfect state, Aristotle walking quietly beside him thirty years younger, handsome and cheerful, holding out his hand with downward palm, as if to bring his master's soaring idealism back to earth and the possible. Socrates, counting off his arguments on his fingers, with armed Alcibiades listening to him lovingly. Pythagoras trying to imprison in harmonic tables the music of the spheres. A fair lady who might be Aspasia. Heraclitus writing Ephesian riddles. Diogenes lying carelessly disrobed on the marble steps. Archimedes, drawing geometries on a slate for four absorbed youths. Ptolemy and Zoroaster bandying globes. A boy at the left running up eagerly with books, surely seeking an autograph. An assiduous lad seated in a corner taking notes. Peeking out at the left, little Federigo of Mantua, Isabella's son and Julius's pet. Bramante again. And hiding modestly, almost unseen, Raphael himself, now sprouting a mustache. There are many more about whose identity we shall let leisurely pundits dispute. All in all, such a parliament of wisdom had never been painted, perhaps never been conceived before. And not a word about heresy. No philosophers burned at the stake. Here, under the protection of a pope too great to fuss about the difference between one error and another, the young Christian has suddenly brought all these pagans together, painted them in their own character and with remarkable understanding and sympathy, and placed them where the theologians could see them and exchange fallibilities, and where the Pope, between one document and another, might contemplate the cooperative process and creation of human thought. This painting and the disputa are the ideal of the Renaissance, pagan antiquity and Christian faith living together in one room and harmony. These rival panels, in the sum of their conception, composition, and technique, are the apex of European painting, to which no man has ever risen again. A third wall remained, smaller than the other two, and so broken by a casement window that unity of pictorial subject seemed impossible there. It was a brilliant choice to let that surface picture poetry and music. So a chamber heavily laden with theology and philosophy was made light and bright with the world of harmonious imagination, and gentle melodies could sing silently through the centuries across that room where unappealable decisions gave life or death. In this fresco of Parnassus, Apollo, seated under some laurel trees atop the sacred mount, draws from his vial ditties of no tone, and at his right a muse reclines in graceful ease, bearing a lovely breast to the saints and sages on the adjacent walls. And Homer recites his hexameters in blind ecstasy, and Dante looks with unreconciled severity even at this goodly company of graces and bards. And Sappho, too beautiful to be lesbian, strums her cythera. 
and Virgil, Horace, Ovid, Tobullus, and other singers chosen by time mingle with Petrarch, Boccaccio, Ariosto, Sanazzaro, and lesser voices of more recent Italy. So the young artist suggested that life without music would be a mistake, and that the strains and visions of poetry might lift men to heights as lofty as the myopia of wisdom and the impudence of theology. On the fourth wall, also pierced by a window, Raphael honored the place of law in civilization. In the lunette, he painted figures of prudence, force, and moderation. On one side of the casement, he represented civil law in the form of the Emperor Justinian promulgating the pandects, and on the other, canon law in the person of Pope Gregory the Ninth promulgating the decretals. Here, to flatter his irascible master, he pictured Julius as Gregory and achieved another powerful portrait. In the circles, hexagons, and rectangles of the ornate ceiling, he painted little masterpieces like the Judgment of Solomon and symbolic figures of theology, philosophy, jurisprudence, astronomy, and poetry. With these and similar cameos, and some medallions left by Sodoma, the great Stanza della Signatura was complete. Raphael had exhausted himself there and never attained to such colossal excellence again. By 1511, when he began the next room, now called the Stanza del Iodoro, from its central picture, the conceptual inspiration of Pope and artist seemed to lose force and fire. Julius could hardly be expected to dedicate his entire apartment to a glorification of a union between classic culture and Christianity. It was natural now that he should devote a few walls to commemorating scenes in scriptural and Christian story. Perhaps to symbolize his expected expulsion of the French from Italy, he chose for one side of the chamber the vivid description, in the second book of the Maccabees, of how Heliodorus and his pagan cohorts, attempting to abscond with the treasury of the Jerusalem temple in 186 B.C., were overwhelmed by three angel warriors. Against an architectural background of great pillars and receding arches, the high priest Onias, kneeling at the altar, begs divine aid. On the right, a mounted angel, with irresistible wrath, tramples down the robber general, while two other heavenly rescuers advance to attack the fallen infidel, whose stolen coins spill out upon the pavement. On the left, with sublime disdain of chronology, Julius II sits enthroned in calm majesty, watching the expulsion of the invaders. At his feet, a crowd of Jewish women mingle incongruously with Raphael, now bearded and solemn, and his friends Marcantonio Raimondi, the engraver, and Giovanni di Foliari, a member of the papal secretariat. It is hardly as exalting a fresco as the Disputa or the School of Athens. It is too visibly devoted, at the cost of compositional unity, to the celebration of one pontiff and a passing theme. But it is still a masterpiece, vibrating with action, stately with architecture, and almost rivaling Michelangelo in the display of angry and muscular anatomies. On another wall, Raphael painted the Mass of Bolsena. About 1263, a Bohemian priest of Bolsena, near Orvieto, who had doubted that the sacramental wafer was really transformed into the body and blood of Christ, was amazed to see drops of blood ooze from the host that he had just consecrated in the Mass. In commemoration of this miracle, Pope Urban IV ordered the erection of a cathedral at Orvieto, and the annual celebration of the Corpus Christi feast. Raphael painted the scene with brilliance and mastery. The priestly skeptic gazes at the bleeding host, while the acolytes behind him start at the sight. Women and children at one side, Swiss guards at the other, unable to see the miracle, are visibly unmoved. Cardinals Riario and Schinner and other ecclesiastics stare at the scene in mingled astonishment and terror. Across from the altar, kneeling on a prie dieu, carved with grotesques, Julius II looks on in quiet dignity, as if he had known all along that the host would bleed. Technically, this is one of the best of the stanze frescoes. Raphael has distributed his figures skillfully around and above the window that mounts into the wall. He has also designed them with firmness of line and careful execution, and he has brought to flesh and drapery a new depth and warmth of coloring. The figure of the kneeling Julius is a revealing portrait of the Pope in his final year. Still the warrior strong and stern, still the proud king of kings, he is a man worn with his toils and combats, clearly marked for death. During these major labors, from 1508 to 1513, Raphael produced several memorable Madonnas. The Virgin with the Diadem in the Louvre reverts to the Umbrian style of modest piety. The Madonna della Casa Alba, literally the Lady of the White House, 
is a graceful study in pink and green and gold, with the large and flowing lines of Michelangelo's Sibyls. Andrew Mellon contributed $1,166,400 to the Soviet government in exchange for this picture in 1936. The Madonna di Foligno, in the Vatican, shows a lovely virgin and child in the clouds, a ghastly Baptist pointing to her, a stout St. Jerome presenting to her the donor of the picture, Sigismondo de Conti of Foligno and Rome. Here, Raphael, under the influence of the Venetian Sebastiano del Piombo, achieves a new splendor of luminous color. The Madonna della Pesce in the Prado is altogether beautiful. In the face and mood of the Virgin, in the child, never surpassed by Raphael. In the youthful Tobit, presenting to Mary the fish whose liver has restored his father's sight. In the robe of the angel who guides him, in the patriarchal head of St. Jerome. In composition, color, and light, this painting can bear comparison with the Sistine Madonna itself. Finally, Raphael in this period raised portrait painting to a height that only Titian would reach again. The portrait was a characteristic product of the Renaissance and corresponds to the proud liberation of the individual in that flamboyant age. Raphael's portraits are not numerous, but they all stand on the highest level of the art. One of the finest is Bindo Altoviti, who could surmise that this gentle but alert youth, healthy and clear-eyed, and as pretty as a girl, was no poet but a banker, and a generous patron of artists from Raphael to Cellini? He was twenty-two when so portrayed. In 1556 he died at Rome after a noble but disastrous and exhausting effort to save the independence of Siena from Florence. And of course to this period belongs the greatest of all portraits, the Julius II of the Uffizi Gallery, from circa 1512. We cannot say that this is the original that first came from Raphael's hand. Possibly it is a studio replica, and the marvelous copy in the Pitti Palace was made by none other than that rival portraitist, Titian. The fate of the original is unknown. Julius himself died before the Stanza de Leodoro was finished, and Raphael wondered whether the great plan of the four stanze would be carried out. But how could a pope like Leo X, wedded to art and poetry almost as deeply as to religion, hesitate? The young man from Urbino was to find in Leo his most loyal friend. The living genius of happiness was to know, under a happy pope, his happiest years. 4. Michelangelo 1. Youth, 1475-1505 We have left to the last Julius's favorite painter and sculptor, a man rivaling him in temper and terribilita, in power and depth of spirit, the greatest and saddest artist in the records of mankind. Michelangelo's father was Lodovico di Leonardo Buonarroti Simoni, Odesta, or mayor, of the little town of Caprese, on the road from Florence to Arezzo. Lodovico claimed distant kinship with the Counts of Canossa, one of whom was pleased to acknowledge the relation. Michael always prided himself on having a liter or two of noble blood but ruthless research has proved him mistaken. Born at Caprese on March 6, 1475, and named, like Raphael, after an archangel, Michelangelo was the second of four brothers. He was put out to nurse near a marble quarry at Settignano, so that he breathed the dust of sculpture from his birth. He remarked later that he had sucked in chisels and hammers with his nurse's milk. When he was six months old, the family moved to Florence. He received some schooling there, enough to enable him in after years to write good Italian verse. He learned no Latin, and never fell so completely under the hypnosis of antiquity as did many artists of the time. He was Hebraic, not classic, Protestant in spirit, rather than Catholic. He preferred drawing to writing, which is a corruption of drawing. His father mourned the preference, but finally yielded to it, and apprenticed Michael, aged thirteen, to Domenico Ghirlandaio, then the most popular painter in Florence. The contract bound the youth to stay with Domenico three years to learn the art of painting. He was to receive six florins the first year, eight the second, ten the third, and presumably shelter and food. The boy supplemented Ghirlandaio's instruction by keeping his eyes open as he wandered through Florence, seeing in everything some object for art. Thus, reports his friend Condivi, he used to frequent the fish market and study the shape and hues of fish's fins, the color of their eyes, and so for every part belonging to them, 
all which details he reproduced with the utmost diligence in his painting. He had been with Ghirlandaio hardly a year when a combination of nature and chance turned him to sculpture. Like many other art students, he had free access to the gardens in which the Medici had disposed their collections of antique statuary and architecture. He must have copied some of these marbles with a special interest and skill, for when Lorenzo, wishing to develop a school of sculpture in Florence, asked Ghirlandaio to send him some students of promise in that direction, Domenico gave him Francesco Granacci and Michelangelo Buonarroti. The boy's father hesitated to let him make the change from one art to the other. He feared that his son would be put to cutting stone. And indeed, Michael was so used for a time, blocking out marble for the Laurentian library. But soon the boy was carving statues. All the world knows the story of Michael's marble fawn, how he chiseled a stray piece into the figure of an old fawn, how Lorenzo, passing, remarked that so old a fawn would hardly have so complete a set of teeth, and how Michael remedied the fault at one blow by knocking a tooth out of the upper jaw. Pleased with the boy's product and aptitude, Lorenzo took him into his home and treated him as his son. For two years, from 1490 to 1492, the young artist lived in the Palazzo Medici, regularly ate at the same table with Lorenzo, Politian, Pico, Ficino, and Pulci, heard the most enlightened talk about politics, literature, philosophy, and art. Lorenzo assigned him a good room, allowed him five ducats, or about $62.50 a month for his personal expenses. Whatever works of art Michael might produce remained his own, to dispose of as he wished. These years in the Medici Palace might have been a period of pleasant growth, had it not been for Pietro Torrigiano. Pietro one day took offense at Michael's banter, and, so he told Cellini, clenching my fist I gave him such a blow on the nose that I felt bone and cartilage go down like biscuit beneath my knuckles, and this mark of mine he will carry to the grave. It was so. Michelangelo for the next seventy-four years showed a nose broken at the bridge. It did not sweeten his temper. In those same years, Savonarola was preaching his fiery gospel of Puritan reform. Michael went often to hear him and never forgot those sermons, or the cold thrill that ran through his youthful blood as the prior's angry cry, announcing the doom of corrupt Italy, pierced the stillness of the crowded cathedral. When Savonarola died, something of his spirit lingered in Michelangelo, a horror of the moral decay about him, a fierce resentment of despotism, a somber presentiment of doom. Those memories and fears shared in forming his character, in guiding his chisel and his brush. Lying on his back under the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, he remembered Savonarola. Painting the Last Judgment, he resurrected him and hurled the friar's fulminations down the centuries. In 1492, Lorenzo died, and Michael returned to his father's house. He continued his sculpture and painting, and now added a strange experience to his education— the prior of the hospital of Santo Spirito allowed him, in a private room, to dissect corpses. Michael performed so many dissections that his stomach revolted, and for a time he could hardly hold any food or drink. But he learned anatomy. He had an absurd chance to show his knowledge when Piero de' Medici asked him to mold a gigantic snowman in the court of the palace. Michael complied, and Piero persuaded him to live again in the Casa Medici, this in January of 1494. Late in 1494, Michelangelo, in one of his many hectic moves, fled through the winter snow of the Apennines to Bologna. One story says that he was warned of Piero's coming fall by the dream of a friend. Perhaps his own judgment predicted that event. In any case, Florence might not then be safe for one so favored by the Medici. At Bologna, he studied carefully the reliefs by Jacopo della Quercia on the facade of San Petronio. He was engaged to finish the tomb of St. Dominic, and carved for it a graceful kneeling angel. Then the organized sculptors of Bologna sent him warning that if he, a foreigner and interloper, continued to take work out of their hands, they would dispose of him by one or another of the many devices open to Renaissance initiative. Meanwhile, Savonarola had taken charge of Florence, and virtue was in the air. Michael returned in 1495. He found a patron in Lorenzo di Pierfrancesco, of the collateral branch of the Medici, for him he carved a sleeping Cupid, which had a strange history. Lorenzo suggested that he treat the surface to make it look like an antique. Michael complied, 
Lorenzo sent it to Rome, where it was sold for thirty ducats to a dealer who sold it for two hundred to Raffaello Riario, Cardinal di San Giorgio. The Cardinal discovered the cheat, sent back the Cupid, recovered his ducats. It was later sold to Caesar Borgia, who gave it to Guido Baldo of Urbino. Caesar reclaimed it on taking that city and sent it to Isabella d'Este, who described it as without a peer among the works of modern times. Its later history is unknown. With all his versatile ability, Michael found it hard to earn a living by art in a city where there were almost as many artists as citizens. An agent of Riario invited him to Rome, assuring him that the cardinal would give him employment and that Rome was full of wealthy patrons. So in 1496, Michelangelo moved hopefully to the capital and received a place in the household of the cardinal. Riario did not prove generous, but Jacopo Gallo, a banker, commissioned Michael to carve a Bacchus and a Cupid. One is in the Bargello at Florence, the other in the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. The Bacchus is an unpleasant representation of the young god of wine in a state of bibbling intoxication. The head is too small for the body, as may be fitting in a toper, but the body is well designed and smooth with an androgynous softness of texture. The Cupid is a crouching youth, more like an athlete than a god of love. Perhaps Michelangelo did not name it so incongruously. As sculpture, it is excellent. Here, almost at the outset, the artist distinguished his work by showing the figure in a moment and attitude of action. The Greek preference for repose in art was alien to him, except in the Pietà. So, with the same exception, was the Greek flair for universality, for depicting general types. Michelangelo chose rather to portray an individual, imaginary in conception, realistic in detail. He did not imitate the antique, except in costumes. His work was characteristically his own. No renaissance, but a unique creation. The greatest product of this first stay in Rome was the Pietà, that is now one of the glories of St. Peter's. The contract for it was signed by Cardinal Jean de Villiers, French ambassador at the papal court, in 1498. The fee was to be 450 ducats, or about $5,625. The time allowed, one year, and Michael's banker friend added his own generous guarantees. I, Jacopo Gallo, pledge my word to his most reverent lordship that the said Michelangelo will finish the said work within one year and that it shall be the finest work in marble which Rome today can show and that no master of our day shall be able to produce a better. And in like manner I pledge my word to the said Michelangelo that the most reverend cardinal will disperse the payments according to the articles of above engrossed. There are some blemishes in this glorious group of the virgin mother holding her dead son in her lap. The drapery seems excessive, the virgin's head is small for her body, her left hand is extended in an inappropriate gesture, her face is that of a young woman clearly younger than her son. To this last complaint Michelangelo, as reported by Condivi, made answer, Do you not know that chaste women maintain their freshness far longer than the unchaste? How much more would this be the case with a virgin into whose breast there never crept the least lascivious desire which would affect the body? Nay, I will go further— and hazard the belief that this unsullied bloom of youth, besides being maintained in her by natural causes, may have been miraculously wrought to convince the world of the virginity and perpetual purity of the mother. It is a pleasant and forgivable fancy. The spectator is soon reconciled to that gentle face, untorn by agony, calm in her grief and love, the bereaved mother resigned to the will of God, and consoled by holding for some final moments the dear body here cleansed of its wounds, freed from its indignities, resting in the lap of the woman that bore it, and beautiful even in death. All the essence and tragedy and redemption of life are in this simple group, the stream of births by which woman carries on the race, the certainty of death is the penalty for every birth, and the love that ennobles our mortality with kindness and challenges every death with new birth. Francis I was right when he pronounced this the finest achievement of Michelangelo. In all the history of sculpture, no man has ever surpassed it, except perhaps the unknown Greek who carved the Demeter of the British Museum. The success of the Pietà brought Michelangelo not only fame, which he humanly enjoyed, but money, which his relatives were ready to enjoy with him. His father had lost, with the fall of the Medici, the little sinecure that Lorenzo the Magnificent had given him. Michael's older brother had entered a monastery. The two younger brothers were improvident, 
and Michael now became the main support of the family. He complained of this necessity, but gave generously. Probably because the disordered finances of his relatives called him, he returned to Florence in 1501. A unique assignment came to him in August of that year. The Operai, or Board of Works, at the cathedral owned a block of Carrara marble thirteen and a half feet high, but so irregularly shaped that it had lain unused for a hundred years. The board asked Michelangelo, could a statue be chiseled out of it? He agreed to try, and on August 16th, the Operai del Duomo and the Arte della Lana, the Wool Guild, signed the contract. That the worthy master Michelangelo has been chosen to fashion, complete, and finish to perfection that male statue called Il Gigante, of nine cubits in height, that the work shall be completed within two years, dating from September, at a salary of six golden florins per month, that what is needed for the accomplishment of this task, as workmen, timbers, etc., shall be supplied him by the operai. And when the statue is finished, the opera consuls and the operai shall estimate whether he deserve a larger recompense, and this shall be left to their consciences. The sculptor toiled on the refractory material for two and a half years. With heroic labor he drew from it, using every inch of its height, his David. On January 25, 1504, the Operai assembled the Council of the Leading Artists in Florence to consider where Il Gigante, as they called the David, should be placed. Cosimo Roselli, Sandro Botticelli, Leonardo da Vinci, Giuliano and Antonio da Sangallo, Filippino Lippi, David Ghirlandaio, Perugino, Giovanni Pifero, father of Cellini, and Piero di Cosimo. They could not agree, and finally they left the matter to Michelangelo. He asked that the statue be placed on the platform of the Palazzo Vecchio. The signory consented, but the task of moving the giant from the workshop near the cathedral to the palazzo took forty men four days. A gateway had to be heightened by breaking a wall above it before the Colossus could pass and twenty-one additional days were spent in raising it into place. For three hundred sixty-nine years it stood on the open and uncovered porch of the palazzo, subject to weather, urchins, and revolution. For in a sense, it was a radical pronunciamento, symbol of the proud restored republic, stern threat to usurpers. The Medici, returning to power in 1513, left it untouched. But in the uprising that again deposed them in 1527, a bench thrown from a window of the palace broke the statue's left arm. Francesco Salviati and Giorgio Vasari, then lads of sixteen, gathered and preserved the pieces, and later a Medici, Duke Cosimo, had these fragments put together and replaced. In 1873, after the statue had suffered erosion from the weather, David was laboriously transferred to the Accademia delle Belle Arti where it occupies the place of honor as the most popular figure in Florence. It was a tour de force, and as such can hardly be overpraised. The mechanical difficulties were brilliantly overcome. Aesthetically, one may pick a few flaws. The right hand is too large, the neck too long, the left leg over long below the knee, the left buttock does not swell as any proper buttock should. Piero Soderini, head of the Republic, thought the nose excessive. Vasari tells the story, perhaps a legend, how Michelangelo, holding some marble dust in his hand, mounted a ladder, pretended to chisel off a bit of the nose while leaving it intact, and let the marble dust fall from his hand before the gonfalonier, who then pronounced the statue much improved. The total effect of the work silences criticism. The splendid frame, not yet swollen with the muscles of Michelangelo's later heroes, the finished texture of the flesh, the strong yet refined features, the nostrils tense with excitement the frown of anger and the look of resolution subtly tinged with diffidence as the youth faces the fearsome Goliath and prepares to fill and cast his sling. These share in making the David, with one exception, which should be the Hermes of Praxiteles, but more probably is the Statue of Liberty in the harbor of New York, the most famous statue in the world. Vasari thought it surpassed all other statues, ancient and modern, Latin or Greek. The Duomo board paid Michelangelo a total of 400 florins for the David. Allowing for the depreciation of currency between 1400 and 1500, we may equate this roughly at $5,000 in the money of 1952. It seems a rather small sum for 30 months' work. Presumably, he accepted other commissions during that time. 
Indeed, the board and guild themselves, while David was in process, engaged him to carve statues, six and a half feet high, of the twelve apostles, to be placed in the cathedral. He was allowed twelve years for the work, was to be paid two florins a month, and a house was to be built for his free occupancy. Of these statues, the sole survivor is a St. Matthew, only half emerged from the block of stone, like some figure by Rodin. Looking at it in the Florence Academy, we understand better what Michelangelo meant when he defined sculpture as the art that works by force of taking away. And again in one of his poems, In hard and craggy stone the mere removal of the surface gives being to a figure, whichever grows the more the stone is hewn away. He often spoke of himself as searching to find the figure concealed in the stone, knocking the surface away as if seeking a miner buried in fallen rock. About 1505 he carved for a Flemish merchant the Madonna that sits in the church of Notre Dame at Bruges. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now. Station, Volume 5, The Renaissance, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued. Cassette 4, Side 2. About 1505 he carved for a Flemish merchant the Madonna that sits in the church of Notre Dame at Bruges. It has been highly praised, but it is one of the artist's poorer works. The drapery, simple and dignified, the head of the child quite out of proportion to the body, the face of the virgin pouting and mournful, as if she felt that it was all a mistake. Still stranger is the homely virgin in the Madonna, painted in 1505, for Angelo Doni. In truth, Michelangelo did not care much for beauty. He was interested in bodies, preferably male, and represented them sometimes with all the defects of their seen forms, sometimes in a way to convey some sermon or idea, but seldom with a view to catching beauty and imprisoning it in lasting stone. In this Doni Madonna he offends good taste by placing a row of naked youths on a parapet behind the Virgin. Not that he was paganizing. He was apparently a sincere, even a Puritan Christian. But here, as in the Last Judgment, his fascination with the human body triumphed over his piety. He was deeply interested, too, in the anatomy of position, in what happens to limbs, extremities, frame, and muscles when the body changes its pose. So here the Virgin leans backward, apparently to receive the child over her shoulder from St. Joseph. It is excellent sculpture, but lifeless and almost colorless painting. Michelangelo was to protest time and again that painting was not his forte. Therefore he must have felt no great pleasure when Soderini invited him in 1504 to paint a mural in the hall of the great council of the Palazzo Vecchio, while his bete noir, Leonardo da Vinci, was to paint an opposite wall. He disliked Leonardo for a hundred reasons, for his aristocratic manners, his costly and pretentious dress, his retinue of pretty youths, perhaps for his greater success and fame till then as a painter. Angelo was not sure that he, a sculptor, could rival Leonardo in painting. It was courageous of him to try. For his preliminary cartoon, he set up a panel of linen-backed paper, 288 square feet in area. He had made some progress on this sketch when a summons came to him from Rome. Julius needed the best sculptor to be found in Italy. The signory fumed, but let Michelangelo go in 1505. Perhaps he was not sorry to leave the pencil and the brush and return to the laborious art that he loved. 2. Michelangelo and Julius II, 1505-1513 He must have seen at once that he would be miserable with Julius. They were so much alike. Both had temper and temperament. The Pope, imperious and fiery, the artist, somber and proud. Both were titans in spirit and aim, acknowledging no superior, admitting no compromise, passing from one grandiose project to another, stamping their personalities on their time, and laboring with such mad energy that when both were dead all Italy seemed exhausted and empty. Julius, following the example long since set by the cardinals, wanted for his bones a mausoleum whose size and splendor should proclaim his greatness even to distant and forgetful posterity. He looked with envy upon the beautiful tomb that Andrea Sansovino had just carved for Cardinal Ascanio Sforza in Santa Maria del Popolo. Michael proposed a colossal monument twenty-seven feet in length and eighteen in width. Forty statues would adorn it, some symbolizing the redeemed papal states, some personifying painting, architecture, sculpture, poetry, philosophy, theology, all made captive by the irresistible Pope, others depicting his major predecessors, as, for example, Moses. Two would picture angels, one weeping at Julius's removal from the earth, 
the other smiling at his entrance into heaven. At the top would be a handsome sarcophagus for the mortal papal remains. Along the surfaces of the monument would run bronze reliefs recounting the achievements of the Pope in war, government, and art. All this was to stand in the tribune of St. Peter's. It was a design that would use many tons of marble, many thousands of ducats, many years of the sculptor's life. Julius approved, gave Angelo two thousand ducats for the purchase of marble, and sent him off to Carrara, instructing him to pick the finest veins. While there, Michael noted the hill overlooking the sea, and conceived the idea of carving the mount into a colossal human figure, which, lighted at the top, would serve as a beacon to distant mariners. But Julius's tomb called him back to Rome. When the marble that he had bought arrived and was piled up in a square by his lodgings near St. Peter's, people marveled at its quantity and cost, and Julius rejoiced. The drama became tragedy. Bramante, desiring money for the new St. Peter's, looked askance at this titanic project. Moreover, he feared that Michelangelo would replace him as the Pope's favorite artist. He used his influence to divert papal funds and passion from the proposed tomb. For his part, Julius was planning war upon Perugia and Bologna in 1506, and found Mars an expensive god. The tomb should wait for peace. Meanwhile, Angelo had received no salary, had spent on marble all that Julius had advanced him, had paid out of his own pocket to furnish the house that the Pope had provided for him. He went to the Vatican on Holy Saturday, 1506, to ask for money. He was told to return on Monday. He did, and was told to return on Tuesday. Like rebuffs met him on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. On Friday he was turned away with the blunt statement that the Pope did not wish to see him. He went home and wrote a letter to Julius. Most blessed Father, I have been turned out of the palace today by your orders. Wherefore, I give you notice that from this time forward, if you want me, you must look for me elsewhere than at Rome. He gave instructions for the sale of the furniture he had bought and took horse toward Florence. At Poggibonzi he was overtaken by couriers bearing a letter from the Pope, which commanded him to return at once to Rome. If we may accept his own account, and he was an unusually honest man, he sent back a reply that he would come only when the Pope agreed to fulfill the conditions of their understanding for the tomb. He continued to Florence. Now he resumed work on the immense cartoon for the Battle of Pisa. He chose as his subject no actual warfare, but the moment when the soldiers, who had been swimming in the Arno, were suddenly called to action. Michael was not concerned with battles. He wanted to study and portray the nude male form in every position. Here was his chance. He showed some men emerging from the river, others running to their weapons, others struggling to pull up stockings on wet legs, others leaping or riding on horseback, others hurriedly adjusting their armor, some running stark naked to the fight. There was no landscape background. Michelangelo never cared for landscape or for anything in nature except the human form. When the cartoon was finished, it was put alongside Leonardo's in the Hall of the Pope in Santa Maria Novella. There the rival sketches became a school for a hundred artists, Andrea del Sarto, Alonso Berghete, Raphael, Jacopo Sansovino, Perino del Vaga, and a hundred more. Cellini, who copied Michelangelo's cartoon about 1513, described it with youthful enthusiasm as so splendid in action that nothing survives of ancient or modern art which touches the same point of lofty excellence. Though the divine Michelangelo in later life finished that great Sistine Chapel, he never rose halfway to the same pitch of power. We cannot say as much. The picture was never painted, the cartoon is lost, and only minor fragments survive of the many copies made. While Angelo was working on the sketch, Pope Julius sent message after message to the Florentine Signory, demanding them to send him back to Rome. Soderini, loving the artist and fearing for his safety in Rome, temporized. After the third letter from the Pope, he begged Angelo to obey, saying that his obstinacy endangered the peaceful relations between Florence and the papacy. Michael demanded a safe conduct, to be signed by the Cardinal of Volterra. During the delay, Julius captured Bologna in November of 1506. Now he sent to Florence a peremptory order that Michelangelo should come to Bologna for an important commission. Armed with a letter from Soderini to Julius, which begged the Pope to show him love and treat him gently, Michael went once more over the snows of the Apennines. Julius received him with a heavy frown, ordered from the room a bishop who presumed to rebuke the artist for disobedience, gave Angelo a grumbling pardon and a characteristic assignment. I wish you to make my statue on a large scale in bronze. I mean to place it on the façade of San Petronio. 
Michael was glad to get back to sculpture, though not confident of his ability to cast successfully a sitting figure fourteen feet in height. Julius provided a thousand ducats for the work. Angelo reported later that he had spent all but four ducats on materials, so that he had for himself only that reward for two years of labor in Bologna. The task was as heartbreaking as that which Cellini described for casting the Loggia of Perseus. I work night and day, the sculptor wrote to his brother, Buonarroto. If I had to begin the whole thing over again, I do not think I could survive it. In February 1508, the statue was raised to its place above the main portal of the cathedral. In March, Michael returned to Florence, probably praying that he might never see Julius again. Three years later, as we have seen, the statue was melted into cannon. Almost at once, the Pope sent for him. Angelo went back to Rome and was chagrined to find that Julius wanted him not to carve the great tomb, but to paint the ceiling of the chapel of Sixtus IV. He hesitated to face the problems of perspective and foreshortening in painting a ceiling sixty-eight feet above the floor. He protested again that he was a sculptor, not a painter. In vain, he recommended Raphael as a better man for the work. Julius commanded and coaxed, pledging a fee of three thousand ducats, or about thirty-seven thousand five hundred dollars. Michael feared the Pope and needed the money. Still murmuring, This is not my trade, he undertook the arduous and uncongenial task. He sent to Florence for five assistants trained in design, tore down the clumsy scaffolding that Bramante had raised, erected his own, and set to work measuring and charting the ten thousand square feet of the ceiling, planning the general design, making cartoons for each separate space, including spandrels, pendentives, and lunettes. In all, there were to be three hundred forty three figures. Many preliminary studies were made, some from living models. When the final form of a cartoon was finished, it was carried carefully up the scaffolding and was applied face outward to the freshly plastered surface of its corresponding place. The lines of the composition were then pricked through the drawing into the plaster, the cartoon was removed, and the sculptor began to paint. For over four years, from May 1508 to October 1512, Angelo worked on the Sistine ceiling. Not continuously. There were interruptions of uncertain length, as when he went to Bologna to besiege Julius for more funds. And not alone. He had helpers to grind the colors, prepare the plaster, perhaps to draw or paint some minor features. Parts of the frescoes reveal inferior hands. But the five artists whom he had summoned to Rome were soon dismissed. Angelo's style of conception, design, and coloring was so different from theirs and the traditions of Florence that he found them more hindrance than aid. Besides, he did not know how to get along with others, and it was one of his consolations up there on the scaffold that he was alone. There he could think, in pain but in peace. There he could exemplify Leonardo's saying, If you are alone, you will be wholly your own. To the technical difficulties, Julius added himself by his impatience to have the great work completed and displayed. Picture the old Pope mounting the frail frame, drawn up to the platform by the artist, expressing admiration always asking, When will it be finished? The reply was a lesson in integrity. When I have done all that I believe required to satisfy art. To which Julius retorted angrily, Do you want me to hurl you from this scaffold? Yielding later to the papal impatience, Angelo took down the scaffolding before all final touches had been applied. Then Julius thought that a little gold should be added here and there, but the weary artist persuaded him that gold trimmings would hardly become the prophets or the apostles. When for the last time Michael descended from the scaffold, he was exhausted, emaciated, prematurely old. A story says that his eyes, long accustomed to the subdued illumination of the chapel, could hardly bear the light of the sun. And another story that he found it now easier to read by looking upward than by holding the page beneath his eyes. The original plan of Julius for the ceiling had been merely a series of apostles. Michelangelo prevailed upon him to allow an ampler and nobler scheme. He divided the convex vault into over a hundred panels by picturing columns and moldings between them, and he enhanced the tri-dimensional illusion with lusty youthful figures upholding the cornices or seated on capitals. In the major panels, running along the crest of the ceiling, Angelo painted episodes from Genesis— the initial act of creation separates light from darkness. The sun, moon, and planets come into being at the command of the Creator, a majestic figure, stern of face, powerful of body, with beard and robes flying in the air. The Almighty, even finer in form and feature than in the previous panel, extends His right arm to create Adam. 
while with the left arm he holds a very pretty angel. This panel is Michelangelo's pictorial masterpiece. God, now a much older and patriarchal deity, evokes Eve from Adam's rib. Adam and Eve eat the fruit of the tree and are expelled from Eden. Noah and his sons prepare a sacrificial offering to God. The flood rises. Noah celebrates with too much wine. All in these panels is Old Testament. All is Hebraic. Michelangelo belongs to the prophets pronouncing doom, not to the evangelists expounding the gospel of love. In the spandrels of alternate arches, Angelo painted magnificent figures of Daniel, Isaiah, Zechariah, Joel, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Jonah. In the other spandrels, he pictured the pagan oracles that were believed to have foretold Christ, the graceful Libyan Sibyl holding an open book for the future, the dark, unhappy, powerful Cumean Sibyl, the studious Persian, the Delphic and Erythrian Sibyls. These, too, are such paintings as rival the sculptures of Pythias. Indeed, all these figures suggest sculpture, and Michelangelo, conscripted into an alien art, transforms it into his own. In the large triangle at one end of the ceiling, and in two others at the other end, the artist still stayed in the Old Testament, with the raising of the brazen serpent in the wilderness, the victory of David over Goliath, the hanging of Haman, the beheading of Holofernes by Judith. Finally, as if by concession and afterthought, in the lunettes and arched recesses above the windows, Angelo painted scenes expounding the genealogy of Mary and Christ. No one of these pictures quite equals Raphael's School of Athens in conception, drawing, color, and technique. But taken all together, they constitute the greatest achievement of any man in the history of painting. The total effect of repeated and careful contemplation is far greater than in the case of the stanze. There we feel a happy perfection of artistry and an urbane union of pagan and Christian thought. Here we do not merely perceive technical accomplishments, in the perspective, the foreshortenings, the unrivaled variety of attitudes. We feel the sweep and breadth of genius, almost as creative as in the windswept figure of the Almighty raising Adam out of the earth. Here again Michelangelo has given his ruling passion free reign, and though the place was the chapel of the popes, the theme and object of his art was the human body. Like the Greeks, he cared less for the face and its expression than for the whole physical frame. On the Sistine ceiling are half a dozen male, a few female nudes. There are no landscapes, no vegetation except in picturing the creation of plants, no decorative arabesques. As in Signorelli's frescoes at Orvieto, the body of man becomes the sole means of decoration as well as of representation. Signorelli was the one painter, as Jacopo della Quercia was the one sculptor, from whom Michelangelo cared to learn. Every little space left free in the ceiling by the general pictorial plan is occupied by a nude figure, not so much beautiful as athletic and strong. There is no sexual suggestion in them, only the persistent display of the human body as the highest embodiment of energy, vitality, life. Though some timid souls protested against this profusion of nudity in the house of God, Julius made no recorded objection. He was a man as broad as his hatreds, and he recognized great art when he saw it. Perhaps he understood that he had immortalized himself not by the wars that he had won, but by giving the strange and incalculable divinity fretting in Angelo freedom to disport itself on the papal chapel vault. Julius died four months after the completion of the Sistine ceiling. Michelangelo was then nearing his thirty-eighth birthday. He had placed himself at the head of all Italian sculptors by his David and Pietà. By this ceiling he had equaled or surpassed Raphael in painting. There seemed no other world left for him to conquer. Surely even he hardly dreamed that he had over a half a century yet to live, that his most famous painting, his most mature sculpture, were yet to be done. He mourned the passing of the great Pope and wondered whether Leo would have as sure an instinct as Julius for the noble in art. He retired to his lodgings and bided his time. Chapter 18 Leo X, 1513 to 1521 1. The Boy Cardinal The Pope that gave his name to one of the most brilliant and immoral ages in the history of Rome owed his ecclesiastical career to the political strategy of his father. Lorenzo de' Medici had been almost destroyed by Sixtus IV. He hoped that the power of his family and the security of his progeny in Florence would be helped by having a Medici sitting in the College of Cardinals in the inner circles of the Church. He destined his second son for the ecclesiastical state almost from Giovanni's infancy. 
At seven, in 1482, the boy was given the tonsure. Soon he was dowered with benefices in commendum. That is, he was made absentee beneficiary of church properties and received their surplus revenue. At the age of eight, he was given the abbacy of Fondus in France. At nine, the rich abbey of Passignano. At eleven, the historic abbey of Monte Cassino. Before his election to the papacy, Giovanni had collected sixteen such benefices. At eight, he was appointed proto-notary apostolic. At fourteen, he was made a cardinal. It should be recalled that one might become a cardinal without being a priest, and that cardinals were chosen for their political ability and connections rather than for religious qualities. The young prelate was provided with all the education available to a millionaire's son. He grew up amid scholars, poets, statesmen, and philosophers. He was tutored by Marsilio Ficino. He learned Greek from Demetrius Calsandales, philosophy from Bernardo de Bibiena, who became one of his cardinals. From the collections of art and the conversations about art in or around his father's palace, he imbibed that taste for the beautiful which was almost a religion to him in his mature years. From his father, perhaps, he learned the profuse and sometimes reckless generosity and the gay, almost epicurean manner of life which were to distinguish his cardinalate and his pontificate, with far-reaching results to the Christian world. At thirteen he entered the university that his father had re-established at Pisa. There, for three years, he studied philosophy and theology, canon and civil law. When at sixteen he was allowed openly to join the College of Cardinals in Rome, Lorenzo sent him off on March 12, 1492, with one of the most interesting letters in history. You, and all of us who are interested in your welfare, ought to esteem ourselves highly favored by Providence, not only for the many honors and benefits bestowed on our house, but more particularly for having conferred upon us, in your person, the greatest dignity we have ever enjoyed. This favor, in itself so important, is rendered still more so by the circumstances with which it is accompanied, and especially by the consideration of your youth and of our situation in the world. The first thing that I would therefore suggest to you is— that you ought to be grateful to God, and continually to recollect that it is not through your merits, your prudence, or your solicitude that this event has taken place, but through His favor, which you can only repay by a pious, chaste, and exemplary life, and that your obligations to the performance of these duties are so much the greater, as in your early years you may have given some reasonable expectation that your riper age may produce such fruits." Endeavor, therefore, to alleviate the burden of your early dignity by the regularity of your life and by your perseverance in those studies which are suitable to your profession. It gave me great satisfaction to learn that in the course of the past year you had frequently, of your own accord, gone to communion and confession. Nor do I conceive that there is any better way of obtaining the favor of heaven than by habituating yourself to a performance of these and similar duties. I well know that as you are now to reside at Rome— that sink of all iniquity, the difficulty of conducting yourself by these admonitions will be increased. The influence of example is itself prevalent, but you will probably meet with those who will particularly endeavor to corrupt and incite you to vice, because, as you may yourself perceive, your early attainment to so great a dignity is not observed without envy, and those who could not prevent your receiving that honor will secretly endeavor to diminish it by inducing you to forfeit the good estimation of the public thereby precipitating you into that gulf into which they themselves have fallen, in which attempt the consideration of your youth will give them a confidence of success. To these difficulties you ought to oppose yourself with the greater firmness, as there is at present less virtue amongst your brethren of the college. I acknowledge, indeed, that several of them are good and learned men, whose lives are exemplary, and whom I would recommend to you as patterns of your conduct. By emulating them you will be so much the more known and esteemed, in proportion as your age and the peculiarity of your situation will distinguish you from your colleagues. Avoid, however, the imputation of hypocrisy. Guard against all ostentation, either in your conduct or in your discourse. Affect not austerity, nor even appear too serious. This advice you will, I hope, in time understand and practice better than I can express it. Yet you are not unacquainted with the great importance of the character which you have to sustain, for you well know that all the Christian world would prosper if the cardinals were what they ought to be, because in such a case there would always be a good pope, upon which the tranquility of Christendom so materially depends. Endeavor then to render yourself such that, 
If all the rest resembled you, we might expect this universal blessing. To give you particular directions as to your behavior and conversation would be a matter of no small difficulty. I shall therefore only recommend that in your intercourse with the cardinals and other men of rank, your language be unassuming and respectful. On this your first visit to Rome, it will, however, be more advisable for you to listen to others than to speak much yourself. On public occasions, let your equipage and dress be rather below than above mediocrity. A handsome house and a well-ordered family will be preferable to a great retinue and a splendid residence. Silk and jewels are not suitable for persons in your station. Your taste will be better shown in the acquisition of a few elegant remains of antiquity or in the collecting of handsome books, and by your attendance being learned and well-bred rather than numerous. Invite others to your house oftener than you receive invitations. Practice neither too frequently. Let your own food be plain and take sufficient exercise, for those who wear your habit are soon liable, without great caution, to contract infirmities. Confide in others too little rather than too much. There is one rule which I would recommend to your attention in preference to all others. Rise early in the morning. This will not only contribute to your health, but will enable you to arrange and expedite the business of the day. And as there are various duties incident to your station, such as the performance of divine service, studying, giving audience, etc., you will find the observance of this admonition productive of the greatest utility. You will probably be desired to intercede for the favors of the Pope on particular occasions. Be cautious, however, that you trouble him not too often, for his temper leads him to be most liberal to those who weary him least with their solicitations. This you must observe, lest you should give him offense, remembering also at times to converse with him on more agreeable topics. And if you should be obliged to request some kindness from him, let it be done with that modesty and humility which are so pleasing to his disposition. Farewell. Lorenzo died less than a month later, and Giovanni had hardly reached the sink of iniquity when he hurried back to Florence to support his elder brother Piero in a precarious inheritance of political authority. It was one of Giovanni's rare misfortunes that he was again in Florence when Piero fell. To escape the indiscriminate wrath of the citizens against the Medici family, he disguised himself as a Franciscan friar, made his way unrecognized through hostile crowds, and applied for admission to the monastery of San Marco which his forebears had lavishly endowed, but which was at the time under the command of his father's enemy, Savonarola. The friars refused him admission. He hid for a time in a suburb, and then made his way over the mountains to join his brothers in Bologna. Disliking Alexander VI, he avoided Rome. For six years he lived as a fugitive or an exile, but apparently never out of funds. With his cousin Giulio, later Clement VII, and some friends, he visited Germany, Flanders, and France. Finally, reconciling himself to Alexander, he took up his residence in Rome in 1500. Everybody there liked him. He was modest, affable, and unostentatiously generous. He sent substantial gifts to his old teachers Politian and Calsandales. He collected books and works of art, and even his ample income hardly sufficed for his aid to poets, artists, musicians, and scholars. He enjoyed all the arts and graces of life. Nevertheless, Guicciardini, who lost no love on the popes, described him as having the reputation of a chaste person and of unblameable manners. And Aldous Minucius complimented him on his pious and irreproachable life. His vicissitudes were resumed when Julius II appointed him papal legate to govern Bologna and the Romagna in 1511. He accompanied the papal army to Ravenna, walked unarmed amid the battle, encouraged the soldiers, stayed too long on the field of defeat, administering the sacraments to the dying, and was captured by a Greek detachment in the service of the victorious French. Taken as a prisoner to Milan, he was pleased to note that even the French soldiers paid little attention to the schismatic cardinals and their peregrinating council, but came eagerly to him for his blessing, his absolution, perhaps his purse. He escaped from his lenient captors, joined the Spanish papal forces that sacked Prato and took Florence, and shared with his brother Giuliano in the restoration of the Medici to power in 1512. A few months later he was called to Rome to take part in selecting a successor to Julius. He was still only thirty-seven and could hardly have expected that he himself would be chosen pope. He entered the conclave in a litter, suffering from an anal fistula. After a week of debate and apparently without simony, Giovanni de' Medici was elected on March 11, 1513, and took the name of Leo X. He was not yet a priest, but this defect was remedied on March 15th. Everybody was surprised and delighted, 
After the dark intrigues of Alexander and Caesar Borgia, and the wars and turbulence and tantrums of Julius, it was a relief that a young man already distinguished for his easy-going good nature, his tact and courtesy, and his opulent patronage of letters and art, was now to lead the church, presumably in the ways of peace. Alfonso of Ferrara, so relentlessly fought by Julius, had no fear in coming to Rome. Leo reinvested him with all his ducal dignities, and the grateful prince held the stirrup as Leo mounted a horse to ride in the coronation procession of March 17th. These inauguration ceremonies were lavish beyond any precedent, costing a hundred thousand ducats. The banker, Agostino Chigi, provided a float on which a Latin inscription proclaimed hopefully, Once Venus, Alexander, reigned, then Mars, Julius, now Pallas, wisdom, rules. A pithier epigram ran the rounds. Mars was, Pallas is, I, Venus, will always be. Poets, sculptors, painters, goldsmiths rejoiced. Humanists promised themselves a revival of the Augustan age. Never had a man mounted the pontifical chair under more favorable auspices of public approbation. Leo himself, if we may believe the scribblers of the time, said pleasantly to his brother Giuliano, Godiomoci il papato, poiché Dio ci l'ha dato. Let us enjoy the papacy, since God has given it to us. The remark, possibly apocryphal, indicated no irreverence, but a blithe spirit, ready to be generous as well as happy, and ingenuously unaware amid its good fortune that half of Christendom was swelling with revolt against the Church. 2. The Happy Pope He began with excellent measures. He forgave the cardinals who had staged the anti-council of Pisa and Milan. That threat of schism ended. He promised, and kept his promise, to refrain from touching the estates left by cardinals. He reopened the Lateran Council and welcomed the delegates in his own graceful Latin. He effected some minor ecclesiastical reforms and reduced taxes. But his edict calling for larger reforms on May 3, 1514, encountered so much opposition from the functionaries whose incomes it would abate that he made no strenuous effort to enforce it. I will think the matter over, he said, and see how I can satisfy everybody. This was his character, and his character was his fate. Raphael's portrait of him in the Piti, painted between 1517 and 1519, is not as well known as that of Julius, but that was partly Leo's fault. There were in this case less depth of thought, heroism of action, and worth of inner soul to give majesty to the outward face and frame. The representation is merciless, a massive man of more than medium height and much more than medium weight the indignity of obesity concealed under a fur-trimmed robe of velvet white and cape of scarlet red. Hands soft and flabby, here shorn of the many rings that normally adorned them. A reading glass to help short-sighted eyes, round head and plump cheeks, full lips and double chin, large nose and ears, some lines of bitterness from the nose to the corners of the mouth, heavy eyes and slightly frowning brow. This is the Leo disillusioned with diplomacy and perhaps soured with the unmannerly reformation, rather than the light-hearted hunter and musician, the generous patron, the cultivated hedonist whose accession had so gladdened Rome. To do him justice, the record must be added to the picture. A man is many men, to divers men and times, and not even the greatest portraitist can show all these features in one moment's face. The basic quality in Leo, born of his fortunate life, was good nature— he had a pleasant word for everybody, saw the best side of everybody except the Protestants, whom he could not begin to understand, and gave so generously to so many that even this profuse philanthropy, involving heavy drafts on Christian purses, shared in causing the Reformation. We hear much of his courtesy, his tact, his amiability, his cheerful temper, even in sickness and pain. His fistula, repeatedly operated upon, always returned and sometimes made locomotion and agony. So far as he could, he let others lead their own lives. His initial moderation and kindliness yielded to severity when he discovered some cardinals plotting against his life. At times he was relentlessly hard, as with Francesco Maria della Rovere of Urbino and Gian Paolo Baglioni of Perugia. He could lie like a diplomat when he had to, and now and then bettered the instruction of the treacherous statesmanship that enmeshed him. More often he was humane, as when he forbade in vain, the enslavement of American Indians, and did his best to check the inquisitorial ferocity of Ferdinand the Catholic. 
Despite his general worldliness, he fulfilled conscientiously all his religious duties, observed the fasts, and recognized no inherent contradiction between religion and gaiety. He has been charged with saying to Bembo, It is well known to all ages how profitable this fable of Christ has been to us. But the sole authority for this is a violent polemic work, The Pageant of Popes, written about 1574 by an obscure Englishman, John Bale, B-A-L-E, and the free-thinking Bale, B-A-Y-L-E, and the Protestant Roscoe alike reject the story as itself a fable. His enjoyments ranged from philosophy to buffoons. He had learned at his father's table to appreciate poetry, sculpture, painting, music, calligraphy, illumination, textiles, vases, glass, all the forms of the beautiful, except perhaps their source and norm, woman. And though his enjoyment of the arts was too indiscriminate to be a guide to taste, his patronage of artists and poets carried on in Rome the magnanimous traditions of his ancestors in Florence. He was too easygoing to take philosophy to heart, he knew how precarious all conclusions are, and did not bother his head with metaphysics after his college days. At meals he had books read to him, usually of history, or he listened to music. There his taste was sure, he had a good ear and a melodious voice. He kept several musicians at his court and paid them lavishly. The improvisatore Bernardo Accolti, called Unico Aretino because of his birth in Arezzo and his unequaled facility in impromptu poetry and music, was able, with the fees that Leo paid him, to buy the little duchy of Nepi. A Jewish lute player earned a castle and the title of Count. The singer Gabriele Marino was made an archbishop. Under Leo's care and encouragement, the Vatican choir reached an unprecedented degree of excellence. Raphael rightly pictured the Pope as reading a book of sacred music. Leo collected musical instruments for their beauty as well as their tone. One was an organ adorned with alabaster and judged by Castiglione to be the loveliest that he had ever seen or heard. Leo liked also to keep at his court a number of jesters and buffoons. This accorded with the custom of his father and of contemporary kings, and did not altogether shock a Rome that loved laughter only next to wealth and venery. To our hindsight it seems offensive that jests light or coarse should have echoed through the papal court while the Reformation raged in Germany. It amused Leo to see one of his monk buffoons swallow a pigeon at a mouthful, or forty eggs in succession. He received with pleasure from a Portuguese embassy a white elephant, brought from India, which genuflected thrice on meeting his holiness. To bring him a person whose wit, deformity, or imbecility could refresh his mirth was an open sesame to his heart. He seems to have felt that to indulge in such diversions now and then would distract him from physical pain, relieve his mind of cosmic worries, and prolong his life. There was something disarmingly childlike about him. Occasionally he would play cards with cardinals, allow the public to sit in as spectators, and then distribute gold pieces to the crowd. Above all other amusements, he loved to hunt. It controlled his tendency to corpulence and allowed him to enjoy the open air and the countryside after being a prisoner of the Vatican. He kept a large stable with a hundred grooms. It was his custom to devote nearly all of October to the chase. His physicians highly approved of his addiction, but his master of ceremonies, Paris de Grassy, complained that the Pope kept his heavy boots on so long that no one can kiss his feet, at which Leo laughed heartily. We get a kindlier view of the Pope than in Raphael's picture when we read how the peasants and villagers would come to greet him as he passed along their roads and would offer him their modest gifts, which were so handsomely returned by the pontiff that the people eagerly awaited his hunting trips. To the poor girls among them he gave marriage dowries, he paid the debts of the sick or aged, or the parents of large families. These simple folk loved him more sincerely than the two thousand persons who made up his menage at the Vatican. But Leo's court was no mere focus of amusement and hilarity. It was also the meeting place of responsible statesmen, and Leo was one of them. It was the center of the intellect and wit of Rome, the place where scholars, educators, poets, artists, and musicians were welcomed or housed, the scene of solemn ecclesiastical functions, ceremonious diplomatic receptions, costly banquets, dramatic or musical performances, poetical recitations, and exhibitions of art. It was without question the most refined court in the world at that time. The labors of popes from Nicholas V to Leo himself, in the improvement and adornment of the Vatican, in the assemblage of literary and artistic genius, and of the ablest ambassadors in Europe, made the court of Leo the zenith, not of the art, 
for that had come under Julius, but of the literature and brilliance of the Renaissance. In mere quantity of culture, history had never seen its equal, not even in Periclean Athens or Augustan Rome. The city itself prospered and expanded as Leo's gathered gold flowed along its economic arteries. In thirteen years after his accession, said the Venetian ambassador, ten thousand houses were built in Rome, chiefly by newcomers from northern Italy following the migration of the Renaissance. Florentines in particular crowded in to pick plums from a Florentine pontificate. Paolo Jovio, who moved in Leo's court, estimated the population of Rome at eighty-five thousand. It was not yet so fair a city as Florence or Venice, but it was now by common consent the hub of Western civilization. Marcello Aberini, in 1527, called it the rendezvous of the world. Leo, amid amusements and foreign affairs, regulated the importation and price of food, abrogated monopolies and corners, reduced taxes, administered justice impartially, struggled to drain the Pontine marshes, promoted agriculture in the Campania, and continued the work of Alexander and Julius in opening or improving streets in Rome. Like his father in Florence, he provided Circenses, as well as Panem, engaged artists to plan gorgeous pageants, encouraged the masked festivities of carnival, even allowed Borgian bullfights to be staged in St. Peter's Square. He wished the people to share in the happiness and jollity of the new golden age. The city took its cue from the Pope and let joy be unconfined. Prelates, poets, parasites, panders, and prostitutes hurried to Rome to drink the golden rain. The cardinals, dowered by the pontiffs and above all by Leo, with innumerable benefices that sent them revenues from all parts of Latin Christendom, were now far richer than the old nobility, which was sinking into economic and political decay. Some cardinals had an income of 30,000 ducats a year, or $375,000. They lived in stately palaces, manned by as many as three hundred servants, and adorned with every art and luxury known to the time. They did not quite think of themselves as ecclesiastics. They were statesmen, diplomats, administrators. They were the Roman Senate of the Roman Church, and they proposed to live like senators. They smiled at those foreigners who expected of them the abstinence and continence of priests. Like so many men of their age, they judged conduct not by moral but by aesthetic standards. A few commandments might be broken with impunity if it was done with courtesy and taste. They surrounded themselves with pages, musicians, poets, and humanists, and now and then dined with courtly courtesans. They mourned that their salons were normally womanless. All Rome, according to Cardinal Bibiena, says that nothing is wanting here but a Madonna to hold a court. They envied Ferrara, Urbino, and Mantua, and rejoiced when Isabella d'Este came to spread her robes and feminine graces over their unisexual feast. Manners, taste, good conversation, appreciation of art were now at their height, and patronage was opulent. There had been cultivated circles in the smaller capitals, and Castiglione preferred the quiet coterie of Urbino to the cosmopolitan, noisier, flashier civilization of Rome. But Urbino was a tiny island of culture. This was a stream, a sea. Luther came and saw it and was shocked and repelled. Erasmus came and saw it and was charmed to ecstasy. A hundred poets proclaimed that the Saturnia Regna had returned. 3. Scholars On November 5, 1513, Leo issued a bull uniting two impoverished institutions of learning. The Studium Sacri Palatii, the College of the Holy Palace, that is, the Vatican, and the Studium Urbis, or City College. These now became the University of Rome, and were housed in a building soon known as the Sapienza. These schools had prospered under Alexander, but languished under Julius, who diverted their funds to war and preferred a sword to a book. Leo supported the new university handsomely until he too was enmeshed in the expensive game of competitive destruction. This book is continued on Cassette 5, Side 1. The Story of Civilization, Volume 5, The Renaissance, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 5, Side 1. Leo supported the new university handsomely until he too was enmeshed in the expensive game of competitive destruction. He brought in a bevy of devoted scholars, so that soon the institution had 88 professors, 15 in medicine alone, 
receiving from 50 to 530 florins, or about $625 to $6,625 a year. Leo, in these early years of his pontificate, did everything that he could to make the combined colleges the most scholarly and flourishing university in Italy. It was one of his credits that he established the study of Semitic languages. A chair in the University of Rome was devoted to the teaching of Hebrew, and Teseo Ambrogio was appointed to teach Syriac and Chaldaic in the University of Bologna. Leo welcomed the dedication of a Hebrew grammar composed by Agaccio Guidacerio. Learning that Sante Pagnini was translating the Old Testament from the original Hebrew into Latin, he asked to see a specimen, liked it, and undertook at once the expense of the laborious enterprise. It was Leo, too, who restored Greek studies, which had begun to decline. He invited to Rome the old scholar John Lascaris, who had begun teaching Greek in Florence, France, and Venice, and with him he organized a Greek academy in Rome, distinct from the university. To Lascaris's pupil Marcus Musurus, chief aide to Minucius, Bembo wrote for Leo, on August 7, 1513, a letter inviting the scholar to secure from Greece ten young men, or as many more as you may think proper, of good education and virtuous disposition, who may compose a seminary of liberal studies, and from whom the Italians may derive the proper use and knowledge of the Greek tongue. A month later, Minucius published the edition of Plato that Musurus had completed, and the great printer dedicated the work to the Pope. Leo responded by granting to Aldus for fifteen years the exclusive privilege of reprinting the Greek or Latin books that Aldus had already issued, or would in that period publish. All who should encroach upon this privilege were by that deed excommunicated and subject to penalties. This privilegium ad imprimendum solum was the Renaissance way of giving to a printer a copyright on the editions that he had paid to prepare. Leo added to the privilege an earnest recommendation that the Aldine publications should be moderately priced. They were. The Greek college was established in the house of the Colocci on the Quirinal, and a press was set up there to print textbooks and scolia for the students. A similar Medicean academy for Greek studies was at about the same time founded in Florence. Under Leo's encouragement, Barino Camerti, who Latinized his name as Favorinus, compiled the best Greek-Latin dictionary yet published in the Renaissance world. The Pope's enthusiasm for the classics was almost a religion. He accepted from the Venetians a shoulder bone of Livy with the same piety as though it had been a relic of some major saint. Soon after his accession, he announced that he would amply reward any person who should procure for him unpublished manuscripts of ancient literature. Like his father, he directed his emissaries and appointees in foreign lands to seek and buy for him any manuscripts of ancient pagan or Christian authorship and value. And sometimes he dispatched envoys for that sole and special purpose, and gave them letters to kings and princes, soliciting cooperation in the search. His agents seem on occasion to have stolen manuscripts when these could not be bought. This was apparently the case with the first six books of Tacitus's Annals, found in the monastery of Corby in Westphalia for we have a charming letter to the papal agent Heitmers, written by or for Leo after the annals had been edited and published. We have sent a copy of the revised and printed books in a beautiful binding to the abbot and his monks, that they may place it in their library as a substitute for the one taken from it. But in order that they may understand that this purloining has done them far more good than harm, we have granted them for their church a plenary indulgence. Leo gave the purloined manuscript to Filippo Beroaldo, with instructions to correct and edit the text, and print it in an elegant but convenient form. Said Leo in this letter of instruction, We have been accustomed, even in our early years, to think that nothing more excellent or useful has been given by the Creator to mankind, if we accept only the knowledge and true worship of Himself, than these studies, which not only lead to the ornament and guidance of human life, but are applicable and useful to every particular situation, consoling in adversity, pleasing and honorable in prosperity, insomuch that without them we should be deprived of all the grace of life and all the polish of society. The security and extension of these studies seem chiefly to depend on two circumstances, the number of learned men and the ample supply of excellent texts. As to the first of these, we hope, with the divine blessing, to show still more evidently our earnest desire and disposition to reward and honor their merits, this having been for a long time past our chief delight. 
With respect to the acquisition of books, we return thanks to God that in this also an opportunity is now afforded us of promoting the advantage of mankind. Leo thought that the judgment of the church should determine what literature would advantage mankind, for he renewed Alexander's edict for the episcopal censorship of books. In the sack of the Medici Palace in 1494, some of the books collected by Leo's ancestors had been dispersed. Most of them, however, had been bought by the monks of San Marco, and these salvaged volumes Leo, while still a cardinal, had repurchased for 2,652 ducats, or about $33,150, and had transferred to his palace in Rome. This Laurentian library was returned to Florence after Leo's death. We shall see its further fortune later. The Vatican Library had now swollen to such proportions as to need a core of scholars for its care. When Leo acceded to the papacy, the head librarian was Tommaso Ingirami, a nobleman and poet, a conversationalist noted for wit and brilliance in a society of brilliant wits and an actor whose success in the part of Phaedra in Seneca's Hippolytus earned him the nickname of Phaedra. When he died in a street accident in 1516, he was replaced as bibliotecario by Filippo Beroaldo, who divided his affections between Tacitus and the learned courtesan Imperia, and wrote such excellent Latin poetry as to receive six independent translations into French, one by Clément Marot. Girolimo Alejandro, or Aleander, who became librarian in 1519, was a man of temper, learning, and ability. He spoke Latin and Greek and Hebrew so fluently that Luther mistakenly pronounced him a Jew. At the Diet of Augsburg in 1520, he strove with more passion than wisdom to halt the Protestant tide. Paul III made him a cardinal in 1538, but four years later Aleander died through too assiduous care of his health and too frequent use of medicine. He was highly indignant at being taken off at sixty-two, and scandalized his friends with his exasperation at the ways of providence. Private libraries were now numerous in Rome. Aleander himself had a considerable collection, which he bequeathed to Venice. Cardinal Grimani, envied by Erasmus, had eight thousand volumes in a variety of languages. He willed these books to the Church of San Salvador in Venice, where they were destroyed by fire. Cardinal Sodaletto had a precious library, which he put on a ship to send to France. It was lost at sea. Bembo's library was rich in Provençal poets and original manuscripts, for example, of Petrarch. This collection passed to Urbino, thence to the Vatican. Rich laymen like Agostino Chigi and Bindo Altoviti imitated the popes and the cardinals in collecting books, engaging artists, and supporting poets and scholars. These abounded in Leo's Rome beyond any precedent or later parallel. Many cardinals were themselves scholars. Some, like Egidio Canisio, Sadoletto, and Bibiena, had been made cardinals because they were scholars of long service to the church. Most of the cardinals in Rome acted as patrons, usually by rewarding dedications, and the homes of cardinals Riario, Grimani, Bibiena, Alidosi, Petrucci, Farnese, Soderini, San Severino, Gonzaga, Canisio, and Giulio de' Medici were surpassed only by the papal court as meeting places for the intellectual and artistic talent of the city. Castiglione, whose genial nature made friends with both the amiable Raphael and the doer and unapproachable Michelangelo, maintained a modest salon of his own. Leo, of course, was the patron par excellence. No one who could turn a good Latin epigram went away from him giftless. As in the days of Nicholas V, scholarship, but now also poetry, constituted a claim to some place in the vast officialdom of the church. Lesser lights became apostolic scribes, abbreviatores, brief writers. Brighter luminaries rose to be canons, bishops, proto-notaries. Stars like Sodaletto and Bembo became secretaries to the Pope. Some, like Sodaletto and Bibiena, were made cardinals. Ciceronian oratory again resounded in Rome. Epistles rose and fell in cadenced periods. Virgilian and Horatian verse flowed in a thousand rivulets into the Tiber as their final destination. Bembo set the stylistic standard pontifically. Far better to speak like Cicero, he wrote to Isabella d'Este, than to be Pope. His friend and colleague, Jacopo Sodaletto, chained most of the humanists by combining an impeccable Latin style with impeccable morals. There were many men of high integrity among the cardinals of this age, 
and Leo's humanists were by and large of finer temper and life than those of the preceding generation. Some, however, remained pagan in everything but their professed creed. It was an unwritten law that whatever one believed or doubted, no gentleman would utter anything critical of a church that was morally so tolerant and so munificent a patron. Bernardo Dovizi da Bibiena was a composite of all these qualities, scholar, poet, dramatist, diplomat, connoisseur, conversationalist, pagan, priest, and cardinal. Raphael's portrait catches only a part of him, his sly eyes and sharp nose. It covers his baldness with a red hat and his gaiety with an unwanted gravity. He was light of foot and word and spirit, escaping from every vicissitude with a smile. Employed by Lorenzo the Magnificent as secretary and tutor, he shared with Lorenzo's sons the flight of 1494. But he showed his cleverness by going to Urbino, charming that urbane circle with his epigrams, and using some of his leisure to write and stage a risque play, Calandra, circa 1508, the oldest of Italian prose comedies. Julius II brought him to Rome. Bernardo managed Leo's election with so little fuss and friction that Leo at once made him an apostolic protonotary, and the next day treasurer of the papal household, and six months later cardinal. His dignities did not prevent him from serving Leo as connoisseur of arts and organizer of festival pageantry. His play was performed before the Pope, who enjoyed it with a good stomach. Sent his papal nuncio to France, he fell in love with Francis I and had to be recalled as too sensitive for a diplomat. When Raphael decorated his bathroom, it was, by the cardinal's choice, with the history of Venus and Cupid, a series of pictures recounting the triumphs of love, nearly all done in true antique Pompeian style, and overleaping Christianity into a world that had never heard of Christ. Leo, pretending not to notice the Venus in Bibiana, was faithful to him to the end. Leo relished drama in all its comic forms and degrees, from the simplest farce to the subtlest double entendres of Bibiana and Machiavelli. In the first year of his pontificate he opened a theater on the capital. There, in 1518, he witnessed a performance of Ariosto's I Suppositi, and laughed heartily at the equivocal jests that stemmed from the plot, the effort of a youth to seduce a maiden. Such gala performances were more than mere comedy. They included artistic stage settings, in this case the scenery was painted by Raphael, a ballet, and entract music by a chorus and an orchestra of lutes, violas, cornets, bagpipes, fifes, and a small organ. To Leo's pontificate belongs one of the major historical works of the Renaissance. Paolo Giovio was a native of Como. There, and in Milan and Rome, he practiced medicine. But inspired by the literary excitement that greeted Leo's accession, he gave his leisure hours to writing a Latin history of his own times, that is, from the invasion of Italy by Charles VIII to Leo's pontificate. He was allowed to read the first sections to Leo, who, with his customary lavishness, pronounced it the most eloquent and elegant historical writing since Livy, and rewarded him at once with a pension. After Leo's death, Jovio used what he called his pen of gold to write a eulogistic life of his dead patron, and his pen of iron to indict Pope Adrian VI, who ignored him. Meanwhile, he continued to labor at his immense Historiae Sui Temporis, finally carrying it to 1547. When Rome was sacked in 1527, he hid his manuscript in a church. It was found by a soldier, who then asked the author to buy his own book. Paolo was saved from this indignity by Clement VII, who persuaded the thief to accept, in lieu of more immediate payment, a benefice in Spain. Jovio himself was made bishop of Nocera. His history, and the biographies that he added to it, were acclaimed for their fluent and vivid style, but were denounced for their careless inaccuracies and their flagrant prejudice. Jovio blithely confessed that he praised or condemned the persons of his story according as they or their relatives had or had not lubricated his palm. 4. Poets The chief glory of this age was its poetry. As in samurai Japan, everyone from peasant to emperor, so in Leo's Rome, everyone from the pontiff to his clowns wrote verse, and nearly everybody insisted on reading his latest lines to the tolerant pope. He loved clever improvisation and was himself an expert in that game. Poets pursued him everywhere with outstretched rhymes. Usually he rewarded them somehow. On occasion he would content himself by replying with an extempore Latin epigram. A thousand books were dedicated to him. For one, he gave Angelo Colocci four hundred ducats, or about five thousand dollars. 
but to Giovanni Algorelli, who presented him with a poetical treatise, Chrysopoeia, or The Art of Making Gold by Alchemy, he sent an empty purse. He did not have time to read all the books whose dedications he accepted. One such was an edition of the 5th century Roman poet Rutilius Nemesianus, who advocated the suppression of Christianity as an enervating poison and demanded a return to the worship of the virile pagan gods. To Ariosto, who may have seemed to Leo sufficiently cared for in Ferrara, he gave merely a bull forbidding the pirating of his verses. Ariosto was peeved, having hoped for a gift commensurate with the length of his epic. Having lost Ariosto, Leo contended himself too readily with poets of duller radiance and shorter breath. His generosity often misled him into rewarding superficial talents as liberally as genius. Guido Postumo Silvestri, a noble of Pizarro, had fought vigorously and written violently against Alexander and Julius for seizing Pizarro in Bologna. Now he addressed to Leo an elegant elegiac poem, comparing the happiness of Italy under the new pope with its turmoil and misery in the preceding reigns. The appreciative pontiff restored him to his confiscated estates and made him a companion in the papal hunts. But Guido soon died, said some contemporaries, of eating too lavishly at Leo's table. Antonio Tebaldio, who had already made a name for himself as a poet in Naples, rushed to Rome on Leo's election and, says an uncertain tradition, received five hundred ducats from Leo for an appetizing epigram. In any case, the Pope gave him the superintendence and tolls of the Bridge of Sorga, so that it may enable Tebaldio to support himself in affluence. But money, though it may finance the talents of scholars, seems rarely to feed the genius of poets. Tebaldio wrote more epigrams, became dependent upon Bembo's charity after Leo's death, and took permanently to his bed, having no other complaint, said a friend, than the loss of his relish for wine. He lived a long time at ease on his back, and died at seventy-four. Francesco Maria Mozza of Modena acquired some proficiency in verse before Leo's elevation, but hearing of the Pope's poetic philanthropy, he left his parents, wife, and children, and migrated to Rome, where he forgot them in an infatuation for a Roman lady. He composed an eloquent pastoral poemetto, entitled La Ninfa Tiberina, in praise of Faustina Mancini, and was severely wounded by an unknown assassin. He left Rome after Leo's death, and at Bologna joined the retinue of Cardinal Ippolito de' Medici, who was said to maintain three hundred poets, musicians, and wits at his court. Moltz's Italian poems were the most elegant of the time, not excepting Ariosto's. His canzoni equaled those of Petrarch in style, and surpassed them in fire, for Moltze repeatedly fell out of one amorous conflagration into another, and perpetually burned. He died of syphilis in 1544. Two major minor poets honored Leo's reign. The career of Marc Antonio Flaminio shows the period in pleasant lights, the unfailing kindness of the Pope to men of letters, the unenvious friendship of Flaminio, Navagero, Fracastoro, and Castiglione, though all four were poets, and the clean lives led by these men in an age when sexual license was widely condoned. Flaminio was born at Saravale, in the Veneto, son of Gian Antonio Flaminio, himself a poet. Violating a thousand precedents, the father trained and encouraged the boy to poetry, and sent him at sixteen to present to Leo a poem written by the youth urging a crusade against the Turks. Leo had no taste for crusades, but he liked the verses and provided for the boy's further education in Rome. Castiglione took him in hand and brought him to Urbino in 1515. Later, the father sent his son to study philosophy at Bologna. Finally, the poet settled down at Viterbo under the patronage of the English cardinal Reginald Pole. He had the distinction of declining two high appointments, as co-secretary with Santoletto to Leo, and as secretary to the Council of Trent. Despite suspicion of sympathizing with the Protestant Reformation, he was handsomely supported by several cardinals. Through all his peregrinations, he longed for the peaceful life and clean air of his father's villa near Imola. His poems, nearly all in Latin and nearly all in the brief form of odes, eclogues, elegies, hymns, and Horatian epistles to friends, return again and again to his love of old rural haunts. Now I shall see you again. Now it will delight me to behold the trees planted by my father's hand, and I shall rejoice to woo a little quiet sleep in my little room. 
He complained of being a prisoner in the tumult of Rome and envied a friend whom he pictured as hiding in a village retreat, reading Socratic books and giving no thought to the shallow honors conferred by the vulgar crowd. He dreamt of strolling in green valleys with the Georgics of Virgil and the idols of Theocritus as his companions. His most touching lines were written to his dying father. You have lived, father, well and happily, neither poor nor rich, learned enough, eloquent enough, always of strong body and healthy mind, genial and of unrivaled piety. Now, having completed eighty years, you move on to the blessed shores of the gods. Go, father, and soon take your son with you to the high seat of heaven. Marco Girolimo Vida proved a more pliable poet for Leo's purposes. Born in Cremona, well-schooled in Latin, he became so skilled in that language that he could write it gracefully even in didactic poems De Arte Poetica, or on the growth of silkworms, or on the game of chess. Leo was so pleased with this Sacchi Ludus that he sent for Vida, loaded him with emoluments, and begged him to crown the literature of the age with a Latin epic on the life of Christ. So Vida began his Christiad, which happy Leo died too soon to see. Clement VII continued Leo's patronage of Vida, gave him a bishopric to feed on, but Clement died too before the publication of the epic in 1535. Though a monk when he began it, and a bishop when he finished it, Vida could not refrain from those classical mythological allusions that were in the very air of Leo's time, but may appear incongruous to those who are forgetting the mythology of Greece and Rome and are making Christianity a literary mythology in its turn. Vida speaks of God the Father as superum pater nimbipotens, the cloud-compelling father of the gods, and as regnator olympi, ruler of Olympus. He regularly describes Jesus as heros. He brings in gorgons, harpies, centaurs, and hydras to demand the death of Christ. So noble a theme served its own congenial poetic form rather than an adaptation of the Aeneid. The finest lines in Beda are addressed not to Christ in the Christiad, but to Virgil in the De Arte Poetica. O glory of Italy, O brightest light among the bards, we worship thee with wreaths and give thee frankincense and shrines. To thee of right we chant forever sacred paeans, recalling you with hymns. Hail, holiest bard! Thy glory gains no increase from our praise, nor needs our voice. Come, look upon thy sons, pour thy warm spirit into our chaste hearts, Come, Father, place thine own self in our souls. 5. The Recovery of Classic Art The pagan spirit of the age was enhanced by the presence and salvaging of classic art. Poggio, Biondo, Pius II, and others had denounced the demolition of classic structures, but it persisted nevertheless, and probably increased as the influx of money enabled Rome to build new and larger edifices with the ruins of the old. Builders continued to throw ancient marbles into furnaces to produce lime. Paul II used the stone wall of the Colosseum for the palace of San Marco. Sixtus IV pulled down the Temple of Hercules and turned the Tiber Bridge into cannonballs. The Temple of the Sun provided the material for a chapel in Santa Maria Maggiore, for two public fountains, and for a papal palace in the Quirinal. Artists themselves were unconscious vandals. Michelangelo used one of the columns of the Temple of Castor and Pollux to form a pedestal for the equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius, and Raphael took part of another column from the same temple to make a statue of Jonah. The material for the Sistine Chapel was quarried from the mausoleum of Hadrian. Practically all the marble used in raising St. Peter's was taken from classic buildings, and to the same new shrine went the podium, steps, and pediment of the Temple of Antoninus and Faustina, the triumphal arches of Fabius Maximus and Augustus, and the temple of Romulus, son of Maxentius. In just four years, from 1546 to 1549, the new builders destroyed or dismantled the temples of Castor and Pollux, Julius Caesar, and Augustus. The destroyers argued that there were enough pagan monuments left, that the neglected ruins took up valuable space and interfered with the orderly rebuilding of the city, and that the appropriated materials were in most cases used to erect Christian churches just as beautiful as the ruins, and presumably more pleasing to God. Meanwhile, the imperceptible inhumations of time had buried the Forum and other historic sites under successive layers of dust, debris, and vegetation, so that the Forum was at places forty-three feet below the level of the surrounding city. It was largely abandoned to pasturage and was called Campo Vaccino, the cow field. 
Time is the greatest vandal of them all. The influx of artists and humanists retarded the rate of demolition and generated movements for the preservation of the old monuments. Popes collected pagan sculpture and architectural fragments into the Vatican and Capitoline museums. Poggio, the Medici, Pomponius Letus, bankers, cardinals gathered into private collections whatever of worth they could acquire of the ancient remains. Many classic sculptures found their way into private palaces and gardens and stayed there till the 19th century. Hence such names as the Barberini Faun, the Ludovisi Throne, the Farnese Hercules. All Rome was thrilled when excavators unearthed in 1506, near the Baths of Titus, a new and complex sculptural group. Julius II sent Giuliano da Sangallo to examine it, and Michelangelo went along. As soon as Giuliano saw the statue, he cried out, This is the Laocoon mentioned by Pliny. Julius bought it for the Belvedere Palace, paying the finder and his son a lifetime annuity of six hundred ducats, or seventy-five hundred dollars. So precious had classic sculptures become. Such rewards encouraged art prospectors. A year later, one of these found another ancient group, Hercules with the infant Telephus. Soon afterward, the sleeping Ariadne was unearthed. The enthusiasm for recovering ancient manuscripts was now equaled by the eagerness to recover lost works of ancient art. Both of these sentiments were strong in Leo. It was in his pontificate that excavators found the so-called Antinous and the statues of the Nile and the Tiber. And these were placed in the Vatican Museum. Leo bought back, whenever he could, the gems, cameos, and other dispersed works of art once possessed by the Medici, and placed these two in the Vatican. Supported by his patronage, and starting with the previous work of Fra Giocondo and others, Jacopo Mazzocchi and Francesco Albertini copied, through four years, all the inscriptions they could find on Roman remains, and published them as Epigrammata Antiquae Urbis Romae, in 1521, an event in classical archaeology. In 1515, Leo appointed Raphael superintendent of antiquities. Helped by Mazzocchi, Andrea Fulvio, Fabio Calvo, Castiglione, and others, the young painter formed an ambitious archaeological plan. In 1518, he addressed to Leo a letter adjuring the pontiff to use the authority of the church for the preservation of all classical remains. The words may be Castiglione's, the passion has the ring of Raphael. When we reflect upon the divinity of those antique souls, when we see the corpse of this noble city, mother and queen of the world, so miserably mangled, how many pontiffs have permitted the ruin and defacement of the ancient temples, statues, arches, and other buildings, the glory of their founders? I dare say that all this new Rome that we now behold, however grand it is and beautiful and adorned with palaces, churches, and other edifices, has been cemented with lime made from the ancient marbles. The letter recalls how much destruction has taken place even during Raphael's ten years in Rome. It surveys the history of architecture denounces the crude barbarism of the Romanesque and Gothic styles, here called the Gothic and the Teutonic, and exalts the Greco-Roman orders as models of perfection and taste. Finally, it proposes that a corps of experts should be formed, that Rome should be divided into the fourteen regions anciently designated by Augustus, and that in each of these regions a careful survey and record should be made of all classical remains. Raphael's early death, soon followed by Leo's, delayed for a long time this majestic enterprise. The influence of the recovered relics was felt in every branch of art and thought. That influence worked on Brunellesco, Alberti, Bramante. Now it became supreme, until in Palladio it completely and almost servilely copied ancient forms. Ghiberti and Donatello had tried to model classically. Michelangelo achieved the classic manner perfectly in his Brutus, but for the rest he remained his passionate and unclassic self. Literature transformed Christian theology into pagan mythology and replaced paradise with Olympus. In painting, the classic influence took the form of pagan subjects and, even in Christian themes, pagan nudes. Raphael himself, darling of the popes, painted psyches, venuses, and cupids on palace walls. And classic designs and arabesques mounted the pillars and ran along the cornices and friezes of a thousand buildings in Rome. The classical triumph expressed itself most clearly in the new St. Peter's. Leo kept Bramante as master of the works there as long as possible. But the old architect was crippled with gout, and Fra Giocondo was commissioned to help him design. However, Fra Giocondo was ten years older than Bramante, who was seventy. 
In January 1514, Leo appointed Giuliano da Sangallo, also 70, to direct the operations. Bramante, on his deathbed, urged the Pope to confide the enterprise to a younger man, specifically Raphael. Leo compromised. In August 1514, he made the young Raphael and the old Fra Giocondo co-masters of the work. For a time, Raphael worked enthusiastically in his uncongenial function as an architect. Henceforth, he said, he would live nowhere but in Rome, and this from love for the building of St. Peter's, the greatest building that man has ever yet seen. He continues with characteristic modesty, The cost will amount to a million gold ducats. The Pope has ordered sixty thousand for the works. He thinks of nothing else. He has associated me with an experienced monk who has passed his eightieth year. The Pope sees that the monk cannot live much longer, and His Holiness has therefore determined that I should benefit by the instructions of this distinguished craftsman and attain to greater proficiency in the art of architecture of the beauties of which the monk has recondite knowledge. The Pope gives us audience every day and keeps us long in conversation on the subject of the building. Fra Giocondo died July 1, 1515, and on the same day Giuliano de Sangallo withdrew from the group of designers. Raphael, left supreme, undertook to replace Bramante's ground plan with a Latin cross of unequal arms and sketched a cupola that Antonio de Sangallo, nephew of Giuliano, proved too heavy for its supporting pillars. In 1517, Antonio was appointed co-architect with Raphael. Disputes arose now at every step, and Raphael, burdened with pictorial engagements, lost interest in the undertaking. Meanwhile, Leo ran short of funds, tried to raise more by issuing indulgences, and as a result found a German Reformation on his hands in 1517. St. Peter's made no substantial progress until Michelangelo was put in charge of it in 1546. 6. Michelangelo and Leo X Julius II had left funds to his executors for the completion, on a smaller scale, of the tomb that Michelangelo had designed for him. The artist worked at this task through the first three years of Leo's pontificate and received from the executors, in those years, 6,100 ducats, or about $76,250. Most of what remains of the monument was probably produced in this period, along with the Christ Risen of Santa Maria Sopra Minerva, a handsome naked athlete, whom later taste clothed in a loincloth of bronze. A letter written by Michelangelo in May 1518 tells how Signorelli came to his studio and borrowed 80 Julii, or about $800, which he never returned, and adds, He found me working on a marble statue four cubits in height, which has the hands bound behind the back. This was presumably one of the prigioni, or captivi, intended to represent the cities or arts made captive by the warrior pope. A statue in the Louvre fits the description, a muscular figure wearing only a loincloth and with arms so tightly bound at the back that the cords eat into the flesh. Near it is a finer captive, naked except for a narrow band about the breast. Here the musculature is not exaggerated. The body is a symphony of health and beauty. This is Greek perfection. Four unfinished schiavi, or slaves, in the Florence Academy were apparently intended as caryatids to support the superstructure of the tomb. The aborted tomb is now in Julius's church of San Pietro in Vincoli, a magnificent massive throne, pillars elegantly carved, and a seated Moses, an ill-proportioned monster of beard and horns and wrathful brow holding the tables of the law. If we choose to believe an improbable story in Vasari, Jews could be seen on any Saturday entering the Christian church to worship this figure, not as a work of the human hand, but as something divine. On Moses's left is a Leah, on his right hand a splendid Rachel, statues that Michael called the active and the contemplative life. The remaining figures of the tomb were indifferently carved by his aides. Above the Moses, a Madonna, and at her feet the half-recumbent effigy of Julius II, crowned with the papal tiara. The whole monument is a torso, the painfully interrupted work of scattered years from 1506 to 1545, confused, enormous, incongruous, and absurd. While these figures were being chiseled out, Leo, perhaps during a stay in Florence, conceived the idea of finishing the church of San Lorenzo there. This was the shrine of the Medici, containing the tombs of Cosimo, Lorenzo, and many other members of the family. Brunellesco had built the church, but had left the façade unfinished. Leo asked Raphael, Giuliano da Sangallo, Baccio Daniolo, Andrea, and Jacopo Sansovino to submit plans for completing the front. Michelangelo, apparently of his own accord, sent in a plan of his own, which Leo accepted as the best. 
Hence the Pope cannot be blamed, as so many have blamed him, for diverting Michael from Julius's tomb. Leo sent him to Florence, whence he went to Carrara to quarry tons of marble. Back in Florence he hired assistants for the work, quarreled with them, sent them packing, and brooded inactively in his uncongenial role as architect. Cardinal Giulio de' Medici, Leo's cousin, appropriated some of the idle marble for work on the cathedral. Michael fumed, but still dallied. At last, in 1520, Leo freed him from the contract and required no accounting of the funds that had been advanced to the artist. When Sebastiano del Piombo asked the Pope to give Angelo further assignments, Leo excused himself. He recognized Michelangelo's supremacy in art, but, he said, he is an alarming man, as you yourself see, and there is no getting on with him. Sebastiano reported the conversation to his friend, adding, I told His Holiness that your alarming ways did no man any harm, and that it was only your devotion to the great work to which you have given yourself that made you seem terrible to others. What was this famous terribilità? It was, first of all, energy, a wild, consuming force that tortured Michelangelo's body, but sustained it for eighty-nine years. And second, the power of will that kept that energy harnessed and directed to one purpose, art, ignoring almost everything else. Now, energy directed by a unifying will is almost a definition of genius. The energy that looked upon formless stone as a challenge, and clawed and hammered and chiseled it con furia until it took on a revealing significance, was the same force that swept angrily over the distracting trivialities of life, took no thought of clothing or cleanliness or superficial courtesies, and advanced to its end, if not blindly, yet with blinders, over broken promises, broken friendships, broken health, at last over a broken spirit leaving the body and mind shattered, but the work done. The greatest painting, the greatest sculpture, and some of the greatest architecture of the time. If God assist me, he said, I shall produce the finest thing that Italy has ever seen. He was the least prepossessing figure in an age brilliant with proud beauty of person and splendor of dress. Middle height, broad shoulders, slim frame, large head, high brow, ears protruding beyond the cheeks, temples bulging out beyond the ears, Drawn and somber face, crushed nose, sharp small eyes, grisly hair and beard. This was Michelangelo in his prime. He wore old clothing and clung to it till it became almost part of his flesh. And he seems to have obeyed half of his father's advice. See that you do not wash. Have yourself rubbed down, but do not wash. Though rich, he lived like a poor man, not only frugally, but penuriously. He ate whatever he found at hand, sometimes dining on a crust of bread. At Bologna, he and his three workmen occupied one room, slept in one bed. While he was in full vigor, says Condivi, he usually went to bed with his clothes on, even to the tall boots, which he has always worn because of a chronic tendency to cramp. At certain seasons, he has kept these boots on for such a length of time that when he drew them off, the skin came away together with the leather. As Vasari puts it, he had no mind to undress merely that he might have to dress again. While he prided himself on his supposed noble lineage, he preferred the poor to the rich, the simple to the intellectual, the toil of a worker to the leisure and luxuries of wealth. He gave most of his earnings to maintain his shiftless relatives. He liked solitude. He found it intolerable to make small talk with third-rate minds. Wherever he was, he followed his own train of thought. He cared little for beautiful women and saved a fortune by continence. When a priest expressed regret that Michelangelo had not married and begotten children, he replied, I have only too much of a wife in my art, and she has given me trouble enough. As to my children, they are the works that I shall leave, and if they are not worth much, they will at least live for some time. He could not bear women about the house. He preferred males both for companionship and for art. He painted women, but always in their maternal maturity, not in the bright charm of their youth. It is remarkable that both he and Leonardo were apparently insensitive to the physical beauty of woman, who has seemed to most artists the very embodiment and fountainhead of beauty. There is no evidence that he was homosexual. Apparently all the energy that might have gone into sex was, in his case, used up in work. At Carrara he spent the day from early morn in the saddle, directing the stone cutters and road makers, and the evening in his cabin by lamplight, studying plans, calculating costs, projecting the morrow's tasks. He had periods of apparent sluggishness, and then suddenly the fever of creation would possess him again, and everything else would be ignored, even the sack of Rome. Absorbed in work, he gave himself little time for friendship, though he had devoted friends. Rarely did any friend or other person eat at his table. 
He was content with the company of his faithful servant, Francesco degli Amadori, who for twenty-five years took care of him and for many years shared his bed. Michael's gifts made Francesco a rich man, and the artist was heartbroken at his death in 1555. For others, he had a bad temper and a sharp tongue, criticized rudely, took offense readily, suspected everybody. He called Perugino a fool and expressed his opinion about Francia's paintings by telling Francia's handsome son that his father made better forms by night than by day. He was jealous of Raphael's success and popularity. Though the two artists respected each other, their supporters divided into feuding cabals. And Jacopo Sansovino sent Michael a letter of violent abuse, saying, May the day be cursed on which you ever said any good about anybody on earth. There were a few such days. Seeing Titian's portrait of Duke Alfonso of Ferrara, Michael remarked that he had not thought that art could perform so much, and that only Titian deserved the name of painter. His bitter temper and somber mood were his lifelong tragedy. At times he was melancholy to the edge of madness, and in his old age the fear of hell so obsessed him that he thought of his art as a sin, and he dowered poor girls to propitiate an angry god. A neurotic sensitivity brought him almost daily misery. As early as 1508 he wrote to his father, It is now about fifteen years since I had a single hour of well-being. He would not have many more, though he had still fifty-eight years to live. 7. Raphael and Leo X, 1513-1520 Leo neglected Michelangelo, partly because he liked men and women of equable temper, and partly because he had no great love for architecture or the massive in art. He preferred a gem to a cathedral, and miniatures to monuments. He kept Caradosa, Santi de Cola Saba, Michele Nardini, and many other goldsmiths busy making jewelry, cameos, medals, coins, sacred vessels. At his death he left a collection of precious stones, rubies, sapphires, emeralds, diamonds, pearls, tiaras, mitres, and pectorals, worth 204,655 ducats, over two and a half million dollars. We should remember, however, that most of these had been inherited from his predecessors, and that they constituted a portion of the papal treasury immune to depreciations of the currency. He invited a score of painters to Rome, but Raphael was almost the only one that he really cared for. He tried Leonardo and dismissed him as a dawdler. Fra Bartolomeo came to Rome in 1514 and painted a St. Peter and a St. Paul. But the errant excitement disagreed with him, and he soon returned to the peace of his Florentine monastery. Leo liked the work of Sodoma, but hardly dared let that reckless rake roam too freely about the Vatican. Sebastiano del Piombo was appropriated by Leo's cousin, Giulio de' Medici. Raphael agreed with Leo in both temperament and taste. This book is continued at this point on the other side of this cassette. Please reverse or turn the cassette over now.